Well, g'day, curd nerds. G'day, curd nerds. Well, 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 g'day, curd nerds. Welcome to Ask the Cheese Man. No, it's not. This is not Ask the Cheese Man. What am I talking about? This is 12 hours of cheese. Oh, I'm tired already. Goodness me, I've only just started. No, I'm only joking. Fantastic. It's lovely to see so many, uh, so many curd nerds. How many have we got so far? 40 watching. This is absolutely fantastic. I'm excited. Woo! So many things happening today. So before we start, though, uh, of course, as always, uh, a big shout out to all the financial members of the channel, both on YouTube memberships and Patreon. Thank you so much for your financial support. But a special mention today, uh, new YouTube members, Thomas Williams and Andrea Rigel. Thank you so much, Thomas and Andrea, and new patrons uh, Ellen Bloomfield, thank you very much, Ellen, for your ongoing financial support. And as I mentioned, thanks to all the financial members for supporting the show. And without it, we wouldn't be able to have a whole day of cheese. Well, nearly a whole day, 12 hours. We'll see. We'll go from there. Goodness me. Right. So let me just show you the schedule. Oh, and we've got our first super chat for the day. And is the, oh, the curd nerd lights going off. Goodness me. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, let me just uh, kill that there. Uh, Jim says, uh, and thank you for the $2, mate. My small donation to this wonderful idea. I appreciate it. And as you saw, when the when a super chat happens over on YouTube, if you're watching on YouTube, um, the curd nerd light comes on just like that. And uh, you get a big mention. And you go to the top of the list as far as the questions go. So let's have a look at the schedule for today. It's a big one. Let me just make sure 
all the tech is working. Goodness me, I hope it does for the whole day. Anyway, so here is the 12 hours of live uh, cheese, 12 hours of cheese. So today, obviously, for the first 30 minutes is the introduction and letting you all know what's going on and when it's going on. Uh, let me just put this in front of me so it looks like I'm actually reading it. There we go. <clears throat> so 30 minutes uh, into the stream, we'll have a beginner's cheese session. Uh, we're going to learn how to make quark and currant jam creamy. Then uh, kicking off the first of the live interviews, we've got a live interview with Jennifer Merch, who actually does have a YouTube channel. Um, so that should be good fun. Uh, she is a home cheese maker. She's got her own dairy cow, so that should be very good. She's over in Virginia in the United States. And then we've got a live interview with uh, Patricia Gauchi, who lives in Nova Scotia, Canada. And she's a home cheese maker as well and a, uh, a frequenter of the channel. Also, at uh, three hours into the stream, we'll have a live interview with Ruth Cohen, who's uh, out of California, San Francisco, and she's been a home cheese maker and she has found it fantastic therapy. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about therapy during her session. Uh, four hours into the stream, we will have a beginner's cheese session number two. So talk about calculating milk fat using uh, the Pearson square. Learn how to make uh, Guido cheese. Uh, <laughs> how do I say this? Charlie, help me out, mate. Uh, this is uh, uh, Gabenyat Talbazar. That's how I'll say it anyway. Sorry about that. All you uh, Maltese people out there, it's a traditional Maltese cheese. So some easy beginner's cheeses and we're going to learn how to do those, and a uh, blatant advertisement for my Cameo page uh, and uh, a little uh, snippet of what I produce there. Then at five hours into the stream, we are going to have some footage that has never been seen before. Uh, we are going to... Uh, we are going to show you how we smoke cheese... So that'll be fun. I did it in my home barbecue. Um, and then the cheese that has been smoked will be tasted live. So I've got another part of the studio that's set up. So we will be doing some live cheese tasting. Uh, so that will be very exciting. And then after that, if we've got some time, I've slated in a, a very small little um, Ask the Cheese Man. So you can ask questions and we'll be doing a little gallery segment there too. We've got some gallery photos, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so we'll do that as well. Uh, and then after that live session, we've got a uh, some more intermediate cheese sessions. So this one is flocculation method, Persian feta and how to make a filly, which is one of my favorite cheeses. Then at seven hours into the stream, we'll have a live interview with Tracy Johnson out of British Columbia in Canada. She owns a little company called Cheese Needs, uh, and uh, they um, she sends uh, cheese making stuff all through um, Canada and the US, and I think throughout the world. I think she's got some international shipping, but we'll ask her, shall we? Um, okay, and then at uh, uh, eight hours into the stream, we will have intermediate cheese intermediate cheese session number two. We're doing washed. Uh, mead washed alpine cheese, Oaxaca and St. Marcelin. Uh, and then nine hours into the stream, we've got a live interview. We've got so many live interviews today. It's just absolutely fantastic. Uh, this one is with John Wilson, who runs a cheese company out of Campot in Cambodia. Uh, this is going to be absolutely fantastic. Uh, so we'll be talking to John. Uh, and then 10 hours into the stream, we'll have a mold ripened session for 30 minutes where I'll teach you how to make uh, petite chili brie. And then the last interview for the day, um, which is 10 and a half hours into the stream, we'll be having a chat with uh, Tutu Sad, uh, and he's from Bangladesh, uh, and he runs a little cheese making company. And um, he has achieved many firsts, which is a great thing. Uh, one of the very, very few artisan cheesemakers in Bangladesh 
who make cheese with rennet, so or long aged cheese. So that should be absolutely fantastic. Uh, and then we'll have a final 30 minute uh, wrap up and final Q&A for the day for those who are still awake or those who have joined halfway through the stream. Um, and then at uh, 12 hours into the stream, we'll finish. That'll be it. I'll go and have a couple of gin and tonics and maybe some champagne to celebrate a big, long, hard day. So that'll be absolutely fantastic. So that is the schedule for today. Um, I'll just keep this over here on my screen so I can keep track of it all. But, uh, yeah, it's it's going to be good fun. So let's say good day to some people who are here today. Um, first cab off the rank today was Jordan, who got here about an hour and a half before the stream started. G'day, Jordan. Hope you're still around. Uh, we've got uh, Junkus. We've also got uh, Lemonosis. My goodness, some great names here. We got uh, Jim. Hello, Jim. Lovely to see you, mate. Uh, we got Habib. Hello, Habib, um, who has sent in many, many photos. Uh, Patrick. G'day, mate. How are you? Charlie. Hello. How are you? Just down the road. Um, we've also got uh, Cease. Hello, Cease. Lovely to see you. And Cheryl. Hello, Cheryl, over in Florida. Um, you're going to pull an all-nighter. Absolutely fantastic. Haven't pulled an all-nighter since college, or was it a bachelorette party? But now I'm older. I'm sure you'll be able to do it. <laughs> okay, Annette, hello Annette, lovely to see you And thank you for those photos, I've got those Which are great for the gallery uh, Which we'll do at um, When do we say we do it? We do it after the live smoked cheese test Cheese taste test So that'll be fun uh, G'day Herb, lovely to see you mate And uh, Stranger Ranch, hello, how are you? Um, where else? Kelly, hello Kelly Love to see you as well. Judy. Hello, Judy. Uh, just one Abesto. I'll call you Just One. How are you, mate? Farm Pants 94. So good to see you. Uh, Robert. Hello, Robert. How are you? Wendy. G'day, Wendy. Lovely to see you. Wendy, I hope you enjoyed your podcast episode that I released the other day. I don't know if you saw it on the... Um, uh, on the community tab or wherever you get your podcast, but over on the podcast channel, Little Green Cheese, you would see a lovely interview with Wendy, who's in the chat today. It's so good. And I'd love to see everybody up on a Sunday morning, those in Australia, bright and early. <clears throat> Goodness me, I hope my voice lasts today. Uh, H7 Apollo, uh, lovely to see you. Uh, Kristen, who we also got? Byron, Donna, Ruth, Ruth, lovely to see you. Um, and, uh, yeah, don't forget your time slot. Three minutes into the uh, – sorry, three minutes, three hours into the stream. Uh, where else? We've got Jennifer. And Jennifer is going to be the first interview at an hour into the stream. So that'll be lovely to see you, Jennifer. Glad to see you're all set up. Uh, we've got – Patricia, who's also, she's two hours into the stream, so she's there as well. So good to see everybody. I'm glad this is all working out. Plath, hello, Plath. Linda, g'day. Um, who else we got? KK and Jordan, still there. Good to see you, mate. Uh, Raphael and uh, Titus is there as well. Uh, gre <laughs> greetings, Sir Gavin Cheese a lot. My goodness. Okay. Um, all right, my little clock says it's 12 minutes past the hour. So if anybody has any sneaky little cheese questions that they want to get answered uh, straight off the bat, let's have a few. Um, just, yeah, let's have a few. So throw them at me, ladies and gentlemen. If you've got some cheese-making questions, let's just answer a few straight away and we will then get into the first session. I don't really want to um, start it early because that'll throw people off. It'd be like having cats and dogs living together. That would be no good at all. So first question, uh, Ruth, you said, I think you sent your photos too late. No, you didn't. I've got them, mate. So it's all good. 
So don't worry about that. I've got your photos and I've got uh, Tutu's photos, but he's not awake yet. So I've got his photos for his session. Um, okay. So first question is from Kristen. Have I ever made cheese with skim milk? Yes. Yes, I have. There's that well-known Italian cheese called Parmesan or Parmigiano Reggiano, which is made with, well, I suppose it's made with semi-skimmed milk. So, um, so Parmesan is made with 2% milk and it is very simple. Well, simple takes a long time to make, but uh, yeah, you need a fair bit of volume. Um, so when I made mine, I used 14 litres of milk, which is, what's that, three and a half gallons. I wish I had a bigger pot. So the bigger the parmesan, the better it tastes. And the moister it stays. Um, for us home cheesemakers, I've probably got about a, about a 1.2 kilo uh, yield out of that cheese after using 14 litres of milk. So it was... Um, yeah, it was it was a smaller cheese than I thought it would be, but it turned out very well and it was absolutely delicious. Uh, thank you for asking. And there's a couple of other ones. Um, is it Leodama? Not too sure. Which is a um, a Dutch style cheese that uses semi skim milk as well. Okay, uh, so a question from Linda over on Facebook. Oh, I forgot to mention before I answer qu uh, Linda's questions. Uh, we are. Uh, live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. On Facebook, you can find me on two Facebook pages, um, Cheeseman TV and The Greening of Gavin, which is my old one I thought I'd stream to. There's lots of people that watch over there as well. Uh, and Twitch, of course. And you can go find Cheeseman TV over on Twitch. So that's very interesting. Okay, uh, question from Linda. Sorry, Linda, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Here we go. Linda says, I have a chowder I just made two weeks ago. When do I attempt to smoke it? It's ready for waxing. Uh, do I wait to smoke it or do it now, then wax it? Right, okay, great question. So uh, there are two schools of thought. Do you smoke it before you wax it? Do you smoke it after you uh, have matured it? Uh, you can do both. You can do either. As long as the cheese is dry, so touch dry, when you first made it, then yes, you can smoke it then. Uh, and you can also smoke it once it's matured. So you can do either. Now, um, Lisa from Cheese 52, I don't know if she's watching, but Lisa from Cheese 52 did an experiment uh, where she smoked cheese as she's made it. So just fresh out of the press. And then she smoked the same style of cheese. Uh, she smoked that after it was mature. And she actually liked the flavour of the uh, cheese that had been smoked uh, early on in the, in the maturation process. So before it matured and then let it mature. However, uh, you couldn't say that that is too scientific because... Uh, one cheese has been aged for three months longer than the other cheese. So the flavor is going to be different anyway. So if, let me just think about this. So if she's already matured a cheese for three months and then smoked, I oh know she waited. Uh, <laughs> I'm just trying to figure it out. Now one will be still three months older than the other one. So yeah, anyway, but uh, yeah, she said that the, the cheese that she smoked before she vac packed or waxed it, well, had a deeper, richer flavour than the one afterwards. Now, what I've done with my cheese today, and uh, you'll all see that uh, at whew, five hours into the stream, you'll see for my lunch, we'll be eating cheese that I smoked after it's been matured. In fact, I've got a, a double Gloucester was one of the cheeses or a part of a double Gloucester that was seven years old or six and a half years old, nearly seven. So that's... Pretty cool. Okay, some other questions um, before we do. Hello, Mary. Hello, Cool Cat. And hello, Kevin. Um, Kevin says, I'm using Bienna, Bienna, I think it's how you say it, Rennet 
and it does not have an IMCU rating, and lately my cheeses are tasting slightly bitter. Please advise. Ooh. Okay, so if it doesn't have an IMC, it, it must do somewhere on the internet. So wherever you bought it from, I would go back to them. I would ask them for the specification sheet. All of these products have a special specification sheet, and it will have listed what the IMCU or dosage rate is of the Rennet. So that's number one. Number two, if you think it's setting occurred really fast... And too much rennet can cause bitterness, as, as you rightly stated there, Kevin. Then maybe ease off on the rennet by about 10% in your next cheese to see what happens. You can't do anything with the cheeses that you've got now. The only, well, you can, sorry. If you age them longer, the um, peptides in the cheese dissipate. So the longer you age them, the less bitter they will become. So if you've got a cheese that's bitter now, age it for another three to six months and that bitterness should subside. If not, cook with it. Once you cook with it, the bitterness goes away anyway. So you can cook with the cheese. So there's some suggestions anyway, Kevin. I hope that helps. Uh, that's what I would do. Okay. Um, Ms. Spinner says, hello, Gavin. Is it okay to use silicon utensils like a spatula for stirring? Yes, it is. So if you've got silicon utensils and, <coughs> oh, excuse me, and you um, uh, have sanitized them, then, yeah, they're good to go. Silicon won't, um, unless they're really scratched, which is pretty hard for silicon. It doesn't really scratch. So, yeah, I couldn't see any issues with that. I prefer stainless steel because you can boil them. Silicon, you can boil as well, but it tends to warp a little bit. So you may just have to use the vinegar or the weak bleach solution to do that. Uh, okay. So, uh, lemonous, lemonosis, lemonis, lemonous. There we go. I'll say it right now. Uh, lemonous has said, and let me just make sure my clock's up there. Right. So, lemonous has said, any cheese you will recommend for somebody new to cheese making? Yeah, indeed. So I do have, uh, there's a video on um, on the channel called, and I don't have a moderator today, so I can't put any links up. Um, so uh, it's called Beginner's, Beginner's Cheese Without a Cheese Cave or Beginner's Cheese Without a Cheese Fridge, something like that. Anyway, so I mentioned, I think, five or six cheeses. So I'll rattle them off. So Paneer, obviously, is a great candidate, and you can flavor that any way you want. Uh, which is an Indian cheese, uh, which has been set with uh, with an acid, usually lemon juice. Um, don't forget um, ricotta, of course, or ricotta salata you can make out of that as well. Uh, halloumi is a good one. Feta is another great cheese to start off with. Uh, queso fresco is a great cheese to start off with. Once you get the hang of those, then you could probably move into semi-hard, hard, and maybe even mold-ripened cheeses. So... I don't think it'll be any problems with that. But, yeah, there you go. There's some suggestions. Um, okay. So next question is from uh, Titus says, ricotta is done with low butter fat milk, NP. NP, what's that? No problems? Not possible? Um, so ricotta is made with, obviously, the way of... Um, of a rennet set cheese, so any other cheese. So if you've got an acid set cheese, you won't get any ricotta. There's no whey proteins left uh, in the milk. So if the whey is cloudy, all right, so this is the stipulation. If the whey is nice and cloudy and it's a rennet set cheese, then you can use the whey and add a bit of either lemon juice or vinegar and make some ricotta, okay? Um, that's... It can be low-fat milk. It can be low-butter-fat milk. So it can be lower on the, say, 3.2 um, or 3.5%. Even higher, the higher the butter fat, the, the fat content of the milk, the more ricotta you're going to get. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. So a question from Cheryl says, how long after a cow gives birth should you wait before using milk to make cheese, found a semi-local source uh, for raw milk, $14 uh, per US gallon. 
Uh, good question. Uh, I don't run a dairy farm, but what I'll do, if Jennifer is still there in the chat, who will be a number one guest at one hour into the, into the um, stream, then if you can answer that question for me, Jennifer, that will be fantastic, as Jennifer has a cow. So she would be able to answer that. I cannot, unfortunately. Let's just see if Jennifer answers the question if she's listening. Uh, anyway, hopefully she does, Cheryl. All righty. Uh, next question is from Jordan. And Jordan says, I was making your petite blue the other day and I used full cream milk, unhomogenized, and when I finished the cured set, there was like clumps of butter. Do I... Leave those or take them out. What happened? Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, you will get little... Uh, if the, the cream doesn't incorporate into the milk, I've had this happen many times before, and you may have seen, I do mention it sometimes in the videos, Jordan, that um, I scoop, though they will float to the top. And usually it's after the culturing and after renneting, you'll see little lumps of butter or it's cream that is, um, has started to turn into butter and you just scoop those off. Don't include them in the, the cheese. Just use a skimmer. I always have a skimmer on standby just to, uh, to skim those bits off if you want to. Um, they don't really incorporate into the cheese very well because they're really fatty. So just take those out. Okay. Um, and I think Jennifer has answered the question from, uh, if I can find it, where is it? She has answered the, well, here we go. So the cow question from Cheryl says, yes, I think it's seven days at the earliest, but maybe wait until two weeks. Uh, and then Jennifer says, with our new cow, I waited about eight days, I think. So there you go. Uh, and Titus has got some extra bit he's looked up. Says the weaning process could last 7 to 14 days, depending on the age with which the calves are weaned, as well as the breed of cow. There you go. So two weeks, uh, the milk is good to go. Uh, and it won't be the... Um, oh, I can't remember what the stuff is that comes out first. There is a special milk protein that the cows produce or any uh, ruminant producers um, that has more nutrients in it at the start of the uh, uh, of the feeding process for the for the cow. All right, there we go. See if I didn't know, the curd nerds would know. So that's the fantastic thing about this community, um, and I'm so happy that we have this sounding board, I suppose, that we can use to get answers to questions that. Um, that we've got burning questions all righty um what's the time we've got four minutes before the first session kicks off so now what i will during this session i will be here most of the time but i've got to go and have my breakfast so uh like i said it is a pre-recorded session but i will be there um in the background on the chat so um if you have any questions about the session that's playing, then don't forget to ask them in the chat. I will be there um, after I go get me breakfast. It's just over there. So having cocoa pops for if anybody wants to know, not cheese. Cheese is for lunch. All righty. Uh, one or two last questions. So this one's from Kevin said, I made a dark ale and mustard cheese um, and also came out slightly bitter. Is that from the Guinness? Uh, no, because... Uh, Kim and I had a piece, I had a piece in the fridge out here in the studio of that very same cheese, the dark ale and mustard. Um, and it didn't have any bitterness at all. It had a, a slight sweetness and a little bit of heat from the mustard seeds. And I really wish I had have um, toasted those mustard seeds before I put them into the cheese. So they had a little bit more spiciness, but definitely the dark ale flavor was there. And, uh, yeah, no no bitterness whatsoever. So you get that deep, rich, mellow flavour from the beer, which is great. Um, Titus, as a question, says, how about using liquid smoke rubbed on the chowder, Gavin? Yeah, indeed. So you may have seen that video, Titus, that I did use liquid smoke 
um, which is, you know, one of those barbecue preparations that you can uh, use as a base on meat or marinate it. Um, and I did do that with a howder once, and it turned out really well. So it was a very nice cheese. Um, not as smoky as I wanted it to be. I would have added more to the milk and then maybe rub it on the outside. I didn't rub it on the outside for that smoked one. I just added it to the milk uh, and it still coagulated and matured and tasted like a slightly smoky gouda. So, okay. So, um, here's a question or maybe a statement from Kristen says, I like to smoke, then seal it. Um, I feel like it seals in the smoke taste. Indeed. So I, I watched about four barbecue channels on YouTube before I smoked my cheese because there's not a lot, a lot of reference out there. there. There are a few. And all of them mentioned that after you smoke the cheese, wrap it in uh, glad wrap or sarin wrap, the plastic wrap. Um, and then store it in the kitchen fridge for at least seven days so the flavour uh, infuses into the cheese. So that's what I've done. It's it's wrapped and in my fridge. I'll take it out 30 minutes before I taste it so it rooms up to room, warms up to room temperature, so we should be good to go. Um, Uh, what do we got? We'll see. Well, uh, Leah, let's start the first session. Um, so I will get to the other questions. Uh, we'll see how we go. Anyway, um, if, if you've still got some burning questions and you're here at uh, five hours into... Oh, it's time to wake up. Uh, five hours into the chat, then we'll have another Q&A session. But... Um, these other questions we can ask during the live sessions as well. I will throw a few questions in there um, so we can do that as well. Uh, all right. So let's start the first session, the first beginner session. And uh, I will be in the chat answering any questions if you have them. Uh, and um, we will uh, then uh, we'll have our first interview with Jennifer. So, Jennifer, if you're watching, which you, I think you are, uh, don't forget that if you want to pop in at 10 minutes before the end of this session, just so I can see you, we can have a little private chat if you want to make sure it's all working, and then we'll show you and go from there. Anyway, uh, on with the first session of the day. Cheese, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Camembert. It's never ending mission to explore strange new cheeses, to seek out dairy delights and new flavors, and to boldly go where no cheesemaker has gone before. Well, welcome to Quark's Bar. Well, it's not really Quark's Bar. It's just Quark Cheese. So for those who don't know, quark is a northern European dish, uh, Germanic in origin and from the Baltic states as well. It is a very simple uh, cheese, very similar to yogurt. I may have drained this a little bit too long. Oh, no, it's very creamy. Here we go. This is similar consistency to thick yogurt. Uh, and uh, very simple to make. Now, it's used in many dishes and straight on uh, fruit and berries for breakfast in Germany. Uh, it is a very simple little cheese to make. Um, the difference between quark and yogurt is that yogurt uses uh, thermophilic cultures and a thermophilic culture called uh, Lactobacillus lactis bulgaris, which is a high acidifier, and uh, this does not. So this has your temp simple two mesophilic cultures in it, uh, Lactobacillus lactis sp subspecies cremoris and Lactobacillus lactis subspecies lactis. They're the two bacteria that were introduced into the milk, and uh, they result in a, uh, a not-so-sharp uh, creamy cheese. 
So let me show you how I made Quark. Named after Quark's bar, obviously, in Star Trek. So the ingredients for this cheese is one litre or one quart of whole cow's milk, an eighth of a teaspoon of mesophilic starter culture, an eighth of a teaspoon or 0.75 millilitres of calcium chloride diluted in quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water, three drops of single-strength liquid rennet diluted in quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water. So turn the heat on and start to heat your milk up. I directly heated it on the stove and just gave it a stir and checked the temperature to make sure it didn't run away from me. So heat your milk up to 25 degrees Celsius or 77 Fahrenheit. So add your starter culture. I'm using the Mad Millie sachet of, it's a mesophilic culture. I think it's just called cheese culture. So remove the spoon from the pot because you don't want to get cultural over that, of course. And then sprinkle the culture all over the surface of the milk. Make sure you get it all out. Now you don't need to rehydrate it, just give it a good stir. And add your calcium chloride, give that a good stir. And then add your rennet solution. And stir that for no longer than one minute. It doesn't really matter at this stage, but yeah, don't over stir it once you put the rennet in. So just take that off of the burner. And I'm going to pour the milk now into my uh, thermos jar. So pour as much as you can into the jar. And this is how we're going to keep it warm during the ripening period or setting period for this cheese. So I put as much as I dare in to the jar, then screw the lid on tightly. And then I place a little warm water from the tap in the bottom of the thermos. Not too hot, just lukewarm. Then I popped the jar into the thermos. It's just a double insulated stainless steel thermos. We sell them, sell them on our website. And then place the jar into the thermos and leave it for 16 hours to set. So 16 hours later, just take the jar out of the thermos. And we're going to pour it into a butter muslin lined colander. And it was fairly solid, as you can see there. So now we're going to hang the cheese up to let it drain. So tie opposite corners into a bag. And then there's not much of it in there. So I simply uh, decided to hang it over a pot. So I'm going to find a wooden spoon. Stick it through the bag and then put it in my largest pot. Hang that there for about four to five hours. So this is the quark that I made earlier. And thanks for coming along on my little trek in the stars. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you here. Um, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to turn the quark out of the bag and uh, put it into a bowl, give it a little quick sneaky taste test, and then we're going to use it on whatever we're going to use it on. Anyway, with clean hands, I'm just getting the 
bag. And you can see I used a big pot this time instead of hanging on the, uh, the cupboard uh, because it was so small. I thought, well, there's no point really. So I just used the, just used the bag. So I've also got a, another bowl there and a, a spatula, silicon spatula. Uh, without getting it in any way. There we go. I think I've got it now. Rightio. So let's get this out of the way. Get a little bowl. And the thing, the beauty of only using a litre of milk with this recipe is that you don't get very much. Uh, and uh, if you want to double it, that's fine. Just double everything uh, in the recipe and you'll get twice as much. There we go. It's a little bit to get out, not much on the cloth. Not a lot. There we go. That is it. So there you have it. Very simple little cheese to make. More of a ooh, condiment than a cheese. Oh, no, it's a cheese. It's a cheese. I used starter culture. I used milk. And I used a few little drops of rennet, as you saw in the ingredients. So what does it taste like? Well... Let me just try. I've just mixed it up. And it is the consistency of yogurt, thick yogurt, thick Greek yogurt. Now, if I had hung it a little bit less, I hung it for five hours. If I had hung it for, say, four hours, probably a little bit more whey in there. Um, I could introduce a little bit more whey back in, actually. Hang on. Do I have any in my pot? Let's see what happens. There we go. There's a little bit of the whey. Everything nice and clean. Stir that. Oh, there you go. That's a better consistency. That's a bit more runnier. So that's more like a natural yogurt. Perfect. And there's no harm with adding some of the whey back in if you think you've overstrained it. Anyway, what's it taste like? Well, I'm not wanting to contaminate that lot there. Let me get another spoon. Here we go. Now, I've been told it's creamy and not as tangy as yogurt. So let's try this. It's a little tart, but certainly not tangy. Um, yeah, more on the creamy side. Um, similar to a... Not so sharp sour cream, if that makes sense. Mmm, that's very nice. That'll go lovely with um, sweet things. It's low in fat because all you've used is just normal 4% milk or, or standardized 3% milk. Uh, there's no added cream to it, there's no salt to it. So you've got to use it fairly quickly uh, within at least. I would say between five and seven days. I wouldn't have it any longer than that, uh, especially if you're using raw milk. It will just keep acidifying and acidifying uh, and it will get tangier and tangier. But as it stands, nice little cheese, very simple to make. I can see why the Germans and the Scandinavian countries uh, and some parts of Eastern Europe are in love with this lovely little cheese. It also goes by the name of quag as well. Um, as well as Quark. Well, hopefully you enjoyed that little Star Trek intro. It was just something different. Uh, I thought Quark, there were so many people when I put a comment up on the, uh, the community tab about the cheeses I was making this week um, that uh, uh, there was quite a few little references to uh, Quark, at Quark's bar on Deep Space Nine. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the little homage to Star Trek. Well, thanks for watching, Curd Nerds. Uh, as always, if you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already and aren't getting notified of cheesy content, then go and hit that subscribe button and ring the little bell to get notified of all future videos. Well, if you want to make this cheese, then I would highly recommend the 
soft cheese kit or the fresh cheese kit, uh, either of those two kits in our range will work perfectly for Quark. Well, thanks for watching, Curd Nerds. Live long and prosper. Uh. Well, good day, Curd Nerds. Welcome to another cheese making tutorial. Today, we're making a cheese that was sent in to me by Charlie Pace, and it's called Curran Jang Creamy. Get your lips around that one. So, Curran Jang Creamy, Charlie describes it as. Uh, let me just read that. I'll read the email out to it. It says, Hello, Gavin. Hope you, Kim, and the puppies are doing well. On last week's Ask the Cheese Man, someone asked about how to invent a new cheese. I don't know if you can use this or not, but I have a cheese I made up we call Curran Jang Creamy. It is a fresh cheese, a little like a feta mozzarella cross. Easy to make and uses standard store-bought milk. I've attached a photo and the recipe which you are most welcome to post on your channel. Cheers, Charlie Pace. Well, thank you, Charlie, for writing. And it sounds like an old TV show I used to watch. I can't remember what it was. But it's lovely to have a new recipe. So um, without further ado, let me show you how I made Karanjang Creamy. So don't forget to sanitise all of your equipment. And the milk I'm using today is from Inglenook Dairy. Even though it's unhomogenized, for this recipe, you can use pasteurized and homogenized milk. So the ingredients for this cheese is four litres of one gallon of whole cow's milk, one quarter of a teaspoon of lipase, one eighth of a teaspoon of thermophilic culture, half a teaspoon or 2.5 millilitres of calcium chloride, diluted in quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water, Half a teaspoon or 2.5 millilitres of single strength rennet, diluted in quarter of a cup of non chlorinated water. You'll also need a brine. You'll need one litre or one quart of whey and 60 grams of salt. So add the lipase as you're heating the milk up. Just sprinkle that over the top. And then give that a quick stir into the milk. Now, lipase breaks down the fats in the milk and adds flavour to the final cheese. Now, heat your milk up to 32 degrees Celsius or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I directly heat the milk to the target temperature and then move it over to my sink where I have the precision cooker sitting at the right temperature. Just checking the temperature again, and it's perfect. So now we're going to add the thermophilic culture. And then sprinkle that over the surface of the milk. And then we're going to allow that to rehydrate for five minutes. Make sure you've got the milk covered during this stage. So once the culture has been rehydrated, then just stir that into the milk. And just check the temperature again. And it's perfect. So we're going to add the calcium chloride now, just stir that through. You probably notice that there's no ripening time for this cheese. And now we're going to add the rennet to set the curds and whey. Give 
Look at a good stir, no more than one minute. And then cover that up. Now we're going to allow the milk to set for one hour. So after an hour, we're going to check for a clean break. And that looks nice and solid to me. Now cut the curds into two centimetres or three quarters of an inch cubes. So I'm using my curd knife because if I use my curd harp, the curds will be too small. There we go. So just allow that to rest now. And we're going to allow it to sit for four hours. During this time, lots of whey will be expelled. So we're going to increase the heat to 52 degrees Celsius or 126 Fahrenheit. And during this time, we're going to stir the curds and whey. Just check the starting temperature and that should be spot on. Now it will take about 20 to 30 minutes if you're using a precision cooker like this to get to the target temperature. So initially I had it at 10 minutes, it took about 25. Here we are at the 52 degrees Celsius. And I've just turned off my precision cooker now that I've got to the target temperature and remove all that. And remove the water. Now place a colander lined with butter muslin. So this is a thick, thick weave cheesecloth and place it over a pot because we want to reserve the whey for the brine. And then we pour the curds Drain them through the cloth and remember to reserve the whey. Don't tip it out. So we're going to tie opposite corners of the cloth to form a bag. So that we can hang it up for draining. So drain overnight at room temperature. Just let that drip into the pot below. Meanwhile, before you go to bed, add the salt to a jug. And then we're going to put in one litre of the whey and stir that to dissolve. Just give it a quick taste test. <laughs> so the next day, we're going to remove the cheese from the bag. You want a perfectly round shape you could have turned it halfway through the draining but i've got like a half circle there it doesn't really affect the cheese at all i'm going to cut it in half with a sharp knife sharp clean knife and it looks nice looks a bit like mozzarella to me and then we're going to place it into the brine now i had the brine in the fridge overnight just resting and we'll give that a quick stir just in case any salt has uh, settled to the bottom and we're going to pop the cheese into the brine to salt it and we're just going to cover that again and pop it back into the fridge for at least 12 hours to brine at that time, it should be salty enough to eat. Anyway, over to Gav. So that's how you make Karanjang Creamy. Uh, looks fairly simple. I've had it in the brine for three days now. Uh, it's a simple whey brine, and you would have seen the measurements for that through the video. So let's take it out of the brine. I'll take one piece out, pat it down a little bit, and see what it tastes like, and see if it's worth making, which I think it will be.
Oh, it's a fairly big cheese. So it's a little bit slimy, as you can see, it's slipping around a little bit. I should have put some vinegar in with the brine. Uh, it wasn't in the instructions, but it's probably where it gets its creamy name from. <laughs> but when I took it out of the cheesecloth, it was just kind of like mozzarella, so uh, without the stretchiness. Anyway, let me just cut a bit off. Let's get this in a position where it's not going to slip and slide. Oh, yeah, it looks just like mozzarella. Now, Charlie says that it can be kept in the brine for two weeks. Now, if you're going to do that, I would highly recommend that you uh, add some calcium chloride and a bit of vinegar into the brine, uh, probably a teaspoon of each, and that'll help firm up the cheese. Uh, it won't lose as many calcium ions as you can see here, uh, but definitely a lovely looking cheese. Nice and fresh. Let me just have a piece here. Even with the creamy side. Mmm. It's fairly salty, but there wasn't a, it's not a high percentage salt brine. So it's not like 18%, it's more like a 10% brine. Um, but yeah, that's delicious. That would go well in uh, on top of salads uh, for the little bit of salt flavor. It'd go nice on a cracker with a bit of tomato and some basil, just like mozzarella. I dare say it probably melts as well. Um, I haven't tried it, but I think it would melt uh, just like a, uh, a good low moisture mozzarella would. So well done, Charlie. Great little recipe. Mm. That is unlike any cheese I've tasted before. The addition of that lipase has really kicked in. It's really good. So for a fresh cheese, well worth the effort. Mm. Anyway, there you have it, Curranjang Creamy. Uh, Curranjang is the area that Charlie comes from, so that's where the name came from. But creamy certainly is. Uh, so great little cheese to try. And as a first-time cheese, probably would be very easy uh, to make for a beginner, that's for sure. The steps were very simple um, and it was a pleasure to make. I didn't really have to stick around too much uh, because, you know, it was just set and forget, especially with the uh, precision cooker using the sous vide method to heat the milk uh, during the cheese making process. Anyway, if you liked the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, then you know what to do. If you haven't already subscribed, please do so. Uh, and don't forget to check out littlegreenworkshops.com.au for your cheese making supplies. Well, thank you for watching, Curd Nerds, and I'll see you next time. Yesterday, there was sun and there was rain.
There I am again. Hang on, I'll just go uh, fix something up, uh, which is going to swap to a different video. Um, let me have a look. Oh, no, that's shocking. Um, right, wrong one. I'll get the right camera in a minute. Whew, is it working? What's going on? Camera's not playing the game. I will get the right camera in a minute. Two seconds, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just reset this camera and we'll start again. One camera that's not working. Why, 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 Delilah? Oh, that's no good. Come on, camera, work. You can do it. It's always the way, isn't it? Always the way. righty we'll have to go with what we've got. So hopefully, right, can you hear me? Fingers up, thumbs up if you can. In bright, thank you, Jennifer. All right, there we go, I'm back. Let me just see if, sorry, just one second. I know, the problem is being the producer and all that stuff as well, uh, it's difficult. So, right. Is it going to go, let's just see if, the, oh, yes, it's working. Right, sorry, there we go. Everybody has technical difficulties. Um, okay, so as long as we're ready to go. Right, so thank you. Welcome back after that technical problems. We have Jennifer waiting, Jennifer Merch waiting in the background. Uh, let me just bring her in. Let's see if this works. Oh, there she is, little, but we'll make her bigger. There she is. And can I hear you? Yes. Can you hear me? Oh, it all works. Goodness <laughs> me. Good. So good. Right, <laughs> Jennifer. So good. Jennifer is from Virginia. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. There you go. I got that right too. See, I had to dig through your blog to find that out. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> So Jennifer has a blog called Jennifer Merch, also has a YouTube, I think, of the same name. Is that correct? Uh, yes. YouTube Jennifer Merch, blog Jennifer Merch. Yep. Lovely. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're a bit of a homesteader type thing. And, uh, yeah, you've got your own cow and make lots of cheese, amongst many, many other things. <laughs> right. So can you uh, – no, we won't introduce you. We just did that. All right. Um, so why, Jennifer, did you start making cheese? Well, we started, I tried cheese a number of years back when we were getting raw milk from a local farm, but it was expensive and mm. I was making small wheels and the learning curve was so steep and I had four little kids and it didn't work. It, was, it wasn't worth it. Mm. And then this past um, 2018, we got four bottle-fed calves from a local dairy, and we were going to raise them for slaughter. And three of them were steers, and one was a heifer. And that was in 2018. When it came time for them to be slaughtered, the heifer, I was thinking, well, why don't we just breed her and try a dairy cow, which I've always wanted to do. Yeah. And we were in the middle of the pandemic, so we weren't going anywhere. And my younger son, Nicholas, he is he was 14 or 15 at the time. And he said, I'll milk. And you have to understand, Gavin, that neither my husband nor I are farmers. We don't we don't do that. And my husband hates it. And so when my son said he would he would milk, we were like tentatively agreeable. So we bred Daisy. She gave birth and Nicholas hand milked her for the first, I don't know, couple months, couple weeks, whatever. And then he switched to an electric milker six yep. months into that. Then he um, stopped and and my husband took over because he kind of jumped on board. But since yeah. that, I've been into cheese making. That's what got it started, because if you have all that milk, you have to use it. You've got to do something with it. That's yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. So your cow's name's Daisy. Is that the, the original cow or you got another one? 
That's Daisy. Daisy is a whole scene and we're actually trying to sell her, but nobody wants her. So I don't know what's going to happen. And my husband can't, this is funny. My husband can't part with her because he's actually attached to her. She's kind of his little pet. Friends. So we're yeah. laughing about that. Um, but then a few months ago, we got Emma, who is a Jersey and she was pregnant. She gave birth. And so now my husband is milking two cows. Oh, goodness. So, <laughs> so it's a lot of milk, but um, yeah. So we have Jersey and Holstein milk. Yeah. So how do you compare the two milks as in the the richness of the milk and the the milk fat difference? It, it really, I mean, I think I'm probably biased towards Jersey milk just because of what everybody says, but the Holstein milk actually, okay, there's so many factors, but Daisy, the Holstein is, she is no longer, doesn't have a calf nursing on her. So we're mm. getting all her milk, just one once a day milking. And her yep. cream level on the top is a good, of a gallon is a good two, three cups, but it's thinner. It, it doesn't quite um, get the, the thick cap on it that yep. Emma's milk, who she is still nursing, we're calf sharing. So we only get a less amount of milk, but it's, it's, it's really, it's like sour cream. It's yeah. really thick. Yeah. yeah. So you leave it for a few days and you've got like a big plug in the top of your milk. Oh bottle. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, you could you yeah. could you could pretty. I mean, basically, it's like clotted clotted cream, but not soured at all. Not yeah, 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 yeah. Indeed, uh, I suppose with all that milk. So, as far as cheeses go, how many sorts of or varieties of cheese have you have you attempted? Um, I don't know. I think I have my ninety sixth or is it ninety seventh cheese in the press right now, and those are just the wheels of cheese. Um, most recently, the cheeses mm. that I made are. Cotswold, Pepper Jack, Gruyere, Black Pepper, Parm, Romano, Sal George, Asiago, Bel Paese, Cheddar, Colby. That's the like the latest ones. Yeah. And then it goes on back through to like Gouda de Vino and Budercas and Lancashire. A lot of them are yours. Oh, yeah. thanks. <laughs> now you have to upscale your recipes, don't you? Because you're yeah. using a lot, a lot of milk. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about that? You just do simple cal simple calculation mm -hmm. like you would a recipe? Yeah. I'm I'm learning. I'm still things are still changing. I am learning that I need to dial back on the rennet a little bit. And the other thing that changes is depending on where the cows are in their lactation, and also depending on what I mean, it's green right now, so they're getting all kinds of yeah, depending on when they have hay or grain or grass, it changes a lot. You can see yeah. a big difference. So like for a recipe for eight gallons, you would think it would be two teaspoons of rennet. I'm generally doing a teaspoon and a half or maybe a little bit less because they tend to get rubbery. Um, but yeah, I just scale up my pot. I have a big pot and I fill it almost to the brim. Oh, so it's like seven and three quarters of, of milk. Gallons? Yeah. Yes. Right. So what's that in liters? Hang on. Hey, yeah, Siri. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> what's seven and a half gallons of milk into liters? 7.5 gallons is 28.39 liters. That's massive. That is a big cheese. Yeah. So how much do they, how big do they how much do they weigh when you're finished? What's the what's the no, range? Not as much as you would think. I would say anywhere between five and I've gotten up to almost eight pounds. I would think that you would get a higher yield, but I have not been getting as high of a yield. And that's one of my problems that I'm I'm puzzling through that. I just made a pepper jack two months ago and then made the exact same cheese this week. And the cheese made two months ago was two pounds bigger. Right. And I don't know why. So that was the pepper jack that you made. Yeah. Yes. And, th and then I made one this week. And the one this week is smaller. Yeah, and I, I would think it would be bigger because it's green, because we have Emma's milk, but it's smaller. And I, watch, I watched that last night. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Nice video too, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's strange. You would think that the Jersey milk one would be mm -hmm. more yield because of the higher mm -hmm. fat content. But okay, here, one more thing to add to the mystery. Maybe you can solve this. Maybe. I, yeah, I did. I'm, I'm developing a Parmesan, a black pepper Parmesan, and it's supposed to be heated to 124. I heated it to 120. And normally my Parmesans are, are there's almost no curd. It's very small. It just compresses so much. Yeah, yeah. So today I added calcium chloride, even though it's not supposed to matter with raw milk. And I have a much higher yield. So I don't know, I don't know what the, what's happening with the milk composition mm. of raw milk. Like, do they have lower proteins? Does calcium chloride affect raw milk 
at all? That's one of my questions that it, I haven't. It, yeah, it will. Yet. So it'll add more soluble calcium into the milk regardless, right, whether it's been heat treated or not heat treated. Okay. Uh, and you don't heat treat your milk, do you? No. <laughs> no, so it's just straight out of the cow, chilled, mm -hmm. and then you mm -hmm. make cheese out of it. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, so it, what it does is adds more soluble calcium into the milk and then that allows the uh, the chymosin to create a better casein matrix. So The what? The what to create what? Right, yes. Let's hear some words for you. So the, <laughs> the white stuff in the milk is called casein. Okay, right. yeah. Starts with a C. C A. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't. Anyway, casein. Anyway, so what that does when the when the rennet ends on the chymosin, which is in the rennet, right? It mm -hmm. grabs onto those molecules and forms a matrix. That's why the curd sets, right? Okay. So yeah. the less calcium in the casein, the less of a firmer matrix you get. Okay. Mm -hmm. So therefore, so by adding in the calcium chloride, even though you're using raw milk. It actually mm -hmm. boosts that little bit of calcium. If the cows are calcium deficient, the milk's calcium deficient for whatever reason, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. um, then you should always add in some a little bit of calcium chloride. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't change the flavour yeah. whatsoever. You know, it's only a tiny amount that you add anyway. Yes. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you'll get a better yield regardless. Okay. The, I did an ex a test a couple months back with a Budokas that I made the same week, same cow, like just a few days apart. And one was calcium and one, one had calcium chloride and one didn't. And they were maybe like one ounce different, which was basically the same. Yeah. Um, so, but that was the same week. And I'm wondering if, because Daisy's so far along, like she's over a year old and still giving yeah. milk. I mean, a year in her lactation giving milk, that I wonder if it doesn't, I don't know. I haven't, yeah, I haven't the researched proteins, it. Yeah, the, the longer the lactation period, the, the proteins start to drop off as well. There you go. Proteins are part of the casein matrix, so okay. you'll get a, a less yield, even though the fat content may be still higher. But yeah. it's it's really hard to check unless you get a machine that will test yeah. for the protein and the fat content, uh -huh. and they're quite expensive. So, um, yeah, you don't, you don't <laughs> need one. Just, just make it. Just I'll make just it. use calcium chloride. Okay, that's yeah, good yeah, to yeah. know. That explains a lot. There you wow. go. Thank you. Uh, no problem at all. <laughs> so what, what made you uh, start recording cheese videos on your YouTube channel? I know you do lots of homesteading stuff as yeah. well. What, what inspired you to do that and the blog? Well, the blog, I got inspired. Uh, it was back when my kids were little. They were ages two to six, I guess. And I... I don't like being at home with, I've homeschooled my kids the whole way up. I do not enjoy being with little kids and yeah. it's exhausting. And so blogging was was my way of trying to focus on what was going on around me and make art out of it and use it as, I do appreciate it. So trying to focus and, and elevate that in a way that made me enjoy it more. And so blogging for me is very therapeutic. It's, it's a very fast form. It's a lot of photography and writing. And I, it's my way of keeping track of what's going on in, in, our, in our life and my thoughts. It's a public journal. Yeah. But YouTube, I don't know. I don't know if I would have gotten into it if I had known how hard it was. Um, <laughs> it's really hard. Yeah. It, <laughs> so, so I am still on a steep learning curve and I'm still undecided because so far YouTube hasn't been an outlet in the same way that blogging has. It has yeah. been work. And I think what will make it fun is once there's a community and there's a support and there's that whole, I love, I love, I love creating. I love teaching. I love performing. I love all those things. And if, and if, and what I would like to do is figure out a way to optimize what I'm already doing and share it, potentially make money, though that's way down the road. I don't think that's yeah. really going to happen. But um, that idea of of using what's already here, what we've already learned and sharing it is is fun to me. Mm. Jury's still out on that, how it's going to go. Yeah, look, people like to learn. Um, and it's, oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, people like to learn. So that's why, and, uh, you know, YouTube being the second largest search engine on the planet, you can reach a large audience, you know, as as we have here. Um, on, can I say in, one other thing about that to you? Yeah, yeah. One of the things that got me um, interested was partly your videos because, oh. and seeing how you manage, you're, you're a natural teacher and the way that you are so um, 
calm, which I'm not calm, but you're very calm and methodical and soft-spoken. And you have a very positive demeanor that's inclusive and and makes people feel welcome and is is um, encouraging, really, really encouraging. And the first time I wrote to you and you responded and paid attention, that's you've been a role model. So thank you thank for that. You. Thank you, Jennifer. So I've gone red now. It's all <laughs> red. Plus the heater was on. It was a bit warm. So, but yeah, thank you. I'm blushing. Uh, no, yeah, I suppose natural teacher. I, mm-hmm. yeah, it just comes natural. Well, I actually had to learn it when I was. Bit of background for you. Probably didn't know. I, I was in the Royal Australian Navy for 20 years. Um, and uh, I actually, the last seven years of that, I actually taught other sailors how to do their trade. So I've had a bit of practice. So I've taught people how to do things for a long time. So I like educating people. And uh, part of Little Green Workshops, which is the company that Kim and I run, um, the first, even before we set up an e-commerce store, we were teaching workshops every weekend. So we we learnt those skills through practice, practice, practice. Are and you if teaching that comes cheese making, uh, cheese yeah, making? I taught cheese making, just some basic cheeses. Uh-huh. But we took we taught soap making, candles, bath bombs, all that sort of you know hippie stuff, which is great. We love it. Um, and uh, yeah, so you know, Kim's a great teacher as well, but she's shy in front of the camera. So go figure. I don't know, maybe. But uh, yeah, thanks for the lovely words, mate. <laughs> so where do you make your cheese? Is it just in your kitchen? Right here in my kitchen. Yeah. Right. So you're in your kitchen now. That's I am right nice here. Setup. Oh, and you've got cheese. I have cheeses. I, I brought them up from the basement because. Well, you know, show us your not? cheeses. Show us. Um. Well, can here you, I'll show you. Can you yeah, reach I can them? Reach. I can reach them. Right. You tell me if I cut out or something. This is the pepper jack. I wanted to show you the difference. Right. You see, I don't know if you can see how one is so much. Hang on, let me just go. So you're the main one. Hang on. (laughs) Can I do this? There we go. There we go. Yep. Right. So can you see the difference? Yeah, one's bigger and one's, is it made with the same mold? It's the same mold. Yeah. This one was just so much bigger and this one is so much thinner. Yeah. So that's just, that's, I wanted to show you that. Um, oh, what else is there to see? I don't know. I have, I have it on plug one ear. No, that's two ears. It doesn't work. <laughs> you might be um, able to hear me. I <laughs> can't hear anything. Um, a Gruyere, this is 93. Cheese number 93. Um, oh, I thought you were going to say 1993 then. No. That's no. an old cheese. <laughs> I have had um, some of my, this is a Colby, and some of them are, oozing and some of that oil around the edge. Yeah, and yeah. And I didn't think, I thought that happened when it's warm outside or warm in the, and when you're um, air drying it, but it seems for some reason certain ones are oozing a little bit more. So I didn't know if I had too much, like if I didn't skim them enough, they, should, they had too much fat in, or if it was just too warm, I don't know. But um, Yeah, well, I just find that the pressure, uh, the, you know, the pressure pulls some of the either the whey or some of the oil uh, or the fat out of the cheese occasionally. doesn't happen very often. As long as it's dry when you put it in the vac pack, you know, and, and remember that when you do, and, and you've probably found this, when you pull the cheese out of the vacuum pack when it's mature to eat, there's hardly of that stuff in, in there anyway. There's not much mm-hmm. in there. So, you know, it's it even though it looks like a lot in the plastic, it's not. Yeah. And it was when it was drying, it got dry. And then I noticed it's had a little bit of oil forming on it. It'll be fine because I've had this happen to another one and it tasted fine. Mm. But it's just the difference. Things keep changing on me all the time. And it's, yeah, it fascinates me. It's a variation of the milk as well. You know, like it's, it's, yeah. it's a lot of the to do with the seasonality of the milk. So there's not much you can do about it. But, yeah, just roll with the punches. And, you know, yeah. one thing I noticed on the, the – I've watched a couple of your cheese-making videos, which are fantastic, by the way. Mm-hmm. They, they, I know they're a different style than mine, but they're, uh, they're free-flowing, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, so they're really cool. Now, one, one thing I do love is that once you've cut the curd, you're using your arm <laughs> – to stir the cheese and because you're so big right 
But yeah, look, artisan cheesemakers for thousands of years have been using their arms to stir their cheese. Yeah. But it's great to see you getting back to the roots of artisan <laughs> cheese making. My husband's actually horrified by that. He said, you're going to post this with your arm in it? I'm like, that's what, well, I clean it well. I wash it and then I spray it down with vinegar. But that's what you see when people are working in the big pots. You you yeah. have to. And, <laughs> and that way, I like it because I can feel it better because I've had yeah. trouble before with certain spots, um, like sticking to the bottom and not catching it. And then it gets melty and hard. And so this way I can just rub across the bottom. I can feel it. And I don't know. I like it that way. <laughs> yeah. No, it, look, because cheese making is a, a sensory thing, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. you can figure out when to stop stirring the curds by the feel of the curds as well. That's why I'm, I always like to do that squeeze test. Explain the squeeze test to me. I am still confused about it. <laughs> it's so simple. <laughs> right, so when you when you get to the end of your stirring time, right, and you squeeze the curd, and if it stays intact in a, in a uh, you know, the shape of your hand, so it looks like a ball type thing, right, and it stays there without falling apart, that means it's cooked. But then if you then press it with your thumb and then it falls apart, it's ready to press. It's that simple. Okay, but then explain, because when you're doing like high temperature cheeses like Parmesan and um, Asiago and those, you can squeeze them when they're lower temps and they will stay together, but you're supposed to keep going and going and going. They will, but they won't then fall apart when you press them with your thumb. They stay stuck together. And you want them to stay stuck together? Uh, well, no. When you So you squeeze it, stay stuck together. It's a little ball. And then you okay. press it with your thumb, right, the ball of curd, and then it should fall apart easily, uh -huh. right? And then it's ready to press. If it doesn't fall apart, it's not cooked enough. It's too sticky. It'll mat together too much, especially with those high temperature cheeses. So you're supposed to – it doesn't matter the temperature at which they are being cooked to. They are no. still supposed to – Mind you, to... the parmesan's going to be so hot, how are you going to put your heart a hand in I it? Know. I yeah, know. so – yeah. But look, those hotter cheeses melt, melt together really quick, r really well anyway. It doesn't matter how long you – Yeah. Yeah, you know, the curds are so tiny, uh -huh. uh, you know, so the grainy, as they call it, grana padano. Oh, sh I've said that. Don't say that what? word. Grana padano. Is that the one you got in trouble for? Yes, the cheese Ooh. and desist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <What>? so, <laughs> it's it's the Vol Voldemort of cheeses, the cheese that cannot be named. It was hilarious. Oh, tell me about it. It wasn't that hilarious. <laughs> I was I think, laughing. You probably. I think, I think my reaction to the whole thing was hilarious, uh, but the actual, it, yeah, it wasn't a nice feeling to get a letter like that. You but, handled it extremely professionally. Thank you. I, well, I try to. I, I would have been so that. much snarkier, and I wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have been nearly as. No, snarky. I thought. Look, I've seen so many YouTubers lose it, and. Mm -hmm. I thought it was tacky if, mm -hmm. you know, when they do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I thought, look, I'm a calm sort of guy anyway. So just take it in my stride and hopefully. And the great thing was, and this is something I didn't really know, was that the, uh, the curd nerd community, um, especially a lot of people on Reddit too, it was posted on Reddit and that's why, why it went viral. Um, a lot of people wrote to the consortium and told them where to shove their grana padano, basically, <laughs> and said, don't you be picking on Gavin. He's just making cheese at home. That's why the apology came quite quickly afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, I think the community helped. I, yeah. I just put it out there, community jumped in, got on their web page, and, uh, yeah, flamed them, basically. It was good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was so good. So, mate, what are some of your what are some of your successes and then challenges? Have you had any like failures, but you've recovered from them type thing? Probably. Well, yes, I have. Well, I haven't well, quite recovered. You, no, I, quite I wouldn't recovered. believe you're a cheesemaker. All you right. What? I said if you said no, I haven't had any <laughs> failures. Then I would I'd be suspect. I tell you. Right. Yeah. No, as far as failures, my I have I have not had a contamination yet in terms of like getting those bubbles, which kind of surprised me. Oh, the light me. blown. Yeah. yeah. Haven't gotten that. 
that's that's quite amazing seeing you exclusively use raw milk. Now, do you mm -hmm. feel do you feed the, the cows silage or not? No, they get ah, hay. There you go. Why? What happens with silage? Silage, silage is the number one uh, creator of late blown cheese. Really? Yes. I know that there's, a, there's a there's a bacteria in the silage that when the cows consume it, it causes. Um, it's called oh oh I can't remember just a big Latin name. Anyway, okay. yeah, just look for the late blown. Hang on, I'll look it up. Two seconds. Okay. I can find it on the YouTube's uh, late blown cheese. Uh, the thing is called late blown deflect def. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, butyric acid is the stuff that causes, and there's a bacteria that causes this stuff called butyric acid, and it creates hydrogen and CO2 and makes the it blow up. All right, and the main cause is silage, uh, the cows eating silage. So, uh, so is, now, that dif is that different from yeast contamination? Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So it's not a yeast, it's a bacteria. Um, okay. Uh, so, yeah, so, the, so it creates the big air bubbles. Now, if your cows are not eating silage, then that's absolutely fantastic. So you won't have any of those late-blown issues. Now, if you do at one stage start seeing that occurring mm -hmm. in the milk, then there's a couple of ways you can treat it. Um, so you can do um, uh, low-temperature, long-hole pasteurization, mm -hmm. which is what simple, and that will kill it. So there's a video on the channel, and uh, you basically heat the milk to – uh, 63 degrees Celsius. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. Hang on. Okay. Siri will tell me. Siri, convert 63 Celsius to Fahrenheit. Siri's not working. Hey, Siri. <laughs> oh, she went to sleep. Right. Convert 63 Celsius to Fahrenheit. Only on live. Oh, all right. It's... It's not working, and nothing works today, right? It is 63 Celsius to Fahrenheit. It's 145. Yeah. 145. I was too slow. Um, so, yeah, so you heat milk 145, and you leave it there for 30 minutes, and then you cool it down to either the temperature you're going to make the cheese at mm -hmm. or to 4 degrees Celsius. Okay. Uh, which is 39 Fahrenheit off the top of my head. Right, so, um, and yeah, so that low temperature long hold, that'll kill any bad bacteria, including the, the, uh, the, the bacteria that causes butyric acid. Uh, and it leaves some of the enzymes intact in the milk because it's the lowest pasteurization temperature you can possibly have. Uh -huh. Okay. So, and that'll kill that. So if you ever okay. see that happening, that, then that's all good. Okay, that's good to know. All right, so on to challenges again. Yeah, so it. challenges. Yeah. Um, my biggest challenge was, okay, I, I, I have been thinking a lot about, this was back cheeses 30, 40, 50, those, the number of cheeses that I made. And I was around that time over the winter, I was thinking of trying to switch to more, trying to figure out how to make cheese making less with the freeze dried cultures and more with natural cultures and just, it's kind of like sourdough bread where you step away and just use whatever you have in your environment and see if that yeah. works. Um, yogurt works wonderfully. I've been using yogurt very well with like the Alpine Tome and yeah. um, all the high temp cheeses. I've, and that's been great. But kefir or kefir, depending on how you pronounce yeah, it. Yeah. Um, I, I don't like how that tastes on its own. I don't like how it smells. And then putting it in the cheeses, I could still... Taste. Like, even after stage, I could hear, I could feel just a little flavor of it, and I, I don't yep. like it. And so I did a whole bunch of cheeses, and some of them were got quite funky, and so, yeah, not that anymore. Yeah, I'm not so a fan. I think you can do. You can, have kefir. you tried it? Have you tried it? I tried kefir, but not in cheese. So okay. yeah, I'm not a fan of the drink personally. Yeah. yeah. Um. Uh, having read uh, David Asher's book, the mm -hmm. uh, the art of making cheese, or the Black Cheese Maker School, Black whatever school called, sheep. Black that's sheep the school one. Black Sheep <laughs> School, of cheese maker, that's the one. Uh, kefir. He mentions that kefir has quite a few different types of molds. That's the one. That's the one. Nice looking bloke. Yeah. 
Um, so it has Streptococcus thermophilus, so it's got a thermophilic culture in it. I think it's got one of the two main strains of Lactobacillus lactis cult strains. And it's also got geo in there as well. So geo, the yeast geo, mm -hmm. trichum candidum. Mm -hmm. So it's got, I know that's got those three, but it can also have some other funky things in there as well mm -hmm. that may change the flavor to something unusual that we don't normally like. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm not a fan of kefir grains yeah. per se. So, <laughs> so I'll, just, I'll just stick to the commercial cultures that I buy. So, and yogurt, like I think the last. A few cheeses, oh, like the uh, cacio ricotta I made with some yogurt. I made, oh, something. Oh, the gorgonzola, I used yogurt as a okay. um, starter as well. So, yeah, that's got and a little bit. Oh, fantastic. Tasted beautiful. So the gorgonzola, the gorgonzola had, uh, so had some yogurt, plus I think I put in some MA4001 as well, which okay. has some mesophilic cultures. Mm -hmm. to help it out. So it'll produce lac lac uh, lactic acid at the start of the process and then as you heat it up, it produces more. So yeah. that's yeah. why gorgonzola is a little bit acidic, the blue cheese. So Yeah. I've been, I've been also wanting to try with buttermilk, cultured buttermilk, and I have done one. I could taste the buttermilk in it a little bit, but I like the flavor of buttermilk. It's buttery. Mm. So that that didn't bother me. And I think I want to try doing that a little bit more for them, the mesophilic cultures um we'll see yeah so the the buttermilk is a is a lovely flavor yeah i've used it a few times as well so i just bought cultured buttermilk from the supermarket yeah um but really the the essence of it is an aromatic mesophilic like um floridanica mm -hmm. so that, that's what they use in cultured buttermilk um yeah. and and they're still live which are good and you can reach reproduce them and it has a nice flavor yeah yeah it's good so, so that's some of your um, challenges. What are some of what are, you, what are some of the best, absolutely best cheeses that have just run off the shelf? Well, okay, one is <laughs> one is a success, and that it's a challenge because my cheeses change. One one of the this is one of the challenges that I've been working with is I feel like I need to make a cheese like ten times mm. over the course of six months and. They will each be so different. I have had Colby's that are almost, almost like spreadable. They're so soft. And I've had Colby's that are rubbery, bouncy like a ball. And, and it's just, I keep, I, I feel like as I work over and over and over again with them, I start to get the feel for it, but it's such a long process. And, mm -hmm. and then there's the wait time, the aging time. It, so so that's a challenge. It's and it's something that I kind of have a mindset that I want to solve this problem. I want to figure out how this is done and know how it's done. And it just keeps changing on me. And I think that's supposed to be the fun of it. Yeah. But it's it's hard for I, I just need to let go and have fun with it. But I still keep trying to like solve the problem and I it eludes me every time. Yeah, there's um, a it depends on how serious you want to get with your cheese making or whether you want to take it the next step and go and do uh higher edu advanced education on cheese making mm -hmm. you know yeah look I, I i've done the, the same sort of thing i look, my cheeses are through experience uh -huh. I, I don't know everything i don't claim to know everything but yeah. what i do know i share mm -hmm. um so a lot a lot of people well not a lot of people some people are going that next step and but it takes a while um so I know uh, Wisconsin Cheese Board, I think it is, have a course that you can sign up online and do it online and it explains everything. Um, I think there are some video sessions and stuff as well. There's some here in Australia. There's a lady who teaches an artisan cheese making course in Adelaide. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that goes for quite a long time. That's through adult education. But there, look, everywhere throughout the world, there are, artisan cheesemakers that will help you understand the process better. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. you're really going to go, if you want to learn more stuff like that, you'll have to go into the yeah. science of cheesemaking. So. And I, yeah, I don't think I want to do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because. <laughs> it's just so much work and it's already, yeah. Look, it is. Look, it might take the fun out of it. That's why. Yeah, I, never, I know. Yeah. That's why yeah. I just, stuck to home cheese making i never yeah. um i never took that next step to becoming an artisan cheese maker yeah. uh not to say and not to say that being an artisan cheese maker is bad 
they have the passion that is just beyond home cheese making, you know, yeah. um, and they want to craft something that they can sell to the public, um, which yeah. is fantastic. And, you know, I know quite a few artists and cheese makers and they have a passion, I tell you. It's just amazing. Have, have you gone and visited them? Like, have you done your own I have, I have been to a few dairy factories where they make mm -hmm. it and their vats, you know, like some of the vats range from 100, 100 litres, which is not a heck of a lot as far as artisan cheese mm -hmm. goes, up to a 1,000 litre vats, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, and they make multiple batches of cheeses a day. Um, I've talked to a lovely lady in the last... Um, uh, in the last 12 hours of cheese last year, the last interview was a lady called Deborah Allard, and she runs a cheese factory out of their dairy um, in uh, northern New South Wales. And, uh, yeah, she gave us some fantastic insights. If you haven't seen that, it's on the, it's on the podcast channel, Little Green Cheese podcast okay. channel, the full video interviews there. Uh, and, yeah, I learned so much. That oh, I learned that. I'm doing the things that I do right as well. Uh -huh. And I learned so much that if I wanted to scale it up some, then uh -huh. yeah. So that would be good. That's yeah. a good review if you haven't seen it. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. Yeah. So so one of the cheeses that I had a really good success with was your Jarlsberg style cheese. Mm. It was beautiful. And I had the two, I did two of them. They're fantastic. And then my third one, it didn't get any eye development. Oh. And and it was, it was kind of like a, oh, I'm so bad at describing cheeses. I don't know, like a mild cheddar or a cross, like a Monterey Jack cross. It was something like that. And it had its unique flavor. It was delicious. It was, I would like to know what I did so I could do that and make that cheese. Right. Um, but now, and so I made another Jarlsberg and it's still, it looks like it's not doing the eye development again. Oh, and I, I don't know. I don't know why. Eye development with the uh, Jarlsberg is more about temperature control. So as long as you add the right amount of propionic Shimani mm -hmm. bacteria, mm -hmm. um, and if that's the same throughout every recipe, you know, you're writing them down, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Good. <laughs> wait, I'm writing. Wait, what did you say? I'm writing down my what I do? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I have a whole book. Absolutely. Right. Yes. I can't read my of handwriting, course. but I wrote of it course. down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so the... The recipes you follow are exactly the same. Now, uh, temperature is one thing that you know. If you made one in summer, mm -hmm. right, and let it and let it sit on the kitchen counter, the summer indoor temperature is going to be different than what the winter one is. Mm -hmm. So, propionic shimani needs about eighteen degrees Celsius, or 65. I don't know. I'm not going to convert again. Whatever it is, it's like, it's like fifty-five and sixty-five, and then back down. Yeah, so you yeah. for a week at, at 13 or 55 and then mm -hmm. take it up to 18 mm -hmm. or 20, around there, 18, 20 degrees Celsius. And then, yeah, that's when the eyes form. So if you can't get that temperature up to 18, then the eyes don't form properly and you don't get that nutty flavour. So, so you're saying if it's too cool, it wouldn't form. What if it's a little too warm? Then you'll get a runaway effect and you'll get too much eye development, too much I, CO2. Okay. I think mine's too warm and I'm not getting any. Oh. This is what this is where I'm so confused. Like all the things that I think like I would have think what you were saying and yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's not doing what I thought would happen. So I I don't know. Oh. Okay. It's a it's a really good cheese. We really like it, but it's it not time. it's not Jarlsberg style. My how how old is the propionic bacteria that you're using? I mean, I probably bought it 6 months ago. It's in the freezer. Oh, that should be all right. Yeah. Yeah. Like when I started. So did you have you used the same same bacteria for all the batches? Same mm -hmm. batch? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a whole pack that comes from New England cheese making. It would have yeah, plenty yeah. in it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. first few worked and then the last two haven't. So mm -hmm. maybe it could be the propionic bacteria, but if temperature if that has ranged, like the the that two weeks that it sits at yeah. the warmer temperature, yeah. If that's different each time, then you may get a different result. I yeah I think of that's that's what I'm guessing and I do wonder I almost feel like doing it again and increasing like keeping the propionic shamani and see if that like maybe just a touch more will make it go yeah because you are using making a big big wheel of mm -hmm. cheese as well mm -hmm. so um yeah. in the initial recipe that I got for Jarlsberg from a guy in Norway he gave a sneaky gave it to me not supposed to but he did um 
and then I scaled it down. The first time I made Yalesburg, I used what the scaled down amount, and I got the tiniest little eyes in it. Oh. So then I doubled the amount of propionic bacteria, <laughs> and then the eyes were better. Okay. So maybe throw a bit more of that in. I'm, I'm going to try that. I'm going to try yeah. that. So it won't hurt to double it. It's, all it does is create the CO2 and the nutty flavour. So. so it's not going to make it like blow up into a huge balloon. Well, maybe, but <laughs> you'll see. You'll see. But if that starts to happen, just put it back at 55 yeah. Fahrenheit, 13 yeah. Celsius, right? And then that stops the CO2 development. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to try it. Yeah. Do it. Do it. It'll be good. <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> So of, uh, of all the cheeses you've made, what's your favourite to eat? Not to that's make. Not a fair, that's not a fair question. I know. It's like my question. When people ask me what's your favourite cheese, it's all the cheeses. It's all of them. I just made a Bel Paese. It was – It's. I, I followed um, – where is she? She's right here. I followed – Have you? are you familiar with Luella Hill? No. Um, it's a – She's. it's this book. How's it showing up on the camera? There you go. Hang on, I'll it's make angry. it. I'll make it bigger for you. There you go. There you go. There you go. Oh, <laughs> see right for you. Yeah, yeah. She's actually pretty local, I think, but I haven't met her yet. And I followed her cheese, and it has her recipe, which I think is very similar to yours. Um, and I've made several of them, but this one that's most recent, it's it's just wonderful. It's very mm. it's very easy cheese. It's, I did a yogurt culture. And I've, I've been brining my cheeses a lot longer than I used to in the beginning, between four and five pounds per pound of cheese. Mm. And so it four gets a good salty. Four or five hours per pound? What? Four or five hours per pound or? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Four yeah. or five hours in the brine. I've been doing it three to four and I'm, I'm starting to scale it up a little bit more. Mm. Um, I just I like salt. <laughs> so, yeah, so this I cheese. Yeah, I like my cheeses on the salty. So yeah. I it stops any bitterness during aging as well. Yes. Yes, and it just it just makes them better. Salt's wonderful. Mm. So um, I did that one. That one turned out very good, very mild and gentle, and just delicious. I loved the Jarlsberg. Um, I've had not quite as much success with cheddars. They yeah. have been they just fluctuate with flavor and texture very wildly. They're not consistent at all. Colby is a a, a given and. I know some people aren't attached to the yellow color with their cheese. And so I tried to make a Colby that didn't have any, any um, annatto in and yeah. I needed my yellow coloring in my yeah. cheese. Yeah. <laughs> I, I put the cheeses I like to add it in. Same as cheddar. I think cheddar needs yeah. to have a little bit of yellow color to yeah. it. Cause mm -hmm. sometimes there's not a heck of a lot of beta carotene in, in some cow's milk. Yeah. Uh, and it depends on the grass they're eating and mm -hmm. yeah, they turn out whiter than, and then when you give it to somebody else, they go, well, what's this? A white cheddar? Where's yeah. the yellow yeah. bit in it? I yes. won't eat it, you know? <laughs> I'm for Colby. Yeah. So I like those. I, we very much like the Cotswold. I make your Cotswold. Oh, it's and so good. When I added the garlic lovely. to it, it was so much nicer. Yes, yes. Mm. I do. I only do it with the garlic. I followed yeah. your, your recipe yeah. for that one. Um, I just made... I have a, this is, okay, you talked about failures and successes. This kind of, kind of goes hand in hand with successes. One of the things that I did is I tried to find local cheesemakers pretty early on in the process. And we have formed a group of four cheesemakers and we get together every several months, nice. which has been super wonderful because to see everybody's style and to see the types that they do, the types of milk, their, their setup, it's so different. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, but one of the that one of the guys in the group, he made an Asiago and he he um took he took uh, fresh rosemary and like put it in hot olive oil and then rubbed it all over the outside of his cheese and then he served it to us when we were there. It had it had aged for a while. Yeah. And that was so, so good. Nice. So I'm I have one that's wrapped over there. Um yeah, I'm eager to see how that one turns out. Yeah. And the one of the other successes has been I'm only I'm only into this. I think I started making cheeses last August. So I'm still a baby in terms of aging cheeses, but yeah. I have just opened a couple um a Gruyere and I forget an As, was it Asiago? No, I forget what it was. I opened oh no, Sal George. I'm yeah. probably not saying that right. But I opened uh, that and the Sal Georgi, I think they say. Sal Georgi? Okay. Yeah, it's it's just Saint George in Portuguese. 
Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. And it tasted, they're, they're so different. They're so different. The ones that are longer aged have yeah. so much, so much more to them. And yeah. it just, it was very affirming and made me realize, okay, we can, we can let these go and it's going to be okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. As, as I found with, uh, and Kim says to me, how do you keep cheese in the fridge for so long? How do you, how do you not bring it out? And I went, well, you just, I keep a little sneaky bit so you can't find it. And I put it at the back <laughs> of the cheese cave and then I pull out these surprises. So like yeah. the other day when I was smoking, she said, have you got some cheese to smoke? That was her first question. I went, yes, I've got some hidden away, my love. And uh, and I pulled out this double Gloucester that was six and a half, seven years old. I couldn't believe it. And uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And the taste was well, you'll see at lunchtime if you're still around. So, oh man, I've got a piece that I haven't smoked and a piece that I have smoked. So, so where, was it how, like how much was it that you had saved? A quarter, so probably about oh, 400 grams, roughly. Okay. So, it's about okay. a pound. Okay, yeah. so you cut it in half and smoked half, and and Oh, I had, a, I had a half left, so I cut it in quarters and, yeah. Okay. okay. And you tasted it? Oh, before, not after. I haven't tasted the smoke ones yet. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, so the before, so good. It, it was left over from last year. So I yeah. did a taste test on it last year when it was six years old, and it was amazing then. And I said, I'll keep a bit for next year. And we'll, yeah. Lovely. So did it did it change did the, did the exterior change at all in the uh, it was, well it was in vacuum packing and didn't really yeah. it and sometimes they tend to get a white powder on the outside mm -hmm. which is just uh, calcium crystals it's no big deal um, but the the inside of the cheese um, inside the rind <clears throat> excuse me I've got a bit of a frog in my throat the um, the flavour yeah it was flaky and there were some, um, uh, what is it called, Tyr tyrosine crystals in it. Is the, that like the crunchy, the crunchy little? Cr yeah, yeah. Ooh. Those aged cheddar and hard cheeses get that in them. Uh -huh. uh, and, yeah, oh, just the mouthfeel was just amazing. Wow. Deep, rich, uh, flavoursome cheese. So yeah. see if you can keep a piece in the cheese cake. For at least over a year, all right? Okay, okay. Uh, I will try that. The difference is astounding. So do you ever, what happens, have you ever had trouble from aging cheeses too long? Like? Yeah, um, mold ripened ones for sure. Okay, uh, well, I mean, I mean like ones aged that. cheeses? Yeah, no, no. The longer yeah. you age them, the better they taste. Okay. Right. No, well, that, that's, it's all subjective. So if you take a a kefili at three weeks, mm -hmm. uh, to me, it tastes perfect. Mm -hmm. If you age it longer, it's too strong and salty as far as I'm concerned. Okay. So that's the kefili, right? You want a nice, uh -huh. it's a nice creamy texture in the middle. It's got a nice mm -hmm. thick rind that's all salty, beautiful. But if you age it too long, mm -hmm. it just don't like it. It goes hard and yuck. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only cheese. So some of those young and same as maybe... Uh, I've aged a cheese. Uh, I was thinking of the Guido's cheese, that Italian hard cheese. I haven't made it yet. Barrel. You haven't made it yet? It's very nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, three weeks you can eat it. It's a hard Italian cheese. It's more of a table cheese. Mm -hmm. A little bit light on the flavour. The salt's just right, but it's mm -hmm. mild, right, as far as mm -hmm. a bit like a, a young Colby, but harder. Okay. With that, that was, I, I think I tasted that too early. Even though it said three weeks in the recipe, I think it was a little bit too immature mm -hmm. uh, for a cheese and it should have been aged longer. But as far as aging cheese is too long, I think Kefili is out there on its own. It's different mm -hmm. class because it's supposed to be served early. Um, but as far as like cheddar, so semi-hard and hard cheeses, you can age them for as long as you want. Okay. Um, okay. This, however, the moist of the cheese, um, the the le the less how do I say this? So the moist the, so cheeses like Havarti and mm -hmm. and Budakeza, mm -hmm. I would not age those past the recommended aging time. They don't because they're a high moisture content. Mm -hmm. They don't tend to age well, and I don't think the flavour improves. It probably gets worse if anything mm -hmm. else. But mm -hmm. the, the harder, drier cheeses, perfect, long mm -hmm. age. 
uh, and go yeah. from there. So great question, Jennifer. Yeah. yeah. It's like you're interviewing me. <laughs> I, I was debating how many questions can I get away with? <laughs> get away with a few. That's fine. <laughs> oh, yeah. My goodness. So we've got 12 minutes left. So um, I noted, I remember that you sent me some photos about a month ago uh, where you had a cheese party. Mm -hmm. Does mm -hmm. this happen often? Uh, no. Well, not, we've had parties, but we have, that was our only cheese party. Right. We do, do, we do donut parties where we make like hundreds of donuts and have over a whole bunch of Right. People. Donuts are nice, yes. Yes. But they're yeah. not cheese. No. Not as <laughs> no. good. No. So this, this cheese party, it, um, well, it happened. Okay. So first of all, you have to understand my aging setup. I have this little cheese cave that my daughter-in-law's father loaned to me. So it's just a wine fridge, a regular yeah. small under the counter one. So that was filling up with all my cheeses. And we were starting, we were at air conditioned. The downstairs bedroom, our house doesn't have air conditioning, but we air conditioned it trying to keep the room cool. My cheeses were spilling over on all the surfaces and the cheese fridge was packed. And so my yeah. husband finally took one of our upright freezers and did the converting thing yeah. and turned it into a cheese fridge. So it stays right around 50, 55 degrees. And I call it my cheeser because it's a freezer turned cheese. Of course. Cheeser. Yes, you would, yes. Yeah. yes, of course. So that was then filling up. So it was getting, I mean, it was, it's unwieldy. There were so many cheeses and we can only eat so much cheese. And also my husband is lactose intolerant. Oh. So it's not, it's not like we eat a ton of cheese. So then I accidentally, um, well, without knowing it, I somehow subs uh, got a subscription to a wine, a wine subscription. And I didn't know it for 10 months. And how, do you, when how do you get a wine subscription without knowing about it? I ordered a case of wine, and apparently when I had done that, it had sent oh, yes, me they up. keep sending them to you. Yes, and they yes. kept sending me notifications, do you want to spend your money? And I kept thinking it was like them just trying to get me to buy one again. So I ignored them for 10 months until right. they finally got my attention. I realized what was happening. I shut down the account, said, please send the wine. And I had three cases of wine delivered. So then I had all this wine, and I had all this cheese. Yep. And so we just sent out, I put out on Facebook to our community, said, anybody who wants to come over, here's the time. There's cheese to taste. There's wine. Bring your own wine glass and show up. And then we got all set up, got all these cheeses out. Like, it's a big deal to unpack a ton of yeah, cheeses yeah. and then to cut them up. And we were wrapping them and setting things up because people had the option to buy or donate, like, if they wanted yeah. to help support Daisy's food. So we set them out and... We had, everything was out here. And then I started panicking that nobody is going to come. And we just unpacked everything. There's no, oh. nothing's going to happen. And people came and they actually took almost all the cheeses. And that I would say, Gavin, is maybe one of, one of, it's, it's not really a success, but it's what was maybe most affirming yeah. in this whole process is having people eat the cheese and value it because I feel a little weird, a little nerdy over here in the corner, making my own raw milk cheeses, which might be scary to people or might, they do taste different. They're not the same as in the store and yeah. people might think they're not good. And but people came and they ate them and they really, they really seemed to like them. And well, they the bought them fridge, all. what they bought them all. They bought them all. Yeah. And then, and then the, the cheese fridge was the cheese. The cheeser is now much emptier and now it's filling back up again. So I think we'll have to do it again. I still, I still have a ton of wine. Like we only, yeah. they did not, they did not make a dent in. Oh, uh, you know, you offer free wine and free and and free <laughs> cheese tasting. Of course, people are going to turn up. I know, I know. I would have turned I'm gonna, up. I, I'm going to trust myself better next time. It was, it was, it was fun. Yeah. I bet it was, and I bet Daisy's well fed now for the next six months. Yes, she yeah. is. She's enormous. She's enormous. Uh, <laughs> well fed <laughs> and well loved. Yes. <laughs> All righty. So nearly time to wrap it up, Jennifer. Uh, what words of encouragement uh, or tips and tricks do you have up your sleeve that you would give new cheesemakers that are starting out? And what's your favourite resource for cheesemaking or favourite resources uh, okay. for cheesemaking? Um, Favorite re I'll start with that. Favorite resources are your your website is phenomenal, and I often check there for everything first. And I will go, I like how you put the ingredients right in the beginning because I can go right to that and compare. And I'm often comparing different things. It's very useful. Um, 
use that online. I also have been following um, Venison for Dinner. It's a it's a blogger, a bit YouTuber in British Columbia, and she is has five kids, stays at home, and she just makes all her own raw milk cheeses yeah. on the farm. It's very, um, it's very different setup, and I get some ideas from her. As far as books, I used um, the home. This one has probably whoops. There you oh go. yeah, edition four. Yeah. 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 This one has been very easy to read and is very helpful for me to, it's just, it's easy on the eyes and it helps me sort through. I often get confused with so many options and I can just streamline it. Um, those are the resources that I find helpful. Yeah. As far as advice, um, you just have to do it. Like you, do. It's, yeah. it, you just have to jump in and go and, and know that you're going to mess up and, I think I, I, I'm, I think a lot about how startup costs are expensive. And I had somebody had given me a cheese press and we have the land and we already had the cow. And those things have helped so much. But um, if you can tap into some resources and make use of them, just go for it and do it. Mm. And I often think about cheese making as is like learning a, a, a language. It, the best thing for you to do is to get into the culture, to immerse yourself in it, and you're not going to understand anything at yeah. all. But the more you're in it and the more you do it, the more you're going to start to understand and the better you'll get. And you might even become conversational in the topic and get to talk to Gavin. <laughs> and, uh, it, it's funny. Uh, I'm, uh, one of the reasons that I started doing the live stuff, just normal weekly live streams, <laughs> is because I wanted to talk to other people about cheese. Yeah. There's nobody in my town except yeah. that I know except uh, Charlie, who's in the chat probably somewhere, um, who lives just up the road, um, and he buys cheese making stuff from me. But um, as far as home cheese makers goes, not a heck of a lot of them around. And when you have a passion this strong, you want to talk to people. Yes. So yes. I've got it. And that's why I thought, well, hang on, this is pretty nerdy. So the, the old curd nerd stuff, <laughs> that's why, hello, g'day, curd mm -hmm. nerds. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It's all happening. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, it's been lovely chatting to you, Jennifer. Yeah. Thank you so oh, thank much you. for turning up on um, 12 Hours of Cheese. Um, I might turn this into a podcast episode as well. It'd be lovely. We yeah. can cut and paste it afterwards. It's lovely. Okay. <laughs> so if you see your beautiful face again later, then you'll know what's going on. Okay. Thank you so much, Gavin. This is really fun. Yes, I appreciate it. indeed. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And, um, yeah, thanks for the lovely words, mate. Okay. You take and care. congratulations on all of your wonderful, massive, big cheeses. And Thank say good day to Daisy. And is it Emma? Was it Emma? Emma. Emma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remembered. So say good day to Daisy for me, will you? Give me a kiss right. on the nose. <laughs> Maybe not that. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're a bit slimy. They're very slimy. Yeah. Okay. All right. See you later. Bye-bye. Okay. We'll take it. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, that was, that was Jennifer. And she's there still. She's just waving to me. We do have our next guest um, that is nearly ready to go. But what I need to do first is have a, a, a gentleman's break because uh, bladders are only so big, uh, apparently, and during 12 hours of live. So um, what I will do in a minute is uh, just quickly go off camera and I will be back uh, very soon. But uh, what I will do is quickly cue something up so you can have a quick look. Uh Okay, so you should still be able to hear me, hopefully, and just queue up a, a quick something, and I'll be back in about one minute. One minute. Okay. All right.
Come on. You coming so quick? Uh, Oh, here we are. We're back. Right. No, sit down. Sit down. Dog. I got doggos and everything. Sorry. Oh, goodness me. Righty-o. Let me just uh, go back to that. And oh, let me just check. Right. So audio coming there. And yep. Right. Looking good. Hopefully you can all hear me still. Right, our next guest, sorry for that brief interruption, our next guest is Patricia Gauchy from Nova Scotia in Canada. Let me just bring up the questions for Patricia. Whew, I had to run then. Um, Rightio. Okay, yeah, there are puppies. Jim wants to see the puppies. Right, hang on. Two secs. Come on. Doggos, come here. Rightio. So we've got Bonnie. Say hello, Bonnie. Hello, cheese people. Oh, that was me. Sorry. And then we've got Hamish. Come here. Oh, you big boy. Oh, he's a big boy, isn't he? There you go. Say good day. Well, hi, boy. Name's Hamish. All right, there we go. It's enough. You can sit down there. All right, there you go, Jim. Whew. Right. All right, let's bring in Patricia. Here we go. There we go. Hello, Patricia. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. We can hear oh, you. Really? Fantastic. Yeah. No, you can get down now, Bonnie. That's enough. Enough dog stuff. Sorry about that, Patricia. Um, oh, hope, no hope you're enjoying the 12 hours of cheese so far. Oh, so far it's been it's been great. And I was just sitting here thinking to myself, how am I possibly going to follow Jennifer? That was such a oh. wonderful interview. She, oh, she's a lovely lady. Um, we haven't personally met, but, you know, that's what the cheese community is all about. And it's lovely to see you face to face for the first time. Yes, and hear the voice behind all of the smart ass comments that I type oh, in well, the chat. I wouldn't say they're smart ass comments, Patricia. <laughs> I think they, they, Hi, add Card Nerds. The, they add to the community. Yeah, thanks. That's all right. And yeah, they, you, the, you've been in the chat for years. I would think. Um, yeah, since about 2018 or so. Yes, I, I, I can't remember when I did the first live stream, but uh, yeah, it, it was well, oh, probably about then, 2018, five years ago. Yeah, it's a long time. But yeah, fantastic. But yeah, you've been making cheese since when? How long? It depends how you look at it. Um, Tell a story. It, well, in, in its in modern incarnation, I've been making it since sometime in 2018. But truth be told, I made my first cheese back in the early 90s uh, when I got interested in doing Indian cooking. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and uh, one of my cookbooks had a, a recipe in it for paneer, which was dead easy to make. And that's, mm. so, so that was the first cheese. But I didn't make that with the thought of, oh, I'm now going to make cheese. I did it with thinking, oh, this is how I can improve on my Indian cooking and you know, slide the meat out and yeah. um, introduce other forms of protein to the to the um, the menu. So, um, yeah, and um, I guess like I've always been very interested in. Um, DIY stuff at home. I like, I love to cook from scratch. Yeah. And with an interest in scratch cooking, I've accumulated various books that deal with how to do this from scratch and how to do that from scratch. So pickling or, or, you know, charcuterie, although I haven't done that. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll show you a couple of the things that I had as inspiration. Yeah, um, sure. Hang on. I'll, I'll make this, you bigger and I'll make me smaller. Right, other way All around. Right. There we go. There we go. All right. So this is an America's Test Kitchen supplement. I don't. I don't even know if you can buy it anymore. And and that's exactly what it is. It's just an inspiration of all stuff you can do at home. Yeah. Um, so preserves and pickles and 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 then it has this section on cheese that includes feta and chev and ricotta. So I had that on the shelf. Yeah. And the second second bit of inspiration was this book. Oh goodness me, that's old. 
It's it looks older than it is. It's actually oh. a modern publication written in a very old style. Right. Um, and in this thing, they'll teach you how. Uh, the, and the way they write it is in the same style as you would find something like Mrs. Beaton's cookbook. You know, it's it's a very antiquated way of presenting yeah. things with very imprecise measurements and and more of a, a style than a method. Mm. So you know how to make your own broom, um, how to make a cob oven, how to make a broom. Um, yeah. All right for sweeping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> I didn't hear you right. I didn't think. <laughs> Um, uh, fermentation things, including making your own soy sauce. Um, anyway, and 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 then there's a section in there on cheese, which um, touches on feta. It touches on uh, quick mozzarella, paneer. What else does it touch on here? Uh, even some of the blooming rind cheeses mm. are in here. Nice. And were they easy to follow those recipes? Oh, I never touched them. Oh. <laughs> I just. No, not a chance. No, I just had them as inspiration. And when I really wanted to, to see if it could be done, I started looking on the internet. That's when I found you. Oh, there you go. Right. So you didn't touch those cheeses. Right. Fantastic. So what was the very first cheese you made, Patricia? Besides, Besides the, the paneer? Yeah, yeah. Moving on into the future. There we go. Belpaisi. Belpaisi. It, it's a great cheese, isn't it? Oh, well, no, it, right? was bad. it was better. Oh right! It, it was it was feta because you can make feta so easily, and um, I you know I I made my molds out of you know plastic containers and it doesn't take much in the way of weight to get it going and that sort of thing. So really, it was feta. The first one I made that used a cheese form that was Belpaisi. All oh, right. Okay. Nice. Nice. So that yeah. um so was that using the mold that um that. Uh, you bought from me or not? You made, it was your own mold, your basket. No, the basket was the 165 millimeter one that I got from you. What a lovely basket. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I was able to make that in time for Christmas of 2018. Mm. And then Santa Claus made me, a, made me a press. Oh, did, did he? Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. Okay. So, how is it, what's this press like? Oh, goodness me. Now we got dogs. Hang on. The dogs have gone. Thank goodness for that. Thanks, Kim. Right. That was Kim getting the dogs. Sorry, mate. So, yeah, press. No worries. Uh, the press uses the same 50 pound spring that uh, you use in your press, and it's, yeah. it's very similar to the, oh, okay. the, way, the one that you have. Yeah. Nice. So, no copyright pending. Thank goodness. No. <laughs> that's uh, good. No, I'm not. I I don't have a consortium that's going to defend no, on me or anything like no, that. No, I won't be sending you a cease and desist. So that's fine. As a relief. Yeah. <laughs> so what other cheeses? So that was your first one, and then were you kind of hooked after you made that, or did it take a while? No, no. I mean, once I got the press, uh, I couldn't be stopped. It, right. that, there was a cheese once every two weeks. Um, really, another thing that helped to get me started was coming across a source of non-homogenized cow's milk here. Yeah. So it's not raw, but it's not homogenized. And that makes such a difference, I find, in the yield. So it's yeah. more encouraging than yeah. simply trying to use the, social, the grocery store stuff that is homogenized. Yeah. So it's a bit more expensive to get it that way. It's just greater incentive to keep the way and use it and make way ricotta and get as much out of the milk as I can. Um, so yeah, the, the feta, the reason the feta was the first one yeah. um, is, is that I actually have a very good source of goat milk. Our grocery store, like our regular like super store carries yeah. goat milk, two oh. different brands of yeah. goat milk. That's incredible. So, yeah. So it's, you know, it's easy peasy and, it doesn't matter that it's homogenized and not homogenized. They're both the same, really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. With, especially with goat's milk where the cream never floats to the top anyway because the fat globules are smaller than cow's milk. So, um, yeah. Even though they're homogenized, it's not. They're not real. They don't treat. They just heat treat it and that's it. They don't filter it. Um, so that it's so that it's not ultra pasteurized, which is a surprise because a lot of the goat's milk here in Australia is either – 
reconstituted powdered goat's milk or um, and then they put it in a carton and then you can't use it for cheese making or they ultra pasteurize it because it sits on the shelf so long no and you know not many people buy it compared to cow's milk so that that's that's good to know yeah um i'm i have i don't know if it's a canadian thing but i've never seen ultra pasteurized milk of any description here oh okay yeah it was uh, it, probably they started doing it here in australia about 5 years ago uh, and it was for things that didn't sell very fast or milk products that didn't sell very fast so they can keep them on the shelf longer. So, but yeah, they're they're a disgrace as far as I'm concerned because they take the flavour out of everything. It, they taste horrible. The ultra pasteurised milk, and including um, UHT, the ultra heat treated stuff that you get in the Tetra Pack. The only good thing it's f- good for making is ricotta and and would you believe yogurt? It makes a good yogurt because it's <laughs> the proteins have been denatured already. So. So what other cheeses? So besides the feta and then all the semi-hard cheeses you make, have you ever made a cheese that you've created yourself? Yes, I at least I think I have. I've always oh, based them off. I've always based them off something else. Um, but uh, the ones that I, the first one I can say that I laid claim to was called Nova Scotia Strong. Right. And that was a, a cheese that I, I, we, we had a, a terrible mass murder here in Nova Scotia. It's, it's the worst mass murder in Canadian history. And it happened early in the pandemic in 2020. Hmm. Um, so it, it, oh, sorry about the sound. I don't live with demons. Those are my cats. Oh, right. <laughs> well, I can hear, yeah, I can hear them. They're fighting. No, <laughs> no, that's an affectionate sound. Oh, right. <laughs> They're siblings, and they they tough sometimes. Um. Anyways, yeah, it was it was. I made it to to mark the occasion, if you want to say that. The the colors of the Nova Scotia flag are white, yellow, blue, and red. So um, I made this cheese that was it was based on Shropshire blue. Yeah, but I used a marbling technique to get a yellow and a white cheese All right, with yeah. blue veining, and then there was some. I included some red berries in it as well. So that was the first cheese that I made myself. And how did that um, taste? It was amazing. Yeah, and and Shropshire blue is one of those ones that you can actually vacuum pack. Yeah, after the blues um, formed, yeah, I, I had to, yeah. I did that as well. Yeah, yeah. So that lasted a good long time, and uh, yeah, that was a beautiful cheese. Um, other ones, I uh, based on the Humboldt fog, as you know, I came up with the yeah. idea of Fundy fog, and that uses a cow milk rather than a goat milk. Mm. And yes, that, that, was- video, that video will be out soon. Thank you so much for the recipe. Um, I did have a little bit of trouble with the maturation of it, and it, it wasn't your fault, it was mine. Um, I put too much salt on the top and bottom. So instead of spreading it all over the cheese, so it's got bald patches on the the top and the bottom. It did the, the, the white mold didn't grow all over it properly. So it grew on the sides where I didn't put all the salt, um, but where I put too much salt on top and bottom. So it's going to look a little bit bald. So I'll call it the bald fundy fog. Um, But (laughs) It's, I can tell it's, it's, I think it's aged to 60 days. It's been 60 days since I made it. So I'm going to crack it open uh, tomorrow and film the rest of that video and, and get that out. So I will sing your praises if this cheese is going to taste amazing. So, so that'll be fun. So I'll show um, the whole world how you made, well, how I butchered your recipe and made fun <laughs> But yeah, I was amazed to find that you did. You go and buy some Humboldt fog to see what it tasted like before you made I've it, never, or just I've never it? tasted it. Oh, okay. No, it's, out of it's California, an American right? cheese. Yeah. yeah, it's an American cheese, and it's based out of the Humboldt County in California. And uh, no, I've never seen it here. I, I if it if it makes its way into Canada, it probably just stays mostly on the west coast. I would think I'm all on the east coast, so yeah. 
Montreal is a firm barrier between the rest of Canada and us. It seems things just kind of stop at Montreal. All right. Uh, so, yeah. Is there a reason um, behind that? Because they they speak French or? No, no, nothing to do with the province or the city. It's just oh, kind right. of the last last major city before you hit the Maritimes. Oh, and, right. Okay. Yeah. Because you're right out on the coast. And you're on, is Nova Scotia an island? Not really. No, Nova Scotia is more connected. of a peninsula. Right. So it is connected. Yeah. Yeah, it's connected by a peninsula to uh, New Brunswick. Um, right. But it has a lot of attributes of an island. Um, it's be- because there's, the only way in and out really is to either fly in, come in by boat, or to go across that little, oh, that right. little uh, joining into New Brunswick. So, I mean, it's a bit of an aside, but this is actually a really cool part of the world to go antiquing yeah. because people brought stuff here and it doesn't find its way out. <laughs> All right. So, does it have a big um, a dairy industry in Nova Scotia? Is there a big dairy industry there, or is the pasture or what sort of um, climate and that sort of thing is there? The, the climate is variable depending on, on what part of the province you're in. Uh, there is some dairy. Um, they, I mean, that's the, it's a dairy that produces the milk that I buy to make cheese. That's a, a dairy that's in the Annapolis Valley. The Annapolis Valley section of Nova Scotia is very fertile and um it's, it's kind of its own microclimate. It's become really well known for winemaking. They've grown apples and uh, other fruit there for years. There's a section of the province that's really big on blueberries. Mm. Um, so there's, there's various types of agriculture uh, in, in different parts of the province. Yeah. And then all along the coast, it's just mostly uh, rocks. <laughs> and gets very cold in winter. Um. It gets okay cold. I wouldn't think it's very cold. So not not no. like not like your Northwest Territories cold. Well, not even like the prairies cold. I lived on the prairies for fourteen years before I moved here. I lived in a city called Edmonton, which is um, it's not as far north as Northwest Territories, but it's further north than most of the major cities in Canada. Yeah. And it's yeah, you know, minus twenty five every day for a week uh, yeah. during the winter is. Is de rigueur. yeah. Someone, someone who's on the regular chat here is is from Edmonton. I can't remember if it's Jim or one one of the Canadians who's always in the chat. He lives in Edmonton, so. You know. oh, I'm not sure. Speak up or forever hold your peace if you're in the yeah. chat. Uh, there, there is a guy, um, Ian Trower, who uh, has a cheese factory in Edmonton. So I yeah, don't know. So gets, yeah, so I don't know how he gets milk in the winter time. So that if it's snowing and cold, or it's, unless it's in, they house the cows indoors. I'm not sure how it works in a, cow, a cold climate. There's, yeah, it would be indoor. Yeah, it would for sure. Um, we're Canadians are really good at building buildings. Right. <laughs> like we we know how to keep warm in the winter. We know how to keep cool in the summer. Uh, climate. Climate building is something we're we're good at. Oh, okay. So right. yeah. So and where there's a will, there will there's a way. If you want of to course. raise cattle on the prairies, you'll build things to, so they'll survive. Yeah, indeed. Now that's but really. We good. Digress. Yes. Yes. Well, it. Well, I, I wanted to find out about the area. So it seems like it's a bit of a mix of everything. So that's fantastic. So. When, you, when you've been making cheese um, using wherever you get the recipes from, and obviously not that book that you showed me, but when you, <laughs> when, when you do make the cheeses, what are some of the challenges or have you had some cheeses that have just been total disasters and you've come back from them somehow, like Lazarus maybe, and uh, tell me about it. I remember when you made Lazarus. Um, yeah. Lazarus's cabin. Yeah, what a funny cheese. That was it. Yeah. Um, I did. I made. I made one that was uh, a disaster because it was too salty, and it was before I had started logging my cheeses and writing down what I did. So I can't even remember what kind of cheese I was making. Yeah. But it was one where I forgot to add the salt, and I added it afterwards, or I broke the cheese apart and added. Anyways, it ended up being way too salty. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've forgotten what I called that cheese. I had a name for it as well. Um, it'll come to me. Um, 
but so so that was a disaster and i saved it and um i kept adding it to various dishes like cooked savory dishes like a macaroni and cheese or something like that and i would just cut back on the salt that i would add to the rest of the dish all right yes yeah and it was fine it was was it was yeah yeah it was just terrible table cheese. <laughs> um, I put it on a platter. Yeah. yeah. Um, I made a um, a fontina that was a disaster. It was a, a it turned out really really bitter, awful, foul tasting, and it was moldy on the outside as well. So mm. that was actually an affinage problem. Right. I, I've learned that I need to pay much closer attention to the cheeses when I'm aging them. Yes, I, I, I learned that the hard way as well. Yes, yeah. if you forget about a cheese for even two weeks sometimes, depends on, you know, what, what it is. So the, the ones that are vacuum-packed, you can forget about them. doesn't matter. Just turn them. Um, but if you're doing a natural rind or you're doing a uh, any, any sort of mould-ripened cheese, whether it be a washed rind or a white one or blue, Tell you what, if you neglect them, they're like children. If you neglect them, they'll go off the rails. They're worse than children. They're like cats. Yes. Right, cats? Yeah, neglect the cat and they'll they'll jump Come on here. your lap and scratch you. Show us your cat. <laughs> Come here, Zim. Come here. Come on, you know you want to. <laughs> they'll be here in a minute. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't work with children and animals. So yeah, so that Fontina had to go into the bin. There was no saving that one really. Right. Um, and I've had two, two episodes with coliform contamination. Oh, okay. So early blown. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Was it from yeah. the milk? Do you think the? Did you use raw milk or not? I've never had access to raw milk. No, I've, all my milk has been pasteurized. I think. With the first one, which was a halloumi, hmm. um, and you look, that was kind of weird, you know, because halloumi, you're supposed to put it in some sort of liquid and heat it up, and then it'll float. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I dropped it in the liquid and it just floated. And I went, oh, there's something very wrong with this yeah, cheese. Full of air bubbles, then. Yeah. Yeah, it was just like it was honestly like a sponge. So with that make- one, I think. I was going to say, were you making like sourdough at the same time, or any yeast infection, any yeast in the kitchen? No. Not yeast, no. Um, Someone on the Learn to Make Cheese site suggested that it may have been from the dishwasher because I I put all my stuff in the dishwasher. Yeah, and and he said that he worked in some sort of commercial setting and they had a problem with coliform in the dishwasher. So I've been much more particular about being about sanitizing my stuff after I've dishwashed it then you know yeah. I don't count on that working it all goes into star sand or it gets boiled or something now yeah the other incidents of the coliform happened really recently um remember I started that series of cheeses that were Sweeney Todd yeah 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 that were great yeah and one of them was called Royal Marine and it had um uh, Szechuan peppercorns and uh, dried orange rind in it. Yeah. Oh, it tasted so good. I was so sick. Yeah. I can't, I can't describe how I went. And the next day I went, oh, I think I know what that was from. So, so I did suspect. It visible, did it have the visible signs of the, the small, tiny sponge like bubbles or not? Or was it just contaminated with something? Those. The, the raw marine cheese, I made su- such a small amount. It, I made it in one of the New England cheese making molds. It was, it was just, it's little. It's about this big around and about that tall. So cutting into it, I didn't see all these little holes. Oh. But, but the cheese was really soft. It, it had a soft texture to it, mm. um, which in retrospect, it probably should not have had. And I don't mean soft like cream cheese. I mean, you like know, like squishy. Cream. Yeah, like a sponge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no good. But we live and learn, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I reckon that that contamination probably came from the inclusions, either the Szechuan peppers or the orange peel or both. Right, yes. So it could have had, it could have been yeast as well and maybe not. So it could have been a wild yeast that was bad on the peppers or, yeah, who knows? 
Do you, do you think that would have made, made you sick? It would, have, it, would have been, uh, it would have been a wild yeast because um, the early blown can be caused by either wild yeast or coliform, which coliform is bad because it will make you really sick. Wild yeast can make you sick as well, so depending on what gets mm. in. So, but yeah, if the, if the holes were really tiny and it looked sponge-like, then it was probably coliform from some there. Yeah, what can you do? Anyway, so yeah. as, any more? Or is that enough? Um, <laughs> as far as as far as personal challenges go, yeah. um, I've never been brave enough to make mozzarella uh, or any pasta filata cheese. Yeah, fear oh. of failure. You should try. <laughs> um, you should try the um, the Oaxaca um, because that's. It's more on the firmer side of, of pasta filatas. You, you stretch it a bit, but, well, you stretch it so you can roll it into the like the tennis ball size thing. Um, but it, I found I've made that about three times now, and it's less prone to failure, if that makes sense. The quick mozzarella is difficult as far as I'm concerned. Some people can just make it, but then they make it once, great, and then it doesn't work, and then they can't figure <laughs> out why it doesn't work. So... Um, yeah, so if you want to give one style a go, try that Mexican string cheese. I think that's, I think it's it's easy enough. Give it a go. What, what can you waste? Four um, liters and your time? Uh, yeah, all that milk that I am so skin flinty on that I keep all the way and make mozzarella or make ricotta out of it. <laughs> Well, you can always, well, you could always make a, 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 if it doesn't work for whatever reason, but it's going to set, right? You've, you've got that down pat. You've made some fantastic cheeses, Patricia. So I'm sure that you, the curd will set. It may not stretch. If it doesn't stretch, just put in a mold and press it and salt it and it'll be a lovely cheese. Fair give, enough. Give it a go. Give it a go. You've got my stamp of approval to give it a go, right? <laughs> All right, fantastic. I need everything else. <laughs> so, uh, what? Are, so, there's some of the challenges. Are, any other challenges besides the pasta falada ones that you haven't had a go yet? Well, I I did make the uh, stabilized paste camembert. Yeah. And it came out like a hockey puck. It was rock hard. It wasn't very cam yeah. yeah, it wasn't very camembert at all. So. <laughs> I think I would probably stick with making a traditional camembert the next time, like a traditional mold and ripen. Yeah, I think that's probably what I would do next time. See, I made a brie, um, and it, it turned out really, really well. And I even figured out how to flip that long, yeah, flat cheese yeah. without breaking it. I got that figured out, too. So, yeah, I, I could probably make another camembert and not worry about doing the stabilized paste version. Yeah, look, it's, it's some people use it because um, they want a longer shelf life for it. I only tried it because that's some of the camemberts we get here, or pretend camemberts, um, we get here in Australia are made in that style and people don't know what a runny camembert looks like, which is why right. I've made all the different types. So I've made that stabilised paste one, which I got from... Um, uh, the Giannoclus Caldwell book, the artisan cheese making one, the really thick um, uh, book that has all the yeah. technical details and stuff in there. And I thought, well, I'll give it a go because that's what we get in the supermarket here. Rarely do we get a runny camembert like the French get made with, you know, raw milk or um, uh, like I used in the instance, I used that stuff made by a cow that we get here, the cold pressed milk, which is not available anywhere else that I know of. Um, but that's a that's a raw style milk because it hasn't been heat treated and, and that created the perfect camembert. So runny, so lovely. So in your experience with the brie, how did you flip it without breaking it? Because the first brie I ever made, it broke in half. Um I used I used a hoop from New England cheese making that um so big one? Didn't, it didn't yeah. And I think it has a bottom on it, but it also has a follower. And I punched some holes in the follower so that I could turn it upside down and it would drain through that follower. Yeah. So I'm just I'm just trying to remember. I, I know that I was able to, to keep that follower on that cheese and flip it and allow it to just ease down. 
So I wasn't really taking it out of the mold and trying to handle it and flip it. I would just flip it within the, the form. Mm. Um, I also, I have a bit of a habit of using cheesecloth when I do my um, white mold cheeses. All right, yeah. Because, and that was a trick that I got from Job's Cheese Lab. Remember Job's oh, Cheese yeah, Lab? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's kind of faded in the... That it doesn't make videos anymore. But yeah, I wonder what yeah. happened. To like. Can't even find him on YouTube anymore. But anyways, he used to make his mold ripened cheeses with a cheesecloth because, well, first of all, he said it, it wicked away the moisture a lot better. Yeah. And the yeah. other thing was that you could you could pull that cheese out of the form in the cheesecloth and flip it, and you had something containing the cheese, so that yeah, it wasn't yeah. you know all, it was just more stable. Yeah. And after you'd done that, flipped it a couple of times, then you could take the cheesecloth off because by that time the thing had lost enough moisture that it would hold its shape. Yeah. So I'm not being very specific. It's because I don't really remember. And I, I could whip out my recipe and, and uh, quote from it. But it, I know that it involved this odd combination of cheesecloths and uh, a follower that had holes drilled into it. Yes, yes. Well, that, yeah, that's it's good to know, especially with the um, the cheesecloth thing, because yeah, it do, it will wick away the some of the moisture as well, and probably make it more stable quicker, if that makes sense. Because a I lot of people, so. I've had so many emails in from people that said my cheese has my camembert has collapsed. So if you take it out of the mold too early and it's too moist, it will it'll just go well, like a big mess, flat. Uh, and that cheesecloth would help because that will help firm it up as well. That's a great. So, are you, so when you make the camembert, do you use a hoop or do you use a basket? So the hoop without a bottom. Well, I've only made the one camembert, and that was the, the hockey puck. Right. So that that was in uh, that was in a basket that had a bottom on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's driving me crazy. I got to look it up now. I got to look at my right. brie and find out how I made it. <laughs> yeah, special remember. book there. Oh my gosh! Oh, nice. That's nice and thick. <laughs> Those are all they're all cheeses I've made. Nice. So, so do you know um, how many you've made while you're looking it up? Uh, well, more than fifty. <laughs> I've got a sort of a semi list of them, and and there's some that I've made more than once as well. Mm. So, free. Right. Okay. Okay. Use a skimmer to ladle slices of curd about half an inch thick into a cheesecloth lined basket. Right. And the basket I used was 187 millimeter by 95 millimeter cheese basket with a perforated follower. I'm pretty sure that has a bottom on it. Oh, okay. Um, Do you remember where you got frame, it from? Where you got the basket from? The hoop? I bought it secondhand from someone who locally had been wanting to make cheese at home and Never got around to it? Yeah, changed their minds and they put their stuff up on uh, Craigslist or uh, Kijiji or something. And yeah. I wasn't looking for it. It was a friend who said, you know, hey, there's this listing. And they were local. Nice. So, yeah, they, they had all of these baskets that they got from New England cheese making. So yeah. That's, that's how I came across it. Oh, great. Uh, carefully remove the cheese and the cloth from the basket. Invert the basket over the cheese and the cloth. The, the bottom is now on the top. Gently flip the cheese, drain for four hours more. So, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I just, it, just I just molly coddled it with uh, cheesecloth yeah, and bath. Yeah, the cheesecloth would have helped a lot and prevented it from cracking because I found that when I tried to do it by hand, it wasn't very stable. Um, and I know that the French have two boards when they make them in their big hoops in uh, near Paris, what's it called? Um, uh, breed um, mu oh I can't even bloody say the word M E U X how do you say that in English yeah, in French uh, no. but even there that'll do and um, well done it must be your French Canadian coming out uh, and it's, yeah it's and a they lot of French over here well, and they flip the boards so they have boards to do it as well and as they get more stable they can do it by hand so 
Yeah, but well done. Nice. That cheesecloth is a fantastic tip. Um, so, what are your what are your favourite? Ham- I'll start again. What are your favourite cheeses to make, as in the process of cheese made? What style? Oh, it sort of depends what I'm in the mood for. Mm. Um, I still really love to make goat feta because it is so fast. It is so easy. It's ready in four days. Yeah. Uh, So so there's a lot of immediate satisfaction from there. And I can, you know, have a cheese on hand in in a really short time that reads as cheese. You know, come out, you put it and it's a brick and you can put it on a plate and you say, this is cheese. As opposed to chev, which is cheese, or cream cheese, which is cheese. But yeah, Yeah, it's it's not, not, yeah, it's not a brick of cheese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the one that I really like to have on hand because I like to eat it is the same one that Jennifer mentioned, and that was your Cotswold that's got oh. the, the chives and the onions and the uh, garlic in it. Oh, my gosh. I love that. I lo- it melts. I love a grilled cheese sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it'd be perfect in a grilled cheese sandwich. Yeah. And the one that I will make uh, so that I've always got some on hand for my husband, Henry, is a stout infused cheddar. He's a nice. huge fan of mm. that stout infused cheddar. It is a lovely cheese, isn't it? It's oh, just, it's beautiful. It's just got a, a, a richness and a body that's unlike any other cheese. Yeah, and I just, I love this, the taste of the stout comes through. We've got a lot of microbreweries around here that do really nice stouts and really nice porters. So using those Local beers in my cheese is kind of a, a nice touch as well. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I love making a blue cheese too. Every time I've made a blue, I've been blown away by it. Yeah, the flavors, um, are, the flavors for blues are so good. And the, there's so many different flavors of blue, if that makes sense. Even using the same Penicillium Rogue 40, just by doing, you know, the high moisture cheeses and the and the drier ones, the the flavour that the 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 penicillium rogue forty provides the cheese is just it's so extreme. The different you can get one that burns your tongue. You can get them that are so mild and creamy, and it's all using the same uh, mould. So yeah, yeah, and uh, using a different kind of milk made a difference too. I made your your blue wee goat blue was the first one that I made. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what a brilliant flavor combination that is. Yeah, and no um, and no veining. In, well, in mine, it didn't have any because I never pierced it, right? But the flavor yeah. was still there, yeah. It was, and the flavor was there in the Petite Blue as well, which is another one that doesn't have veining, but you've got all the blue flavor. And that one's ready really quick too, just a month or so. Yeah, 30, 35 days or something. But, yeah, that and that yeah. just has that skin of blue on the outside, like a camembert would have white mold. This has... The blue, but yeah, I I I, I think I, I remember piercing those, but only just you only get a little tiny. You don't get any veining because it's so creamy, but yeah, it's a delicious little blue cheese. And then making the Nova Scotia blue, which is based on a Shropshire blue, that was a completely different experience with blue cheese. You know, yeah, it was it was, it was essentially it was a hard cheese with blue veining. Yeah, um, yeah, and that was very sharp. That had a pretty good bite. Mm. That was a tricky one to put together too, talking about hoops and flipping and everything, because you have to rub them up. <laughs> uh, so, it was it was the biggest pain. I when I made it, it just fell apart. So here's what works. Here's what works, though, Gavin. Um, yeah. Don't use a basket. Use a hoop. In fact, use two hoops. Um, right. I use uh, two hoops piled on top of one another and taped together with masking tape on the outside. Right. And so when when you need to get to the cheese you just you pull that hoop up, Lift it up right and just expose a couple of inches and friction will hold that hoop up there you so let it go and you grab your hot knife and you start or your wet knife and you start rubbing it up oh, and right. rubbing yeah, it up yeah, and smoothing yeah. nice then yeah. you raise it raise it a couple of inches again and do it again it's really it takes forever but by the time you've got the hoop off the thing is completely consolidated and it's all smooth on the outside and that's the answer. Beautiful. Thanks for the tip. That's so yeah. good. So next, my dad loved the um, the Shropshire Blue. He couldn't believe how bitey 
the 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 blueness the in blueness the blue veins was in the in the cheese because I served that up for a a Christmas cheese platter once when he was here before COVID, and um, yeah, it was uh, it, he just loved it. He couldn't believe it, but it's a deli- it's an amazing cheese. I'm so glad that they included it in the um, uh, the fourth edition of the home cheese making because it wasn't in the third edition. So they added some new recipes in. So I'm glad I made it. It was really good. Yeah, it's a hard cheese to make. It's it was it's definitely an advanced cheese, but it's yeah, uh, yeah, it's not for a beginner. That's for no. sure. I was taking on some really stupid cheeses, though. I'm you know I took on that Huntsman cheese. Remember the Huntsman cheese? Yeah, yeah, the Huntsman one with cheese. a different uh, cheese on the inside, and it's wrapped with another one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You make a Stilton and age it completely, and then you make a double Gloucester. And 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 try to pull like like play doh. Try to m- massage this double Gloucester around the Stilton, and it worked. But you know, I yeah, I remember I feel like a I, video on ha- the how they did it in the commercial world, and the it was they might mu- I don't know did they heat the Gloucester the double Gloucester up so it was a little bit more pliable or how did that you do that video it? is have a that video is heavily edited, so it's really hard to tell. I I didn't heat it up. I just uh, just will <laughs> sheer <laughs> force of will. <laughs> hey, look who's look who's come to join me, Gavin. Oh, you got a pussy hanging on. I'll, I'll make it bigger. I'll make it bigger so you're in the oh other way. That way, there you go. So what's oh, yeah. what's the pussy cat's name? Well, this one is Zim. Zim Z I M. Zim Z I M Zim. Zim. Yeah. Like you, Invader Zim. All right, yes. Lovely. Boy or a girl? This one's a little boy. Eats cheese? Uh, not to my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> you don't feed it cheese. <laughs> I haven't found him up on the counter while I'm making cheese yet, no. All right, okay. Yeah, because I know Lisa's got a cat. Um, What's it called? Yum Yum. And, uh, yeah, always <laughs> yeah. her um her cheese videos, so... Yes. Yes, I think she's she, always yum yum. Is always in shot. It's sort of whenever she gets the milk out. So. Yeah, yeah, always gets a drink of milk as well. Oh, somebody doesn't like something. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. Zim has a brother. Uh, we right. call him Gur, and, and the two of them are just um, yeah. They're having an intimate moment. Oh right, like that. Nice. Okay. <laughs> 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 so you've got your cheese platter all set up from all your cheeses. We're doing a hypothetical, right? So you got your cheese platter all set up and you've got a selection of cheeses. What would be your perfect cheese platter and what would you drink with that perfect cheese platter? Ah, oh, the perfect cheese platter would have... In the center, there would be a, a, a tub with chevre. Right, yep, beautiful. All right, so that we have always have that tub with chevre right in the middle. Uh, on the outside, I would like to have some kind of a blue cheese. Um, any of the blue cheeses. Yeah. Um, I think it would be really nice to have, um, I'd say maybe my bloomy goat red. Remember right. when I based a bloomy goat red off your bloomy goat blue? Yeah, I yeah. put um, on the outside of uh, of the cheese, there was a, a smoked paprika. Yes, yes. Remember yeah. that. Yep. All right. And one of the reasons I would want that there is because not only is it a beautiful a tasting in cheese, but it's a beautiful to look at cheese with that red casing around the outside underneath the white mold. Gorgeous mm. thing. I would want to have one of the stout infused cheddars. Nice. Or one of the other alcohol infused cheeses because you get that, that eye catching marbling is mm. just, it's a sight to behold. Honestly, if the, if the cheese tastes bad, it's got to look good. Yeah. <laughs> I believe that I taste bad, but yeah. Yeah. And what else would I have? So that's, that's a pretty, pretty fair selection right good. there. Oh, pretty good. Yeah. I would only, I would. Yeah. I would do a minimum of four. Yeah, something mild and mild and white, but I don't know what it would be. It, it wouldn't be Wensleydale, though. <clears throat> I have to say, I, I made Wensleydale once, 
And when I got to the part of the recipe where it said stir for two hours, that's when I decided I'm not making that cheese in again. Again. <laughs> you said, did you finish it or? Yep. Right. That was it. I almost finished what I started, but did it taste okay? Hours. Oh, it was great. Yeah. Right. Yes, I've only made it twice. <laughs> It no, takes, I'm making that one again. It takes a long time. That stirring and then the and then as soon as you finish stirring, it's that breaking up for two hours as well. Breaking the curds up. Oh, tell you what. Gromit, Wallace and Gromit can have that cheese, all right? <laughs> for the home cheese maker, sure, in a factory, go for it. Maybe that's why it nearly well, went extinct. Wallace loves it because he doesn't have to make it, you see. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, and, and you want to know what I would drink with it? Yeah, what would you drink you with the drink? Do you know? I I'm not a wine drinker. I I'll have a glass of wine now and again, but I never really think to pair wine with my cheese. I'm a Scotch drinker. All oh, right. And and I would never pair cheese with my Scotch or Scotch with my cheese. The but, flavor would be it wouldn't not a good combination or. I've just seen some. Uh, when, when I was researching flavor pairings for scotch, because we do scotch tastings from time to time, yeah. um, there is a suggestion that maybe cheese is a poor choice to pair with scotch. Mm. And it's a better to go with a chocolate um, or a ginger snap or even apple pie, uh, yeah. but cheese is in a different realm. So yeah. no, I, don't, I, I don't really have a beverage with my cheese. So, if someone brings one, yeah. I'll enjoy it. Not, not even a beer? Just beer in my cheese. <laughs> right. So you got beer in your cheese, but you don't need to drink it with it. Yeah, look, I find you're right. You know, I don't always have a um I don't always have a a a wine with the cheese. I, even sometimes I'll pair it with cider or perry, um, which tastes really nice. It depends on the style of cheese. The stronger the cheese, the 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 cider probably doesn't go too well with it. But even beer. So, you know, a nice dark ale will go nice with those stronger cheeses as well. But, yeah. I Look, I hear whiskey's nice. I do like it. Scotch. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and the longer aged it is and single malt, even better still. So, delicious. All right. So, nearly, what time is it? Oh, you've got 13 minutes. So, do you have any words of encouragement that you and take your time? <laughs> any words of encouragement for new <laughs> cheesemakers? Lessons learnt on the in the kitchen. Oh, and one of the things I forgot to ask: Where do you make your cheese? Is it just in your home kitchen? Yeah, yeah. I don't have any other like special devoted space or or anything like that. No, just the home kitchen and um i'm i'm the cook so i'm not kicking anybody out when i make yeah. cheese there yeah. yeah i don't have to work around anybody um other than if i'm making one of the uh mold uh the white mold cheeses where they have to drain yeah. at the side of the sink forever and ever then i you know then my husband's got to make toast around it and stuff like yeah. that so there's that consideration but otherwise the kitchen's all mine since nice. where, I, where i do it all and and down in the basement i've got uh, two tiny little wine fridges and that's where everything gets aged right fantastic so um did you like buy one wine fridge and then that wasn't enough and then you had to buy another one or when santa got me the cheese press he got me a tiny little wine fridge i think it holds 16 bottles or something it's really really right. wee yeah. Um, and it, I outgrew it pretty quickly. So the second one is, uh, it looks more like a bar fridge in size. It, you know, it kind of comes up to tabletop in height. And, yeah. um, so between those two, that's enough because there's only two of us, right? I yeah. don't have kids and I don't have extended family. His family's all in Ontario. I don't have any family. The only family I have is in Australia. Okay. Oh, all right. You. Cool. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cooey cobber. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, so it's it's um it's not like I'm feeding a lot of cheese to a lot of people. So I, you know, I don't want to keep a whole lot of cheese on hand. It's great to have it and let it age, but I'd be it would be a ridiculous pursuit yeah. for me to get a large cheese fridge. 
Yeah, I've only I've only got a small cheese. I've got one single dorm fridge. You know, there's ones that are, you know, well, bar fridge we call them here. That's all yeah. I got because once it's mature, I've act, once it's fact I've tasted it, then I'll either give it away to friends or we'll keep a piece ourselves and put it in the kitchen fridge to stop it from aging because if I think it's a perfect age, I won't age it any longer. And you know, in the in that door, there's you know those racks like you get in a in a proper little fridge. That's where I put the little quarter pieces if I'm going to age them for a long, long time. You know, so yes, yeah, so that, that works for me. And we don't have a heck of a lot of cheeses in the cheese fridge. It's just the ones that I've been doing the videos on, waiting to mature. So yeah, yeah. yeah. contrary to popular belief, we're not we don't eat a lot of cheese every single day. So same as you. <laughs> yeah, no, we don't either. Um, so, um, my advice to novice cheesemakers is, um, well, first of all, I took a lot of inspiration from your videos. Thank you. Um, I, I could echo everything that Jennifer said in that you are, you know, implicitly encouraging, uh, you know, you don't, you're not in there saying you can do it. It's not that kind of encouragement. It's just more of a, a there's a steady methodology to the way that you make the cheese um, and the step-by-step -step is very, very easy to follow. And once you watch several of your videos back to back, you start to see the same patterns over and over again. And that is really encouraging. That's the sort of thing that says, I can do this. I can follow these steps and, and make this. Yeah. Um, and it makes my friends. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, and do you have a, and do you share a lot of the cheese with friends and stuff like that? Um, Yes, I do. I mean, if, yeah, anyone who trips across my doorstep usually gets something foisted on them. Mm. Um, I'm semi-retired, so I don't, I don't, I don't work as much as I did. I was working full time in 2018, so the people I worked with always got cheese, you know, brought to them, and they liked it. Um, but I don't have that outlet anymore so much, so I don't really get to give it away at work. But yeah, yeah we absolutely, friends get to have it. Um, the last time that I went back to Ontario to see Henry's family, um, I schlepped some cheese with me and put it all out for them to eat. So, yeah, I'm a good it. person to know if you like cheese. Nice, nice. Yeah. And there is, a, there is a secret that you have. Um, you, you play an instrument that is unique. Uh, it, what's it called? It's euphonia? The, oh, you've got... The oh, the euphonium. Oh, I thought you were going to talk about the serpent. Oh, yeah. Well, no, I yeah, you could, well, you do to more than one instrument then. Yeah. Um, yeah, euphonium. It's uh, Anyone who knows anything about brass music will know the euphonium. It's a large brass instrument. It's about half the size of a tuba. Yeah. You see them in brass bands. You see them in wind ensembles. Yeah, I've been doing that since I was a teenager. Nice. And yeah, I, I remember you sent me a photo on my birthday once with you, you playing the in it because your birthday is is it the same day as mine or a day after or something? Same May day. May 23rd. There yeah. you go. Oh, now you've told the whole world they're going to send us presents. <laughs> <laughs> Different year. I've got a few years on you, you know. Oh, yeah. Stop it. You look, don't look a day over 30. I just turned 60. Stop it. No. Yeah. It's only yeah. two years difference. <laughs> I tell you what, you don't look your age, and I, I'm not trying. To, I'm not trying to chat you up or anything there, Patricia. But you know, no, I, I get a lot of people telling me that. So. Yes, I think even Ruth said in the comments that uh, yes. you, you look so. And Ruth's in the green room at the moment. Give us a wave, Ruth, just to see you can see me. There she is. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so it's lovely to see uh, Ruth's waiting in the green room for the next interview. And it's been so fantastic to talk to you today, Patricia. Oh, it's uh, been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. Oh, and I've, you've been part I'm of not the sure why you want to talk to me, but here we you've are. Been, you've been part of the Curdner community for so long. It would have been criminal not to invite you on. Sweet. Oh, it's, been, it's been a complete pleasure. And, uh, again, thank you so much for the opportunity and uh, for your interest. And, uh and for your inspiration. Thank you so much for Thanks, making mate. me the cheesemaker that I am. Thanks for that. No, you made yourself the cheesemaker you are. I just put it out there for everybody. So give yourself some credit. I think you've done a fantastic job, especially those cheeses that you, are just unique that you make. So well done, mate. Well done.
Well, keep working on it. There's more, there's more in the Sweeney Todd series to come. There's so much to learn. That's what I love about cheese making. There's just so much to learn. I haven't even got to the, you know, I haven't even got to the end of the, what have I made? About 160 different types of cheese now. <laughs> and there's still, I'm still, people are still sending me recipes and I'm still finding them. And, you know, the channel's not going to end anytime soon. And, you know, as I move into uh, semi-retirement, so look, I only work about, um, uh, what was it, 60 hours a week which is uh, 60 hours a fortnight, not a week. That'd be crazy. 60 <laughs> hours a fortnight, so about 30 hours a week, you know, on the business. So that gives me a bit of time to, you know, do cheesy things and learn new skills and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, that's really good. But, yeah, thanks for yeah. having you on, uh, Patricia. Thanks for coming. It's been fabulous. Lovely chat too. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, no problems at all. I'll, uh, I'll move you out and uh, say goodbye. See you Have later. a great rest of the 12 hours of cheers. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Yes, we will. I'm sure we will. All right. See you later. Bye-bye. All right. That was lovely. Thank you so much, Patricia, once again. It was a lovely segment. Um, okay. So what have we got next? So the next uh, thing we got, we got an interview with Ruth, who is in the green room as well. And uh, Ruth, can I, before we bring you on, can you... Uh, lower your camera a bit. I've just got the bottom part of you. So I don't know if you can see your, yeah, that's better. There we go. That's it. Lovely. All righty. So before I introduce Ruth, I'm just going to have to park the, um, the stream for a second and um, uh, two seconds. I just need to go and get another drink of water before my uh, before my throat goes a bit funny, hopefully you can all still hear me there. And I'll just pop this on again, and hopefully there's some nice music playing. So just speak amongst yourselves for a second. I'll just grab another drink of water before I go horse. Here we go. Righty go. There we go. Let me just uh, get out of this and back to that. And uh, right, one second. Thank you so much for waiting, everybody. And back there, we got that's all good. Right now, allow me to introduce Ruth. Uh, Ruth is from San Francisco in California, United States of America. She's a therapist um, and that's her profession, but she'll tell us about that as we go along. But uh, her passion is cheese making, which uh, is, it's, she can't stop making it. Anyway, let me, I'll, I'll bring Ruth on and we'll have a fantastic chat. <laughs> there she is. Hello, Ruth. How are you? <laughs> I'm so excited, Gavin. I'm so excited. And I have to tell you, I feel really emotional. Do you? When you saw me in the group, I thought, oh, no, I'm going to start crying because <laughs> you have been such an important person in my life since um, since I found you on YouTube about four years ago. Yeah. So your first question is, how did I get in making? And yes. well, first of all, I will back up and say I am a therapist. I'm a psychotherapist and a sex therapist, and I work with trauma, so it's very stressful. Mm. So I need, I need the relaxing 
movement of stirring the vat. Mm. And um, so how did it happen? Well, somebody brought me Ricky Carroll's book as a, on loan. I always yeah. loved cheese. I never made cheese before. I never really, I always kind of dreamed about it, but I never really thought seriously about making cheese. Somebody lends me this book, Ricky Carroll's How to Make Cheese at Home or something like that. Yeah. And so making quick mozzarella, which is what we all do first. And um, <laughs> Patricia once said um, she got PTSD from making quick mozzarella, and I, right. I agree with her. <laughs> She said, um, she said mozzarella causes PTSD, and I, I think it does. Quick anyway. mozzarella, yeah, if you can't get it right, I'll tell you what, it's just a pain. Um, can, oh. I just, can I just stop you there for a second, Ruth? Um, I'm getting a little bit of audio, uh, not feedback, but some crackling. Do you have a different microphone oh. that you could possibly use? Um, I could just take off the headphones. Yeah, Would see, that that be works, better? see if that okay. works any different. Yeah, let's try that. Is that better? Uh, just count to three for me. One, two, three. That's the same. Oh. Doesn't matter. Doesn't oh. matter. It's just the microphone. I'm not sure. Oh. Um, is, are you using one of the inbuilt microphones on your computer I'm or something? One in the computer, yeah. One, the other thing we could, well, no, I don't want to get on the phone. So I'll just try and speak loudly. You're getting feedback? Yeah, it's just a, a crackling. That's all it is. You can plug your headphones back in if you can't hear properly. But um, uh, I hear you. I hear all right, you fine. that's that's fine. All right, we'll continue on. That's no hassle at all. I'm just gonna all of a sudden the sun's come out and I'm bright. I've got an I've got a halo. I don't know what's going on there. It's really <laughs> hot here. We haven't had any hot weather in ages, and finally we got some hot weather, which is not good for cheese, but I love it. Anyway. Yeah. So um, somebody continue brings, on. Somebody brings me this book, Ricky Carroll's book, and so I tried making quick mozzarella, and it didn't come out well. But I thought, mm, I'm trying, <laughs> and I, I've never stopped. So um, I looked for teachers on YouTube. I never was a YouTuber before, but yeah. I looked around on YouTube. I found this young woman named. San Francisco Milkmaid, and I oh yes, yes, for a little while, and she didn't have very many cheeses. So I then I started looking around, and then I felt found Gavin, and it was like, who's that bloke? What? Who's that bloke? Um, <laughs> good question. <laughs> I don't know how it happened, but I I found Gavin and. Sidebar, I have a sleep issue. I don't sleep very much. So I would get up in the wee hours of the morning. And at that time, Gavin only had about maybe 86 videos on the chat, on the, on the, on the site. Yeah. And I would watch them one after another and watch them again and again and again. And it was like I was in love. I um <laughs> I lived for the live stream and I rarely got to watch it live. And in those days before Kim got sick, you were even doing him twice a week for a while. Mm. And oh, I was so excited. And I remember when you started having them on the weekend and I could sometimes come to the live to have it to, to watch it in person. Yeah. Anyway, so I just started trying to make everything that I could that you were making on the on the site. Nice. And my failure rate was about sixty percent. Oh goodness me. I, I remember you reaching out to me a few times asking questions and I hope that helped. It did and then I took the uh Kurt Nerd Academy. And yep. for a long time my problem was I, I didn't get it about finding the right milk. And so I searched and searched and searched and tried all these different kinds of milk. And then I thought the problem was my thermometer. So I would get one thermometer and another thermometer. And I was trying all these different thermometers. And um, I, 
I just was obsessed with like, what was my problem? But I kept going. And then Larry from deep South Texas and you made that, that video about American cheese. So I yes. could make that out of all my failures, but um, we ate all my mistakes, but it was it was pretty bad for a while. I mean, every week I was, I had another little disaster. At that time, I was making small batches, so it wasn't as bad. But um, anyway, so I tried a lot of things and I failed a lot, and then little by little I started to have successes, and mm. it was so exciting when my cheeses started to be not only good enough. That, that we could enjoy them, but actually good enough where I could feel proud to give them away. And I started making cheese and giving it away. And everybody was so excited because nobody makes cheese. Everybody makes bread or, you know, other things, but nobody around here makes cheese. So it was very exciting. And so that's how it all began. And then for about a whole year, besides watching your YouTubes as much as I could, which was a lot. Yeah. I started reading books, and for a whole year, I only read books about cheese. And nice. I so I read every night for like a two. Sorry about the doorbell. Um, That's okay. And um, so I just read and read and read and read and read to see what I could learn. And then little by little, I started getting it. So that's mm. how it all began. And it was an accident. But you were a big part of it. Uh, I was a part of the accident. <laughs> you were part of the accident and part of the success. And you were part uh, of the joy. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. That's a lovely start to your story. You still are. You still are. Oh, thanks, mate. Yep. Uh, and uh, I must say this publicly, thank you so much for your support during the time that Kim was sick. Um, I got a weekly email from you, you know, checking in on me, especially if I wasn't making videos and stuff like that. It was a very stressful time in our lives. And, um, and I know you were going through a similar experience with your sister. Um, but thank you so much for being there for us both. I really well, appreciate it. I was heartbroken about Kim being sick and I remember watching those videos where you were sitting in the car and Kim was inside having her chemotherapy and I just was so sad because when my sister was in chemo I was at every single every single chemo it yeah was. I just couldn't and go in they wouldn't let me in no and you were you were going through it during COVID and we got through the chemo before COVID. All right. And my sister is five years out now. Nice. That's fantastic. Stage four, Stage four she had. Yeah. She's, she's going strong. She has beautiful hair. And um, just like Kim has beautiful hair now. Yeah, she does now. Yeah, yeah. Not that she didn't before, but, you know. And uh, I, loved, I loved her hair when it was short too, so it didn't really matter. Love it a bit, but thank you. Like I said, Ruth, thank you so much yeah, for helping. It was the least I could do because I was thinking so much about both of you all the time. And also, it was heroic that you kept on showing up and helping all of us when you were going through all that. I, I thought of it as my great distraction, really. You, you yeah. know. Even, you know, it's, even though I've got a passion for it, I've got a passion for Kim, of course. She's my lovely wife. Um, but really, when I'm trying to, well, yeah, I suppose, distract myself from pain. So, you know, as uh, that's what people do. Um, but, yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, I did. I, well, I thought this is my community. This is These are the people that love making cheese and love talking about it and... Who am I to let them down, really? Well, you know, Gavin, um, even before the pandemic, one thing I always loved about cheese and one thing that really attracted me to cheese making was that around the world, people make cheese. Mm. And for thousands of years, people make cheese. And I just felt, I feel 
connected to humankind throughout history and throughout the world, and then having this chat, which is so big, the world, like people from all over the place, Africa and Spain and, and South America and Australia and Europe and all these people from all over the place logging on and yeah. making and it, I just feel so connected. And then when we got COVID and we were all locked down and staying home by ourselves, I just felt like, oh, I'm not alone. All these other people are stirring their vats too. And I felt so blessed because some people couldn't get their milk. Yeah. And I always, you know, one, one thing about San Francisco, I feel so fortunate. I have a health food store where I can get raw, All right, yeah. get raw milk delivered every week to my door through oh, so the good. pandemic. So I could make cheese every week and I would hear people talking from other countries where they couldn't get their milk. And I just thought, oh, I felt so grateful and I feel so blessed. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, we, we were, we're in a similar situation. The guys from Inglenook Dairy, even though, you know, they sponsor the show, they delivered the milk during the pandemic as well. They just brought it to my door for me. Um, and, yeah, they're a great bunch of guys at that dairy. So similar to you, you know, if you can get it, keep making it as far as I'm concerned. That's what so. I do. That's what I do until it, you know, until it all goes away. But I'm, I'm so grateful. And yeah. I swear to God, you know, just like you, um, cheese making is stress management for me. And I have a hard job and I hear – pain and problems all day long so this is a real wonderful um outlet for me and it's a wonderful yeah. community for me and just so you know gavin i think you probably know this already but everybody in my life knows about you what and really i didn't know that therapy sessions i tell everybody you know my australian <laughs> cheese making teacher at the end of every chat he always says see you next time so <laughs> i always say to my clients at the end of my sessions i say see you next time and they very say, good australian time. accent i like that see you next time that's all i can say in the australian accent but we all <laughs> do it and so you are well loved in my world everybody knows about you thank you ruth and and uh, i must thank you again you actually dedicated was it the last book there was a dedication to cheese making in there it's just um thank it was so kind thank you well, mate. you're a very important person and um i don't know i i did recently write my second book and um i don't know how i would have gotten through it without making cheese but i will also say and this is um i guess in the category of advice one of the things that writing a book is really stressful, especially, you know that. Yeah. Especially yeah. When you're trying to do the rest of your work at the same time. So what happened was I terribly, terribly, terribly neglected my cheese. Really ironic. Because I've done it before. The book is yeah. about childhood neglect so here i <laughs> you neglected, neglected your all cheese. my children just <laughs> like i was writing about neglect so anyway i at the end of the year of writing that book i had a terrible mess of because weeks would go by where i hadn't even gone in and seen how any of the cheeses were doing so the mold just went crazy yeah. And it was a mess. So here's what I learned to do. And this is what I tell people to do all the time. I would just for 10 minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, work on cleaning my mess. Yeah. Because, you know, one thing, this is another way that I'm blessed, but it was a real problem during that year of neglect. I have seven little, not little, I have seven cheese fridges. Seven? Seven. That's, seven. that's seven. incredible. And, oh, that's um, and they're all full. 
and they they all were completely moldy, especially with rope forty. It was everywhere, yeah. so everything got kind of bluish, and the 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 refrigerators. I mean, everything was such a mess. So ten minutes a day, and little by little, it all got. And now I have a routine where I stay on top of it every day. I clean. One cave each day, and I turn the cheeses in that one each day. So instead of turning everything once a week, I turn one fridge each day, and I clean down the walls of that fridge that day. So yeah. at the end of the week, everything's been turned and cleaned one time, and that. And now my my little woman cave is immaculate. Nice. Okay, everything's fine. So that's, that's fantastic. Right. That's fantastic. Now, do you want it? Do you want me to show some of the pictures that you sure, sent sure. me? So sure. I'll just and I'll bring those let up. Me give, let me give one little um one little sidebar before you do that. Yeah. That is when you ask what are your favorite cheeses to make. I'm really um, partial to visuals, so I like having cheeses that look really interesting and yeah. beautiful so the cheeses that i've invented have been um for looks a lot of it is for looks i care about flavor of course also yeah. but i really like a showy looking cheese and i also love making labels so yeah. you'll see that i sent with my pictures of the cheeses i sent my pictures of the labels so go ahead Right, here we go. And you can see both of us as well. So, yeah, so you can see, so this one is a candy corn. So describe this cheese to me. Well, in in the States here, we have um, a traditional Halloween candy called candy corn. It's nothing to taste, but it looks just like this picture. So I thought, well, I'll make a, a Halloween cheese. I just made mine for this year because it needs about four to six months. Yeah. So um, I'll make a Halloween cheese that's got stripes of orange and yellow. There it is. There. So it's, it's um, cheddar with um, annatto, and it's striped with um, saffron-infused cheese. And if you're as old as I am, you might remember an old song called Mellow Yellow. Oh, yes. And a great um, song. So I call my saffron infused cheese mellow yellow. So <laughs> the candy corn is striped of cheddar and mellow yellow. Very and that's nice. My Halloween candy. So my what's Halloween the taste candy. like? So it's 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 still it's cheddary, wonderful. but the the saffron does that come through? It, not so strong, but it, it the saffron is mostly for looks. Although it's a, kind of a woody taste and but it's subtle you've got a nice semi-sharp cheddar it's it's a good cheese yeah. it, people love it and yeah it yeah i loved i loved uh, and you you haven't there's no peppercorns in this one like the I saffron didn't in put any peppercorns in this one although the little flakes of saffron you can see some of those little kind of red flakes yeah, and, let me see. Um, can I zoom in? Let's have a look. Yeah, see those. Oh, there, there. right. Yeah, so there. there. And th those are flakes of um, saffron. And over and there, and yeah. It tells you to um, grind half of it and keep half of it in threads. I don't keep quite half of it in threads, but I keep about a third of it in threads. So you've yeah. got those little threads floating around. Fantastic. It's uh, fun. So there's another one. This is a, a Montazio. Uh, okay, there you are. That's a bit bigger. There you go. So describe this one to me. Okay. Well, I, I, I love honey and I love everything sweet. So I found this recipe in that Deborah, what's her name, Deborah, the two Deborah Amram boys. Yeah, that's a good yeah. book. And I, she had a recipe in there called Honey Rubbed Montazio. Yep. So I thought, oh, anything with honey, I'll try that. So I went on Amazon and I found this truffle in honey. Now I've never, I never had truffles before, but truffles are really fancy. So I thought I'd, I'd try <laughs> yeah. it. 
So I got this little tiny jar of, of truffle infused honey for this little tiny jar for $18 yeah. US. And I thought, well, I'll use that for my honey rubbed Montasio. So I made this honey rubbed Montasio and um, it was really fun because it's very fussy. And now that I have a time, I, I like the fuss. So the, the cheeses ha that have like, um, like um, what are they called again? By, uh, rind, um, wash. Wash rind cheeses, yeah. Them. Yeah, wash rind. It's things that you have to fuss with while you're aging. Yeah. Oh, I God. enjoy that. If I can keep up with it, I really enjoy it. So I got this um, honey, this truffle infused honey, and I made this honey rubbed Montasio. And it's mm. really interesting and it was really a lot of fun to make. Yeah. Although yeah. I think the um, the truffle, I truffles are really expensive and they're really fancy and they're a little bit kind of what they call too rich for my blood. They, yeah. um, I'm, I'm not sophisticated enough for um, um, truffles. So, so what, I, what was the flavor like, though, Ruth, of the final it, cheese? Um, it's you know how truffles are sort of shroom family. Yeah, it's earthy. Had it a had um had a woody, mushroomy kind of dirty taste. Um, yeah, and it's it's too strong for me. So I would say if I was to do it again, I wouldn't um, use truffle infused honey. I would use regular. Wonderful. Normal, yeah, honey, yeah. But the um, but the concept of Montasio with honey is a good one, and so this is this this one in this picture is um one that I recently made, and um, so it's in the cave now. It'll be ready in about three months. Oh, okay. So I you haven't it, tried. It. So how many? It how many? Times, can I just any, ask a question? Yeah. So how many times have you? Uh, put honey on it was it just once the initial time no no you put on, well i do it more than the recipe says she says to put it i think um once a week for the first month and then once a month and i did it more than that i don't remember exactly probably like every other day for the first week or two and then every few weeks after that so it might yeah. have been that with the um, with the with the um, oh god, what was the word again? Um, the infused honey I did yeah. too often, but it came out just a little too strong. Although other people loved it. Yeah. I'm I'm just I I never had truffles before, and I I don't really like truffles that much. But that's good. <laughs> they're crazy expensive, and they're not worth. Yes, crap, they aren't they just. Now, um, uh, oh, goodness me, what was the question I had? Oh, did you have to heat up the honey to to make it no. more uh, fluid, or was it just quite runny? No, I, I no, I just used it as it was. I, I didn't okay. Heat it up. Mm -mm. Right. Okay. All right. Let's move on to your next one. Um, okay. So this is a Morbier that you made, and I think it's using a um, Manchego basket or something like that. Right. No, right. And one thing I'll say: this is one of my little trade secrets. Um, I got these molds from um, New England cheese making, yeah. And they don't wear cheesecloth, so um, now never use cheesecloth anymore because a lot All of right. my failures were cheesecloth related either the oh, okay. cheese stuck to the cheesecloth or something went wrong that had to do with cheesecloth right so um this mold is cheesecloth free and i also splurged and got one of those louder molds oh yes um, yes also don't require um cheesecloth and what i'll say about louder is that they are crazy expensive but the people are so nice yeah people are so nice and when i got my um when i got my loud mold and it's really big it 
it takes, uh, I mean, one, one of the things that happened as I got more crazy into this was I started working bigger and bigger and bigger. So now my, um, my, and oh, did I send you a picture of the pot? Uh, yeah, but it didn't come through. Oh, it didn't. Oh, I'm no. sorry. Anyway, my, my pot that I now use is eight gallons, which is 32 liters. Goodness That's me. Crazy. It's yeah. big. And I sent, did I send you a picture of the bees on the, on the scale? Uh, yes. Try to. Hang on. There it yeah. is there. Yep. Oh, there it is. Hang on. So I'll bring it up. that one up so people can see it. There so we I, go. See, I'm a sex therapist. So right. I'm a little, <laughs> a little dirty minded. But, you um, are funny, Ruth. Um, these are, um, <laughs> really big cheeses and that one is th those are those are kilos on oh goodness scale. i thought that was pounds no goodness no me. kilos that's a that is a mess how'd you get a scale that big <laughs> i don't know i have these i have this big pot and i i got a, a press you know um sins who makes the uh curd harps he yes. i couldn't find a a press big enough for my molds. So, yeah. So I went to um, Steve and I asked him to make a Dutch press. Right. So I have a Dutch press that's big enough for my um, for my big molds. So I have a big mold out of which takes it'll it'll take a, a four kilo um, batch if I I yeah. So, um, I don't so is that the same? So, Ruth, is that the same size as the big one that I've got? Like, I think they say it's three kilos, but you can put more in it. Yeah, I think. that one. I think the same one that you have. They're yeah, they're that, not cheap. No, they're not cheap at all. But when I got that one, um, the guy who was so nice and he liked me because I would go on Google. And I would learn how to say little things in Dutch. So I would, All right. I would write him these <laughs> little um, emails in Dutch, my little cryptic Dutch, and he just loved it. So he, he sent me all this free stuff. He sent me, actually, I got this little um, water bottle. Oh, no. Hey, he, he never sent, sent me one of those. That, and he sent me... Um, a little cheese cutting board and um he sent me a bunch of free stuff and he was so nice and and he he kept in touch with me for a little while anyway i'm working without cheesecloth so i don't use yes, cheesecloth at all, right. at all anymore and my life is much easier yes i, I do like working with um the, the louder molds they are just so easy and you don't have to flip them or anything you just press them and no cheesecloth, no flipping. They're just, they're just made for commercial cheese making, which is, you That's know, what they're right. for. Yeah. That's right. And a shout out for Steve Benz. I always say his Kurt Harps are the, the Mercedes Benz of cheese making. And I <laughs> I've never thought of that. About his presses that I love my Dutch press and I can make really big um, cheeses in it i mean as big as i make yeah um, i've tried to um contain my enthusiasm and not get a bigger pot although well i don't think it would fit on my stove anyway yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so do you hate your oh well, i think that's all the photo oh there might be one more we'll just do one more photo i think it was your that one this is oh, your... that one's um that one's my galileo um I, I got actually I got another mold from Lauda, which is the um, the square one, the rectangular mold. Yes, I, yes. I read a book about cheddar that was written by a local person at my health food store. His name is Gordon. I forgot his last name, but he wrote a book about cheddar. He's a he's actually a prof a professional cheese tasting guy, and he goes to the contests. And he, right. and he tastes the cheeses. And um, so he was right. He wrote this book about cheddar, which is actually pretty cool. And he was writing about these 40 pound blocks of cheddar. Now, 40 pounds, I, I 
you have about to ask 20 kilos. Them, about 20 like, kilos. Okay, so it's big. So I thought, oh, I want to make blocks of cheddar too. So I, I went, I got another, I splurged again, and I got another louder mold, which is the rectangular one. And that one doesn't fit in my, um, in my Steve Benz Dutch press, so I have to up with gym weights, which is precarious. Right, yeah. Anyway, I made this great, um, I've done it twice now, I made two big, um, big cheddar blocks um, in the rectangles. And, you know, when, when I had them before they were in the wax and I was just looking at this block of marble cheddar, and I know Kim used to call it planet cheddar, and yeah. it does look like a map of the world. So I thought, wow, this rectangular cheese, it looks like the world is flat. Yeah. So, called it Galileo. So that's the uh, Galileo cheese, and you've got the label for that one too, right? Uh, yep, hang on. There we are. Oh. My Galileo label. And label making is another one, one of my great pleasures. So <laughs> one of the ways that I got through the pandemic and one of the great pleasures of my life was since we're so isolated during this lockdown, and I miss everybody so much. Started sending people packages of oh, yeah. cheese, and um, it would make so happy, and it would make people so happy to get these packages. And one thing I learned, and this is for single people, you know, I'm a I'm a relationship therapist, and I'm an old married lady. But one thing I learned was every time I would meet somebody where that I like, I would my perennial question um i would say to them do you like cheese and <laughs> and pretty almost everybody says yes and so then i said give me your postal address i'll send you a little package and then they love me forever <laughs> so i made so many friends cheese and i swear to god People love you forever and don't know anyone who makes cheese. They've never had artisan cheese before. And, and they're so excited in their soul. And I swear to God, I've made so many friends that way. I'll and tell you so what. If you're single, it might be a good way to meet. Nice. You know? I never thought of that. Yeah. yeah Lucky I, I'm married. I'm an old married <laughs> lady. My um, other advice is if you're going to be a re crazy cheesemaker like me, you have to have a spouse that's an angel. And my right. spouse is an angel, and it also helps that he loves cheese. So of he course. puts up with all my insanity, and he lets me completely monopolize the kitchen once a week, and um, he puts up with the smells and all the refrigerators, and... Um, He's a really good guy. So you have to have a tolerant spouse. And I remember there was a person on the chat who was constantly getting in trouble with his wife. And I just thought, wow, I'm so fortunate that my husband is such an angel. And he really is. And he loves the cheese. He yeah. makes the cheese every every night when we have cheese for dinner. We do uh, almost I I, I remember that guy. He was in. Sp he's an Englishman that lives in Spain, and uh, yeah, That's he's, right. uh, yeah, and his. Uh, I think his wife shut him down. Basically, he's making too uh -oh. many smelly cheeses. Oh, terrible. yeah. What <laughs> What can you do? Yeah. What can you do? Well, um, he also knows that I'm a much nicer person when I make cheese. So, oh yes. Um, it, oh. He loves the cheese, and he likes me better when I make cheese. So it, it works out well that way. That yes. that is fantastic. He sounds like a very patient man. He's a good guy. Yeah, I'm very fortunate. Uh, yes, same as me. Kim loves everything that I make, um, and yeah, she's even tolerant of the uh, the smelly washed rind cheeses, the ones that smell like old socks. Yeah. 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 It work, yeah. It's it. It's good to have such a supporting partner. And if you're single, you don't have to worry about stuff like that anyway. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but it's nice to have somebody there. 
They're Indeed. So, so you like making the visual style cheeses as you know, as long as they got some flavour as well. What what's the weirdest one that you've made? The weirdest one. Yeah. Mm. Well, I um the the honest answer to your question is some of them came out weird that weren't that were supposed to be weird. Right. Yeah. And um, for example, um, it took me three tries, but I got it um, to make Shropshire. Um, was blue. It Shropshire. Blue? Yeah, Shropshire blue, the one that falls apart. Yeah, yeah. and um, actually, I I did a whole blog about it because um, it was such a it was such a challenge, and it was only when you and Larry um, came out with that American cheese solution that I found something to do with my um, Shropshire blue failure. But um, that one came out weird the first two times. But then when I finally got a good one, it was really, really, um, but yeah. it, took, it took three tries and I've never, never made it again because it was, I think I have a little pee to that one. But, <laughs> so that was one of, that was came out weird. Um, a couple of times, and the buttermilk blew out to be a really stinky sponge. So oh, I think okay. it probably got an early blow, but mm. it turned into something really weird and made it into something like a buttermilk blue cream cheese. But um, all right, so it, it was, turned out it a right was, event in the end. It was okay. But it was kind of weird. I would never do that one again. Yeah. And um, the only thing I've ever thrown away, and I, we <laughs> ate all my failures, and there were a lot of failures even before the um, Amazing video. Yes. And, um, I ever threw away, and it's kind of ironic because you teach it as a as a beer's cheese was when Lumi. And my oh, home right. came out so terrible, it, 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 it wasn't edible. I don't know what went wrong, but that was the weirdest thing, that it was so bad that I hate wasting food, but that one we threw out. Have you made it again since? No. No? No. I, there's so many things to make, Gavin, that I just stuck True. Stuck. Yeah. Yeah, I'm quite um, quite partial to Lumi. I, I, it once you get it, once you get the hang of it, I suppose it's um, it's very very nice. But you know, who knows what went wrong? It's it's uh, it, you do so many things with it. So, but anyway, and I do, do make sourdough bread, and I don't know if there was like yeast in the air or something. But and also so because I I have a cabinet where I keep my starter. And it's in the kitchen, so yeah. I don't know if it, you know, yeast is airborne, and it could have been that there was yeast in the air. I don't know what happened. But anyway, yeah. that was the, the one weird thing I've done. It's not really weird, but it's sort of stinky. And that's all the ones, Brevi bacteria linens, the, the yes. um, linens. The red cheeses. mold. Yeah. Yeah. And... I love those cheeses, and my mother, who died, she died in 2000, but her favorite cheese was Port Salut, and so right. sometimes I make Port Salut um, for her because it's good, and it reminds me of her, and um, it's also kind of stinky, and it it's easy to make everything smell like brevi bacterium linens. And now I've got a lot of um, brevi bacteria linens cheeses going. I I did make that Italico that was on yeah. the New England site. I haven't, it, it's, it's not ready yet, but it that one and the uh, Morbier both have brevi bacterium linens in the wash that you have to use every few days and yeah. also I've got a port salute in there so I've got a bunch of bee linens going on and I swear to God I have to change my clothes a lot when I yeah. take care of the cheese. I stink. 
Yeah, yeah you got to wash you got to wash your hands about three times, especially um because I wash them with my hands now. You, the wash is well, that what you do as well? Well, no, because my skin gets really reactive, so I actually use gloves and and oh, so I okay, special little brushes that I use for the um for the washes. Yeah. So yeah. I bought my little linens wash. It stinks, but it it's worth it. And it's I yeah. love the color. The flavor is just uh, out of this world. It, you would not think that a cheese that stinks that bad would taste so good. I know, that's right. And everybody loves it, so they don't have to know how smelly it is when it's being made. But my husband yeah. knows. But he loves it too. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I, when I first tasted my first um, wash rind cheese, it just blew me away. I think um, it was Tilsit because I'd never tasted one before I made it myself. So, yeah, it was really, really good. All right, I've got some. I've got some dogs barking at the door. Ruth, can you just um, okay? Sure, I one second. Dogs. I'll bring them in. Yeah. I've known Gavin through a lot of dogs. Come on, dogs. Come on. Do you want to say hello to Ruth? Here we are. Hey, That's Hamish. Oh, oh Hamish. <laughs> You know, look, look, Hamish. It's Ruth. He reminds me of Teddy. Oh, he's so cute. Yeah, Teddy was a beautiful boy. Oh, here, Bonnie. Come here. You know, those of us who have been with you for a while. Oh, oh. That's Bonnie. Look how much she's grown. Oh, she doesn't get down then. No, she's a puppy. Yeah, oh. she is still. She's got about, um, she's nearly 10 months old. So oh. she's nearly oh. an adult. So. Well, those of us who have been with you for a while, Gavin, we've been through a number of dogs. With yes, you. yes, we had. Um, if you've been with that long, it would have been Butch would have been there as well. I didn't know Butch. But yeah, I he was an Australian Silky Terrier cross before we had Holly. So, and then, yeah, you would have remembered Holly. She loves Edam cheese. Yeah, and, then, and Teddy as well, who's a Westie. And uh, yeah, and these two Westies. So yeah, we kind of like Westies now. Sweet dogs. I remember watching Holly on the taste test videos, and she was your assistant taster. Yes, yes, I remember that quite a few times when we were filming in the pool area. We got a little gazebo thing, and uh, yeah, she was um, she was eating the cheese. She loved it. So <laughs> don't give them too much though, because <clears throat> excuse me. Don't give them too much because they are um, lactose intolerant. They don't like yeah. it that much. Our dog loves cheese. We only have one left, too. We lost one during the pandemic. Oh, sorry to hear. Yeah, you know how it is. But you yeah. know, it's, the, it's the price of loving. That's what I always say. Indeed. So, and dogs don't live as long as we do, so it's kind mm. of part of the deal. Yeah. The, um, somebody asked me uh, a while back, what's the worst day? of a dog owner's life and it's the day the dog passes away you it's know true. so it the, all the other days are joyful they just are it's yeah. true and our we only have one dog left now and the one that died they were litter mates so they were in the womb together yeah and they were together for every minute until the first one died and the other one the one we have left her name is um her name is Angel, and she, she cries. Yeah. She's just inconsolable, and um, we understand how she feels, but we mm. so now we can't leave her alone anymore. Because yeah. She's, she can't stand it. Yeah. Well, the, the, these two dogs are the kind of the the same. They're they're um, they're brother and sister, half brother and half sister, and yeah, they've been together. Well. Hamish since Holly passed and he was really sad, but so were we, of course. Um, but um, yeah, so they, they because of their because we got them both during the pandemic, we've never left them per mm -hmm. se. So we can't leave them. We don't leave them alone. So I know, and cheese always helps. But yeah, yeah like, too much. can't it have too much. Different. It does, have doesn't different. it? I have so some. Do you use, 
So do you, Ruth, can I just ask you around, about therapy and cheese? Sure. So do you use cheese making analogies during your therapy sessions? I do. I do. <laughs> and I'll be honest with you you know I'm an old lady and when you're old you can make your own rules I give cheese to my clients yeah I give them cheese because I I tell them it's of the treatment <laughs> and everybody loves it and and so I do you making metaphors all the time and I write a blog and I use cheese metaphors in my blogs because it's really relevant. And with that long episode of neglect of my cheeses, mm. I use neglect metaphors both ways. Cheese metaphors to talk about neglect, neglect metaphors to talk about cheese. And absolutely. And, you know, I... Yeah, I do. And when you get old like me, you can make your own rules. And it yeah, people get better. Yeah, that's right. And it help. It must help in the healing process as well. I'm sure it does. And yeah. I don't know. It's probably something in my own head, but I think something that I make that gets into their body is good for them. It's kind yeah. of like part of the healing process. And people most. Most people love it. Some people are a little skittish about it, but most people just love it. Yeah. I uh, dare say you probably got many repeat patients as well. I do. And, you know, <laughs> the thing about trauma is it takes a long time to get better. Mm. So people are with me for a while. So we kind of, you know, we, we get used to each other. And yeah, absolutely. And I do yeah. have people that come back who, you know, finish and then they come back at a different life stage. Maybe somebody dies or somebody retires and they need to come back. Yeah. So, yeah, that does happen. Yeah. Well, that yeah, the, one of the reasons I ask that question is because I do read all of your blog posts. You do? Yes, I do. And they are very informative. They have, yeah, yeah. Oh, don't worry about that because it, it it's part of life, trauma and and uh, you know, loss and grieving and all that sort of stuff. Not so much. I don't read so much about the sex therapy part, but mm -hmm. you know, the, the trauma stuff. I certainly do. But you know, it's um, it's so interesting. It's uh, and I love the way that you you do use those cheese analogies of of your hobby and compare it to certain things in in people's lives. So you know, it's really good. Cheese is a living thing. So there's a lot of there are a lot of ways that it is like we are. Mm. And it also I feel so connected to goats and cows, even though I don't have any. I'm I when I heard Jennifer's interview, I thought, oh, she has two cows. That is so awesome. Yeah. And, um, Gianna, what is that woman's name who wrote Gianna Clus Caldwell? Yeah, she has videos about her goats and I love yeah. love those little goats they're so cute so um yeah i do use those metaphors and i and we're we're all just mammals living in the world and yeah Jesus, no that's fantastic um i so, wanted to say one thing because it yes. might be of interest to people and it's certainly um kind of a fondness that i have and the one and only um live cheese making workshop I ever took and it wasn't very good and I didn't really like it but one thing I learned that was so bad was I learned how to make ricotta out of nothing but whey right yes which is you've got the wheat and you let it after you take out the the curd and you put it in the press then you've got the whey and you heat it up really really hot and mm. you as it um as builds this cap on the top way of this thick layer of white cap and yeah. it starts the heat just starts to build 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 and if you'll forgive me since i'm a sex therapist with a filthy mind it builds <laughs> up and it looks like the um 
the way is starting to have its little climax and it bursts through. And when it bursts through, you put the lid on. And then in the morning, when you come out, you've got this pot of ricotta. Yeah. And there's nothing in it but whey. So it's this wonderful way to use your whey and you get this big amount of ricotta. So what I discovered is all these wonderful things you can make with ricotta. So I make ricotta scones and ricotta oh, nice. blondies and ricotta cookies and all wonderful baked goods with ricotta. And I've got this abund I've got this ricotta factory. And and then if you're really ambitious, after you take the ricotta off, you still have a pot of liquid left, yeah, which yeah. I call the Ways Way, and I use it to make bread or bagels. And if you really want to go all the way, way yeah. if you really want to go all the way, um, bagels are boiled. So all right. I use the Ways Way for the liquid in the bagels, and I boil the bagels in the liquid. And so you've got this one way. It's really cool. Uh, I tell you what, you, you should write that video that I've been promising to make for so long and that the 14 ways with way, you should make it. But I would call, <laughs> Gavin, I would call it 50 shades of way. Ah, very good. Very good. You're so cheeky. Uh, but I only use it. I only make ricotta. That's yeah. the only thing I know how to make with whey. That's why I've been for you to make that video, but I don't know if you ever will. You've got too many other ones to make. Yeah, look, I um, I, I, I have a procrastination problem when doing scripted videos. So I'm more of a free-flowing sort of guy, as you know from the videos that I make. I don't have a script for any of my videos. I, I might have bullet points that I want to... Uh, I want to achieve during the video, but I don't script. I don't read a teleprompter. I don't script that, which is probably part of, I don't know, part of my success and maybe part of my downfall that I haven't hit a million subscribers or anything, but I don't care about that stuff. It's about you the will have a million in a minute, Gavin. You will have a million. You reckon? Are you going to tell everybody, tell everybody, tell everybody. I, have I, I read, you I haven't reached years and you thousands and thousands and thousands and now you've got how many channels do you have oh uh, we've got four four channels but so the podcast one we got the gavin and kim one we got the little green workshops one i think that's it and this of course so that's four yeah well that's pretty awesome so gavin you have to ask me the question what is your favorite cheese to eat all right ruth what is your favorite cheese to eat? Okay, this is this is my answer. All the cheeses. <laughs> because I've heard you say it a million times. Yeah, I get it asked a million times too. Yeah, I was going to just say back what you always say because I feel like I can't pick a favorite. Although I will admit this is my craziness that during that time um, of neglect, all my cheeses got so moldy and the rope 40 was everywhere. So everything yeah. had all this unwanted mold and um, lots of unwanted rope 40 that was all over everything. And I have to admit, I love that stuff. Mm. I love the moldy, un unwanted mold they're stinky and slimy. I love that. So, um, you know, my husband would cut it off and I'd say, oh, save it for me. And I would eat it because I, I love it. So yeah. that's a little bit crazy, but I do like that stuff. And it it, it'd, make a, it'd make a great, and some of the blue mold cheeses that I've made that are run away with themselves, as you know, and they go really runny. If you neglect them, yeah, I've done that. Um, yeah. They make the best blue cheese sauce because oh. they're just so flavoursome, you know, for meat or over potatoes or, you know, any of that sort of stuff. On cauliflower, oh, it was beautiful. Oh. So, 
That sounds good. That sounds yeah. good. Now, Ruth, do you have any – we're nearly – we've got six minutes to go. Um, do you have any words of encouragement or tips that you can give new cheesemakers? Um, and what's your favourite resources on the web for cheesemakers besides mine? You can say mine if you want. but well, I don't have any others, Gavin. You are the guy. And uh. actually, um, I do like um, cheese history. Oh, Julia's great, isn't she? Julia, that one's fun, but most just stick with your channel. And, I mean, now you've got lots of videos, but before, when I first started, I was watching over and over again the same ones. That's where I got all those views from, Ruth, obviously. <laughs> it was you. I always liked, but... Um, so you're you're the guy you're my one and only on um on youtube um and my so my advice to to beginners is a couple of things i would say stick with gavin and also the um curd nerd academy was really helpful oh good also, good so because i was able to have it you know I, once you get it you can keep it and watch i like to watch things over and over again so um, I recommend that, that. And also just go ahead and fail and fail and fail and fail until you stop failing and start succeeding. Because like I said, 60% failure rate. Mm. That's a lot of failure. And it helps to have to be married to an angel and he ate all my mistakes with me. Um, but we ate all the mistakes. And don't be afraid. I, my first boyfriend was a photographer, and in, this was in the in the Stone Age when we worked with film, not, yeah. with, um, not with digital. And he, his teacher in graduate school said, "Don't be afraid to waste film." And so, as many shots as you have to take until you get it right. And I that would be my advice with the cheese: mm. make it as many times as you have to to get it right and eventually it starts working and then it starts working most of the time and now it mostly does yeah and when it doesn't i know i can ask the cheese man thanks uh, so, i tell you what you you yes. ruth you ruth are my therapy i tell oh. you that, that is that is so nice as i always say to my husband what a great arrangement <laughs> no it works it's a perfect give and take because you're my cheese making guru and if i can help you in some way that makes me happy and thank you to all the world curd nerds for keeping me company in this crazy couple of years of pandemic which is not over so mm. please stay well don't get sick keep on making cheese and keep on showing up yeah definitely Great advice. thank you so much and one other thing I request before my time ends, anytime we get to see Kim on camera makes me yeah. happy. Yes, it, it so does. Beautiful. She, she looks is so lovely. Beautiful. I saw her the other day when we did the test, and she looks great. So everyone who went through her sickness with her would want to see how beautiful and how thick and gorgeous her hair is. and. Come on out, Kim. Uh, she she's not in the room. She's hiding with it. She's probably watching. She said she was going to okay. keep a track of us. Okay. So um, yeah, well, if she wants to chime you. in the comments, <laughs> okay. but uh, yeah, but uh, I will make sure she gets on camera more often, Ruth. That would be great. That would be great. Thanks, everybody, and thank you, Gavin. Thank you, Ruth. You've been a treasure. Right. You are truly an amazing person. Thank you, Ruth. You too, Gavin. Thank you. All right. Bye. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Oh, that was such an amazing interview. <laughs> Ruth is such a character. I just love her. So um, let me just uh, change back to my other audience. There we go. That should still be working. All righty. So the next session we've got, and once again, thank you so much, Ruth. I'll give you a wave. She's still sitting in the green room. She can't go away, I can tell. <laughs> uh, it's just, just amazing. But, yeah, so many people, as you can see, 
Uh, Tutu says that uh, Ruth is amazing and uh, I, I totally agree. Great. Thank you, Ruth. All right, so let's move on to the next session because um, I need to get a coffee, I think. And um, let, let, me, let me just queue it up and uh, it will be. Let me just check my schedule. So the next session, this is another begin beginner's cheesemaking session and this is talking, we've got a few topics. This is about calculating milk fat, uh, how to make a cheese called Guido's hard Italian cheese, which is only ripe. It's ripe in three weeks. Um, and how to make, uh, I'll get this right, uh, uh, Maltese pepper cheese. There you go. Jabenet Talbazar. And uh, a quick plug um, for uh, Cameo, my Cameo uh, spot, where I can send you some lovely messages and I include a lovely message in there. So let's move on to the beginner's cheese making session number two. And I will see you live on the other side of that. What time is it? Yes, for a, uh, a, a live cheese taste testing of smoked cheese and a Q&A. So um, let me just cue this up. Well, g'day, curd nerds. Welcome to another cheese making video tutorial. This one is about Pearson's square or the Pearson square. It is used to calculate fat content uh, in your milk for cheese making. Have you ever wondered how to get the right percentage of fat that is stated in a cheese making recipe? Not everybody has the same standardized milk fat content uh, in their pasteurized milk uh, that you buy from the store. So let me just show you a way on how to calculate uh, by either adding cream or adding skim milk to the standardized milk that you've got. Now, it's a very well-known technique, and it's called Pearson Square. Uh, and it's a way to quickly calculate a target milk fat for cheese making. So let me just uh, pop over to the Cheese Science Toolkit, and I'll show you how to do the calculation. So uh, here we are over on uh, Cheese Science uh, Toolkit. This is an easy way for standardization. Here's the calculation up here uh, for standardizing milk. So in the top corner, there's a calculator down below here. Uh, and uh, I will share the link in the video, in the video description down below. Uh, but the percentage of fat of the milk and the percentage of fat of the skim milk or cream, you can add, you can change this to cream if you like. Uh, and that gives you a calculation. Uh, but in the middle, you put in the percentage fat you want uh, for the resultant milk. Um, okay, so let me do some examples. So down here in the calculator, uh, it's got percentage fat in milk, percentage fat in skim. It should also have percentage fat in cream. You should be able to change that because... Uh, you can use it for cream and increasing the fat content of your milk as well. So let's say we want to make Parmesan and we want a 2% fat milk. Now, here in Australia, you can't get 2% fat milk. Uh, it is nigh on impossible. So let's plug in some figures and see what we get. So I want 2% fat, so 2.0 down here. That's the required fat content of the cream. So up here in percentage fat milk, so standardized milk in Australia is 3.4% usually. Uh, and the, um, the, the skim milk depends. You can get either 1% uh, skim milk or you can get 0.1%, which is a lot more extremer. So it doesn't matter what system of calculation you use. See, this could be pounds, this can be kilograms of milk, 
This can be liters of milk. This can be gallons of milk. So this pounds is a bit of a furphy. That's an Australian term for something that's not quite right. Um, so I put in 10. So that's going to signify 10 liters. Uh, or actually in the Parmesan recipe, it was 14 liters of milk. I wanted 14 liters. I put in 14 liters of milk. Um, so what I will need to add, so in whole milk, uh, which is the 3.4% up here, uh, down here, I would need 8.1 liters and the skim milk, I would need 5.9 liters. And that would give me my 14 liters at 2% fat. So great little calculation. All right, let's say a recipe calls for 3.8%. Uh, or no, let's do better than that. Let's go Jersey milk, which is 5%. And you haven't got Jersey milk. All you've got is this standardized milk. In fact, you're living in Canada and they have a standardized milk of uh, 3.25. Now, we want to get up to that. Uh, at the moment, it doesn't make any sense. And we've got a 10-litre recipe, so we'll change that to 10 down here. Uh, so I'm going to add cream. Now, the cream I've got is pure cream, and it's 35% fat. Okay, so what I would have to do to get a 10-litre batch at 5% fat, you want to high, you know, for a recipe that asks for Jersey milk or, a, or an Alpine-style cheese, then we would need... 9.4 uh, 9.4 litres and uh, 0.6 litres, which is 600 millilitres. Uh, so that's what you will combine together to get 5%. So that's amazing. One last calculation. So I buy milk, which is called Ingle Nook Dairy. It's pasteurised, unhomogenised. Uh, and that milk uh, is 3.6%. Recently, I wanted a fat content of 4.8 for a, uh, a Gruyere that I was making. So I wanted it just a little bit less than Jersey milk. Uh, and the, the cream that I had was 35%. So what I had to do, uh, actually it was 3.8. Sorry, totally wrong there. 3.8% milk fat in my whole milk. And I had 35% fat in my cream. So let's plug those figures in. So I've got 3.8 here. I've got a required fat content of 4.8 and I've got cream, just ignore this skim bit, cream at 35%. I wanted a total of 10 litres. So I would have to put in 9.7 litres of whole milk or the 3.8% fat milk and 0.3% skim milk. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, as it says down here, this method could be used to calculate how much cream you need to add to milk for cheeses with higher fat milks. Uh, in fact, Pearson Square, the Pearson Square method isn't just for dairy-related calculations. It can be used to calculate components of any mixture while making spirit fortification, animal feed, to name a few. So that's Pearson Square. You can find it over at the Cheese Science Toolkit. Uh, you just need to go to the link that I'm going to put into the description down below uh, or on the screen right now. So hopefully that's been helpful for those of you who want to change the fat content uh, of your milk. Now, uh, if you wanted to find out if you had milk at home and you wanted to find out how what the fat content was, uh, you would need a tool to do that. So there's a couple of tests. There's a Babcock test, uh, which you can get a testing instrument for. Uh, but most of the dairy companies these days, or a fair lot of them, use a thing called a FOSS Milko scan, which is a device, big machine, that you put uh, a little sample of milk into. And it not only tells you the fat content, it tells you the uh, protein content tells you whether it's got any urea in it, which is urine, or urea is part from urine to make sure it's not contaminated. It tells you a whole bunch of things. Uh, so it's called Milko Scan. It's very expensive. Uh, only a proper proper dairy could um, uh, afford one. So uh, yeah, calculating milk fat for 
uh, cheese making uh, when you know the fat content uh, of the items that you're going to put in. So I'm going to be doing a series of these curd nerds, not only stuff from uh, the uh, cheese science toolkit, but lots of other stuff. So things like uh, ways with whey, so things to do with whey um, after you've finished cheese making. And also I've got another one coming up called the good, the bad and the ugly, what mold is safe to eat? Um, so that'll be interesting. I'm doing research on that now. Now, if you want me to make more of these technical style videos, please leave a comment down below. Uh, let me know if you found it informative. And uh, if you enjoyed it, uh, give it a little thumbs up. Give it a like. That would be lovely. Thanks for watching, Curd Nerds. And I'll see you in the next cheese making video. See you later. Bye. Well, g'day, curd nerds. Today we're making a cheese uh, that's from uh, Ricky Carroll's home cheese making book, third edition. Uh, it's called Guido's Hard Italian Cheese. So Guido's cheese is a very simple Italian cheese. Let me just read a little bit about it. So in the book, it's on page 146. So that's good to always have more than one edition, of course. So Guido lives in, well, I don't know if he still does, but he lives in Collingdale, Pennsylvania, and his full name is Guido oh, Giantini. Hopefully I said that right. Uh, and a little bit of a spiel that says, when Guido and his American wife, Margot, uh, moved from Italy to Pennsylvania in 1999, he discovered to his dismay that it was hard to find good Italian cheese that tasted the way it did in his home in Florence. He decided to make his own. Um, so this recipe is based on the recipe that's in the book, which is a, a very simple recipe. However, there is a better one uh, that's been transcribed and kind of updated. I printed it off. It's from um, the Learn to Make Cheese Facebook page, which I'm a member over there. Uh, of that group, really good interactive group. But yeah, it's, the recipe is in the files. It's called Guido's Hard Italian Cheese. Um, and it's kind of in uh, metric and some of the uh, instructions in the Ricky Carroll's book are a little bit um, uh, difficult to understand. So uh, they've made it simple. And so I've used this, changed a little bit of the weights for pressing and some of the brining time. So, um, yeah, there we go. So enough waffling. Let's get on and see how I made Guido's Hard Italian Cheese. So a big thank you to Inglenook Dairy for supplying the milk for this video. First of all, don't forget to sanitise all of your equipment. I bought all the stainless steel stuff and all the plastic stuff I sprayed with white vinegar after pouring boiling water on them. To make Guido's hard Italian cheese, you'll need 8 litres or 8 quarts of whole cow's milk, at least 3.25% fat, a quarter of a teaspoon of thermophilic B, that's ST and LB starter cultures, half a teaspoon or 2.5 millilitres of calcium chloride diluted in quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water, three quarters of a teaspoon or 3.75 millilitres of single strength liquid rennet diluted in quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water. I'm using IMCU 200 strength and an 18% brine solution. So pour all your milk into the pot and give it a good stir. If you need to whisk any cream in, this is the time to do it. Uh, that is floated at the top in the bottles. So heat your milk to 32 degrees Celsius or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. You can see there I've taken my milk from the stove top where I heated it up and put it into a water bath using a precision cooker to maintain the target temperature. Next we're going to add in the calcium chloride early in the make and just give that a good stir through. Calcium chloride is used to increase the calcium levels in the milk so you get a better curd set later on when you add the rennet. Give that a good stir through. 
Now we're going to add the thermophilic starter culture. I'm adding a quarter of a teaspoon there. However, the sachet uh, stated that you can use up to 10 litres of milk for one sachet of the thermophilic bee. Uh, this is a brand that I stock in our store from the culture cupboard. So we need to allow that to rehydrate so you can stir into the milk better. Just pop the lid on and wait for five minutes. So five minutes later, we stir the culture into the milk. Some of it hasn't rehydrated, but that won't matter. There's a lot of culture in there. So give that a good stir so it's mixed thoroughly through the milk. And just check the target temperature. If you're using a position cooker, it shouldn't change very much at all. So pop the lid on and we're going to allow that to ripen for the very a small time of 10 minutes. Not much acidification. So after the 10 minutes, we're going to give that a brief stir to put the cream back in. Remembering I'm using unhomogenized milk, cream lined milk. If you're using pasteurized homogenized milk, you probably won't need to stir it as often as I do. So once the cream's incorporated back into the milk again, it's time to add the rennet. So make sure that when you're pouring the rennet in, you're stirring the milk all the time. But then stir for no more than one minute because it works fast. So pop the lid back on. I'm going to allow that to set for 15 minutes because we're using a fair bit of rennet. Now check for a clean break. Now, I thought that was quite sloppy, that clean break there. So I decided to wait for another 10 minutes. Just to let it firm up a little bit. So we're going to check for a clean break once more. And that's a lot less sloppier. That looks much better. And we're going to cut the curds into 0 0.6 centimetre or 6 millimetre or a quarter of an inch columns. Now, I'm not cutting them uh, horizontally, just the vertical cuts at this stage because I can't get them that small. So there's a little bit of a trick. But first of all, we're going to allow the curds to heal a little bit uh, so they don't fracture when we stir them. We'll allow them to heal for five minutes. This is because the... Uh, coagulation time was uh, on the lighter side. So we're going to use a whisk now to stir the curds for 40 minutes whilst increasing the heat to 49 degrees Celsius or 120 Fahrenheit. I find that by turning the sous vide or the, the precision cooker to the temperature you want straight away, it takes about that amount of time for it to get to that temperature. So with the whisk, I'm just stabbing it up and down at the moment. And that's basically cutting the curds into the desired size. And just gently stirring. So I decided to stir for about 40 minutes to get to a very small curd size. So by the time we're finished, it's very small. They're about the size of a plumped, a plump cooked rice grain. Maybe a little bit bigger, but very small indeed. And you'll have a lot of whey left over. So just confirming that the temperature is correct. Very close to 49 degrees Celsius. Now you notice that the precision cooker set at 50 Rarely does it get to the exact temperature that's set on the precision cooker. Usually it's about one degree Celsius lower in the milk than it is set on the precision cooker. So I'm just removing all the heating that we need now. That's all over. 
Maybe I should have put the lid on so no water splashed into the way. But we pull the plug out now. So the water bath is no longer necessary during this cheese making process. So that's all drained away. Now the curds are fairly hot. Like I said, they're 49 degrees Celsius, which is probably a little bit hotter than you get out of the hot water tap in your home. Now just leaving that there for a second, and you can see that I've got a cheesecloth lined medium basket, uh, and we've lined that with a loose cheesecloth. So this is a medium to large basket. It takes about a kilo of or two pounds of curds. So I'm just stretching the cheesecloth there so there's no wrinkles in the side of the cheese once it's pressed. And then we take it over to the pressing area. I'm just spraying white vinegar on my hands there to avoid any yeast or molds, even though I did wash them with soapy water. So I'm going to fold over one side of the cloth and we're going to put the follower on top. And we're going to put it into the cheese press. This is a spring type cheese press. And the spring is rated at 50 pounds or 22.5 kilograms of pressure when using a basket with a diameter of between 150 and 170 millimeters across the top. You can see how I use this cheese press in this video in the info card. So I'm tightening down the screw, not all the way. You don't need maximum pressure straight away. So about 11 kilograms or 20 pounds of pressure for 15 minutes. That'll help drain some of the whey out and not entirely close up the rind of the cheese because you don't want it fully closed. At this early stage, all the cheese will retain too much moisture. So remove that from the press, turn the cheese and redress. Not quite fully closed rind at the moment. Pop it back into the mould, fold the cloth over again, pop the follower on top and press away. Now we're going to press at uh, 11 kilograms or 20 pounds for 15 minutes again. We'll have to do this pressing and flipping procedure for a few times to get the cheese to consolidate well. So remove from the press, turn and redress. The rind's starting to come together now. Pop it back in the mold put a bit of cloth over and press again. So same pressure, but this time for 30 minutes. So once again, remove from the press, turn the cheese, redress it again. And you can see the cheese is coming together very well. Fold the cloth over, pop the follower on top and press at the same pressure again, 11 kilograms or 20 pounds for one hour this time. So an hour later, remove from the press, turn and redress. And there's a good rind on the cheese now. Hasn't locked in too much moisture. We've had free flowing whey out of the basket during the entire pressing process. There's no cloudy whey. If you're pressing it too hard, it'll be cloudy. I'm going to press for 12 hours at the same pressure, 11 kilograms, 20 pounds. So 12 hours, all that can be overnight. So the next day, for me it was anyway, it was time to brine the cheese. So remove that from the press. Now be careful because we have pressed for a long time the cheesecloth may stick a little bit to the cheese. Gently pull it away and you won't have any issues. So I've got an 18% brine solution. You can see how to make this in the info card now. So plonk your cheese in there 
You don't need this fancy little bowl that I've got. Any plastic container will do. If you've got some cheese floating, just sprinkle a little layer of salt over the top. So I'm going to brine that for 12 hours, which is quite a long time. It's going to be a, a salty sort of cheese. So 12 hours later, we're going to remove it from the brine and place it onto a drying mat. Now, I did turn it once during the 12-hour brining session just to make sure it had even salt absorption. So, using some paper towel, just uh, dry off the brine and we're going to allow it to air dry for three days and I'm going to turn it twice daily. This is because I'm vacuum packing the cheese. If you're not vacuum packing the cheese and want to form a natural rind, you can pop it straight back into the ripening box and ripen it at the target temperature you'll see in a minute. So the post brine weight is 900 grams or two pounds, which is a fairly good yield for using only eight liters of milk. So after about three days it was, it took to air dry for mine, I'm going to vacuum pack the cheese. I'm just using a Food Saver brand by Sunbeam, uh, no affiliation or anything. I'm double sealing it. Uh, I find that sometimes a little bit of air seeps into the bag. So vacuum that. It's not moist, so you can vacuum it as fast as you want. And once again, I'm double sealing it again. So I'm going to pop that into the cheese fridge after I've written on it. I've got to figure out how long for. So ripen at 13 degrees Celsius or 55 Fahrenheit for three weeks in your cheese fridge. Don't forget to turn it at least twice a week. Anyway, back to Gav. So there you have it. That was how you make Guido's hard Italian cheese. Uh, there's two versions, well, two aging alternatives uh, on the recipe from the uh, Learn to Make Cheese website. And one is a natural aged rind. Now, I found that the, it's a very small cheese. Uh, so if we naturally age this, it's going to tend to dry out really quickly. Um, but what I did was vacuum pack it. So I let it air dry for about three days, um, as you've seen in the video. And now I vacuum packed it. And in three weeks it is going to be ready uh, to eat. So how good is that? A nice three-week of uh, three week table cheese. And, um, yeah, so I am going to do a taste test in three weeks' time, and we're going to try the Guido's Hard Italian Cheese. I dare say, look, from the cheese-making experience, it was very simple. <clears throat> and um, there weren't too many steps, not a long ripening time. Uh, and yeah, it's 100% cow's milk and yeah, really good cheese. So uh, we will find out what it tastes like uh, in the taste test in three weeks time. Well, g'day curd nerds. Today we're going to be tasting Guido's hard Italian cheese. Now I made this cheese in early February, 2022. It's now 19th of March, 2022. So it has aged a little bit longer but to slow down the aging process, what I did, because I kind of wanted to taste it around the three to four week mark, I had had it in the kitchen fridge. So that slowed down the ripening process. If I had to have left it at 13 degrees Celsius in my cheese cave, then it would have continued to ripen and mature a little bit longer. Now, with, because this is a hard Italian cheese, there's no issue with this being aged longer, you could age it up to six months, 12 months, no big problem. The flavor profile, however, will change dramatically as it ages. Anyway, without further ado, let's cut it open and have a taste. So there's no um, moisture inside the bag, which is fantastic. I opted to vacuum pack this. You can do a natural rind. But this is a fairly dry cheese, no moisture in the bag whatsoever. Uh, so it didn't leak any way, so that's fine. 
uh, it's a good sign, actually. As far as smell goes, ooh, it smells very nutty, actually, which is really good. It's very firm, very firm indeed. Not to the point where it's dry, uh, but yeah. Anyway, so let's cut into it. Oh, it's cutting very well. There's some slight, let's have a look. They're probably more mechanical than anything else, but some slight holes, but a really close knit paste. I think it's probably more mechanical than anything else. You can see the holes here and over here, but as far as smell goes, it smells sweet. So let's cut it into a quarter so we can taste it. Pop that over there. I know I'm a lefty. Right. Let's slice a bit off. Slices really well. It's not crumbly. It has an elastic sort of paste, uh, very similar to uh, a Swiss cheese or even a Gouda. Gouda. Yeah, two nice slices. Lovely indeed. Let's have three slices because you can never have enough cheese. <laughs> All righty. So let's, the one that's more finely sliced. Now, could you do other things with this? Could you grate it? Yes, of course you could. Uh, there would be no issues with grating this cheese for pasta or whatever in sauces, whatever you want. Nice quick cheese, but let's taste it. Proof is in the pudding. Oh, I like that a lot. That's less on the picante side of hard Italian cheeses and more on the nuttier flavour towards things like uh, Gruyere, Emmental, Leodama, that sort of thing, but without the, the super nutty flavour of uh, propion, when you add propionic bacteria, propionic shimani, which creates holes. Now, this cheese, because of the flexible paste, you could actually add some propionic shimani if you wanted to create some eye texture within it. I couldn't see that being an issue. If you want to do a little bit of a variation there, that would work. It's not overly salty, so it's not a real salty cheese. It's got a beautiful mild flavour. Mmm. I like this a lot. And I love the way the paste is elastic. By elastic, I mean that you can bend it. Oh, hang on, let's better example. Here's a big piece. You can bend it a fair bit without it cracking, as you can see there in the close-up. So I bent that nearly in half before it actually breaks. And it's starting to break now as I've folded it closely. So, yeah, nice. So there's no difference between the centre of the cheese flavour-wise um, as to the, the outside or the rind because, because it was vacuum-packed, there's no real distinction. It's just the same sort of flavour. There's no drying of the rind, you can't really see a distinct rind at all, even though I air dried it for a couple of days there before we vacuum packed it. But certainly no mold, um, really good, like I said, elastic paste and a very uh, subtle flavor, but it's it's nice for a, for a quick, uh, harder style cheese that's matured in three weeks. Like I said, it was ready in February, it's now March. Um, but like I said, for the last three weeks, I've had it in the kitchen fridge, so it wouldn't have developed in flavour any longer. No, any further is what I mean. Uh, but yeah, nice. Very tasty. Good table cheese. I would serve this on a platter. No problems at all. What I will do is um, I will vacuum pack these other two bits, so this half and this quarter, and I'll put them into the uh, cheese fridge uh, and they will mature further at a higher temperature. So what I'll do is, um, is open those up at uh, six months and 12 months respectively and do another taste test, see how much it compares, what it compares like. 
But um, as it stands, very nice little mild cheese. So, yeah, really good. Um, I don't think there's much more to say about Guido's hard Italian cheese, except that it was simple to make. Uh, the ingredients are readily available from cheese-making suppliers. And, yeah, what kit would I recommend? Um, at a buy range of kits at littlegreenworkshops.com.au, I would select the Italian cheese-making kit. So that would be a cheese kit that would be perfect to make um, the Guido's hard Italian cheese using the 8-litre recipe. So big thank you goes out to um, Learn to Make Cheese, which is a Facebook group that I got the recipe from. It's a winner as far as I'm concerned. And as a beginner's cheese, it's absolutely perfect. You wouldn't have any issues making this cheese and getting it to this state uh, to taste. Now, it probably could do with just an hour longer in the brine, maybe, but it does taste really nice. It's not, there's no bitterness whatsoever. Um, the culture that, I, culture that I used was a very simple uh, thermophilic culture. Uh, it's known as thermophilic B, if that makes sense to anybody, um, using a, a relative culture chart. But yeah, we have this in our store, uh, the culture for this one, and it's just simply called thermophilic mozzarella parmesan. So it is a thermo B style culture. So yeah, perfect for this style of cheese. Anyway, uh, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already subscribed, please do so, because over 90% of the views that I get on YouTube are from unsubscribed viewers. If you want to get notified of more content like this, uh, hitting the bell is the thing to do. For all good kits and uh, cheese making supplies, you can do no better than popping over to littlegreenworkshops.com.au. I've put a link in the description below for those who want to purchase anything to make Guido's hard Italian cheese. All right, well, thank you for watching, Curd Nerds, and I will see you next time. G'day, Curd Nerds. Today we're making Gabenyet Tal Bazaar. So Gabenyet Tal Bazaar is difficult to say or pronounce uh, if you're not Maltese, but fairly easy to make. Love a little cheese, and thank you very much to... Charlie Pace, who provided me with a recipe uh, based on his uh, experience and, well, him being Maltese as well. So uh, what I'll be doing uh, a little bit later on in the video is I'm going to be, well, brining, but there's no salt involved, uh, soaking in vinegar and, uh, and then coating in some uh, uh, freshly ground black pepper. Uh, and then you can eat them straight away, basically. But yeah, great little cheeses. Um, so let's get on and see how we make Gbenyet Tal Bazaar. I hope I got that right. So before we start, don't forget to sanitize your equipment. I'm just boiling everything there for about 15 minutes. And with the baskets, their dimensions are 80 millimetres by 80 millimetres or 3 inch by 3 inch. I'll sanitise those with white vinegar. So the ingredients for this cheese is 3 litres or 3 quarts of whole cow's milk, at least 3.25% fat, uh, 1 eighth of a teaspoon of calf lipase in quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water, prepared 20 minutes before use. A quarter of a teaspoon or 1.25 millilitres of calcium chloride diluted in quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water. Half a teaspoon or 2.5 mils of single strength rennet diluted in quarter of a cup of water. You'll need some cheese salt, some white vinegar and three tablespoons of black, black peppercorns. So heat your milk to 36 degrees Celsius or 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I preheated it on the stove first and then moved it over to my uh, sous vide or immersion cooker, what are they called? Precision cookers uh, with a water bath there. Just checking the temperature, see if it's close enough yet. And that'll do to start with. Uh, it needs to be at 36 though, but it'll get there. So we're going to add the lipase now. So just stir the milk and then pour that in. 
So lipase breaks down the fats uh, and speeds up a thing called lipolysis, uh, which uh, adds a bit of flavour into the cheese. Now, we're not using any starter cultures in this cheese. Traditionally, this would have been made with raw milk. But let that rest for 30 minutes. Make sure it's covered so no dust gets in it. Then once 30 minutes has elapsed, I'm just going to give it a quick stir. And then we're going to add the calcium chloride. Uh, if you're using pasteurized homogenized milk like I am, you absolutely need calcium chloride to get a better curd set. If you're using unhomogenized or raw milk, then you probably don't need the calcium chloride. So add in the rennet and then give that a stir for no more than one minute. So just cover that up and allow the curds to set for three hours. Yes, it needs to be three hours because we haven't got any starter culture in the milk. Okay, after three hours, we're going to check now for a clean break. check for a clean break Gav you can do it there we go and it looks pretty good you would think after three hours it'll be set anyway cut the curds into two centimeter or three quarters of an inch cubes so I'm just using my curd knife and then do it at 45 degree angle all the way around and then the other side as well Now the good thing is we don't have to stir this cheese. So we're just going to let that uh, the curds heal for 15 minutes. So set your baskets up on a bamboo mat on a chopping board and then ladle the curds into the baskets. So just scoop out a ladle at a time of the curds and make sure they're evenly distributed uh, through the baskets that you've got. So keep filling the baskets until all of the curds have been used. This does take some time. So I pulled out the plug because the pot started to float because I'd taken some of the curds out. Anyway, as it lowers, drains, then just top it up with another ladle worth of curds. Now this took about, about an hour. So still filling. Still draining. Another top up and another drain. Exciting stuff. Okay, that's the last of the curds. I just let that drain for about another 10 15 minutes and then we're going to move on to the next step. So we're going to place the baskets now into a ripening box. Make sure the ripening box has a mat in the bottom. So this is just a safe place for it to drain. Now we're going to pop the ripening box in the kitchen fridge to drain overnight and uh, leave it uncovered. So the next day we're going to remove the baskets from the box and there will be a fair bit of liquid underneath the mat. So we're going to drain that off now. So we're going to flip the cheeses and put them back in their baskets and drain for another 12 hours in the fridge uncovered.
There they go. Okay, so we're going to remove the cheese from the baskets now. They're fairly firm. Now, I had a bit of a debacle going on here. I really couldn't decide which plate to use. I ended up finding a rectangle one in the cupboard, and that seemed to fit the bill. So place them on a bamboo draining mat on a plate. Now, as you can see, I should have turned the bamboo mat around the other way, turned it by 90 degrees, and I wouldn't have had a problem. Not like that, Gav. Anyway, using a quarter of a teaspoon of salt per cheese, uh, sprinkle that over the top of each cheese. Now, because there's no lactic bacteria in this cheese, because I use pasteurized homogenized milk, probably doesn't matter if you use uh, iodized salt, but I'm uh, erring on the side of caution. So we're going to place that back in the fridge uh, for 12 hours so the salt absorbs. So after 12 hours, we're going to turn each cheese over. And there may be a bit of whey under the mat. So let's make a decision there and drain that off. Just cleaning up the plate and popping the cheeses back on now they've been turned over. So using quarter of a teaspoon per cheese, we're going to salt each top again. No need to rub or anything like that. And place them back in the fridge for another 12 hours so the salt absorbs. So keep the cheese in the fridge for 14 days and turn it every other day. These will help it dry out. It's fairly moist cheese. Now I did replace the bamboo mat with another one I'd sanitised, about seven day mark, uh, because the bamboo mat holds a lot of the moisture. So after the 14 days, place the cheese in a container or two, if you don't have any big ones. And then we're going to cover with white vinegar all the way. So I just pop the lid on the top of each container, keep any bugs out. I'm going to allow that to soak for four hours. So meanwhile, while you're waiting, uh, grind three tablespoons of black peppercorn. I'm just using a mortar and pestle there. Now you can use a dedicated coffee grinder or a, a pepper grinder, pepper mill, if you want to. But I find that this uh, is quite quick. It took me about five minutes to grind the pepper. And there it is. It's a fairly coarse grind, but a grind nonetheless. So once the four hours have elapsed for your vinegar soaking, to set everything up on your table, you'll need a plate. Let's move those out of the way. Just pour the ground pepper onto it, onto the plate and just shake it out. And give it a shimmy and spread it all over the plate. Get that out of the way so I don't bang it over. Alrighty. Where'd he go? Oh, there we are. Got the other plate again. Wrong way, Gav. That's the way you do it. Alrighty. So, we're going to remove the cheese from the vinegar. And just be careful. And while we're still damp, we're going to roll the cheese in the ground pepper. Make sure you've got a complete coverage on the cheese. Because you want it spicy. Now 
Okay, that should be enough. Don't you miss any bits? So I'm just putting that on a clean bamboo mat on the plate just to allow that to dry and hopefully the pepper will stick to it a bit better. And then I commence to do the rest of them. There we go, number three. Just do as best you can. Doesn't have to be perfect. And lucky last. So I let them rest for about 30 minutes so the pepper would stick before consuming. Anyway, back to Gav. So that's how you make Jebni Tal Bazaar, a lovely little Maltese cheese. So let's taste it, I suppose. I've never tasted cheese that has been soaked in vinegar. Anyway, let's have a look. So I'll take the biggest, fattest, plumpest one and pop it on a plate. Just get these out of the way. Oh, hang on. The, they have been dried out for about 30 minutes since I put the pepper on them. Now, the recipe does state that you can store them in a, a clean mason jar. Uh, I don't think you soak them in anything else. I think this is how it is. The instructions aren't any more specific. So if you know anything <laughs> more than uh, how to store... Uh, the uh, Jebneet uh, Tel Bazaar, then I would love to know. But because it's a fresh cheese uh, and it's been salted a little bit, then uh, I would be surprised if it would last probably more than two to three weeks tops. Um, but yeah, it's meant to be eaten fresh. So let's try the cheese. Just got a normal knife. I'm gonna take a little bit out of it. Quite soft being a soft cheese and remember that we didn't add any starter cultures to it uh, the only thing we added to it was lipase uh, and I used um, calf lipase so there it is there lovely looking little cheese it's soft creamy uh, not like cream cheese because we made it in a different way of course we drained it in little uh, in little baskets but I dare say she's going to be fairly peppery and uh, given my recent experience with the Belper cannoli <laughs> uh, I can only imagine what this tastes like it smells vinegary and peppery so if that's your thing then let's try mmm Very nice. Very nice indeed. Oh, I've got some pepper now. Oh, oh goodness me. Just a little bit. Mmm. <clears throat> it's got a nice flavour. The lipase has done something there. Help break down some of the fats. Um... Yeah, the very interesting taste. So it's not, um, uh, <clears throat> it doesn't taste cultured like a normal cheese. It's, it's more on the fresh side. The vinegar lends something to it. Quite nice, actually. <clears throat> it's the pepper. Uh, and the pepper, of course, always does what pepper does and burns your tongue. But there you have it. But yeah, lovely little cheese. Very nice indeed. Thank you, Charlie, for recommending it to me and for pro providing the recipe. Uh, I would have never have found it any other way, but let me just have this last piece. Yeah, four hours in the vinegar is just right. Wouldn't do it any other way. Now, I dare say, if I used raw goat or sheep or cow's milk, then it would be a bit different uh, and it would 
uh, have a more robust flavour. But I like it how it is. It's quite nice. So the peppery, vinegary, the cheese, uh, it's well, it's salted. You can taste just a little bit of salt there. So the salt's just right. But yeah, great all round cheese. I like it a lot. So I dare say if you've got any Maltese friends and they haven't been able to get their hands on uh, Jibenyit Tel Bazaar before or where you live, then make it for them and they will love you for it. I dare say, uh, seeing I've gone from a, an authentic sort of recipe, it is the real deal. So give it a go and you will surprise not only yourself, but your Maltese friends as well. Okay. Um, I can't really suggest a kit. Uh, you, I think just buying the individual ingredients would be fine. You know, like I said, there's only it's milk, lipase and salt. Uh, and obviously vinegar and pepper. Very simple little cheese to make. Just got to get your hands on some little baskets uh, to mould the cheese in. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't already subscribed, please do so, uh, and you'll get notified of uh, weekly cheesy video uploads. Well, thank you for watching, Curd Nerds. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, at Jebneet Tal Bazaar. I'll get it right in a minute. At Jebneet Tal Bazaar. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks for watching, Curd Nerds, and I'll see you next time. Well, g'day, Curd Nerds. Uh, this is a bit of a community announcement. I recently signed up for Cameo, and for those who don't know, Cameo is a service where you can for a small fee, ask me to do things like uh, shout outs for birthdays, for Father's Day, Mother's Day, Christmas, bar mitzvahs, you name it. Also, I've lately given a couple of pep talks. I've also done, even done a sleep story. Uh, somebody says they watch my videos to fall asleep. So I did a little, uh, not a lullaby, but a little story to help them go to sleep. Well, g'day, Dem, you curd nerd. I've just been told by Vincent that you like to fall asleep to my videos. So I'm going to read you a bedtime story. Uh, it's taken from my book, Keep Calm and Make Cheese. Anyway, snuggle down, nestle into your pillow, and here we go. I grew up on a dairy farm where my family managed about 120 milking cows, a couple of bulls and the odd sheep or two. We also kept chickens and ducks to provide us with fresh eggs. There were even a couple of pigs for meat. Milk was always in abundance, as you would expect on a dairy farm. And as a child, my brother and sister would and I would drink fresh raw milk by the bucketful. Dad would always extract cream from some of the milk so that my mother could make butter and drink the skimmed milk. With all this abundant milk, one would think you would naturally that we would make cheese. Alas, this was not the case. My parents did not make cheese in any form, not even yogurt. And we grew up thinking that processed cheese, which came wrapped in tin foil and packaged in a blue rectangular cardboard box, was what cheese was supposed to taste like. You didn't even need to refrigerate it. My dad used to call it soap suds, but being uninformed kids, we did not know if cheese got any better than that rectangular block. Anyway, Pleasant dreams. Good night, Dem, and have a lovely sleep. Bye bye. So, these shout outs are in the form of uh, a video message. Uh, there are also chat options if you want to ask me a question and you don't want to wait until Ask the Cheese Man uh, and it's a burning question, then you can pay a small, very small fee for a chat and I'll give you an answer, obviously. Uh, so, yeah. Any words of encouragement that you would like me to impart 
on either yourself or one of your loved ones, I'd love to help out. Uh, the link for my Cameo page is in the description below. Like I said, only a quick one, a uh, short community service, and uh, hopefully, uh, and like some people have already done, uh, have taken up the service. Anyway, thanks for watching, Curd Nerds, and I'll see you next time. Beyond the other, beyond gravel, beyond Okay. Oops, bit of an echo. There we go. All fixed. <laughs> Technology. Anyway, so no echo now. Um, thank you so much for watching those sessions. Uh, it was uh, a pleasure to bring to you. And I think a few people learnt some cheeses that they've never seen before. So that's really good. Okay. Um, this next session is going to be cheese <laughs> funny about that on 12 hours of cheese uh it is a live smoked cheese taste test uh but first of all i'm going to show you some footage uh that nobody has ever seen before so an exclusive an exclusive so this is how i smoked the cheese that i'm just about to taste for my lunch uh seeing it's a 12 uh, 12 p.m. here in in Melton, where I live, uh, lunchtime. So that's good. Um, okay, so Curd Nerds, here we go. Here is the cold smoking my cheese session. And then after we've done the taste test, or even during the taste test, it's going to be a live interactive session. I've got a laptop up on the table and I can see the chat so I can answer questions um, kind of as we go. We'll see how we swap between cameras. But anyway, over to uh, Gav for cold smoking my cheese. So g'day, curd nerds. Today, we're going to be smoking some cheese. Now, this is my first time. I must admit, I'm a bit of a newbie at this. So I'm going to try and give the best advice I have. If it doesn't work, then we'll figure it out as we go along. But hopefully... We're going to be cold smoking, not hot smoking, because hot smoking will melt your cheese. I'm going to be cold smoking my cheese in my barbecue hood. Now, this is the only real tool that I've got. I haven't got a cold smoker or anything flash like that. Just got my barbecue, and you can see that I've put foil everywhere to block up any holes that may be there. Fingers crossed. We'll figure that out as we go along as well. I've got a lovely selection of cheeses. I've got some stout cheddar got jalapeno cheddar um, I've got some double Gloucester which is five years old or over nearly six now yeah six years old maybe seven goodness me I can't remember uh, anyway and then we got some Guido's hard Italian cheese which is probably not so hard anyway so I've got a little rack set up here uh, in the barbecue held up by a couple of pieces of Cypress which is uh, non-treated so that's not going to affect the, the food any I've got a little cold smoker machine here, which I'm hoping will work. It starts off with a, a tea light, and then you take that out, and hopefully it produces enough smoke. But what I'll do now is I'll cut up some pieces of cheese that will be the right size. I'll probably use quarter of a uh, of a wheel. I've got three halves here and a quarter, so I'll use this quarter, and we'll do the other quarters. And that way I'll be able to test the smoky flavour versus the natural flavour of the cheese. Anyway, so bear with me as I set this all this up and we'll get going. So firstly, the uh, stout cheddar. And they're all fairly dry inside. There's hardly any moisture in the bags. Pop that up there for a sec. Let's cut off a quarter. Oh, cut so good. A little bit crumbly. Look at that. Pretty good. So I'll pop that on the smoker. Out of the way. There we go. First piece of cheese. And we'll store that one away for prosperity. Oh, doggos will love that. Mm. And this one's the Guido's. That 
one's not crumbly. A little bit of eye development. It's nice. Really good. So I'll pop that up there too. So smoked weedos. Right. This one's the jalapeno cheddar. Smells all right. Let's do a quarter of that. About a quarter, that's that much. This is probably really crumbly. It's very old. Yeah, and you can see the lines. A little bit moist, but that'll help. Right, so I'll pop that up there. What's it taste like? Mmm. Oh. That's so good. And then last but not least, the double Gloucester. Oh, it smells so good. Well, let's just have a sneaky taste test. So we've got our four cheeses there, as you can see. As I mentioned before, we'll go this way. So we've got the jalapeno cheddar there, we've got the guidos there, we've got the stout cheddar there, and we've got the double Gloucester there. You know, really, I think the key to this, to getting a good smoked cheese, will be having amazing cheese to start with, and they all taste absolutely fantastic. Now that they've been aged a long time, <laughs> They are really, really nice. Anyway, so let's start up the smoker machine. Use a, uh, a tea light to start it up. So it says for 30 seconds until the smoke gets going. So I'll just put that out. Oh, no, that's no, good. So this wood is hickory. So I'm hoping this will give it a nice smoky flavor profile. And we'll go from there. Well, not a lot of smoke at the moment, but we'll see what happens. It's starting to catch. Right, so we're getting a fair bit of smoke now, which is good. It's just started to go brown, as you can see on the edge there. I'll just zoom in. It's on that corner there. That's definitely smouldering, which is what we want. And it says on the instructions for the cold smoker uh, that after 30 seconds or when it's started to produce enough smoke and you get a brown spot on top, that you should turn off the, uh, blow out the candle. So we'll do that in a sec. Now we've got some smouldering. All right, so candle's out. And it says put it underneath the thing you want to smoke. So... So now that that's going, and there's definitely embers in there, so it's making the, it's moving along the path of the, of the sawdust. Um, not a lot of smoke, but I'm hoping that once it's down, we leave it for a few hours. I'm going to look at it at two, uh, and then I'll check it at three to see if they've changed colour or anything like that. But pop the hood down now, and we'll go from there. Hopefully we're blocked up enough holes and there's enough smoke going into the cheese. So we'll see how that goes. So uh, two hours later, typical Melbourne weather. It is now raining. It was sunny as anything before. It's amazing how much the weather can change. And it's got about five degrees colder. So let's just have a quick look. No promises. We'll see what's going on. So we've got a little bit of a colour change, which is good. I can see that on the cheese. <coughs> Just turn it over. Oh, look at that. There you go. Tastes 
It's actually melted part of that cheese there. So it's actually too hot. So let's just, that's not good. Move that over to here. <laughs> and well, at least it's working, but that's not a good sign that it's just melted the cheese. So way too hot. But still a lot of smoky flavour in there, so let's just cover that back up and probably have to let it burn uh, for another, well, at least another four hours. So we'll, we'll let it go and we'll see what happens. Well, Curd Nerds, it's been another two hours of smoking, so I'm going to have a quick look and hopefully we're finished now. So let's, it's just started to rain. So hopefully the noise isn't going to be too bad. So I'm still smoking. Get a bit of colour on the cheese, which is good. That cheese that was, um, you know, melted has firmed up a bit. But uh, yeah, looking not too bad at all. I might put it back underneath. But move the cheese away from where the smoke is so we don't get any of that burning so look at the other ones here yeah, they're starting to change color a bit which is good so i'll just move that out the way so it doesn't get hot cool so what i'll do i'll leave it in for another two hours uh so to that so that'll be a total of six hours smoking and then it will go from there Well, Curd Nerds, it's been six hours in the smoker now. I think that'll be enough. It, you know, the, the minuscule amount of smoke that this thing was creating, uh, I think we've, we've got some smoky flavour in the cheese. Now, I've been told that you need to wrap in cling wrap or sarin wrap for seven days and keep it in the, in the kitchen fridge at four degrees Celsius for the smoky flavours or the carbon to infuse into the cheese. So we'll do that. And then in uh, a few days' time, uh, probably not seven, but in a few days' time, I will do a taste test for these cheeses, comparing them with the standard cheeses that I cut the other, the leftover bits of the cheese. So that should be interesting. Anyway, let's get on and uh, put these cheeses and uh, put them in wrap. Nice. Very good. So we've got a little bit more, I know that's all melted. So we've got the, they've dried out a fair bit. They have changed color, which is good. So I'll just put them over here. These ones a little bit too much because I think it little got a little bit too hot there. But I think we've got some smoky flavor. There's no way that I'm gonna be able to stop this without tipping it out. So I'll just move that out the way. Move my bits of wood and just tip it out and hopefully stop it from smouldering. I don't think I'll be able to save any of the, save any of the, um, the wood. Maybe it should have been like that. There's more smoke there. Um, scissors, that'll do. Let's move that away from the rest of the wood and ash. Still a fair bit of wood there, so I'll bag that up. Tomorrow, after this all stops smoking. There we go. So there we have it. There's our smoked stout cheddar, our smoked double Gloucester, our smoked jalapeno cheddar, and our smoked guidos. I'm very excited that in the next few days, we're going to taste all of these wonderful cheeses. Oh, that doesn't look good, does it? Let's um, just fix that up. Hang on.
Okay, we have some technical difficulties on the other camera. Let me just please bear with me while I, I fix this up. Uh, okay, so how do I fix this? Yay, thank goodness for that. Um, can somebody give me a thumbs up if they can hear the audio okay? Okay, let's have a look. Yeah, it looks rightio. Looks like it's working. Let's move over to studio number two. Let me just uh, get this beast all set up. There we go. All good. Right. Everybody's saying it's good. I have a laptop here. I believe you can still, you can see part of it there. Of course, I can see all the chat. So thank you, Annette. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Jim, Jim says he can't see the audio, but the cheese looks good. Wendy. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. So this is what you've been waiting for since the um, uh, the smoked video two seconds ago. Uh, so I am going to taste, what I'm going to do is I'm going to taste the original cheese. So like, for example, the uh, stout cheddar, I've got a piece of that still, and I've got the smoked version. So I want to compare the two and see if there's a different depth of flavor uh, and that sort of stuff. And I'll do the same with the guidos. I've got um, two of those um, and the jalapeno cheddar. And unfortunately, I don't have any more smoked double Gloucester. This is the one that's uh, six and a half, seven years old. I've only, I smoked the whole bit that I had left. I didn't have any more. So uh, we'll go from there. So let's first cab off the rank is the stout cheddar. I'll have to keep these with the bags. So there may be a bit of a mess as we go through, but it should be all right. Let's have a look. Now, um, I did have them in, I've only kept them in cling wrap. I didn't re pack these pieces. I will do that after the show. So this is the stout cheddar. Um, let's just carve a piece off. Which knife? So many cheese knives. You've seen all these. This was a gift. For a while, so I've got a cheese, uh, what do they call that shaver thing. This is for um, softer European cheeses, uh, and I've got two hard cheese knives. I think this might not be hard, but anyway, we'll see. Um, let's uh, just uh, oh, it's very crumbly. All righty, so that is the um, the stout cheddar. Hopefully, you can see. Get that out of the way. The stout cheddar is very crumbly. Let me just try this. So this is about two years old. Oh, so good. Oh, what do I need? Paper towel. My messy fingers. So there's no bitterness there. Well-aged, deep-flavoured cheddar cheese. Um, on the stronger side, so probably more like a vintage. Oh, yeah, and there's the aftertaste of the stout, the Guinness. Oh, very nice indeed. Mm. So let's put that aside. Let's just try a bit. I've got some plain crackers here. We've got everything today. Um, somebody had... A question, do you smoke the hard cheeses longer? Um, no, I didn't. Well, I did them all for six hours. So, uh, but these are all hard cheeses. So I suppose the question is, yes. <laughs> uh, if you've got softer cheeses, um, like Havarti or Budakeza, if you wanted to smoke those, I would smoke them lot, uh, less because they're high moisture. Anyway, let's just try this one. Mm. Better with a cracker. Mm. Very nice. Mm. So that's the stout cheddar, unsmoked. Let's 
Sorry if there's any mouth noises, but I can't edit them out because it's live. Now, the stout cheddar is the one that you saw in the video. It melted a little bit um, just because I had it too close to the smoke. Now, the smoke, oh, oh my goodness. Oh, that is so smoky, if that makes any sense. Of course it does. All right, put that over there. Right, so let's cut off a bit of the smoked version. We'll go for that knife, because I can. Oh, even crumblier. And you can see that the smoke, this color is different than this, the, the unsmoked version on the inside. So I think I've got a fair whack of the smokiness there. Let me just try a sneaky. This is the really smoked bit. Oh, that one, that's the little bit of melted, but my goodness, that is amazing. That's like nothing I've ever tasted before. It's so good. Mm. The smokiness has come all the way through that. That is fabulous. It's a lot. Um, the cheese is softer on in the mouth than this. This was harder and sharper. The smoke gives it a bit of um, smoothness, if that makes sense. Yeah, a bit of smoothness to it. That's nice. Goodness me, I hope it can, um, hope it keeps for a while. So you can't really taste any of the stout anymore, which is surprising because it was so prevalent in the non, uh, sorry, the non-smoked version. You could really taste the stout. This one here, the smoke obviously takes over, but the, the, the fullness of the aged cheddar is there. It really delicious so good mm. i like it a lot right what did i do with the plastic right don't throw it away gaff because i need the labels on them for when i backpack so what i'll do I, I will backpack that and put it just in the kitchen fridge from now on all right so that's the smoked stout oh so good hang on this is my lunch by the way About the same with a cracker. Mm. All right, let me just get some water. I need to cleanse my palate. Right, two secs. Don't you just love live? I do. Righty-o, it's quick. Mm. That's delightful. Right, so that's cleansed the palate a little bit. Right, what are we going to try next? Let's try the Guidos, which you just saw the video for uh, not so long ago. So this is now aged. This is about three months old. I last tasted it when it was... Uh, three weeks old so we've got a little bit of age in it now let's see if the flavor has developed uh, more because when i last tasted it it was very mild it was a very mild cheese so let's which part that part and this one's not crumbly this one's firmer as you can see and it'll be interesting to see what the smoked version it has a the smoked version has a darker color so let's just cut a piece off and we'll just do the comparison that way so you can see the color is darker cutting a piece off and it hasn't made it crumbly the smoking yeah, you can definitely well you can tell by the rind anyway there's the outside let's just uh 
to a cracker comparison. More crackers from it. Right. That slab on that. So we'll try the unsmoked uh, version first. Mm. That has aged well. It's more, it's got a more complex flavour. Before it was quite young, fresh, milky, had a more milky flavour. This now tastes like a Alpine cheese. But without the nuttiness. So, hmm. Very nice indeed. I like a Guido's. That's good. Oh, I've got to eat the rest, don't I? All of these cheeses will be excellent on a hamburger. Yes, indeed. Um, the crumbly one, probably not so much, maybe, because it won't. Uh, it won't, well, it did melt, so yeah, it would melt, yeah, it probably would be. This Guido's melts really well. Okay, so from a mild cheese, let's try the smoked portion of the Guido's. Smell is amazing. Mmm. That is something special. That is really, really nice. So, yeah, I like that a lot. That has added another layer of flavour on top of what the already um, nice-tasting Guido already is. Yes, yeah, that's, that's very nice. Um, yeah, I like that a lot. That is really good. That's impressed me. Let's go without the cracker. The smoke hasn't penetrated all the way through because it's a harder cheese. It's, But it does have a fair bit of moisture in it. So, But the subtle, smoky flavour, that is really good. So if you want that something um, subtle, then try smoking the Guido's. Not a lot of penetration um, into that cheese. So that's really good. Put a piece of that over there. There we go. Clean up my board a bit. I think I'll put all these bits into a cheese sauce or something. That would be really good. All right, just a palate cleanser. Okay. So we've got the jalapeno cheddar now. I used fresh jalapenos when I made this. Um, there is no... The, the jalapenos didn't go rotten in the cheese. This is over two years old as well. So these are all the bits of cheese that I had in the back of the cheese fridge. Uh, well, not in the back, in the door, um, just hidden away. So let's grab a bit of, so let's get a bit of white stuff on the outside, which are uh, calcium lactate. Um, and, and that adds to the flavor of the cheese. So let's, this is the unsmoked version. This is really crumbly, this cheese. So it slices a little bit, but yeah, crumbly indeed. So we'll keep a piece of that. This is so good. Right. So keep that. And this is the, oh, the smoked one. Goodness me. Right. Half a cracker for you. Put you out the way. Oh, I broke the label. What are you doing, Gav? All right, so the smoked jalapeno, darker in colour again, as you would expect, having a bit of carbon on it. Oh, look at that. Look at that side there. Hopefully you can see now. I should be able to zoom in, but let's grab a pick. Oh, it's got a chunk of jalapeno in it too. There we go. Look at that. Nice. 
All right. So this wasn't a very fiery cheese. This wasn't that spicy. It had undertones of jalapeno. Let me just... Here's a piece with it in. Oh, that is crumbly and flavoursome. Little hint of chilli. But the overall cheese itself, it's aged so well. This one, again, is about two years old. So... Oh, yeah, and it's got crystals inside. That is beautiful. Oh, even without being smoked. This is one fabulous cheese. Right, so let's try. Oh, so good. A bit of the smoked version. You can see it's a lot darker, even on the other side. So the smoke has permeated in to the cheese quite a bit. Mm. That has taken it to a different level. Mm. Now I can taste a bit of the spiciness. Goodness me. I don't know what's going on there, but there is more chilli flavour in the smoked part than is in the non-smoked cheese. So... <clears throat> And I didn't need any more chilies, so it is bought out. Oh, goodness me. Can't stop eating it. So good. Oh, hope you're enjoying this as good as me, uh, as, as, well, as much as me. Not as good as me. Oh, so good. So that's the smoked uh, jalapeno cheddar. So good. So these aged cheeses have just, this and the stout cheddar have just absorbed that smoke flavour. And it's just, somebody said, Dennis has said, maybe the heat from smoking activated the chilli. Indeed, it could have done. I don't know the science behind it, but I don't care. It tastes really good. Oh yeah, that chilli is there now. Wasn't before, is now. So good. Oh, I love that. That is great. Just keep that. That's going to my cheese sauce. Now I'm going to definitely oh, have to clean the palate. Well, I'm going to clean the knife too for this very special last cheese. Uh, Fun Pants 94 says, what cheese has the chili? Uh, that was the jalapeno cheddar. So go and check out the video of that one. Okay. Uh, Chipotle is the smoked jalapenos. Jalapenos. So you kind of round about into that. Yeah, kind of. Um, all right. So this is the oldest cheese I've got in my cheese cave. It is. Uh, from what I figure out, between six and a half and seven years old. So it was on the side of the smoker that was deeply smoked, as you can see, very brownish. Remembering, though, that Double Gloucester has a deep um, yellow, slant orange colour to it anyway. Uh, so let's just cut into this beauty. This is crumbly as anything. Yeah, you can see straight away, she crumbles. There we go. So it has a deep orange uh, colour anyway. Let's get a bit more. And I did have a sneaky taste of this before we, um, uh, before I smoked it the other day, and it just was melting in the mouth. So that's the double Gloucester. So let's have a piece. So this is a piece that um, was in the inside. So it's not the skin, the skin, not the skin, the rind. So let's try this by itself. Oh, so smoky. Oh. You've got to age cheese for a long time to get this superb flavour 
this is just over the, I, and, uh, I don't know. I can't, I'm lost words, lost words, must eat cheese. I'm so proud of myself right now for having held off on eating this piece of double Gloucester until now. This is absolutely amazing. That is a beautiful cheese. Mm. I love it. Double Gloucester, the best, seven years old. You can't get any better than that. And smoked, the smoke flavour has given it even something more. But what is it about smoke? Oh, that is delicious. Well, let me get rid of that. That's so good. There's no more tea. That was my lunch. I better have another cracker. I've got to have some more double Gloucester. And this is, um, I mean, computer's gone to sleep for some reason. Come on, computer, wake up. There we go. Sorry, I can't see the comments. There we go. Jim says, I think any cheese left to age in the cave for more than two years will, uh, two or more years will only continue to get better and better. Indeed. Um, does smoking end the aging process? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't think it would. Um, and the reason I say that is because uh, Lisa over on um, uh, Cheese 52 channel smoked a cheese at the start of the aging process and smoked one at the end of the aging process. And she says she prefers the flavor of the cheese that was smoked before it started to mature. So um, I don't think it matters. So it doesn't end the aging process. Otherwise, that cheese that she smoked before she put it in the backpack wouldn't have aged. Uh, and it did. So. Mm. Mmm, so good. That is one lovely cheese. Double Gloucester, goodness me. The flavour is outstanding. Alrighty, so. What did I learn? Well, I learned that all cheese is beautiful. <laughs> but I knew that before. And I learned that there is a totally different flavor between non-smoked and smoked cheeses. I think if you ate too much of the smoked cheese, it'd become a little bit overpowering uh, on the palate because it's so dominant. Um, so I would only serve up a, a small bit of that on a cheese platter. I wouldn't serve four smoked cheeses on a cheese platter. You'd serve one, right? Because you want that, uh, you want different flavors on a cheese platter. Um, so I would serve up probably, what, an eighth? Yeah, an eighth of a wheel uh, on a cheese platter smoked cheese. Otherwise, it would become too overbearing. The Don't get me wrong, the flavour is beautiful. It is absolutely beautiful. I think I've outdone myself, and it is really nice. I think Kim will really like those. Uh, and I'll give her some um, after the show tonight. So cheese, that is. Keep your minds out of the gutter. Um, so... This, uh, like I said, very complex, deep uh, flavour and you couldn't eat a lot of it, I don't think, unless you really like smoked cheese. Uh, so fill your boots. Um, that'll do, I think. Uh, as far as uh, the che live cheese tasting goes, uh, let me just go back to my other camera and we'll have a little... Um, for a 20 minute Ask the Cheese Man session. So, excuse me for a second. There we go, back again. All righty. So, that was lovely. Um, isn't it nice having a studio this big that I can set up multiple cameras? Let me just take this off and turn it off. Don't need this extra microphone on. There we go. Should still be able to hear me. Okay. So that was delicious. Now, um, uh, Titus says that 
A drop of balsamic vinegar would round up the cheeses. I th yeah, it might do, actually. Uh, if you're eating a lot of smoked cheese, you probably would take a little bit out of it, um, out of the smokiness. So that would probably be very nice indeed. Um, somebody says, who's this? Big Shoe. Have you ever heard of pincotting, pinconning, pinconning? Uh, cheese is similar to cheddar, but I can't find any recipes. Yes, it is a Colby, actually, that is aged for uh, 12 months plus, and it gives it that really nice, deep flavour. Even though Colby starts off quite mild because it's a washed curd cheese, so it takes a lot of the acid out of the cheese, so it's a lot milder than what cheddar is, of course. But if you age Colby for a long time, you get, um, well, that style of cheese, pin conning, uh, so I'm told. So there you go. I have heard it. So just make a uh, Colby from one of my recipes and age it for a long time. Okay. Uh, what cheeses would I not smoke? Um, well, mold-ripened cheeses, of course. Uh, they just they wouldn't take the flavour. It wouldn't be uh, – it wouldn't – I don't think it would be okay – does, it, does that make sense? I don't think they would taste better. I think they'll probably taste worse, if that makes sense. So I, I've never heard of a smoked camembert, but maybe that's just me. But I don't think that would go very well with that flavour. Okay, uh, Wendy says, hello, Wendy, lovely to see you. Um, thank you, Gavin. I feel encouraged to give smoking a go now. Uh, they all looked wonderful. Yeah, I think the... Um, Thanks for that, Wendy. But I think the smoker itself, the one I had, the little box thing, it, look, it worked. If you can keep it fairly airtight, um, it worked well. But I had to keep, as you saw, I had to put the smoker underneath the cheese. And that's not always uh, conducive to good smoked cheese because the smoke has a bit of heat in it. You, you, it can tend to uh, melt the cheese. All the barbecue... Uh, things that I, all the barbecue YouTube channels that I saw where they smoked cheese, they tried to keep the smoke uh, as far away, um, far away from the cheese as possible, whereas I couldn't um, in, in, that, um, in that instance. So there is a tube that you can put smoke, uh, wood smoking pellets in, and then you can keep that out of the way, and it actually produces quite a bit of smoke. You can get them on Amazon for about $40, um, or any good barbecue place would have uh, proper smoking stuff. So, Wendy, uh, here in Australia, probably barbecues galore would be a good place to try and find one. Uh, I don't think I'd use that smoking device I've got um, anymore. I, I think I'd rather get the pellet ones. Uh, and get the big, long, I think it's a stainless steel tube and do that. But I will be smoking more cheese in the future, that's for sure. Um, we've got to get through that lot first, of course. That will take a t some time. Okay. Um, Fun Pants says, do you think you've improved your process enough when it comes to cheese making? Would you consider redoing any of your original videos to compare the outcomes? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I, I actually have done that for some of the cheeses. So uh, I think there's two Colby videos and the second one was a better one. There's two Cotswold videos and I improved the recipe and um, it, it tasted better because I put in some garlic powder as well into that um, uh, into that Cotswold cheese. I've done Kefili a few times and I've upscaled the recipe of the kefili up to 10 litres. So I think that tastes better. And I used a different starter culture in the kefili as well. Instead of, I originally used MO30, which only has Lactobacillus lactis, subspecies lactis, and subspecies cremoris. It's only got two strains. Whereas the um, MA4001 or 4000 series uh, by um, uh, Denisco, choose it, um, has uh, four other cultures, including a, um, a thermophilic to give it a little bit more depth as it matures. Um, so I thought that cheese was much better. The kefili with uh, MA4000 series was was better than the original kefili, which was pretty hard to improve on because I was impressed with that as well. 
Um, what else? Well, I've made various styles of camembert or white mold cheeses as well. I've redone videos on those because I wasn't disappointed with the original ones. Maybe the videos weren't that good, but uh, they're better uh, now. And I've done a couple of versions of the uh, the um, stabilised paste, uh, washed curd, mold ripened cheese, uh, which I called fake camembert, just to compare that version of camembert with uh, raw milk camembert even. I've done that as well. So, uh, fun pants, I've done that a few times. So... Um, it's a, it is a, it's an evolution, this channel of, I may repeat some more of the cheeses, uh, use tweaking the recipe a little bit. And I think that it's worth doing, uh, it really is. So yeah. Uh, and you've got a follow-up question that says, I think that heating, uh, sorry, that heat you were tasting in the jalapeno was due likely due to some of that heat releasing the oils in the chilies. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Uh, because it was fairly close to the smoke, that piece. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, Jim has a comment. He says, uh, all of about three days anyway, as far as consuming all the cheese. <laughs> Very cool. Um Umbrella says, uh, forgive me as I'm new here. That's okay. We welcome all curd nerds from all over the world. Um, have you smoked them the old school way like a hut? Not that it matters, uh, but I saw a video on it and found it fascinating. Okay, so there are two, uh, two types of smoking. So there's hot smoking, which uh, you can... Um, you can use the, the heat from the smoke to cook the meat as well as infuse the, the flavour. And then there's cold smoke. You try to keep the heat away. Uh, try to keep the heat away from the, the cheese like I tried to. It didn't, not as successfully as I would. But in those hut type things, and it depends on how they do it. They sometimes create a fire and then blow it out, and there's a lot of hot smoke in there. So that could be hot smoking method. But uh, with cheese, it's more cold uh, smoking. Um, Tutu says, how far did the smoke penetrate? Look, I think, um, well, as far as colour goes, Tutu, it was mainly on the surface. But as I cut and had a couple of pieces off, off some of them, uh, I think that the smoke flavor was still in there. So it wasn't just like surface. Uh, remembering that I smoked for the whole six hours. So I think that was that was quite good. Um, uh, Jim says he uses the tube smoker for meat, uh, which is great because that gives me some sort of encouragement. If I can keep that away from the cheese and, and not have as much heat, that will be good. Um, Cheryl says, I smoke chowder and then aged it. Fantastic. The tube works nicely. That's good to know. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, second, Attrax says, do you think there are some types of cheese you could create somehow, maybe different strains of bacteria or something? Uh, I don't quite understand the question. I have created new types of cheeses already. So you can always check out my, uh, there's a few videos. So I've made quite a few different types of cheeses that nobody else has. So, um, Petite Blue comes to mind. Um, that's one of my own recipes. Um, I'm trying to think of some others. There are a, quite a few original ones that I've made on the channel. Um, but yeah, they are, well, remember, all cheese is variation on a theme. You've got milk, you've got rennet, um, and depending on the type of milk, whether you add starter cultures. Um, and yeah, it's all the difference of how long you ripen it for initially, the, the milk ripens with the cultures in it, how long you rent it for it, how small you cut the curds, how hard you press it, how long you stir it for. Yeah, they're all just variations on a theme anyway. Um, Tracy from Cheese Needs, who's coming up um, soon after the next session, um, says, I smoked in a wooden box next to my hot smoker and added a metal pipe between the two. That is a fantastic... Um, idea tracy now we've got a super chat thank you so much uh that was from dennis 
Um, Dennis says, my wife, Shelley, first time watcher, says hello. Hello, Shelley. Lovely to see you. Um, and thank you, Dennis, for the $5 super chat and uh, making the curd nerd light flash, which is pretty hard to see at the moment because there's blazing sunlight coming through the the door. It's a big glass door that you've seen uh, on the channel before. Okay. Um, so Fun Pants said, um, I've made some of those, sorry, I've made some of those tubes for smoking at home using smoker wood pellets. Roll them loosely into a tube with aluminium foil. You can stab it a few times with a fork and leave each end open for the air. Oh, that is a good idea. Maybe I'll do a comparison video. I don't want to become a barbecue channel, but that, pardon me, that smoked video, smoked cheese is amazing. It's delightful. Okay. Um, so thank you for that tip, Fun Pants. Um, Hot and Creamy says, are there any cheeses you've had trouble getting the recipe, recipe magic formula for? I know the EU is very protective of its products. Um. Not really. I've got a lot of cheese making recipe books, a lot. Um, I would say about 20 at this stage. Uh, so there are lots and lots of recipes out there that people put um, put into books. Uh, so, yeah, I have used a lot um, of recipes. Now, there's a couple that um, recently have been sent to me uh, so um, the one Charlie did the the peppered um, Maltese cheese. I you know I'd seen it, I've heard of it, but I'd never found a recipe. So Charlie was uh, very gracious in giving it to me. Um, and uh, another one, Fundy Fog, which a video that's coming up very soon uh, from Patricia Gauchi, who you saw this morning um, in one of the interviews, the second interview we had. Um, Patricia sent me a recipe for Fundy Fog. Now, I've heard of Humboldt Fog before, which is a goat's made cheese with a, an ash line in the middle, ash coating around the outside, and then white mould. Um, but she created a version that was made with cow's milk, and um, uh, it has that ash line and all that sort of stuff. So she provided me with a recipe for that. Um, some of the difficult ones, so a lot of people ask me from South America to do some of their native cheeses. Now, it is difficult because I find it hard trying to get uh, written recipes. And when I do get them from South America, they're either in uh, Spanish or Portuguese. Now, I know I can Google translate them. That's fine. Um, but I've got to get them written. There are, there are quite a few South American uh, cheeses that have videos, and even when I've got the translation turned on, I find it so difficult to follow and can't understand what sort of starter cultures they're using. And in most cases, they don't. They actually use raw milk, so you can't do too much about that, unfortunately. Uh, so, yeah, so I do have trouble getting some recipes. Not so much the French and Italian ones. Um, I think a lot of people have visited cheese factories and figured out some of their recipes. They're not going to be perfect, but they are a pretty good facsimile of some of the ones that I've eaten here in Australia. Very hard to get European cheeses direct from Europe that last the trip. I know, you know, refrigeration and all that stuff, but Australia doesn't a lot, allow a lot of raw milk, milk cheeses into the country. Uh, so it's very difficult getting some of those amazing European cheeses. Um, okay, Cheryl's got a comment, uh, says, I started making a wood smoking box but had to stop to watch the highly anticipated 12 hours of cheese. Uh, you are a gem. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, and I'm glad you're uh, still watching and enjoying the show. Okay. Um, Herb said that the, uh, the segments from with Jennifer, Ruth and Patricia were fantastic. A great insight into how people make cheese. Indeed, I, I loved all of those interviews. And we've, like I said, we've got three more still to come uh, this afternoon. So if you can hang around, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, and all you curd nerds that are watching, then it would be a shame to miss them. However, what I will be doing after the probably tomorrow or the next day, is actually um, 
cutting each of the interviews and um, putting them onto my podcast channel. So that's um, Little Green Cheese Podcast with Gavin Webber. There's another channel there. So if you want to watch those interviews again or you miss them uh, and don't want to go through the whole 12-hour video to find them, um, then they will be separate individual video and audio podcasts that will be available after the day. Um, so, uh, but however, have, however, having said that, there are timestamps. I think they're already in the stream, but I don't think they will work until the video is archived on YouTube. So there are timestamps in the description. Um, and the way YouTube is kind of like hidden the description these days, it's a little bit difficult to see it on the page. But in the description are the channel uh, markers, and usually it's on the little red line um, down the bottom. Down the bottom, where is it? Down here somewhere. You can't really see it. But, yeah, the little line um, after the, the, the video has gone live. Anyway. Okay, so uh, we've got five minutes, four minutes. So if anybody's got any more questions, um, very happy to uh, answer them. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, Jim has commented and said that uh, he'll second that those uh, those interviews were fantastic. So indeed, um, yeah. So like I said, if anybody's got any questions, uh, feel free to ask. <clears throat> I'm starting to lose my voice. I hope. It doesn't go. That would be bad for the 12 hours of cheese. Ah, okay. All right. Does it? Oh, yes, we do. Uh, what's my favourite false cheese? Um, tofu facsimiles and such. Um, I don't normally try um, vegan style or vegetarian. Yeah, these are well vegetarian. Um I don't really try false cheeses. Um, I have made a a vegan cream cheese before, which tasted okay. I thought it was quite nice. Um, I didn't particularly like... Um, I tried to make a vegan-style halloumi. just didn't work. I couldn't get it to set. It, was, uh, it just turned into slop, so I just had to throw it away. Um, even though there was a lot of cashews in it as well. so And they're not cheap. Milk's cheaper than cashews, that's for sure. <clears throat> All right, so, uh, yeah, so I don't really try vegan cheese very much. I stick to the dairy style. Um, <laughs> being new to the channel umbrella, <laughs> there's a standard response to this question, do you have a favourite cheese? Uh, All together now, all the cheeses. All the cheeses are my favourite cheese it's just too hard to pick one or two so yeah anyway um a question from robert robert says is your book on audible no it's not on audible um it is on amazon kindle so there's only the written versions uh, i've got two books by the way uh, one is um keep calm and make cheese and the other one's keep calm and make more cheese the written versions, um, where I get the most uh, cut or royalties is uh, in the merch shelf down below. There should be a merch shelf down there on YouTube, part of it. But, um, yeah, so those two books, I get the maximum um, royalties. Amazon just take a lot of royalties from the, the creator for hosting the books. Apple's the same for Apple iBooks. But, uh, yeah, um, the ones on the merch shelf down below, I get more royalties <clears throat> for those uh, those e-books. Uh, but thanks for asking, um, Robert. I don't know if I'd ever record uh, an audio book, recipe book. It, it, it wouldn't read very well, I don't think. Um, uh, Jim says that the timestamps are there, so that's fantastic. Thank you, Jim. Um and uh, Big Shoe says, what is the best kind of beer stout to infuse with the stout cheddar, making one as we speak? Well, you can't go past one of the best stouts in the world, I believe, and that would be Guinness. Um, pretty hard to replicate Guinness. The ones in the can that you get with the little widget that makes it all froth is a good gimmick. 
But when you've had real Guinness on tap uh, in Ireland, it doesn't compare. The, uh, it just tastes so much better. So very hard to get it. So look, can of Guinness, nice. That's the stout I use for the stout one. Okay. Um, all right. So moving right along, uh, it's now um, how many hours into the stream? Six hours into the stream. So the next session is an intermediate cheese making session. Um, and this one is talking about the flocculation method for a better curd set. Uh, it also has Persian feta, which I think is a, a, another step on top of feta, which makes it very nice. Yes, it is about half time, Herb, indeed. We're, we're getting there, and I, I haven't lost my voice, so that's a good thing. Um, we're also going to look at um, kefili, the new kefili recipe that I've got. Uh, and then seven hours into the stream, we've got a live interview after this session with Tracy Johnson from Cheese Needs. I hope, Tracy, you're all set up and ready to go um, in an hour's time, of course. Um, so that should be very exciting. Um, and, uh, yeah, Tracy has just recently bought uh, Cheese Needs from another person, uh, Shera, uh, and has taken over that and is one of the administrators or owners now of the Learn to Make Cheese Facebook book, uh, group. Uh, which is which is a very there's a lot of members. I think there's over thirty thousand members now. So yeah, a very very good for a Facebook group. Anyway, so let's move along and uh, bring up the oh hang on sorry my bad um, bring up the intermediate session uh, number one and uh, learn about the flocculation method, Persian feta and kafili. Here we go. Well, g'day curd nerds and welcome to another cheese making video. This one is slightly technical, not so much. I keep it in uh, easy layman's terms. But today we're going to talk about the flocculation method to determine when it is the best time to cut your curds. Now, I know a lot of cheese makers who watch the channel tend to use their own milk from their own cows or goats uh, or sheep. Now, one of the issues with having a single animal or a single herd of the same type of animal is that you are going to get seasonal variations in the quality of the milk. Now, this is where the flocculation method can certainly help you. So what is the flocculation method? Well, it's a, a very simple method where you put your rennet in after uh, acidification of the milk and you start a stopwatch and basically you time how long it takes for an object that's floating on the top of your milk, and I'm using like a little lid, like a very small Tupperware lid, uh, and when you spin it, uh, it, the milk moves freely, it hasn't reached the flocculation point. Uh, I start testing at about the eight minute mark and just spin the little lid, and if it keeps spinning, you're not quite there yet. Once the lid uh, stops and doesn't move anymore, that is when you have reached the flocculation point. So make a note of what this time is. It's very special. So we take the time that it has taken to get to the flocculation point, or better known as when the casein matrix has begun to form, or the, in layman's terms, the curd has begun to set. We take that time and we multiply it by a factor. So you'll see in this chart that the factors are different for each type of cheese. This is the multiplier number that we're going to apply to the time it took to get to the flocculation point. So in this instance, in this video that I've taken here, it took me 14 minutes and seven seconds to get to the flocculation point. So for the type of cheese that I'm using, I made a mustard and ale cheese. Uh, I used a multiplier of 3.5. So basically you multiply the time it took to get to the flocculation point or when the curd started to set and you couldn't spin your little lid anymore. 
and then we multiply it by the 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 fact the multiplication factor for that specific type of cheese so the reason for the different multipliers for different cheeses is that because the curd at the time of cutting will have a different strength so for example young curd will set more readily and release more whey so the mult lower multipliers are used for harder cheeses so you'll find that uh, a factor of two is applied to a cheese like parmesan which has very small grains and hardly any whey within them it's a very dry grainy cheese however if you look at say camembert or brie those really moist cheeses, they have a high multiplication factor. Therefore, the curds is going to retain more whey. So it's going to be a moister cheese. So each different family of cheeses have a different multiplication factor and therefore will be able to determine when the curd is ready to be cut. So I hope I haven't overcomplicated things and it's just a simple way of evening out the variations in the quality of the milk that you may get. So instead of following a specific recipe where it says, and it doesn't matter, it doesn't know what type of milk you're using, you can determine when it is best to cut the curd for the type of milk you're using, for the type of cheese you're making. So I hope that cleared it up. And now you've got another uh, feather in your cap, in your cheese making toolkit to help you make a better curd set and therefore a better cheese. This, as far as I'm concerned, is a game changer. And from now on in all of my video tutorials, I'm going to add in the flocculation time it took for the cheese, for my cheese, and uh, what the multiplier is that I think should be applied to this style of cheese. So hopefully that'll help people take their cheese making to the next level. Uh, if you don't want to use the flocculation uh, time or method, then what I will also do is state a very rudimentary timing for how long I think the rennet should set. But I'm going to show the flocul flocculation point time and I'm going to show what the multiplier is and let you figure it out from there. Anyway, thanks for watching Curd Nerds for this uh, little mini tutorial or tips and tricks on cheese making. And I hope you got something out of it. So don't forget, if you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. That would be fantastic. And if you feel generous, then you can also support the show financially. There are links for Patreon and YouTube memberships down below in the description. Well, thanks for watching, Curd Nerds, and I'll see you next time. Well, g'day curd nerds. Today we're making Persian feta. Now, feta is a cheese that I've made many times before. I've made cow's milk feta, goat's milk feta, and the traditional Greek feta, which is a combination of goat's milk and sheep's milk. Now, the good thing is you can make use any of those three recipes that I've got on the channel to make this cheese. So it doesn't really matter which type of feta you use. The Persian part of the feta is basically marinating the feta in olive oil, a bit of sunflower oil, and a whole bunch of spices and herbs. That's what makes, well, here in Australia, what we call Persian feta. Now, let's go through the basics of making the feta first, and then near the end of the video, I'll show you how and what spices and what herbs I use to make the Persian feta. Now, in this video, I also doubled the recipe that I normally would, and I use cow's milk exclusively to make a mild sort of feta, very mild indeed. Uh, not very sharp, not very much sharpness to it, um, and that's what I kind of wanted to achieve. I wanted a nice, mild cheese. I wanted it to absorb all the herbs and spices, all those flavors, and, uh, and come up with a fantastic tasting cheese. All right, let's get on and see how we made Persian feta. So first of all, sanitise all your equipment. Also, I'm using milk by Inglenook Dairy today. It's the full cream, unhomogenised version. 
The ingredients use eight litres or eight quarts of whole cow's milk, a quarter of a teaspoon of lipase diluted in 60 millilitres or quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water, an eighth of a teaspoon of MA11 or MO30 uh, by uh, Sacco, the MA11s by uh, Choose It. It's mesophilic starter culture. Three eighths of a teaspoon or two millilitres of calcium chloride diluted in a quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water. Three eighths of a teaspoon or two millilitres of single strength liquid rennet. I'm using IMCU 200 and that's diluted in quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water. Also, you'll need a 10% brine solution and the recipe for that is further on in the video. So once your milk is in the pot, then if you're using unhomogenized like I am, you'll find some of the cream may be a little bit solid. So just whisk that back into the milk and then clip your thermometer on. I've turned the heat on now and we're going to heat the milk up. Now, if you get any bubbles like that on the top, that's no big deal. It's just uh, caused by the milk fat. Now, before we go any further, we're going to add an ingredient. We're going to add the lipase because this takes a little while to activate. So I'm adding it up front in the process. And just gently stir that in. So we're going to bring the temperature up now to 30 degrees Celsius or 86 Fahrenheit. So I'm just taking the pot off the heat before I do anything else because I don't want the temperature to creep up during the cheese making process. Okay, so that's nice and settled. I'm just stirring the, any cream that's floated back on the top that was in the milk. And we're going to add in... Oh, before we do that, we'll just check the temperature. So a little bit over 30 Celsius, which is absolutely fine. It'll cool down uh, during the culturing period. Now we're going to add in the starter culture now. This is the mesophilic starter culture. It's an eighth of a teaspoon and just sprinkle that over the top. Now because it's a direct vat inoculated uh, starter culture, it needs to rehydrate now before we stir it into the milk. So do that for five minutes. So once the five minutes has elapsed, we're going to stir the starter cultures into the milk. So I'm only stirring for about a minute to make sure that they're well incorporated into the milk for this next phase, which is the ripening. So this is where the lactic bacteria that we've introduced converts the lactose or the sugar in the milk into lactic acid. So we're going to allow it to acidify for one hour. So one hour later, we're going to give that a stir, get the cream back into the uh, milk again. Just a quick check of the temperature. It's about 30 degrees still, so that's okay. And now we're going to add the calcium chloride. Just pour that in while you're stirring. And now that that's stirred through, we're going to add the rennet solution. There we go. So stir that for no more than one minute. Okay, distill the milk and then cover it and allow it to set or coagulate for one hour. So an hour later, we're going to check it for a clean break 
Let's just see if the milk is set, and it has. That looks very good. Not too sloppy, quite firm under the knife. Now, if you don't get a clean break straight away, then wait for another 10 minutes and then check it again. So I'm using my curd cutter. I'm going to cut into 1.25 centimetre or half inch cubes. So I just did the horizontals there. I'm using my curd knife to do the verticals. So you do it one way and then you do it perpendicular to the first cut. And we should have some nice cubes. All the way around for luck. So we're going to allow the curds to heal for ten uh, for five minutes. This stops them from fracturing when you stir it for the first time. I see a little bit of whey seepage, which is good as we've cut the curds. Just gently stir. If you've got any big bits, now's the time to cut it with the side of the spoon. Just a quick check of the temperature. It's dropped down a little bit. I've turned the heat back on just for a few minutes just to get it back up to 30. And we're going to stir the curds for 20 minutes. Now, when you do this, don't forget that you've got the heat on um, because you don't want the temperature going over 30 degrees Celsius or 86 Fahrenheit. So 20 minutes later, um, I turned the heat off long ago and you can see the curd size is down to about the size of a peanut, which is spot on for this cheese. Now, feta tends to have a fair bit of moisture in it. You don't want the curds any smaller than that. The lid on. I'm going to allow them to settle for five minutes. This just makes it a little bit easier when we go to the draining. So over to the sink, just uh, take my boiled cheesecloth and put that over the colander. There we go, ready for pouring. Make sure your entire sink area is sanitized as well. So just transfer the curds into the cheesecloth line colander. Quick wash of the hands. And we're going to allow those to drain for five minutes. Okay, so we're going to transfer the curds into a large feta basket. So I thought I would have to use two, but I'm only using one. Uh, I managed to fit it all into one basket. So that's a, a large rectangle basket, and it is lined with a cheesecloth make draining a bit easier so I don't lose any of the curds. Now in my normal feta recipe, I would allow it to drain for 30 minutes before I put it into the basket, but I wanted it a bit moister for the Persian feta. So that's why I only drained it for five minutes. Okay, so now we've got it all in there. We're going to put the cloth over the top. I'm going to use a very rudimentary press. Just press it down on the hands to start with. Just get a bit of the way out. So I'm going to top it with another basket of the same size. And because it's, um, it's tapered, it will fit inside the other one. I'm just putting four litres of water, which is four kilograms or 8.8 .8 pounds of weight on top. It's a bit of a balancing act, as you can see, to start with, because it's quite firm. But persevere, you'll find a spot where it doesn't fall over. And we'll allow that to press uh, for 30 minutes. So I'm going to put the basket back on out of shot. Anyway, there, there it is after the 30 minutes. Kind of goes a bit wobbly, but carefully turn the cheese. Doesn't really matter what shape it is at the moment. It gets a lot smaller by the end of the process. So I'm just going to turn that over, make sure it doesn't all fall apart, and pop it back into the basket. You'll probably need to press fairly firmly to get it in there. Put the cloth over and then put the weights back on top again. And hopefully you can balance it enough. There we go. Now we're going to press for another 30 minutes.
Okay, so 30 minutes later, you can see that the cheese has shrunk and we're going to now carefully turn that over again. And we're going to put it back in the basket and we're going to press it again. There we go. Now doing these short presses, we're going to press this one for an hour this time. These short pressings uh, and rotating the cheese helps to not release any of the fat that's in the in the curds. You don't want cloudy whey. This ensures clear whey and you're not losing lots of the, the fat, which is essential to the ripening of the cheese. So we're going to take it out again and we're going to carefully turn it over and press it for a last time. This time we're pressing for two hours. So we're going to make a simple brine solution, 10% solution, uh, 250 grams of salt, two litres of water, one teaspoon of calcium chloride and one tablespoon of vinegar. And you can freeze that to get the recipe for it. Then we're going to carefully undress the cheese, take it out of its basket, ready for brining. You can see it shrunk probably by about half its volume, which is fantastic. That's exactly what it should be. Just checking to see if it would fit in my ripening box, which I've kind of converted at the moment into a brining box. That's where I put the 10% brine solution. So I'm going to put it in there for two days and turn after the first day. It's a fairly light salt solution, so it won't absorb too much. It won't absorb any more than is actually in there until it's all balanced. So, so after the first day, give it a turn just to make sure it's even. Now for Persian feta only, we're going to air dry it for one day. Normally you could just store the cheese in the brine and eat it and cut it off and eat it as you need to. But for Persian feta, we need it quite dry uh, before we marinate it. So I'm setting up my area. I've got a couple of jars there. I've got some herbs and spices and we're ready to make the Persian feta. So this, the herbs I've got is rosemary, thyme, fresh from the garden, some dried garlic, a couple of bay leaves and some pickling spices. Uh, these can be usually found in the, uh, the herbs and spices section of your supermarket. So we've got uh, olive oil and sunflower oil. We need some of that to make up the marinade. And sanitize two one litre or one quart mason jars or ball jars, whatever you want to call them, uh, as long as they can be sealed. So I'm going to divide the spice mix. I'm pretty sure it's got pimentos, fennel seeds, um, some yellow mustard and some uh, coriander seeds are the spices that are in this. Just divide it evenly between the two jars. Just gives it a nice flavour. So then divide the dry garlic evenly between the two jars as well. Uh, if you use fresh garlic, uh, there can be an issue, issue especially in oil, uh, with botulism. So I would avoid fresh garlic and use dry garlic just to get that flavour, just a hint. So we're going to pull off a couple of sprigs of each of the herb bunches, just pop them in the bottom of each jar. It's a little bit of thyme, a little bit of rosemary in a second. Leave the rest for later on for decoration. A little bit of rosemary there, pop again. There we go, not too much, leave the rest and don't touch the bay leaves yet. So now we're going to make the marinade, the oil. Oh, before we do that, I forgot one thing, the most important thing, and that's the cheese. So we're going to cut the feta, which is fairly dry now, and we're going to cut it into 25 centimetre or one inch cubes. 
I'm going to place those into the jar or jars. So arrange them um, in the jars with the uh, sprigs of herbs down the sides and the bay leaf. Just makes it look nice. Not that we're selling it to anybody. It's just for our own personal consumption, of course. So push the cubes as many as you can in there. Slip in the bay leaf into the side and put a few sprigs of rosemary and thyme down the sides of the jars for a little bit of decoration there. And then repeat the process with the second jar. Now you won't fit all the feta into these two one litre jars. You'll get a fair bit. Uh, I would say uh, three quarters of the cheese and the rest of the cheese can be put back in the 10% brine and eaten later on. So once again, put the bay leaf in, a bit of the rosemary, twigs in there, you could put some thyme in there as well. You can put chilies in, you can put all sorts of herbs and spices in there. Depends on your personal taste, of course. Anyway, trying to fit a few more cubes of cheese in and top it with the rest of the herbs. That's all done. So pop that. That's going to go back in the brine. Just a bit of a quick taste test there. Cheese is absolutely delicious. Lightly salted, nice and uh, creamy, not crumbly. So we're going to measure out the oils now. So I've already put 250 millilitres or one cup of the sunflower oil in. Now I'm pouring in the olive oil. So that takes it up to 500 millilitres or two cups. Blend them all together with a whisk just quickly. And then fill each jar with oil, uh, making sure that you cover the cheese uh, entirely at the top. So there's a few air bubbles in there. We'll fix that up in a second. But like I said, make sure that you entirely cover the cheese. Now, if you should have just enough oil with that first batch for one, then give it a bit of a tap, get rid of any air bubbles. And then seal it off with the lid. Right here, that's the first jar done. And then make up another batch of the oil and do the second jar. Give it a quick whisk and then fill up your Persian feta jar with the oil. So I had a little bit of exposed cheese there, so I just pressed it down. There we go. There's both of them done. Absolutely fantastic. Now place them in the fridge at 4 degrees Celsius or 39 Fahrenheit for at least two weeks before you try some. Uh, I might be trying mine a little bit earlier, but uh, two weeks minimum. So as you can see, that wasn't very hard at all. Standard sort of feta recipe and the, I suppose the culmination of all the flavors will come out when it has been marinated within a few weeks. Now I'm gonna try a little bit in a week's time and then I'm gonna try another piece in two weeks time. So these cheeses will mature in the kitchen fridge at four degrees Celsius. Whatever you do, don't put them in the pantry and leave them at room temperature because they can ferment. Now, I've done this in the past and they turn out very, oh, <laughs> they taste terrible, basically. Um, the lipase in them goes hyperactive and uh, basically you get some very sour, sickly tasting cheese. I prefer them to be nice and mild with just the flavours of the herbs and spices throughout them. So I'm going to keep them in the kitchen fridge. 
Now, to stop your oil, the marinade, going all cloudy, that's the reason I used the sunflower oil, as you saw. So I used 50% sunflower oil and 50% olive oil, virgin olive oil. And that is just about the right ratio to stop the olive oil from going solid. So you get a nice, clear oil, even at four degrees Celsius. Now, if you want to buy the kits to make this cheese, you can pop over to littlegreenworkshops.com.au. We've got feta kits online. And if you want to support the channel financially, don't forget that you can use the join button below uh, to join as a YouTube member, or there are links to Patreon where you get extra benefits for different tiers of financial support. Well, thanks for watching, Curd Nerds, and I'll see you next time. Well, g'day, Curd Nerds, and welcome to another cheese taste test. Today, we're going to be tasting marinated feta. So this is, or uh, well, Persian feta, as it's better known as here in Australia anyway. So I've got some lovely feta. It's been in the fridge for about ooh, three weeks, maybe four weeks. Um, and it's got all sorts of lovely fresh herbs. It's got uh, rosemary thyme, uh, bay leaf, a whole bunch of other stuff. And it looks absolutely delicious. Here we go there, here's a lovely close up. A little bit cloudy, the olive oil's gone cloudy, just a little bit, but the sunflower oil hasn't. And it's a little bit thick and gluggy, but that's okay, that's just the marinated, not the cheese. So let's open up the cheese and have a look. There's no cutting, obviously, you don't have to cut the cheese. Now I'll just get my trusty fork in there, and break the seal. Ooh, there we go. So naturally, because it was cold, it formed a bit of a seal. So let's just, where am I going to put this? Let's get a, a trusty coaster. There we go. Pop that on there. So let's get out a cube. Oh, this has gone a little bit soft. That is not, oh, this reminds me of the cheese from Meredith Dairy, the go, marinated goat's cheese. It's not, it's, it's cow's cheese, uh, oh, cow's feta. Let's put a bit there. Let's get another bit because, you know, just can't have one bit. Right, there we go. A little bit of oil. Mmm. Oh, that oil's delicious. Look at all the herby goodness. Let's just put the lid back on there. So we have our feta. Um, it's in oil. Let's just be a little bit crumbly. It's good. That's what it should be. Uh, this is, yeah, it's good. It's really good. It's matured up a little. It's, it's well. As many Greeks have told me on the channel recently when I did this, they said uh, uh, there is no such thing as Persian feta. It's Greek feta and you can't call it Greek feta. Fair enough. I'm not selling it. It's no big deal. Um, I made it for myself and it's what I want to call it. Um, if you really want, I'll put feta with two T's and a silent Q at the end. Who knows? Anyway, this is my version of Persian feta uh, or um, marinated white cheese, whatever. Anyway, so let's have a taste. Looks absolutely perfect. Excuse the fingernail, but let's have a taste. So smells, you can smell um, the, uh, the garlic, the uh, granulated uh, dried garlic. You can taste that, Oops, not taste it, smell it. You can smell the herbs. Oh, it's just got a fantastic aroma. All right, let's have a go. Mmm. I have died and gone to heaven. This is gorgeous. Mmm. That is an amazing cheese. It's it's crumbly, like get in store bought feta. The flavour though, oh my goodness. Let's try another bit on the cracker. Oil just does it, the marinade. Oh. Mmm. Oh, bro. And the oil's so good too. Just put a bit of that on. I'm not wondering using the crackers. 
It's creamy, crumbly, a little bit salty. Not too salty, it's not overpowering. Um, and the flavours of the herbs and spices are, are just to die for. It's really nice. I'm glad I kept them in the fridge. Um, I did one many, many years ago uh, and <laughs> it started to ferment in the oil and when I tasted it, it tasted terrible, a bit like vomit. Uh, but this cheese is not like vomit. It's delightful, really, really nice. Uh, very proud of this. Very proud of this cheese indeed. Um, as you should be if, when you make it as well. But yeah, can't go wrong. This is so nice. So nice. Oh, goodness me. The flavours all the way through the cheese is just so good. I, I could eat half a jar. I'm not going to, but I could. Oh, goodness me. That is a winner. Winner, winner, chicken dinner, as they say. Absolutely lovely. Oh, just can't get over the flavour explosion in my mouth. It's just, um, dare I say, a cheese gasm. I think I've used this term before. It's not dirty. It's just the overwhelming feeling of delight in one's mouth, I suppose, when eating cheese. That's my um, definition of it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so marinated feta or Persian feta, uh, give it a go. Use fresh herbs if you can, if you've got them uh, growing in your backyard or you can get them at the supermarket. A very nice flavour. Dried herbs probably wouldn't give you the same flavour. Those pickling spices down the bottom have added just a certain little something to it. Uh, but definitely use the granulated garlic, the dried get granulated garlic, and that has a subtle garlic flavour through it as well. Not too overpowering, just you know, subtle. It's quite good. Anyway, so that is marinated or Persian feta. Delightful cheese. Anyway, uh, if you want to make feta, we've got kits over at littlegreenworkshops.com.au. Uh, and uh, if you want to support the show financially, please click the join button below and become a YouTube member, or there's a link to Patreon for different tiers of patronage, and you get different rewards. Anyway, thanks for watching, Curd Nerds. I know this one's been anticipated. I've had lots of people asking, when are you going to try the Persian feta? Well, I've tried it, and it's delightful. Absolutely lovely. Well, thanks for watching, Curd Nerds, and I'll see you next time. Well, g'day, curd nerds. Today, we're going to be making kefili. Well, kefili has Welsh origins. Uh, traditionally, it was made in Wales or sold in Wales. And it is a very simple cheese to make. It's in the cheddar style. It's in the cheddar family, I would say. But it only takes three weeks to mature. Um, this has been maturing for about five weeks. Um, and... If you, have a, if you had watched the previous video, you would have seen me shave the kefili. Very interesting video, so go and check that out. Anyway, let's get on and see how we made kefili. So firstly, I sanitise all my equipment by boiling all the stainless steel equipment, including the cheesecloth that is required later on in the process. So I steam those for about 15 minutes. Then all the other equipment that I can't boil, I spray liberally with white vinegar and that kills off any moulds or yeasts. So the milk I'm using today is Ingle Nook Dairy's full cream, unhomogenized milk. It's about 4% uh, fat. So the ingredients for this cheese is 10 litres or 10.5 quarts of unhomogenized cow's milk but it has been pasteurised. An eighth of a teaspoon of MA4001 Mesophilic Starter Culture, uh, that's made by Choose It. Uh, an eighth of a teaspoon of MO30 Mesophilic or any Mesophilic with those two strains of bacteria in them. An eighth of a teaspoon of calcium chloride. One teaspoon or five millilitres 
of single strength rennet and two tablespoons of cheese salt plus more salt for later on. So whisk in the cream if there's any floating to the top. Give that a good whisk. And then we measure out the rest of the ingredients. So I'm measuring out the calcium chloride there. And then the teaspoon of liquid rennet. This is single strength rennet. It's about an IMCU of about 200. Okay, so that's all ready to go. So I've heated the milk up to 32 degrees Celsius, 90 Fahrenheit, roughly. Yep, close enough, I think. So now we're going to add the calcium chloride. This adds in soluble calcium back into any heat treated milk, especially pasteurized milk. Give that a good stir. This helps the curd set much, much better with using pasteurized milk. So next we're going to add the starter cultures to the surface of the milk. So I'm adding the plain mesophilic there. You can use MO30. I'm using a Mad Millie mesophilic sachet, same cultures. Now I'm going to use the uh, Choose It MA4001 uh, starter culture to sprinkle that over the top. I'm deviating a little bit from my normal kefili recipe. I wanted to get an extra cheddary flavour. That's why I'm using the MA4001. Now we're going to allow it to rehydrate for five minutes before we stir it into the milk. So five minutes later, we stir the cultures into the milk. Using a top to bottom motion so it distributes evenly through. Temperature has risen up a little bit to 32.5 Celsius. That's okay still. Now I'm going to take that off the heat. I don't want it to get any warmer, but we're going to cover that, allow it to ripen for 30 minutes or acidify. So 30 minutes later, I put it back onto the steamer. Let's check the temperature there. It went down a little bit during that 30 minutes. So that's okay. So we're going to add the rennet now. And the rennet is going to coagulate the milk. Let, allow us to separate it into curds and whey. So stir, stir for no more than one minute. And I'm going to cover that and allow it to set for 40 minutes. Now just remember when we add the calcium chloride and the rennet, they must be diluted in a quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water for them to work effectively. So we're going to check for a clean break after that 40 minutes. Now this is probably double the amount of rennet I would normally use, but it's required for this recipe. However, it hasn't set as well as I think it should. So I'm going to leave it for 10 minutes. Pop the lid back on. Go. I'm going to check again. Yeah, it's a much firmer set. Big thumbs up. So we're going to cut the curds into 1.25 or half inch cubes. Just doing the horizontal cuts there with my trusty curd harp. And then using the curd knife, I'll do the, the vertical cuts. Try and get them as evenly as possible. So the cube sizes are consistent throughout the cut. Do your best. 
Uh, so then we go the other way, perpendicular to the first set of cuts. And there we go. So cover that and we're going to allow the curds to heal now for five minutes so it makes it easier to stir. So five minutes later, you can see a fair bit of whey has been expelled. So we're just going to gently, gently <laughs> lift and separate those curds and just cut any large ones that you see as you stir it. It didn't quite make the cut. Huh. Okay, so we're going to stir for 40 minutes whilst increasing the temperature up to 33 Celsius, 91.4 Fahrenheit. So there we go, 40 minutes on the clock and start stirring. So gently stirring, don't need to rush it or anything like that. You can see that the curds have shrunk a fair bit there. And we have indeed got very close to 33 Celsius. 32.8, that'll do. So they're about the size of a peanut, the curd cubes that is. Right, so we're going to allow the curds to settle to the bottom for five minutes. Just makes it easier when we drain the curds in a second. So over to the sink area with our cheesecloth lined colander. I'm going to drain the curds through the cheesecloth and we're, re we're reserving the whey because we're going to use that to heat the curds during the cheddaring process. Right, so that's enough whey. Let's put that back on the stove and then we're going to just drain the rest. There's not much whey in that at all. There we go. All the curds are out. We're going to allow those to drain for five minutes. I was just gently pressing those down then. So five minutes later, it's shrunk down a little bit in the cheesecloth. And we're going to take it out of the cheesecloth now, just flipping it out, and leaving it in the colander. And just give a firm press there so it forms into a slab. So we're going to allow this to drain now for five minutes. Just putting the lid on so no beasties get in there. Okay, so heat the whey on the stove to 33 Celsius or 91 Fahrenheit, place a colander on top and then we're going to cut the curds into five centimetre or two inch slabs and stack them on top of each other. This just lets the um, curds drain a little bit and uh, aids in forming the texture of the kafili. So we're going to drain that for 10 minutes. So 10 minutes later, they shrunk a bit there. I'm going to restack them and drain for another 10 minutes. Just place them on top of each other. The ones on the bottom, put on the top. There we go. Best you can. And another 10 minutes on the timer. So then take it over to the sink area. And using the pot that we used before. But with clean hands, we're going to break the curds into small sized pieces and place them into the pot. So I'm breaking up each of the big curd uh, fingers, I suppose, or slabs, using my thumb as a ruler and just breaking them up. So they'll be a little bit chunky broken them up. I'm 
nearly done. There we go. All done. Quick wash of the hands. And now we're going to add salt to the curds. We're going to mill that through. Milling just simply means to mix it through. So that was two tablespoons of salt. We're just putting that in there. Didn't quite have enough, so I put a little bit more in. There we go. Just a smidgen. And then just gently mix that with your hands. There we go. Looking good. So with your cheesecloth lined basket, I'm using a, a six inch basket across the top there, 165 millimeters. And just place all the curds into the mold or basket. Okay, all done. So we're going to cover the curds with the cloth. Just pull it down a little bit at the side so there's no creases in the cheese. Just put the cloth over the top, follow on top, and press it at 5 kilograms or 11 pounds for 10 minutes. Okay, so after 10 minutes has elapsed, we're going to remove the cheese from the press. Now, it will be just formed at this stage, so just be gentle. Now, an extra step in making kefili is to uh, salt the cheese top and bottom. So just sprinkle a little bit of cheese, on, oh, sorry, cheese, <laughs> cheese salt uh, over the top. As long as you're using non-iodized salt, any salt will really do. The iodine kills the starter cultures, so try and avoid that. And then just a sprinkle over the top, and then give that a little bit of a rub. There we go. And we're going to bundle that back up and put it into the basket. Cover it with the cloth, put the follower on top and then repress at five kilograms or 11 pounds for 10 minutes again. Okay, so remove the cheese from the press again. Now it'll be a bit firmer, so just salt the top and bottom again. There we go. Wrap it up. Pop it in the basket. Cover it with the cloth and follower. And we're going to press a little bit firmer this time. 10 kilograms or 22 pounds for 20 minutes. Now all these little pressing steps help the cheese to press evenly. You won't get a wonky looking cheese. Okay, so we'll move it from the press for the last pressing. And the salt top and bottom. Now this extra salting, what this does is it helps firm the rind up very quickly uh, and expels any excess whey. So Kefili is traditionally known for We'll get back to that in a sec, but cover the cheese with the cloth and press at 10 kilograms or 22 pounds for 16 hours. Philly normally has a very firm rind and a fairly soft center. So the extra salt's for. Okay, so the next day for me, take it out of the press. Okay, so it should be fully formed and it may have a little bit of a edge at the top depending on the mould you're using. I found that I needed to trim a little bit off there. So trim it off any excess with a clean knife. And then air dry for about three days or until touch dry. So I turned it about every six hours during air drying. And then mature in a ripening box at 13 Celsius or 55 Fahrenheit for three weeks and turn it twice a week. And there's the finished cheese in all its glory. A lovely, 
fantastically creamy kefili. Anyway, back to Gav. So you can see that was a fairly simple process. I simply kept it in a ripening box for the three weeks. I turned it every week, once a week. Um, but uh, in my case, this normally grows fairly vigorous mould um, if you don't wash it down with brine every week. So I highly recommend you wash it down, wash in down, wash the cheese with a simple brine solution, which is basically a tablespoon of salt in a cup of water uh, or 250 millilitres of cool boiled water and then wash the cheese all over and do that probably once a week. That'll keep the moulds at bay. This looks pretty good. Um, it's got a little bit of fluorescent yellow on it, um, which I washed out, but uh, that's okay. No big deal. And uh, that looks good enough to eat. So nice and clean now after I've uh, done the final wash and actually got, uh, there was some vigorous white mould on, so I just scraped that off. And it hasn't affected the rind of the cheese at all, which is fantastic. So the proofs and the pudding. So let's cut into the cheese and see what it tastes like. Here we go. Well, the rind's fairly good. I won't say it's soft, but just right, I think, for a kefili. Let's have a look. A little bit of cracking in it, but that's normal for kefili, um, I find, and I've found that before. So nice. Oh, oh, the smell is just beautiful. It's got that. Oh, it's, it's the paste is a little bit soft, um, but that could have been from the white mold that was all over it. But it's not soft in in so much as it's like camembert. But you can see there a little bit of uh, development, eye development. Uh, which is normal for this and for the cultures that I use for this cheese. But yeah, it looks absolutely fantastic. Smells amazing. So let me just cut it into quarters. Perfect. Tower of cheese now. Let me just cut a slice off. A little bit crumbly, but Kefili is known to be crumbly. Let's just cut that off. So this is the 10 litre recipe, which is a little bit bigger than the original one that I ever made. Let's, oh, nice. Still very moist in the middle, uh, so that's good. Let's just give it a go. Mmm. Salty, creamy. Oh, this is delightful. Just how I remember it. Oh. Now I know why I recommend this cheese for beginners, because really the cheddaring process was very simple. Um, the age, you know, the aging of the cheese is very simple. Even when it's really gnarly, the mold on it just tastes amazing. It's all that salting during the uh, pressing process. Mmm. Inside of the cheese is very nice. Um, the rind, a little bit nutty, which is good. Oh, that is outstanding. Honestly, one of the best cheeses on the channel, Kefili. And I recommend it to so many people as a beginner's cheese. Absolutely delightful. Oh. Oh, I can't stop eating. It's beautiful. For a semi-hard cheese, this is just amazing. No bitter aftertaste. Oh, perfect. Creamy, rich. A little bit nutty on the edges. Mmm. Oh. Very nice. So this is going to be... I'll just uh, fix that up with the tea towel. This is going to be our Christmas cheese. Um, so this, it's a week before Christmas when I shot this. So it will be amazing. Um, so I'm really looking forward to sharing this with um, family and friends um, over the Christmas break. Absolutely delightful cheese, Kefili. You can make it. You won't be able to make it before Christmas, but you'll be able to make it uh, 
uh, for the first week of the new year, if you make it now. So give Kefili a go. Well worth it uh, and delightful. And I'm looking forward to one of Kim's special dishes that she makes, which is angle sea eggs, um, which has Kefili as the feature cheese within an absolute delightful. It'll be an amazing meal. Anyway, uh, as always, thanks for watching, Curd Nerds. If you want to buy the kit to make this, I recommend the hard cheese kit. Uh, I think we've got some in stock on the website. Give that a go. Um, but otherwise, all the supplies, ingredients are over there at littlegreenworkshops.com.au. Well, thanks for watching as always, Curd Nerds, and I will see you next time. All righty, we're back again, and hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, right, so in the green room, we have Tracy Johnson. Thank you, Tracy, for turning up. Give me a wave to see if you can hear me. Yep, yeah, right, good. <laughs> it's all good. I'll bring her on right now. Here we go. There Hello. we go. Only see half your head, mate. Oh, hang on. Do you want me sideways? No, no, that's fine. That that view's fine. Just make it so you, your head's like my head. Same height. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, my stand won't go any shorter. <laughs> oh, okay. Hang on, let me scooch. There Ooh. we go. How's that? Perfect. Lovely. Thank you so <laughs> much. Um, Tracy runs a cheese company, recently purchased, I believe. Called, Indeed, yeah, February. Yeah, called Cheese Needs, and you took over from Shera. Yes, um, so, um, now wh where are you from? Uh, I'm originally from Winchester in England. I get asked an awful lot where in Australia I'm from because the Canadians can't pin down the accent. Australian. Um, <laughs> yeah. I nice. blame that on growing up with neighbours and home and away. Um, I can do a reasonably decent Australian. Um, so my Canadian... My Canadian is awful. It's embarrassing and it yeah. comes out valley girl. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to stick with the English and just politely correct anyone who thinks I'm Australian because I'm, I'm clearly English. Yes. Um, but yeah, I'm also Canadian now as well. So Lovely. I was just telling Kim a minute ago, she said, who's the next lady you got? I said, oh, she sounds like Kate Winslet. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. Nowhere near as posh. That's what I thought anyway. Doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but yeah, so which region of British Columbia are you, uh, is your, are you based? Okay, so you've got all of Canada. Yep. Uh, the States is down here. We don't need to worry so much about that. Um, <laughs> I think they might the have West... something to say about that. <laughs> uh, we're on the West Coast. So um, BC, well, I say the West Coast. The sea is still like 500 miles from me. I'm in the dead center of British Columbia. Right. So I'm in Prince George. Um, I'm actually at the moment doing a three-day uh, BC Gourmet Festival in Prince George. So if you happen to be in the area, I know you have viewers all over the world. Yeah. Um, then, yeah, it's it's a foodie festival. It's fabulous. So many people, so much food. So were you there today before this? Yes. Yeah, no. I've been there for nine hours today. So my voice Are there is photos on somewhere. Facebook? Uh, they can find that on Facebook, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. All righty. Um, so... Why did you start making cheese? Because I, I remember you were the admin of um, the Learn to Make Cheese group, and I don't think you were making cheese at the time, or were you already? Yeah, I um, I found Learn to Make Cheese about eight years ago, uh, seven years ago, and I was just I was just kind of browsing Facebook, you know, as you do. Um, as a foreign national, we call ourselves expats if we're English. Everywhere yeah. else, we're an immigrant. But if we're English, we're expats. Yeah. So um, a lot of the way that I keep in contact with my friends from back home and my family from back home is I share things on Facebook. Um, 
so it's really it's a really good tool for me um especially when skype goes down all the time before we had zoom before we had all the the pandemic video chat yeah. stuff you know skype was the only thing and it was a real pain it was so, dreadful. yeah yeah and um facebook just seemed to be the easiest way to do that for me so one day a, a suggestion popped up learn to make cheese and i'm like oh okay i might give that a go you know um and within i think three months i was admin on the page i was still learning myself at the time um and yeah i've i've been i've been admin for six and a half years now so yeah. uh we have a group of admin it's not just me there's me there's chera there's a lady called daria ross and she's mainly in the background yeah um and then we have susie yarborough we have rachel i'm gonna butcher her name sorry rachel rachel washitz banks I think yep. that's how you say it. Um, and then Heather Barnes has yep. recently joined us. So we have a great team of admin and um, it just keeps it clean. You know, we have the rules on the page, no politics, no bullying, just cheese. Yeah. And uh, it's like our little bubble on Facebook. So there's Indeed. no... And, yeah. and I must say it's one of the most friendliest and um, non-bitchy facebook yeah. pages that i've ever been on so it, it yeah, is a we're pleasure really for supportive <laughs> yeah it's a pleasure to be on honestly so uh kudos to you and all the other other admins yeah it's a great team as i said and the, you know the people make it what it is yeah um we do occasionally have to remove people if they don't get the message or if they won't follow the rules um you know we don't like censoring people i really every time someone posts a joke that's got a swear in it i really it grinds my gears to have to take it down because it's funny, yeah. but we don't allow swearing on the page because we yeah, have yeah. children on the page. So, yeah, exactly, and that, that, that's why I don't swear on this channel either. So, because I know that kids watch it. You know, I've had, I've been told many times that teachers show my cheese making videos to classes um, mm -hmm. as an educational tool. So, uh, it'd be silly if it wasn't family friendly. I think. Yeah. 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 Now, when did you start making cheese? So you're the admin of the page and stuff. Did you then yeah. obviously get the churrophile bug and decide to, oh, give it a go? Yeah, I mean, as soon as I found the page, I did what a lot of people do when they find the page. I posted a whole bunch of questions like, where do I start? What do I need? How do I do this? Yeah. And a very patient admin came along and they're like, okay, one post, ask all the questions and you should look in the files. We have a bunch of recipes in the files. Yeah. So i'm more tolerant now when people join the page and they bombard us with a whole bunch of questions and posting every day and you know i've been there that was me so yeah. it's great to be excited it's really great to be excited about cheese and learning the, the process so within i think i made my first cheese the first day that i was on the page um i i threw together a feta because i moved to a country where um it's a lot better now but 10 years ago when we moved here you couldn't find kafili. You couldn't find even a decent gouda. You know, mm. you'd be paying a fortune for a tiny little slice of it. And I want more. I mean, I mean, yeah. we eat cheese with everything. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I was I was just watching the the previous video there, your kafili, and um, I absolutely the way I love the way that you chuckle throughout your videos. Clearly, you're really enjoying it. I, I, enjoy, it. I that. enjoy cheese. That's that's what yeah. it's all about. Yeah. yeah. No, it's good. So, um, so after that first cheese, uh, what did you move on to? Anything more complex? Yeah. So I did feta the first day, and then I went out and got more milk the next day, um, and I did a guidos. And right. I have been going on about guidos for six years now. It's a great beginner cheese. It's really easy. You can throw anything into it. You know, it loves chives. It loves pepper flakes. You can rub it with things. Yeah. I've been banging on about guidos for years. And of course, if you don't make cheese, you've never heard of guidos. That's right. So, yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm bringing it to my friends to try. And they're like, well, what is it? I said, well, it's a cheese. It's a hard Italian cheese. OK, what's it called? Guidos. OK, I've never heard of it. Well, of course you haven't heard of it. So, That's right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great cheese, though. Yeah, indeed, and uh, I don't know if you watched the session, but I think you would. You of did. But yeah, in the the smoked, uh, I smoked the guidos, and it lent a little bit of something extra to it. Um, but having said that, the cheese, the the one that I tried was three months old, so 
Um, right. I, I think it's it's quite immature at three weeks. I don't know if I'd eat it at three weeks anymore. I definitely yeah. aged it for at least three months uh, because the flavour was there on the piece that I tried that wasn't smoked, that it was nice. So a good mm -hmm. table cheese at that stage. Yeah. And then I think at the once it was smoked, my goodness, it really brought out all the extra flavours and stuff that these you things. You get the layers then and the nutty as well sometimes. Yeah, I, I found not... one in the back of my fridge that was two years old. Oh. And it was amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and it's the same for any cheese, really. When you you find one in the back of the fridge, I tell you, it's like gold, isn't it? So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, indeed. So why did you then move on from cheese making to buy a cheese making supply business? I mean, it's not that much of a stretch. You know, um, my close friend, Shara, wanted to retire. Yeah. Um, I'm already offering advice and support on learn to make cheese every day for several hours. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm not allowed to sell my cheeses here in Canada because they're not made in a commercial facility and I'm not dairy inspected and I don't have license up the wazoo. Same here. Um, yeah. So I can't sell, even if I'm not making it, like I have goats at home, so I have raw milk. But even if I'm using store bought milk, I still can't sell my cheeses. Yeah. So, uh, I have a lot of cheese and um, I give a lot of cheese away to friends and we visit a lot, especially, I mean, COVID was tough, but I would just drop off parcels of cheese and we have like steps. a Zoom meeting. Yeah. You know, they'd have their charcuterie at home. I'd drive home and we'd have a Zoom and, and uh, have a cheese board together apart nice. kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, it just seemed like a natural progression for me anyway. Um and because I'd helped Chera build the business, she didn't want to sell it to anybody else. Right. Um, I'd happened to come into some money. I'd had an inheritance from um, my dad's estate. He passed eight years ago, but my sister was laid up with a bad back. And she's a lawyer. She hates to be doing nothing. So uh, she was rooting around in the estate and she found extra money that we were owed. So oh. I had a little, you know, it was kind of like my dad was helping out. Nice. Um, That's lovely. So it just, it feels like the nod, you know, and then, Go and a friend do of mine it. said yeah. these things happen when it's the right time. And uh, and it was just, it was the right time for Chera. It was the right time for me. Uh, it seems to have been the right time for Prince George because this town is going crazy for cheese. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, my classes are selling out. Um, so, so, you teach, so you teach as well? I'm right. teaching in person, yeah. I'm working on an online course. Uh, I mean, everybody's got an online course now. but Have you a know, um, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I'm working on that um, and I'm teaching in person. We've got a railway and forestry museum here. So there's a whole bunch of old buildings. And I mean, old by Canadian standards. These are like 70 or 80 year old buildings. Yeah. Um, and uh, they they renovated one of the buildings. So it's a perfect teaching space. I can easily fit 10 people in there, even with COVID protocols, which mm. we don't luckily have at the moment. Yeah. And, uh, and it's a great interaction with the students. So, um, I have a Facebook, sorry, a messenger group that I set up for each of the classes so that we can all right. back and forth about, oh, yes. oh, my cheese is doing this, you know, should it be doing this? And then I can help them if they don't want to ask publicly on the page, if they feel nervous or if they're shy or whatever, um, then they can ask privately on that little group and we all kind of learn together. So, yeah. um, so far, 100% of my students have gone on to make more cheese, which yep. is fabulous. Yes, indeed. that's my goal. Yeah. Um, and it's a good business model too. For sure. Yeah. I can sell them rennet. <laughs> That's right. You can sell them rennet and the cultures and the baskets and all that sort of oh, good news. Yes. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I think that was one of the uh, the spin-offs of this YouTube channel as well. Same thing, you know, because people, when I was teaching workshops, we stopped now because of, you know, Kim's illness and, and COVID um, kind of compounded it. So we stopped oh, yeah. teaching faces to face. Uh, but at the end of each cheese course, people will go to me, where do I buy the stuff? So that was one of the reasons we started selling, you know, kits and stuff like that. But I buy all my stuff wholesale. I don't package any kits per se. I buy the kits already made and uh, and then sell them on that way. So happy to I support see, I like all to the play other. With it a bit. Yeah. I, I um I was happy to support the other companies in Australia that were doing that sort of stuff. Plus I don't have the time for that, you know, yeah, <laughs> really. It can be time-consuming for sure. Yeah, because I remember seeing a photo on Facebook that you uh, that you put up saying you sold 100 kits, and I went, my God, putting together yeah. 100 kits, my <laughs> goodness. It was 176 in the oh, end. Oh, that's crazy. 
I know. I got really, really lucky. Somebody on Instagram who used to be on Learn to Make Cheese, she's got this huge homesteading page, huge following, like 60,000 followings. Yeah. Um, so Kate at Venison for Dinner, she has her own YouTube as well. Oh, she does somebody, all the homesteading stuff. Somebody yeah. mentioned her before. I think it was uh, Jennifer um, yeah, Kate in, in the fabulous. earlier. Yeah. Kate's really, really nice. And she boosted this kit for me. We, we got together and we chatted about what should be in the kit, what she would like if she was, you know, making cheese because she makes yeah. cheese, she has dairy animals. And uh, and she boosted it for me. And I sold 176 of them in a couple of weeks and I had to put it on back order. And I mean, I like to turn out an order the next day. Yeah, And I've got I. people waiting two weeks because I've got to wait for stuff to come in from Quebec, which is the opposite side of Canada. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, that was a little nerve wracking. That that didn't help the blood pressure, but it was a great problem to have because you know it gave me the boost as a new business. That gave me the financial boost that I could solidify my my products coming in, um, and now I've got stock of everything. So uh, when the next miracle, you know, viral kit comes around, I'll be ready. <laughs> they, they do happen. They happen uh, quite often. So I find when a, one of the videos goes viral, then they, they happen all the time. All of a sudden, I'll get this flurry of orders from overseas, and yeah. um, and sometimes within Australia as well. But most of our customer base is Australia. Is you, most of yours based in Canada, or do you get a lot of US orders? Or it's it's pretty much sixty percent Canada, forty percent the US, and about two or three percent everywhere else. So I've had mm. a couple of orders in from Australia. I've had a couple from New Zealand. Um, I got the Margerero. I didn't think to send you any pictures beforehand, so I've gone old school. Oh, um, okay. Oh, hang on. So yeah. this is the Margerero mold. Yeah. And um, people saw that and they just went mental for it. So I had oh. to put a special shipping rate on my on my website. It costs more to ship than it does to buy the mold. Yeah, I yeah, that's a problem with the international shipping. There's nothing we can do about that. No, you know? no. <laughs> for people but people really want to. Thing. Yeah, I find that um, when people buy a lot of the stuff, so like I had an order the other day. I don't know. I know we're talking more small business than cheese, but it's interesting. I think um, uh, somebody bought a whole bunch of stuff and they paid like a hundred and forty dollars for shipping, right? And I managed to get it into because the calculators online are, are really uh, ordinary. They don't work it properly, right? They can't figure out yeah. that you can put things inside of other things and. Anyway, so I got the shipping down and I gave him 40 bucks back. So, um, you know, that's the sort of thing I like to do because I don't want all that. Just, I don't pay. The shipping is just for shipping. It's not cost. cost. Yeah. yeah. That's, so that's I'll, get, yeah. I'll get the money back. So, no, it's a good thing. Um, what was right. So how many cheese? How, I bet you don't get much time to make cheese for yourself now. Um well, but when... I mean, my goats are in milk, so I have to make. Oh, milk. you have to, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I've got I've got milk coming in every day. Um, so there was there was a crunch point. I went to England in March and April. Um, I went on a book tour. Ooh. Yeah, um, nice. And uh, I managed to make it coincide with my mother's seventy fifth birthday, so I'd be in in the UK for her birthday. Um, which was a big party, you know, well, I say big party, it was a COVID, post-COVID big party, there were yeah. like 12 of us, but it was all of her family, all of her kids were there, um, her brother and, and some close friends and stuff, so um, I took my daughter with me as well, we flew to the UK, zigzagged around the place, I think I did about 13, no, uh, it was 1,500 miles, so right. about 2,000 kilometres mm -hmm. in the space of 12 days, Goodness up and down me. England and Scotland and back again. So, yeah, there was an awful lot of driving. Uh, How many book signings miss... did you do? Uh, I had seven different stops on the tour. And uh, and I did a couple of personal things as well because I don't get back to the UK very often. Yeah. Um, I've got a farm. I've got a kid with autism who I homeschool. You know, leaving for me is is pretty difficult to manage. I bet. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we we zigzagged all over the place, and uh, it was it was an awesome trip. It was a really good trip. But I couldn't take any cheese with me. They wouldn't let me bring dairy into the country. Yeah. And I was really frustrated because my mom's not a big feta fan, and I'm thinking, well, what can I make her while I'm here that she can eat while I'm here? And yesterday's was born. Oh so right, yeah, I heard that. Um, I have seen your video. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm not up to your standards in any way. And anytime anybody says 
oh you know have you got a video for this i'm like no just use gavin just, yeah <laughs> go with gavin's um because I, I don't have the technical wherewithal clearly um yeah. and uh you know the the video cards and that kind of stuff is all very rudimentary but i i come up with this cheese and i've tried it several times and it works several times mm. and i gave the recipe to a couple of other people including someone who'd never made cheese before and she managed to get a very passable cheese nice. so i'm like okay Maybe this actually works then. So mm. I put it out on YouTube and I think we're at two and a half thousand views and it's only been a month or two. Nice. So there was a while there where it was getting a little tedious. You know, everybody's posting about it all the time. And I just think it's hilarious because people are putting all kinds of things in it. It's a great, yeah. it's a very mild table cheese. So, you know, it's aged for 36 hours. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's not so, going to be cheddar. So it's know. got a thermophilic in it as well, right? Yeah, yeah so, if that, so that really yeah. firms up the curd and and makes it, it edible um, a lot sooner than, say, a mesophile, which takes a long time to develop as well. Yeah, you tend to get a lot more bitterness with um, mesophilic before it's done aging, whereas yeah. the thermophilic you can you can bang in straight away. So because uh, yeah, um, the higher set temperature. Yeah, yeah, the addition of the lipase I think really kicks it in. I have tried it without, and it was just not there. A bit bland. Um, yeah, and I've also, I made it with goat milk, which has lipase in it anyway, and just goat milk and the thermophilic, and it was perfect. It was really, really good. Nice. Do, so do you recommend using goat's milk with that recipe, or can cow Not everyone's with the lipase? True. <laughs> you know, I wrote the recipe for cow milk because right. mostly I work with cow milk year round. Mm. Uh, when my goats are in milk, obviously I have milk. So yeah. I use the goat milk. But yeah, most people, especially people in Canada, most people don't have access to their own raw milk, mm. um, goat milk or cow. Yeah, so we're same, all using same here. It's milk. banned. It's banned. You yeah. can't buy it unless, unless you're a commercial cheesemaker that's gone through all the hoops to, um, yeah. to, you know, manufacture raw milk cheese. And there aren't very many. I think there's about seven, five or, yeah, between five and seven. Because it just costs so much to go through all these hoops to do it, so that's a shame. Um, would you uh, would you mind if I used your yesterday's recipe and made a video on it? Or I would love it. Of course, yeah. I would love it. That's kudos. That is. Come on. Indeed. Yes. <laughs> Obviously, with um, links to uh, the the Facebook page and the yeah yeah with due credit to Cheese Needs and all that. So that yeah, would be all right. perfect. All right, yeah, lovely. Yeah, thank you so much, Gavin. I had to ask. Yeah, I, I mean, wasn't just going to go and make it. Mm -hmm. It's it's a brand new YouTube channel. I've only been in business for four months. Yeah. You know, clearly, I have I have some things to learn about the social media aspect of owning a business. Uh, in the twenty twenties, I have owned a business before, but that was in the nineteen late nineteen nineties. Mm. Uh, we didn't have the internet so much. We certainly didn't have social media. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, you, you couldn't just put videos onto YouTube. There was no way to get content out there. So, um, yeah, this is a learning curve for me. But I, I would absolutely, I'd be flattered if you would try it. If if you want any tips, we can have a private session, video session and, and do that free of charge. Oh, I'm going to hit you up for that for sure. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> we can organise something after this chat because I'm sure people are here to listen about cheese and not sure. so, social media. But... <laughs> I could talk about it all day. In fact, I recently, um, oh, I'm going to talk about it now. Um, I recently did a, uh, on Thursday, this Thursday just gone, I was um, uh, asked to present at the Rotary Club of Ballarat on um, nice. as YouTube as a business uh, enabler. So, yeah, I gave a 20-minute talk there. Unfortunately, I didn't video it. I should have. No, but nobody would have minded. Um, it would have been great content for um, for our personal YouTube channels or little green workshops. But, uh, yeah, it was a great little present. I could probably do a voiceover thing and, yeah, I'll do that. Um, but, yeah, so it had lots of tips and, and, uh, and you know, rotary clubs tend to have an older demographic. There aren't too many younger Rotarians these days. Well, I didn't see any anyway. Um, so they were open jawed flabbergasted that I was making money on earning out of yeah. using uh, YouTube. Uh, and they were surprised by the different revenue streams that there were. So not only the ad revenue, but the e-commerce revenue from the store, 
the merch revenue. They couldn't believe that I was making that much on merch. Um, and, you know, the courses, the online courses and all that sort of stuff. So once you package it all together, you can make a living like I do. Like I don't, this is my job. I don't, I don't work. I used to work in the city and uh, gave that up as a bad joke. So we managed to pay, <laughs> we pay our mortgage every every month and um, and have some money to spare. So it's good. That would be cool. At the moment, the business is making me the money. The teaching is making me the money. Uh, the social media side, I'm still stumbling in the dark. But yeah, for sure, I'll I'll hit you up later on and we'll we'll have a chat about that. Yeah, indeed, no problems at all, Tracy. Happy to help, mate. Cool. Thank you. All right. So moving right along. So yesterday's cheese is you, your creation. You invented it. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are there any others that you have uh, invented yourself? Yes. In the last cheese in my book, actually, is uh, Winchester Rock, which, oh. again, was kind of accidental. I named it after my hometown in the UK. Um, and I call it Winchester Rock because it's absolutely solid. <laughs> it's, right. You can't get a knife through it. It's, rather, it's, rather hard cheese. Yeah, it's very hard, but it's really, really strong flavour because you age it for a year. So right. it started out being a Gouda that went wrong. Uh, I was halfway through the Gouda process, and I always say to people, keep good notes, keep good notes, keep good notes. This is my mm. mantra. Um, if anybody ever asked me for a signed copy of my book, that's what I write in the front. Keep good notes. Nice. Um, because if you make something and three months down the line, six months down the line, a year later, you try it and it's fabulous. You want to know what you did. And I don't remember what I was doing this morning. Mm. So, you know, I can't remember it the down. first interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Write it down. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, good notes and uh, experimentation. I think once you've been making cheese for a while, you know yourself if it's going right or if it's not going right, you can yeah. tell. Yeah. And um, if something, you know, I always, the other thing I always say, never give up, never surrender. You know, got to love Galaxy Quest for that one. Yes. Um, I was just yeah. about to say. <laughs> Yeah, oh, so fantastic. you've got cheese. It's going all pear shaped. It's all gone wrong. What do I do? What do I do? Well, don't throw it away. Yeah, you know, keep, keep going. Mm. Because even if you have to drain it through, like I've had brie that I've had to drain through a butter muslin. I couldn't put it near a basket because it would just go. Yeah, you know, um, you still end up with cheese if it's not what you intended. Okay, but it's still you still end up with cheese, and it might be awesome. Mm. Most of the time it's edible too, even the disasters. Sure. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, you're right. Awesome cheese. Um, speaking of your book, I know you've dropped the hint a few times. I should have asked <laughs> the question. So uh, you have written a cheese making book. What is it called? And, it's called uh, Cheese and Please. Cheese Please. Yeah. And it's in hardback? Uh, hardback and paperback now. Yeah. Okay. And where is it available? Uh, you can get it at Cheese Needs. Or right. you can get it on Amazon. If you've got Amazon um, Prime, then it's probably cheaper to get it from Amazon because you get free shipping. Um, if you want me to sign it, you've got to buy it from me. Of course. Or you have to come and meet me somewhere. <laughs> yeah. so I'll sign anything. Amazon takes a decent cut, though, don't they, unfortunately? I find that with my e-commerce books that yeah. if you price it over $9.99, they take 70%, which is yeah, massive. Yeah, they do. But, I mean, uh, it's go the with only volume, way I that I can get it out there. You know, yeah. it's the only way I can afford to get it printed and get it into print and get it done. So um, it's the lesser of two evils. I could have, uh, you know, I could try printing and binding it myself. But with everything else that's going on, I just, I wanted to just leave it to someone that knows what they're doing. True, true. And they're... Um... Uh, what's it called? Create Space. It used to be Create Space. Um, yeah, uh, Kindle yeah, Direct now. Yeah, their their process is pretty good for making the the publication, and it looks good with a nice cover and and um, and the binding's pretty good. I'm found on the hard book pack. I did one once. I did a run of about ten or something. This was not for the cheese book. This was for a, one of the other books that I wrote. Um, people snapped them up, but uh, like I said, there was no money in it, unfortunately, because um, it was a little bit too expensive. Um, yeah, yeah, but look, kudos to you. And you've ordered them in bulk as well for your own oh, store. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I ordered them in bulk. And um, the kit that just sold 176, every single one of those had a book in it. So I've just oh. gone over the 1,000 mark. <laughs> well done. Well done, you. Yeah. 
it's hard to sell a self-published book, honestly, you know, even speaking from experience. Um, it, it takes a while to get the word out there unless you've got a medium where you can sell it, uh, like yeah. we both have. So, mm -hmm. yeah, well done, mate. Well done. Thank you. I'm very proud of you writing that <laughs> book. Yes. I'm proud of me finishing that book because... Mm. As you know, you know, you get all these ideas and they're like, oh, this recipe, this recipe, this recipe. And yeah. then you have to try and edit it. Um, yeah, I'm a little too opinionated to edit my own work. So um, I have to say thank you to my friend, Christine, uh, who edited it for me. And uh, I'm actually I'm using her Wi-Fi right now because my right. Wi-Fi is very rural. Oh. Um, so I'm I'm in my travel trailer in her driveway. Oh, right. <laughs> So I can talk to you without my Wi-Fi cutting out. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so, <laughs> what was I going to say? It was a follow-up from that. Oh, goodness me. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I also uh, couldn't edit my – I edited the first version of Keep Calm and Make Cheese. Um, I actually had it proofread, though, by um, Kim's mum, who was a professional proofreader, which was quite good. Nice. Um, but she's since passed away and I couldn't get the second book proofread, unfortunately. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so I, I asked uh, one of my daughter's friends, who's a high school teacher, and she did the first run edit proofread for me, which was good. So, yeah, it's always good to get somebody or hire somebody to, to do that part of the work because as a writer – when you do write the book, it's difficult to find the mistakes. Even even when you read it aloud, myself, mm -hmm. you know, that's what I do to figure out whether I've made a mistake. And there was hundreds of them, you know, and <laughs> you know, it was yeah. unworthy to publish. It would have been a, a nightmare. But so for me, I the thing I found, the found was thing. I was making assumptions. I was assuming that people knew what a uh, clean break was i was assuming right. that people knew some of the terms that i was using and um i actually have my daughter read it she's in college right now um mm. to be a proofreader editor yeah so um she's she's like my little you know she's she's my little grammar police she goes around and checks that i've got the right commas and because i've been internetting for the last 20 years i've, I've got a degree in psychology and i've i've studied english to college level mm. um but I've completely forgotten what a semicolon is for. Nice. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so she's come along with her big red pen and written see me at the bottom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I made her go on the computer and edit all of the changes that she'd made because I'm not going to sit there and, you know, scroll through all that. So she did that for me. That was that was really helpful. That's lovely. That's lovely. A great team, obviously. Yes. Yeah. Well, she's 20 now and she's just awesome. Yeah. Are you? Um, all thinking... my kids are great. <laughs> yes. And uh, I remember what you said just before is where do you stop? Which When do you stop putting recipes into the book? And I found it so um, uh, the second book took me like four years to write. Um, the first one had like 28 recipes in it. The second yeah. one had like 75. I just couldn't stop. So yeah. because every time I created a video, I'd written down the recipe and then I keep making halfway through the book. I'm making, you know, I'm making a cheese Two, cheese, two new cheeses a month, and where do you stop? So <laughs> that's why the book kind of took so long as well. Plus, I was procrastinating the heck out of it um, because I had so many, you know, you got a business to run, you got yeah. videos to put up because I like teaching people new things, and, you know, the book kind of took second fiddle. Uh, so, yeah. And also yeah. the first one was really successful. You know, everybody points to it as a really – accessible you, if you want to learn you click on the link you buy the book and it's there on your you know your reading device whatever you yeah. use straight yeah. away uh with mine you have to wait for shipping um the main reason behind that is kind of twofold firstly i'm worried it's going to get nicked and posted online um oh, and look, secondly, i wouldn't i wouldn't worry about that because mine has Yes, I saw yours was, yeah. Many, many um, times. And I don't care because the people who care will go and buy a copy. The people yeah. who steal one, they'll never read it. So it doesn't yeah. matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, look, I, mean, I, I think the, the first book was such a big success that then trying to follow it with something that may be, you know, is it going to be as good? Are you going to make as many, as you say, you, you cram in as many recipes as you can so that you can guarantee mm. it's better than the original. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
but you cover so much groundwork in the first book. I did, um, yeah, yeah. The illustration of, of Little Miss Muffet on her tuffet, I've got that stuck to my fridge. That makes me laugh all the time. Yes, one of Kim's favourite drawings. She, it's, she, it's an old English thing, yeah. Yeah, because at the time she was actually doing a, um, she was doing a degree, uh, no, a diploma of children's cartoons out of the uh -huh. London Art College. Yeah, London Art College. She's got a, she, so she got her diploma um, so she was doing all those cartoon type things all the time. So when I approached her to put them into the book, she said she jumped at the chance. She loved it. So, you know, I've That's actually awesome. got, I've actually got, here we go. I'm doing a strip tease now. <laughs> People will talk, Gavin. <laughs> I know. There we go. That's straight out of the book. That's me, apparently, yep. uh, with a glass <laughs> of wine and some cheese. So. There you go. That's actually in the first book that um, yes. Kim did. Now, she didn't do any um, in the second one because she was sick. So, Yeah, I'll... how's she doing? Yeah, really good, really good. Um, so, yeah, she's fully recovered from, uh, well, the cancer's dormant, gone or whatever. I don't think cancer ever goes, but it goes dormant. Um, awesome. But, yeah, the treatment, all the chemo and all the radiotherapy and all that has worked well. So she's, what, two, two and a half years free at the moment which is good um all, good. The, all of the tests that she's had recently and she's listening to this probably as well she's in now she's inside Hi. the goes um yeah she, she's she's very, very positive lady she's my xena warrior princess she is remarkable so i think Love if this. she's english she ought to be Boudicca, really but yeah okay, we'll right. yeah so we'll <laughs> it from new zealand wasn't she yeah so yeah, yeah, Buddha, Zena, 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 yeah I think. <laughs> she was pretty cool. Um, yeah, those Romans, they had the rough end of the stick after they sorted her out, I tell you. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> All righty. Um, <laughs> that so, escalated quickly. <laughs> it did, didn't it? Right, where so where do you make your cheese? In your kitchen or you got a special place? Uh I've just had my kitchen remodeled. It was uh five months nightmare. Um, living with an autistic kid who hates change and I just yeah. ripped out the kitchen and it takes so long. We literally went back to studs. We had the bare roof. It was the middle of winter, which in Canada, it's a little spicy. A little bit um, cool, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we had we had uh, snow gear on in the house because it was just absolutely freezing and they don't believe in rooms in Canada. It's all open plan. Oh, um, goodness. I'm English. We have rooms. We have doors. You know, you can shut the kitchen door to keep the dog out when you're cooking because I have Labradors. They can reach the surface. I know nice. you guys can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I'd, I'd have dog hair in every single cheese if I didn't find a way to keep my dogs out of the kitchen. So we remodeled the entire kitchen. I absolutely adore it. It's gorgeous. I'm still struggling to keep it clean because I'm a terrible housekeeper. Um, but, yeah, my, my most recent favorite place, and I've got another one of my aid here. Yeah. Um, so this is a historical building. Um, right. It's a place called Hubble Homestead. It's just up the road from me here. And they dressed as Puritans, and I was making cheese in a field on a gas burner. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we had a visit from a bear. A bear? So, yeah, it doesn't get much more Canadian than that. The lady's just walking around, and, and I'm like, uh, bear, bear. And because um, we get them in the yard. I, I live rural. I've got a forest. I've got a farm. You know, we, we do see bears. We see moose. Yeah. Uh, it's the main reason, actually, that we didn't move to Australia when we emigrated. We right. were looking at it, and the things that are going to kill you in Australia are really small. Well, I'm not and dead they... yet. <laughs> yeah, the spiders and the snakes oh, um, you... are really small. You Whereas English here, are so funny there. when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to creepy crawlies here. You know, every night when we go to bed, Kim pulls back all of the covers <laughs> to check for redback spiders every night. And I'm already in bed. I would have been bitten by now, right? The one thing, the one time no she doesn't backs. check, it's going to be there. The one That's time. That's right. She'll put on her <laughs> boots one day, and it'll be in the boot. She probably, yep. I think, she checks those too. But yeah, yeah. And there's no snakes <laughs> in, in our DNA, backyard. Yeah, it. I think it's an English thing. You must have been watching too much Neighbours. Yes. Oh, for sure. Definitely yeah. too much Neighbours and Home and Away in my life when I was young. <laughs> my mum used to watch the country practice and flying. Oh, practice, yeah. So I've had it from, like, birth, you know, um, that, that it's very dangerous in Australia. <laughs> it's, no, it's not. No. Unless you I'd live love out, to visit one day. Unless you live in the bush, out in the outback. 
But then they, they're used to it anyway, so it doesn't matter. But cool. Yeah. So we're back to a bear and a and a fest and yeah, a, so and she, a festival. Yeah. So she came right. out with an air raid siren. Oh, and scared <laughs> the bear. Along with this air raid siren, going. <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness me. Um, luckily, I did have some cheese with me. I always take samples when I do an outdoor event because I'm not yeah. allowed to take samples to an indoor event here because it's classed as a restaurant. Right. Okay. Go figure. <laughs> oh, Canada. Mm. Um. And so I had a bunch of cheese with me. So I was already formulating in my plan, you know, there's a table in between me and the bear and I yeah. can throw the cheese and then leg it. Nice. Uh, <laughs> that would work. Did it work? Uh, the bear didn't come that close, luckily. Right. They managed to uh, persuade it to remove itself from the situation. But I mean, the bears here, as soon as they know you're there, they'll wander off anyway. It's very rare that they get aggressive. Um, but as I said, you can see them coming. The bears and the moose are nice and big here, so mm. you don't have any anything really that small to worry about. Fair um, enough. Yeah. So. so did you have to dress up in all the garb as well for the thing? Or I didn't have to, but, you know, everybody <laughs> else that's there is dressed. And, I mean, it's, it's basically just a really long skirt and a shirt that you can button up to your T-shirt. Well, I, I always wear a high T-shirt anyway because I'm an English woman. I don't go around showing cleavage. It's not the done thing. Um. I just, you know, you can take the girl out of England. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I'm, I'm wearing a high, high neck shirt and a very long skirt. And actually that really served me well because it's mosquito season here. Um, and they are the one thing that is small that does attack you here. Mm. Uh, and they drive me insane because I'm different. They like me. And they yeah. just, every time I go to a campfire, I'm sitting there like the whole time. And, and everyone else is like, there aren't any mosquitoes. I'm like, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah, Kim, I mean, they seem to attract to her and they don't bite me. Well, if they do, I don't even notice them, but and I don't get any welts like she does. Goodness me, yeah, me Must too. Special mozzies, delicate flower, yeah. that's what it is. Yes. <laughs> Very cool. Um, Charlie, Charlie actually says, Gavin, we had a brown snake and tiger snake in the backyard. He only lives up the road about. B. Five kilometers from me, so hi Charlie. Maybe there is, maybe there is uh, some snakes around here that I just haven't seen yet. So yeah, okay, I'll watch out for those. But he um backs onto the bush. He's right. All righty, so let's let's move on. With some, what how much time we got? Twenty minutes. We got twenty minutes. Um, so what is your what is your favorite? Uh, no, hang on. We'll do one. There's another one. What is it? What are some of the challenges you found when you've been making your cheese? Butakazi. Oh, Butakazi did my head in. What, you did trouble? Or? It would not work. I could yeah. not get that cheese to work. I tried your recipe. I tried New England cheese making recipe. Uh, I'm following it to the letter. I even threw out my thermometer and got another one in case that was the issue. I could not get Butakazi to work. The first probably four times I tried it. Yeah. Um, I, I actually, yeah, it just it just wouldn't work, and I don't give up. So um, the the fifth time I tried it, I didn't do anything different, and it worked like a charm. Mm. Um, so I named that one. It, I kicked its booty casey because um, <laughs> I keep good notes, obviously. Um, and then I labeled that one, threw it in the back of my cheese fridge, and uh, I scowled at it <laughs> for weeks. Yeah. And weeks. <laughs> so and did I it taste all right it when it was ready? Because I was like, if you're bad, I'm just going to be furious. And then eventually I opened it and it was lovely. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think it was a milk issue or don't I know? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, sometimes I go a bit maverick with the recipes, but I was really, really being careful. And I mm. thought if I, if, sometimes the milk here changes consistency quite drastically because yeah. they, um, the cows, there's something to do with silage. They feed them over winter and then they change to different food in the spring. Yeah. And there's always a sort of a two or three week area where if I buy regular milk in the, uh, in the grocery store, yeah. it's not, it's not worth anything for making cheese with it just won't work. Mm. So, um, I tend to freshen my goats around this time of year so that I've got raw milk at home. Yeah. Um, and then I just, I use that to bridge the gap. So speaking of the goat's milk that you've got at home, do you, when you make a, a recipe that specifies cow's milk, how do you adjust the recipe for goat? Is there anything you change as far as the rennet strength or the culture? 
because it's raw milk and it's already got some lactic bacteria in it. So how do you how do you change that up to make it work for you? So most of my recipes are based at the suburban housewife or house husband um, making cheese at home without goats, without cows. Right. Um, I always write my recipes for store bought cow milk. So um, if people are using raw milk, I always say to them, you need to half the culture and you need to use a third less rennet. And that right. generally seems to be the combination that, that does work. And that works um, for you as well when you're making your own cheese, yeah. Yeah, I tend to LTLT my, I pasteurize uh, yeah. low temp long time. Yeah. Um, just because I've seen my milking area, it's mud season here. And uh, even though I wash the teats and drip the teats and strip everything out, uh, I'm still not confident that it's going to be COVID free. Mm. So my choices are either I add a protective culture to every single batch of cheese, yeah, uh, which is fine. I can do that. Hmm. or I low temp pasteurize. Um, at the moment, I'm just milking my Nigerian dwarf and my Alpine, but they've both still got kids on. So I'm getting about a liter a day, right. uh, which is an awful lot of work for a liter of milk, frankly. Yeah. Um, so I'm pasteurizing that and then it can stay in the fridge for two or three days. But if it was raw milk, yeah. I wouldn't leave it in the fridge for two or three days and then use it for cheese making. Yeah. Just because even at those lower temperatures, the bacteria are still growing. Yeah, and um, you get more acidic cheese too. Yeah. yeah, and then if you leave it in there for like a week, you can end up getting ropey milk, which is mm. death to cheese. Yeah. So yeah. It'll make you really not well. So um, I try and err on the side of caution. So I pasteurize when I'm getting a small amount. When I'm getting three, four liters a day, I don't tend to pasteurize. I'll just put it in the fridge really fast. And make the cold. cheese right away, yeah. Make the cheese the next day when I've got another two or three litres and do like a six-litre batch. Yeah, uh, that's good. Good advice for the uh, the homesteader. <laughs> yes. Because a lot of, like you said, if the kid gets, you know, half the milk and you've only got a small amount, it, the only way you can get around it really is is past low-temperature pasteurising. And then you can combine batches as well. Um, yeah, I've also frozen it. So I have uh, some really deep, uh, so, sorry, really shallow, wide plastic tubs yep. um, with a lid. So if you can get the milk cold really fast, um, you can freeze it. And then you can even freeze it in layers. So I've got today's milk at the bottom and then tomorrow's milk goes on top of that. And the cold of the underneath helps to cool the fresh milk I've just put on it. And yep. that freezes it faster. Um, so freezing like raw or freezing it past raw? Right. Yeah, freezing raw. Um, because goat milk does really well if you freeze it. You can thaw it um, in the fridge and you can make, make cheese with it, no problem. Not the same cow's milk. You do have some issues yeah, with cow's milk. Yeah, that breaks it. up. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't seem to happen with goat's milk because it's naturally homogenized. Mm. So that seems to be the that seems to be the reason that you can get away with freezing it and then thawing it and then using it for cheese. Yeah, because uh, fat globules are a lot smaller in goat's milk than they are in cow's milk. So yeah, uh, I didn't know that. That's really good. In, that, really good information. Thanks for that. Um, so yeah, that, I could see that that would be a big challenge as far as having your own animals and having to get enough milk. Um, so what, do you? How? I'll start again. How long before you wean the kid off the off the nanny, um, and then you get the whole whole lot? How long do you? They're about there. Right. Um, the babies are eating food now. The mums are getting more milk when I do the milking. Um, the babies are nine and ten weeks now. So I've still got one girl and three boys left to move on because yep. they're not staying for my breeding program. Um, I kept two of my Alpine Nubian babies from last year. Um, I lost my favourite goat this year. My oh, Danny no. died, unfortunately. So I've kept her baby. I've kept her daughter um because she's the spitting image of her mum and she's got a blob on her back and it looks just like a heart and oh, uh, yeah it, i've got to keep danny's little baby so um I'm, I'm ending up with several goats is the problem my husband won't let me have a cow right because um we got the space but he's like you've got too much work to do already and i'm like yeah. okay i've got this True many though. goats i get this much milk if i had one cow i get this much milk yeah but then you'd be yeah. making more and more cheese, though, too. Yes, and that does crowd out the beer in the fridge. I can imagine. Um, we have several fridges, as I'm sure you do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we have a couple. 
So, um, yeah, I, I, I need to do a clear out. Actually, I've got too much cheese at the moment. So we're coming up to the summer season. I will be visiting people and bringing cheese. Nice. So what out of... Right, how do I... Say? I'm, get, I'm getting tired. But um, the And I've got two more interviews to go, yeah? So, right. So the question is, what's your favourite cheese to make as far as the process goes? Not to eat, but, yeah. the uh, To yeah. make... I really like to make a camembert. I really enjoy it. It's um, a good process, isn't it? It is. It's a nice, relaxed one. Um, I don't make a lot of brie because the cream here has all got carrageenan gum in it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so unless you can get raw milk, which you can't, or unless you can unhomogenize the goat milk, which you can, but it's it's a really faffy process and it's it's a very thin amount of, of cream that you would get. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I tend not to use cream in my recipes just because... Um, it's difficult to find, um, you know, unfiddled with cream here. Yeah, yeah. So um, you can use UHT cream. That's fine. Uh, we have a product here called Half and Half. So it's 10% fat. So um, it's half cream, half milk, and they yeah. don't put anything else in it. So if I'm using cream in a recipe, then I will take out, I have to do the math and, and the Pearson Square that you shared recently, super helpful. Thank you for yeah. that. No problem. Um, yeah, it gives me the opportunity to then work out how much milk do I need versus how much cream do I need that I can actually make a brie successfully. Because if you try and use anything with carrageenan or any of the other gums or yeah. binders in there, then your curd just shatters and you can't make the thing. Yeah. Um, and it's just miserable. And I really enjoy making a nice, a nice easy camembert. Um, uh, I just I love the way that they shrink. You know, you fill the mold up and it's it's mounded over the top, and then all of a sudden it's gone. Vroom, yeah, that's right. This tiny you got that much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We had we had the same. Them. Yeah. So we had the same. Yeah. We had the same trouble with cream here, except it's not uh, gums. They put in gelatin to uh, thicken okay. to thicken it, and gelatin and milk don't like each other in cheese making either. So there are only there's only like two brands in the whole of Australia that you can get pure cream that's actually pourable and not already pre whipped thick dollop stuff so it's so hard to find but mm -hmm. yeah that was one of the reasons why i actually did that piece and square video because it's so difficult to find and so difficult to figure out otherwise so yeah well yeah. i'm not a great mathematician i really struggle with that Me time, neither. So. i i think yeah. year 10 was about as good as i did with maths <laughs> yeah yes. they not. started putting letters into the math and that was when i lost it yeah it got a bit confusing uh, some people love maths i'm not not a fan uh, Excel helps me. That works for yes. me. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> so if camembert is your favourite cheese to make, what's your favourite cheese to eat? I'm going to circle back to your answer on that one, all of them. <laughs> all of the cheeses. I, yeah. I love, I love um, a cut of your jib. Yeah, I stole an idea from a uh, Tennessee cheese guy on Learn to Make Cheese, uh, Troy Susie McMahon. Mm. And um, he takes a camembert or a brie cuts it horizontally and then puts cream cheese in the middle Ooh. with um, additives. I like to do it with a chive because the kick really, it balances with the creaminess, but yep. you can do peppers as well. Um, and I'd never actually thought of taking a cheese that I've made and then further processing it. It just, it never crossed my mind. Yeah. So um, I, I would suggest you try that one because if you, you cut it and then you put the cream cheese in, uh, smooth it all around so it looks pretty, and then right. wrap it back up, pop it back in the fridge for like three or four days, and it infuses those flavours throughout the whole of the cheese. And, oh, it's amazing. That sounds very interesting. I haven't seen it. I'll have to go and see, dig it to the archives and have a look. But, yeah, that sounds very interesting. So the white mould doesn't grow over the cream cheese or anything like that? Well, no, because the white mold's all around the outside and you're yeah. putting through it as if it were a cake. You're lifting right. it off. Right, so like a sponge it. cake. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. Um, I didn't bring a picture of that one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that doesn't matter. <laughs> no, that sounds really interesting. So, yeah, very cool. So um, so you can put all sorts of different flavours with that and, and the like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Now, we've only got seven minutes left, so let's wrap up. I could talk for hours, of course. <laughs> um, and I think you could too. Oh, yes. So, yes. So finally, what are your words of encouragement for newbie cheesemakers and 
What are some of your favorite um, resources on the web? Self-promotion, you can do that too. Okay, so I refer everybody to Gavin Webber. Oh, um, stop this, it. That guy yeah, everywhere. That um, bloke says g'day all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I send people to you purely because you've got the videos for everything. There are other people now making videos. Um, we've got Kim Mack. We've got Lisa Peterson. Um, you know, there are there are people that are coming up that are doing what you've been doing for years. Mm. Um, and I prefer to send people to the source. So, um, you Thank know, you. I, I always will send people to your channel, even if my channel, even if I actually put videos on my channel, you know, I'm, I'm only intending to use original content at this point. So if I invent something else, I'll add that on there. But mostly yeah. it's going to be go check out Gavin. Thank you. Um, words of encouragement. I would always say, yeah, never give up, never surrender. Um, keep good notes mm. and stick to your recipe. If you're learning, stick to the recipe because you can mess around with it later on when you understand the curd and the acidity and how it all works. Mm. But if you don't know how it all works, um, you can go off on a limb somewhere and you can you can waste a batch of cheese. And I hate waste. I mean, I have mm. chickens, so they eat any of my mistakes anyway. But, um, you know, uh, just just keep trying. If it's failing, just keep trying because you'll end up with something. Yeah, that reminds me of uh, what Ruth said at the end of her interview, that she had a 60% failure rate what for what sounded like a couple of years, and she just kept going and going and going, and then it just clicked. And, yeah. you know, and she sought out better milk and just refined her processes and um, sanitised maybe a little bit better, and it just all clicked, and it was just lovely. It was, yeah, so... Exactly right. Just keep trying. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it, very few cheeses are inedible. So yeah, oh yeah, that's right. You can eat it. It'll yeah. just be different. Yeah, um, and that's fine. I mean, a lot of cheeses were invented that way. You know, mm. in England, there's a different cheese for every town. Just about. Uh, literally. So yeah. uh, I think you've made videos on most of them, but um, I try my best. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did a behind the scenes tour at Cheddar and that was absolutely awesome. They let me see the vats. I was allowed in the aging room and um, they let me core a uh, Cheddar that was 23 kilos and it had oh, been goodness. stored in their cave at Cheddar Gorge in an actual cave. Yeah. Um, which is 12.3 degrees all year round. And um, and she handed me the trier and I was allowed to core it. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. ah tell you what that, uh, like a cheese gathering but better yeah it was it was good yeah it was really really good <laughs> yeah i've been to uh i've been to cheddar gorge but and and i did go to the cheese factory but you didn't there was no behind the scenes type thing it was like here's the shop eat the cheese here this is some <laughs> of the stuff we do and we couldn't we couldn't even go to the, the caves to look um yeah they changed it's, it's all of that now um, yeah. If you email them, they know who you are because I was talking to them about you. Oh, okay. They, they are aware of you. And I said, you know, I gave her a copy of my book. Again, shameless self-promotion. Um, and I said, you know, have a look at the cheddar recipe. Am I close? And she said, I'm not going to confirm or deny, but I will right. tell you this. We only use Kaimos in Rennet. Right. So all cheddar that you get from the Cheddar Cheese Company, which is the only cheddar cheese company in cheddar now, um, all of their cheese is vegetarian now. Yeah. So, um, and uh, and I said to her, you pick chymosin because obviously microbial, you end up with bitterness if you're going to age it for any length of time. And she's like, mm. yep, you've clearly read a book or two as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Nice. Yeah, so I, that's, I exclusively use chymosin myself, so. Me too. Yeah. And, and the micro, uh, microbial or is it the fermented one? I don't know. It doesn't matter. They're both the same as far as I'm concerned as far as the final taste. So, yeah, well done. Thank you, Tracy, for Thank having you. a chat with me today. It's been lovely, even talking about other things other than cheese making, but it's all cheese related. So that's all good as far as I'm concerned. So, like I said, take me up on that offer of the um, having a chat about social media um, sure. and, and how to make things better and, and whatever. But we, we can talk for an, a couple of hours on that. Um, but, yeah, so, um, yeah, when you get a chance, just drop me an email and we'll, we'll sort something out, yeah? Awesome. Thank you so much. 
No drama. Thanks for, for coming on board and staying up. I don't know. What the, what's the time there now? must be pretty uh, late. I'm coming up on 10 p.m., so Goodness I'll be me. ready for a, a beer when I get home. <laughs> nice. I've got a bottle of champagne in the fridge for when I finish too. So Yeah, I think you've earned that. Thank you very much. <laughs> so those in the chat, say, say thanks to Tracy um, for coming along. Thank you, and, everybody. Uh, it's been wonderful. Thank you, mate. See you later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, that was a wonderful interview. I really enjoyed having a chat to Tracy. And it was a good little tangent we went on about running a cheese supply store. Um, I think that was relevant as well um, because... I don't get to talk to many people about that sort of stuff. So Tracy was a kindred spirit as far as owning that sort of e-commerce store. But, uh, yeah, thank you so much, Tracy, for um, staying up late and uh, having a chat to us today. Okay, so the next session, it is, what is it? It is 3 o'clock my time, so we're eight hours into the stream. We are now going to have another intermediate cheese session. Uh, this one is a washed... I'm just reading it off the screen here. It's a, a mead-washed alpine cheese, which is very similar to Appenzella, um, but being an AOC cheese, I can't call it that. Um, Oaxaca, which is a Mexican string cheese, which I believe is more on the intermediate side as well. And last but not least, St. Marcelin, which is a, a petite little cheese uh, that is sold in little crocks, and it's a white mold cheese and very delicious, but I, I class it as more of an intermediate cheese. It's probably even a little bit more technical than, say, uh, Camembert, which is intermediate as well. So um, so let's start that session off, um, and uh, I'll take a, a quick break and be back in the chat uh, during that session, so that would be really good. Okay. Um, right, so let me just get the right session here. And I will see you in the chat. Oops. Well, g'day, curd nerds, and welcome to another cheese making video. This one, I'm doing a washed rind cheese in an alpine style. It's very similar to Appenzella. So it's not exactly the same as Appenzella. I didn't use a brine wash. I actually washed the cheese in a spiced mead, a mead that I made. Now, I've gone through half a bottle of this mead which was absolutely delicious. And you can see the mead recipe up here. There we go, They're just there. Uh, that'll be cool. Uh, you can go and check that out, how I made that. But yeah, it was a lovely mead. It's a honey wine. And I used that to wash the outside of this Alpine style cheese. And I'll tell you what, it looks and smells amazing. So the color is a, well, it's an orangey brown color which is really good. And that's because I added in a little bit of brevi bacteria linens uh, into the wash the first time round, and then that kind of took off. But as I washed it every time with the, um, with the mead, uh, it kind of took the edge off it. So it doesn't smell so much like funky socks. It smells more like spiced mead, which is good. Uh, so that's a good thing. And it's it's come out quite intact. It's quite firm, which is great. Well, g'day, curd nerds. Anyway, so let me show you how I made this mead washed rind cheese. So before we start, don't forget to sanitise your equipment. I do this by putting everything into my big pot there and boiling it for 15 minutes. The ingredients for this cheese are 12 litres or 12.7 quarts of whole cow's milk, unhomogenised. 3 eighths of a teaspoon of thermophilic starter culture, 5 eighths of a teaspoon or 3 millilitres of calcium chloride diluted in quarter of a cup of cool non-chlorinated water, 5 eighths of a teaspoon or 3.0 millilitres of liquid rennet, IMCU 200 diluted in quarter of a cup of cool non-chlorinated water, 18% brine solution, 
uh, one sixty-fourth of a teaspoon of Brevi bacterium linens for washing and spice mead for washing or any dry white wine with herbs or spices. Now, heat your milk to 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So once it's at the target temperature, take your thermometer out and also remove your spoon. Now we're going to add the thermophilic starter culture by sprinkling it over the top of the milk. There we go, nice and evenly over the surface. Now to avoid any clumps in the starter culture, we're going to allow that to sit on top there for five minutes while it rehydrates. So five minutes later, remove the lid and we're going to stir the culture into the milk. Just use a top and bottom motion so the milk gets, the culture gets evenly distributed. Just checking the temperature there for those who can't see it, that says 30 degrees Celsius. Okay, cover the milk and allow it to ripen or acidify for 45 minutes. So after 45 minutes, uh, you may notice that some of the cream may have risen to the top if you're using unhomogenized milk. So just stir that back into the milk. Now is the time to add the calcium chloride, so give it a stir whilst you're pouring it, and then mix that through. The calcium chloride adds back some soluble calcium to help the rennet set when you're using heat treated or pasteurized milk. Now we're going to add the rennet solution. So whilst you're stirring, just pour that in. and stir for no more than one minute. So once it's thoroughly stirred through, then we try and still the milk and then cover it up. So we're going to allow that to set for 40 minutes. So after the 40 minutes, we're going to do what's known as check for a clean break. So pop your knife in at 45 degrees, give it a twist, and if it splits cleanly, then it's okay to proceed to the next step, which is cutting the curd. Now, if you don't get a clean break, just wait for another 10 minutes and then test it again. So cut the curds into 0.5 centimeter or 0.2 inch cubes, which is about the size of a lentil. I'm using a balloon whisk there to assist in the cutting. Just stab it into the curds up and down and go all the way around. And you'll find that your curd size is the right size for this cheese. So once you think all of the curds is cut, then we're going to allow those curds to heal for five minutes. So after five minutes, we're now going to apply the heat, a low heat, and heat it up to 47 degrees Celsius or 116.6 Fahrenheit while stirring it for 15 minutes. This uh, allows the whey to be expelled from the curds during the stirring period. Now I've moved to a whisk just because it was easier to stir. Just check the temperature. Yeah, it's nearly 30 degrees. 
uh, at the starting point, which is good. So over those 15 minutes, it'll rise up uh, to 47, as you can see there. So just remove your whisk from the from the pot and cover the pot and we're going to let the curd settle to the bottom over the period of about five minutes. So the temperature is fairly stable at about 47.3, which is fantastic. Now we're going to remove five cups or 1.25 litres of whey. So we're going to add back in the same amount of water that has been heated to 48 degrees Celsius or 118 Fahrenheit. Just make sure you do this beforehand. So tip that in there, just check the temperature. It should go up to about 48, which is spot on. And then stir that for another 15 minutes. The reason we add the water in there, we're washing the curds, we're lowering the acidity, overall acidity of the curds. So it'll make it a milder cheese. As you can see, fairly small curd size by the time it's finished. It's about the size of a plump rice grain. So cover that up, let that rest again, so it settles back down to the bottom to make it easier to pour off into the colander. So over to the sink area, you can see that my sanitised cheesecloth just wringing that out there, and we're going to line the colander with a loose weave cheesecloth. So, to avoid the curds from sticking to the cheesecloth, because this is a high temperature cheese, we just spray that with white vinegar. Now just pour your curds and whey and drain them through the cheesecloth. It is fairly warm, so just be careful. Okay, so just cover those up with the lid of the pot and allow them to drain for 10 minutes. After draining, we're going to transfer the curds back into the pot. Just shake off the cheesecloth and use that to line the basket that we're going to use in the press. So now break up the curds with your hands because it would have formed a fairly solid slab during the draining. Just break those up and then fill the basket with the curds. Get every last bit out, you don't want to waste it, it's too precious. So just fold over the excess cheesecloth over the top and then pop the follower on top. And now we're going to press at 15 kilograms or 33 pounds for 30 minutes. If you want to know how my cheese press works, check out the info card now. So after the 30 minutes, I'm just washing my hands with white vinegar there. I'm going to remove the cheese from the press. Now just be careful because the rind hasn't fully formed yet. And this is where the cheesecloth may stick 
to the cheese. So gently peel it away. And then gently turn it over. There we go. No sticking. Very good. That white vinegar is amazing. So turn the cheese over and then redress with the cloth and place it back in its basket. Make sure it's in the center. It makes it a little bit easier. So fold the excess over, put the follower back on top. And then press it again at the 15 kilograms or 33 pounds for 10 hours. So 10 hours later, we're going to remove the cheese from the press. Gently remove the cloth again, it may stick to the cheese. Ever so gently. Just remove that off, place it aside. Now we're going to brine the cheese now. I'm using an 18% brine solution. You can use any container, it doesn't have to be like this. So brine the cheese for 10 hours and turn it over at the five hour mark. Now, if you can't get your cheese to be submerged, then sprinkle a layer of salt over the top and that will suffice. And do that again when you turn it over. So after the 10 hours, I'm just spraying my hands again there with the white vinegar. Now I do this quite often, I just don't show it in the videos. So I remove the cheese from the brine and place it on a drying mat. So cover it with a food umbrella and air dry for two days until touch dry. Now turn the cheese every six hours during those two days for even drying. Now it may take a little bit longer than two days. Mine was two days. Spot on. Now sprinkle half a teaspoon of salt on the top and then turn it over and sprinkle half a teaspoon of salt on the bottom of the cheese. Smells cheesy. Place it into your ripening box and ripen at 13 degrees Celsius or 15 Fahrenheit at 85% relative humidity for one week and turn that daily. So after a week, add some breviary bacterial linens to a quarter of a cup of mead and wash over the cheese. Now, you don't see me adding the breviary bacterial linens because this is about the third time that I've washed it but you can see the result of the very first wash with Brevi bacterial linens. You can see it's starting to go a bit of an orange color. This is typical of red mold cheeses. So I'm just using a little bit of old cheesecloth there that's clean and getting rid of any molds. Dipping it into the mead solution. Just finishing it off with my hands there. Clean hands, of course. So you don't have to wipe off the, the wash. It just stays moist on the top. It'll absorb into the cheese. Just clean your ripening box with a clean tea towel or paper towel before you put the cheese back in there again. Make sure it's turned the opposite way it was when you got it out of the box then place it back into the ripening box and continue to mature at 13 degrees Celsius or 55 Fahrenheit at 85% relative humidity. So repeat washing the cheese only with mead now uh, once a week for three months. And all you can see there is I'm just pouring a bit of mead on top and washing the surface all over with my clean hands. It's all you need to do once a week. Pop it back in its box and can continue ripening for the three months. Now back to Gav for some additional commentary. 
So that was not the most difficult cheese to make. It was fairly easy, as far as I could tell. Uh, I thought it was uh, it came together really well. The rind held up well, uh, very nice and firm, and the washing very simple to do. Uh, as you can see there, I washed it about probably once a week. So in, the the Appenzella recipe that I highly modified, uh, it said to wash it daily. Now. As a home cheese maker, who's got time to wash your cheese daily, honestly? So I ended up every week, every Friday, I pulled it out of the cheese cave and I gave it a wash just by hand, as you saw. No cloths, anything like that. Poured a bit of meat on top, gave it a rub over and then put it back in the cheese cave for another week. And that's what I did. Flipped it, gave it another wash. Very simple to affinage this style of cheese. So good. So it's been in there for about three months. So I think that the flavor will probably be spot on. I wouldn't age it any longer, uh, but let's give it a taste and see what it's really like. So we've got an extreme close up camera here. So I'll cut this open, swap to the extreme close up camera. Oh, here we go. Let's have a look. Hopefully there's a little bit of eye development. Oh, and there it is. Oh, absolutely fantastic. So we've got some lovely eye development there. And uh, hopefully you can see that. There's that one and there's that one. So in the true Alpine style. Now, I this, these are proper eyes because you can, see, you can tell the difference uh, from mechanical hull. So I had a bit of CO2 production during the making of the cheese. And, oh, it smells absolutely beautiful. You can smell those. The mead overtones, the spicy mead overtones uh, in the in the cheese. But oh my goodness, that's amazing. Anyway, as I was saying, you can tell that these are not mechanical holes, but these are um, eyes formed by CO2. It's because the interior of the eye is shiny. Now, with mechanical holes, they're just the same color as the cheese, but these holes are all shiny on the inside. So, absolutely lovely. So let's. Crack open, put it in quarters. Very easy to cut, nice and smooth. No drag on the knife, which is a good sign. Let's cut off a bit of a slab here for tasting. Oh, look at that. Absolutely perfect. Well, as they say, the proof is in the pudding. Let's try it. Oh, I think I died and gone to heaven. This is beautiful. Mm. In the, the rind area, you can taste the flavor of the mead just slightly. Not so much funkiness of brevi bacterial linens because it was only slightly on there. More for rind development than anything else. But the middle of the cheese, ah. Oh. It's unlike any other cheese I've ever made. Mm. It's got beautiful, deep uh, flavour um, that umami, umami, uh, umani. Oh, I can't say it. The um, the savoury flavour. Oh, it's just delicious. This just a, a slight, absolutely the slightest of nuttiness. Not not so much like a Yalsberg or a Liadama, but perfect in its own special way so i notice i'm eating rind and all so yeah absolutely spot on oh well oh, let me have another piece mm. delicious hey mish come here Oh, hang on. It's not, don't get all of it. Just a little bit. There you go, buddy. Holly! Cheese! Holly! Holly, come on, quick. Where are you? Here. Come here. Where are you? There we go. Hamish, sit down. Here, Hamish. Not too much. Hamish, sit down. Sit. 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 Hamish, sit. 
Good boy. Holly, sitting. Good. There we go. Not very salty, which is good. Absolutely creamy, but full flavour in the mouth. It's coating my whole mouth, which is beautiful. Absolutely perfect. Oh, so good. Uh, it's not over salted and it's not under salted. There's no after. There's no bitter aftertaste. It's just a flavour that lingers on the palate. Mmm, delightful cheese. Oh, so good. So you've got to have a go at making this mead washed alpine cheese. That's what I'll call it. Mead washed alpine cheese. And yep, absolutely perfect. Delicious little cheese. Um, and uh, yeah, this will go down well on a, a cheese platter for sure. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you want to support the show, don't forget you can do that either via YouTube memberships or Patreon. Uh, a little bit goes a long way to helping support uh, the show and all the gear and getting it all done and buying the milk, of course, as well. But anyway, if you liked it, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Absolutely would love to see lots of thumbs up on this video. And if you think this cheese is worth it with all that washing and all that sort of stuff, then leave a comment down below. Anyway, thanks for watching, Curd Nerds, and I'll see you next time. Well, g'day, Curd Nerds. I'm Gavin Weber from littlegreenworkshops.com.au, and today we're going to make Oaxaca. Now, Oaxaca is a string cheese, pasta falada cheese, that is traditionally made in Mexico. It was brought over by Dominican monk, monks. Uh, so the process of the pasta falada stretching. And I've made one, two, three, four, five, six, six balls of Oaxaca cheese. Um, very similar in texture to mozzarella, although I did use a different recipe. In fact, I cobbled this recipe um, together myself and changed everything that I thought I needed to make it acidic enough uh, to be able to stretch the cheese. And thank goodness I did because the stretch on this curds was really, really good. Anyway, let's see how we make queso Oaxaca. So for a pasta falada cheese like this, you need unhomogenized milk. Now I'm using unhomogenized milk from Inglenook Dairy and thanks for the guys there for supplying it to me. The ingredients you'll need is 10 litres or 10 quarts of whole cow's milk, one quarter teaspoon of thermophilic starter culture, one eighth of a teaspoon of mesophilic starter culture, one sixteenth of a teaspoon of lipase which has been diluted in quarter cup of non-chlorinated water, one quarter of a teaspoon of calcium chloride, which has been diluted in quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water, half a teaspoon of liquid rennet, and I'm using single strength IMCU 200, and that's also diluted in a quarter cup of cool non-chlorinated water. You'll also need a saturated brine solution, which is about 18%, and you'll need a bowl of cool water. So clip your thermometer on to the side of your pot once the milk is put in there. And we're going to heat the milk up to 35 degrees Celsius or 95 Fahrenheit. Now it doesn't look like that there, but uh, it will heat up as it goes along. Now we're going to add in the uh, mesophilic starter culture. I'm using a Mad Millie sachet there. You can use a single use sachet or just add in the, the right amount. And there's the thermophilic starter culture. Just sprinkle that over the top of the milk as well. Now, it may seem like a lot of starter culture, but what we're trying to do is acidify this milk really quickly so we can make a pasta falada cheese. Right, so cover that and allow the starter culture to rehydrate for five minutes. So five minutes later, we're going to stir that into the milk. So I'm using a top to bottom stirring there, trying to get the cream mixed back into the milk again. And all the starter culture mixed thoroughly throughout.
So just another check of the temperature of the milk. I'm going to use my trusty thermo pen. And as predicted, it has creaked up and it's nearly at the target temperature. So 35, which is perfect for um, the ripening of the mesophilic starter culture to start with. So that's going to ripen for 60 minutes. The thermophilic won't really act in, uh, won't kick in too much during this period. So the thermophilic culture will happen later on. Anyway, so after it's ripened for the 60 minutes, um, stir the cream back in again. And you see a fair bit of it has floated to the top. So we'll just stir that back in using a top to bottom motion. Okay, now I'm, I was taking pH measurements, um, but first of all, we'll just check the temperature. And it's close enough to 35 Celsius for me. That'll do, that's good. So we're going to add in the lipase now. And the lipase needs to be added 15 minutes before the uh, calcium chloride and the rennet, or it kind of inhibits the rennet action. So I'm just stirring that all the way through. And now we're going to allow, cover that and we're going to allow it to rest for 15 minutes. There we go. So 15 minutes later, give the milk a stir again. And this is where I'm going to take a sample to check the pH of the milk. So just make sure that's thoroughly stirred through. So I can get an accurate sort of check on what the pH for the milk is. So I'm just taking a little scoop out of my stainless steel cup there. So it should be approximately 6.5 at this stage. If it's a little bit lower which means it's a little bit more acidic then that's okay um, so now we're going to move on and we're going to add in the calcium chloride solution by adding this this helps the uh, adds back a little bit of calcium uh, to the milk to help it set a better and firmer curd so we stir that for about a minute and then we go and find our rennet so we're going to add our rennet solution to the milk now Stir that in and stir for no more than one minute. If you stir any longer, there's a chance that you may start to fracture the curds uh, as they start to set. So now I stilled the milk there. You saw me still it. Um, so it's not moving at all. Now we're going to cover that and allow the milk to set for 45 minutes at 35 Celsius or 95 Fahrenheit. Okay, now we're going to check for a clean break. Now, if you don't get a clean break like this one, that's a beautiful clean break, clean, clean break there. If you don't get that, then wait another 15 minutes and uh, try and test again. Now I'm going to cut the curds into two centimetre or three quarter inch cubes. Um, you'll see I'm not using my trusty curd heart because that is calibrated for one centimetre cubes, which is... Um, about half an inch, a little bit less than that. Anyway, so I'm doing the uh, the two uh, the vertical cuts there, and then to do the horizontal cuts, I'll do it at a 45 degree angle, uh, all on all four sides. Now this works mostly, but you will find that you probably will get some rather large chunks of. Uh, curds that you'll need to cut as you start stirring. So just pop the lid on and we're going to uh, let the curds heal uh, for five minutes. That stops them fracturing when you start stirring them. Okay, a little bit of whey on top. It's a good sign that everything's doing what it should be. So I'm just putting the thermometer back on because we're going to start 
uh, stirring the milk. I just want to check what the temperature is. It has it dropped down. It's dropped down by about half a degree Celsius. That's fine. So we're going to gently stir the curds now for 30 minutes and I just turned the heat on there and we're going to slowly heat that up to 42 degrees Celsius or 108 Fahrenheit. So you can see I'm cutting the uh, large cubes of curd that uh, I didn't manage to cut during the, uh, the cutting process. So just cutting and stirring, just so they're all fairly evenly cut. There are some rather large chunks there. So um, as I'm stirring there, I cut them as I'm going along. Okay, so 30 minutes later, and we're very close to the target temperature. So that's, uh, what, 41.5.6. That'll do. So close enough to 42 Celsius for me. So the temperature is uh, fairly even. That's pretty close to 42 or 108 Fahrenheit. And I'm just going to grab my trusty iPhone there. So we're going to stir for another 30 minutes whilst holding the temperature at 42 Celsius, 108 Fahrenheit. Now what this does for us is it allows the thermophilic starter culture to start acidifying the curds because their premium temperature range is between 40 and about 45 Celsius. So that's spot on for the thermophilic culture to start acidifying. So I have finished uh, stirring there. That's 30 minutes later. Well, all right, I'm still stirring, but uh, not for very much longer. So just take all utensils out of the pot. And we're going to allow the curds to settle for one hour and 30 minutes. This is to help acidify the curds even further. Okay, so we're going to drain through a cheesecloth line colander. Now you can keep the way if you want to. Um, it's up to you. I chose not to this time around. There we go. So just pop the curd mass into the colander. Give it a bit of a pat down. Now allow them to drain for 30 minutes. Now this stage you can test them, uh, test the pH. And the pH of my curds at this stage was 5.2. So it was okay to move on to the next stage. That 30 minutes will probably allow it to drop down by uh, one decimal point. Meanwhile, heat up eight litres or eight quarts of water to 85 Celsius or 185 Fahrenheit. And now we're going to move the curd mass to the chopping board. And then we're going to cut the curds into five centimetre or two inch cubes. I'm using my trusty curd cutting knife there. It's nice and long and you don't have to muck around too much. You just press down and it cuts the curds. Now we're going to move the cubes of curd into a large wide bowl. And this helps us a little bit later on when we add the hot water to start stretching. So we've got all our cubes in our big bowl. So I'm going to get me steaming hot water here. Here we are. And I'm going to ladle that over the curds until they're just submerged. And wearing heat resistant gloves, we're going to knead the curds until they're consolidated into one big mass and it becomes a little bit shiny. Now I have seen uh, on other videos and TV shows, seasoned cheesemakers not wear um, gloves. I don't know how they do it because that water is so hot. So I'm just tempering the curds, so drain it off. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to add more hot water um, and we're going to cover the curds again until they're just submerged. 
So I'll go get my pot of water again. So I'm going to ladle over some more hot water at 85 Celsius, 185 Fahrenheit. Over the top of my curds, which have been warmed up. And this way, by doing this, the water temperature stays higher for longer and helps you stretch the curds into the shapes that you're after. So what I'm doing here is uh, pinch off uh, the curds into six even size balls. Uh, I didn't really know how much to, uh, to pinch them into, but I thought six sounded like a pretty good number. So that's what I'm doing here. So take one ball and uh, stretch it out into one big long thread. And you can see there the curds are just perfectly um, at the right acidity that you can stretch them. Now, I didn't have a long angle camera, so, but anyway, I'm winding it up, winding the thread up as you would a ball of yarn. So it looks pretty cool. And then just tuck the end in under the last bit. Pop that into a bowl of cool tap water and then keep stretching and rolling up the remaining balls of, of curd. There we go, looks lovely. Now if you find a bit doesn't stretch, then just pop that back into the hot water and that'll help you stretch again. Now if you also find that the uh, curds start to fracture then uh, you need to um, either change the water out make it a bit hotter um, yep see so there you go so I just dipped it back into the water again so I could uh, stretch it even further there you go beautiful big long strings or threads of curd there This was actually so much fun. I really did enjoy um, making these little balls. I was actually chuffed to bits that it actually worked in the first place, but uh, to get this much stringiness and stretch, it was just absolutely fantastic. There we go. It's a nicely shaped ball, that one. Now, I felt that the water temperature had dropped down a little bit. That one was starting to split. So what I did was drained off the water again and pour some more hot water back in over that uh, curd ball. Okay, which was much better. Just make sure you get these really heavy rubber gloves. It does work wonders. I couldn't feel the temperature of the water uh, very much through the gloves at all, so... Anyway, I chose that, that that bit was a bit too big, so I made a smaller ball, and now I'm going to make a normal size ball here. Now, by dunking the end back in the water again, you saw there that uh, I could stretch it a little bit more. There we go. Lovely, there's my six balls. So they're just in cool water. They're not in iced water or anything like that. It's just to bring the temperature down a little bit so that when we brine it, um, yeah, they don't uh, heat the brine up. So we're just going to leave those in the cool water for five minutes to cool down. Okay, so once that five minutes is finished, we're just going to tip that water off. You can see all those lovely Oaxaca balls there, lovely cheeses. There we are. Lovely. Very proud of his work, that man, isn't he? Okay, we're going to brine the cheese. Now, here's a brine I prepared earlier. Uh, for those who want to see my brine video, you can check it out. A little info bar comes up now. Now, we're going to place the balls in a uh, cool brine, 18% uh, saturation, for 60 minutes. That's one hour. Now, I was thinking about putting them back into the brine, and I thought, no, nah, just leave them like that. Much easier. So 
So at about the 30 minute mark, I just turned the balls over. That's all I had to do there to make sure that they were evenly brined. Very cool. And there they are, I've drained them. I'm gonna air dry them for about an hour. That gets any moisture off them. And I actually stored them then in a ripening box just for one day to let the lipase kick in and uh, provide a big boost of flavor. So as you saw, a very simple process. You know, all we had to do was wait a certain amount of time. And the good thing about this cheese is all you have to do really is wait um, and a little bit of stirring. Um, it turned out very good. Now, I haven't tasted it yet because I'm going to wait until it's brined for an hour. I've only just finished putting it into the balls. Um, so I'll do a separate taste test video uh, than this one. But anyway, they do look absolutely fantastic. And uh, I must attest to the recipe that I cobbled together um, to being good enough to be able to stretch this into nice big long threads so I could wrap it up into these ball shapes. So fantastic, absolutely lovely. Well, g'day, curd nerds. Today we're doing a taste test for Oaxaca. Now, I'm gonna do this in two parts. First, I'm gonna try the, the ball of cheese. And I've had this sitting in a ripening box um, just in the normal kitchen fridge, just to drain if it needed to. I wasn't too sure on, you know, whether it'd stay moist or, or what have you. So what I've seen people do on the YouTubes is um, basically pull us apart and see how stringy it is. So it seems to be very stringy and they then put the strings over um, a dish, whether it be some Mexican dish or anything that's melty. This seems to be very stringy. Um, so all the little fibres, I think I've done it right. So that looks good so far. I'm very impressed with this cheese. Um, so, oh, there we go, some more. Let's do some more strings. Very relaxing, this. There we are. Oh, look at that, beautiful. All right, so very stringy cheese. So let's stop playing with the food. And um, let's eat some, shall we? Very nice. It's um, salty. Um, so a lot of salt got absorbed, which is good. Um, I can't, uh, I don't like cheese with a little bit of salt in it. So quite salty. Um, you can definitely taste the lipase that I put into the cheese. You can see that started to convert the, the fats already. Um, so that's uh, a bit of a, a flavour kick, which is good. But all around, it's a fairly mild cheese, very similar to mozzarella, but a lot drier um, and a lot stringier, which is a good thing. Um, so what we're going to do next is um, I'm going to go grab some food and put some of the strings on top and see how well they melt. Righto, so I've just whipped myself up some corn chips, some uh, Tex-Mex chili beef, and I've melted the uh, Oaxaca over the top, the strings. So it melts really well. So as you can see, it wouldn't be string cheese otherwise. So let's have a little bit while it's melted. Maybe it'll taste a little bit different. It's all stuck together. All right, let's not do that bit. Mmm. Oh, it tastes excellent melted, especially when wrapped around this Tex-Mex. Mmm. That is absolutely fantastic. Oh, there we go. Just roll that up a little bit. Just like uh, the other day when I made the cheese. Hang on, let me just break that apart. Mm. 
absolutely delicious, fantastic food. Oaxaca. I would never have thought that this humble little cheese would taste so fantastic. It actually even beats the traditional mozzarella, the cow's milk mozzarella I made. And the good thing is Oaxaca normally is made with cow's milk in Mexico. Um, so great little cheeses. I've still got uh, this one plus five left, but I dare say they probably won't last very long in our family. That's for sure. Well, g'day curd nerds. Today we're making Saint Marcelon or Saint Marcelin, however you want to pronounce it. It's a, a bloomy rind cheese and it's similar in uh, in preparation to say camembert. Um, however, there's a slight little twist. You actually mature it, mature it in clay crocks, uh, which you'll see during the video. Very interesting cheese to make. Um, it was a little bit different than some of the cheeses that I've made before, but nonetheless, simple enough for the home cheese maker. On with the video. So the ingredients for St. Marcelin is three litres of full cream milk, an eighth of a teaspoon or a dash of aromatic mesophilic culture, 16th of a teaspoon of penicillium candidum, a 132nd of a teaspoon of geotrichum candidum, 1 16th of a teaspoon of calcium chloride and a 16th of a teaspoon of liquid rennet. So we're gonna heat the milk to 24 degrees Celsius or 75 Fahrenheit, which is quite low. And then we're gonna add in the aromatic mesophilic culture. Just sprinkle that around. And then we're going to add in the two mold powders. So penicillium candidum first, in no specific order. And then we're going to add in the geotrichum candidum. So let those rehydrate for a while. Now five minutes, I normally let them sit. I just let them covered. So they'll rehydrate. Yes, five minutes, thanks Gavin. And then give them a stir just to incorporate them through the milk. So we're gonna add in the calcium chloride now and we would add in rennet as well. Notice I only poured one in there because the recipe book guys had uh, didn't allow for um, for calcium chloride, but it definitely needs it. So set for 18 hours. Seems like a long time, but I just did that overnight. And then test for a clean break. Yeah, we have a decent break there. It did take a long time. I did test it at 12 hour mark, uh, but now cut the curds into 2.5 centimeters or one inch cube, so rather large. So we do that vertically and we try and do it horizontally. I'm using just a uh, 45 degree angle there to try and get the cuts correct. So I did that, let that rest for about five minutes and took over to the sink area now I'm going to use a skimmer and I'm going to ladle those into four small St. Marcelin moulds. These are smaller than the normal camembert mould. So this did take quite a while. Uh, it took about two hours to do. Maybe a bit longer if I remember rightly. So use all the curd up, don't add another basket in. So once you've got all the curds in there, let it drain for six hours and then flip them over. So as you can see, they're very simple. Just flip them over onto the bamboo mat. And they did fall down eventually after I give them a bit of a tap. So we're gonna salt the surface of um, each cheese before we flip it over again with quarter of a teaspoon of salt. 
So by the six hour mark, you can, they're firm enough to actually take them out of the mold and then flip them over properly. And you'll need to do that to allow the rind to uh, form correctly. So this is the actual second salting here. So we're salting top and bottom with quarter of a teaspoon of non-iodized salt. So they're ready for the ripening box now, just to uh, keep them out the way. And so the uh, cats and dogs don't eat them. <laughs> so they're gonna uh, drain a little bit further now. So over the next two days, just make sure that you keep the, uh, the ripening box clean, the bottom free from whey. So just to make sure you wipe that over with paper towel. You don't want them swimming in their own way because that'll wreck the cheese. So I just normally put a cheesecloth over the top of the box, just like that. So for 48 hours. So after the two days, we put it into the cheese cave and ripen at 13 Celsius, 55 Fahrenheit at 80% relative humidity for two weeks. So there we go. We've got that after five days. It's just starting to bloom now after five days. So don't forget to turn these daily. So I did transfer them to the the bamboo mat on top because I found that the plastic mat was actually not allowing any way to drain freely and that was stopping them from forming their rind. You can see there after 10 days the rind is starting to look really crinkly. That's the geotrichum kicking in. So just keep turning them. Make sure you turn them every single day. If you don't, they actually start to flatten on one side because at the moment what is happening is the paste is starting to form inside the cheeses. So good mold development there. So once again, just make sure that the maturation box is dry all the way is uh, removed by using paper towel and then pop them back in again. Nope pop the lid on and then pop them back into the cheese cove. So this is after 14 days and we're going to, you can either put them in cheese wrap now or if you've got little crocs like I've got. These are ramekins, so anything ceramic is fine. So just push those in. This helps uh, develop the very runny paste that St. Marcelin is famous for. So they all fit in without an air gap in the bottom. And I only had three of these blue ones um, and I uh, found some other crocs. Uh, these clay ones there that have been lined, they've been glazed on the inside, which is necessary for this sort of cheese. It's, it's not a tight fit, but uh, it'll do. Now you can use um, small mason jars. They work uh, just as well. And then you can just sit the lid on top instead of having to put this plastic wrap like I had to here. So you just uh, cover each of the of the ramekins or the cheeses just to keep the moisture in a little bit. And I'm just using plastic wrap and just making a little protective barrier there to make no other moulds grow in there because I'm putting it back in my cheese fridge. So the pottery evens out the moisture and allows the cheese to remain at optimum condition for longer. I found it that the paste developed quite well uh, instead of using cheese wrap. So here we are after another week of development. The top surface is very crinkly. So you can see the, that the geotrichum has really kicked in, which is fantastic. So I'm gonna actually try one of these in a second. So we're gonna cut into the cheese this is just for taste test purposes. I'm gonna let the other ones ripen a little bit longer. So using a spoon, I'm just gonna check the consistency of the cheese. And we have some runny paste. Oh, there we go. 
some runny paste on the outside and it's not quite runny all the way through. So it probably needs a week or two to mature a bit further, but it tastes fantastic. That one went straight into my gob and, uh, and was very delightful. I did share it with um, my lovely wife, Kim, and she agreed that it needed a little bit more ripening. Mmm, there's me trying some more. But you can see there, if I turn it around, there we are. You can see that the paste inside is not quite runny all the way through. Um, it needs to be for this cheese to be uh, to be fully ripened. So I'll ripen that for another one to two weeks, probably two weeks, and then I'll try it again. But it is a delicious little cheese right now. Okay, thanks for watching that session. I hope you got a bit out of it. Uh, and uh, yeah, we now have an interview with John Wilson. And John is uh, running a artisan cheese factory in uh, Cam Pot in Cambodia. I hope I got that right, John. I can see you in the in the green room there. Um, and what we'll do is I'll bring in John now. Um, and uh, we'll have a chat about all things cheese. So here he is. Hello, John. How are you? Hey, Kevin. Thanks for having me. No problems at all. Now, what's that accent? Uh, English originally, but oh. I grew up in Cambodia, so it might have faded over the time. Uh, over time. Yeah, I, I, I found it a little bit hard to pick, but yeah, lovely to see you, mate. Good video too. Oh, so uh, you. You, you run out of power, or the power went off, and you had to go to your phone. Yeah. So I've got an extension lead running from my neighbor's house now to my phone so i can charge it with you <laughs> and it's it's like completely just like last minute improv improvisation I, oh, I wasn't it's, really it's, it's it. crazy <laughs> yeah i, I did a, uh, when i was doing i had to switch to another camera before to um to do the the taste test when i was doing that and the camera mm. died and i <laughs> had to quickly figure out how to fix it so yeah i know i can feel your pain mate i can feel your pain <laughs> that's cool so um you run a artisan cheese factory. What's it called? It's called the Cavignac and Wilton. Uh, yeah. Cavignac is my business partner, Chris Cavignac. Um, he arrived a couple of years ago, and uh, we had this chat like out of nowhere. And like he wanted, he needed to find something to do. I had looked up how to make cheeses before, and like <laughs> we just like it was a perfect match, basically. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. So where is, where's the the Factory is the factory in Campot. Yep, yeah, the factory is in Campot, but the farm is about a hundred kilometers away from here. All right. Like even sorting out the the delivery process for the milk and everything is the uh, is a massive challenge, <laughs> uh, especially here. Like so there's, there's no like, transportation. Yeah, so there's Campot. no infra there's no infrastructure to transport that would normally be like like we would yeah, have here exactly. in Australia. Yeah, exactly. So no milk tankers and stuff like that? No, well, they have for the farm, but we, we don't buy enough milk currently to, to, to afford to use it. So at the moment, we have small milk containers, like 50-litre uh, milk jars yep. and uh, some insulating boxes. And we basically put them in, uh, in a taxi. He goes to the farm, picks up the milk, and brings it back in the, in the boxes. <laughs> that's, that's ingenious. Mate, where there's uh, a will, there's a way, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Um, <laughs> so what kind of cheeses do you make? Um, camembert, brie, like a lot of French style cheeses. My, uh, my business partner is French and uh, I grew up a, a bit in France before coming to Cambodia. So it's bit, it had a big influence on, the, on my eating needs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so like camembert, brie, tom, uh, raclette, saint marcelin um, we've experimented also with feta and mozzarella, yeah. uh, but they don't prove to be as popular. Uh, our most popular is uh, the camembert so far. It, we're making a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, we call it camembert the cam box. Right. <laughs> Lovely. Nice. You don't get a cease and desist from camembert to Normandy? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I know all about uh, that. that was, uh, 
funny. <laughs> oh, the cheese, the cheese and desist cheese recipe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was really cool. Um, I'm just trying not to lose my voice, so I'm just taking it, taking a sip. Now, um, so, uh, so all those French style cheeses you said they're popular there. Is that because was Cambodia part of the uh, French colony? Um, yeah, it was. World War Two. Yeah, it, it definitely was. I think it um, it changed mostly after the Khmer Rouge regime in Cambodia, yeah. about uh, 40, 40 years ago. Um, and like a lot of the culture from Cambodia before that is it, it, it's not vanished; it's still there, but very it, it's not as apparent anymore. It's um, it, it really had a massive effect on the country, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen the the documentaries and that sort of stuff on the terrors that happened during Pol Pot's regime. So, yeah. Well, but at the same time, everywhere, all the Cambod- Cambodians voted, uh, voted the, the happiest, lost the most smiley country in the world. And it's true everywhere you go, everyone's smiling, everyone's happy, and uh, it's a really lovely place to be. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> Sounds really good. <laughs> <laughs> so, as far as the French, uh, if, if there's any French culture left, um, but um, they would love the the French style cheeses. Is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. 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 Exactly. There, there's still a lot of uh, French expats there for sure. Like. Mm. Um, yeah. So, so the demand for your product. Are you the only sort of French cheesemaker in Cambodia yeah. you know of? Yeah, we are at the moment. There is another. There's a local Khmer uh, that learns how to make uh, cheeses in France, I believe, and she's up in Siem Reap, uh, making Italian style cheeses like mozzarella and um, uh, burrata. He makes a lot of burrata, and then yeah, we we make uh, mainly the French style cheeses at the moment. Oh, fantastic! And there's, there's only the two of us in the whole of Cambodia. It's a oh, very right. new opportunity to be able to do this because. For a long time, there has there, there's been um, no dairy farms in Cambodia. Uh, it's not part of the, the local diets at all. So it's very it's been introduced a couple of years ago, and mm-hmm. uh, slowly, slowly. So uh, it's, it's going, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So the, the the dairy that you get your milk from, uh, what sort of cows? What, what breed of cows are they? Uh, they're Frisian Holstein. Right. Uh, yeah. They're imported, imported from Australia. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they have about five hundred cows there, yeah. and it's like a state of a uh, state of the art farm. Most of everything is automated. There's like as little human interaction as possible with the cows. Um, but even getting the milk in the beginning was a was a challenge because they didn't want to they didn't want to sell raw milk to individuals. Right. So we were able to buy about forty liters the first time for our first uh, experiment. Yeah. Which was uh, only about. So the first one we ever did was only four camemberts following your recipe, your oh. raw, raw milk camembert. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> and before that, we, me and uh, my mate didn't really know much about cheese. Like, we, it, it, The good thing in Cambodia is that you have the freedom to have an idea and then execute it without having to worry so much about permissions, licenses, all this. Obviously, we still follow all the, the hygiene standards. Sure. But, but there's no one that comes and enforces it, and um, uh, it just makes it easier for for every type of business venture. Yeah. That's fantastic. So why 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 did you make start making cheese in the first place? So you say you and your mate make the cheese, right? Mm-hmm. Why? why why did you start? <laughs> well. Uh, when it comes down to it, it's basically my love. Oh, well, me and my business partner's love of cheese and the the crazy price of cheese here because uh, there's forty five import ta- uh, forty five percent import tax oh. uh, on on cheeses coming into Cambodia. Yeah. So it's like a luxury to be able to have cheese, and uh, we saw the opportunity to buy the milk and make it ourselves, and it <laughs> it was perfect for us. Yeah. And yeah, we, we we would like to also. Uh, we're trying to get the the price down as cheap as possible. For example, with the camembert, it started at twelve dollars fifty for a two hundred and fifty gram wheel. Yeah. And now we're down to eight dollars fifty, and then we're trying to get down to to five dollars eventually to be able to to make it not such a luxurious product. Yeah. Well, look over here. Even here in 
Vincent, um, Vincent Camembert here, made in, by Artisan Cheap, like, is going to cost us about twelve dollars a in the world. So, you know, so I think your price point's probably okay. It depends on the um, demographic of the country. I know there's, uh, as far as expats go, they've probably got a bit more cash, maybe yeah, than, sure. than the locals. So. You know, yeah, up, in, up in the capital, like also for sure in, in Phnom Penh. Yeah. Um, there's a lot higher, uh, a lot more higher paying jobs up there. Uh, in Kampot, for example, it's pretty hard to, to make money, even if you're Western, un unless you're working online. So to be able to make cheese and sell it, and it's like, <laughs> it's a dream. <laughs> I bet it is. So where do you sell it? Uh, a lot of restaurants, uh, a couple of supermarkets at the moment, but it's still very low scale. Um, we've only recently got a cold room, which we're in the process of installing at the moment. Mm. Uh, but otherwise, we're just using fridges, regular fridges. Yeah. Uh, and with small humidifiers and temperature regulators. Uh, so the amount we could produce is, um, it is very limited at the moment. So you're hoping to scale up once you get that cold room up and out running, yeah? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So when you make a batch, how many litres in total do you make a batch and what sort of vat do you have? So even the vats, uh, we have about, we, they're about 50 litres. They're really small ones. So we have to heat the milk in small, in like small amounts, then add it together, make sure it's the right temperature and if not, correct it. And um, like the whole process is... It's already quite a complicated process, but and but this is just adding so many more steps to it, mm. um, which we're trying to. Uh, but it's just the beginning, you know. Like it, it's the same as it is with everything. There's always going to be hiccups along the way that you have to move out. Yeah, exactly. So, how many years have you been producing the cheese for sale now? Uh, we started just over a year ago now. For like the 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 first four camemberts that we made were about. Yeah, 14, 15 months ago. Oh, okay. And you've gone from there. So, when yeah, and now we're, we're, we're producing, um, we're, we produce once every fortnight, and uh, it's about 350 liters uh, we order of raw milk. Oh, okay. And we divide it up into uh, camemberts, brie, tom, or raclette, and, uh, and ricotta at the end of the day. Mm, of course, you'd be you'd be crazy not to make a ricotta and sell that as well. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> An interesting thing I've learned about whey recently is that you can actually turn it into bioethanol. Oh, right. Yeah. So we're we're actually looking into that to to reduce our, our waste, and it, we can you can use it directly in a motorbike. Sorry, I know this is not cheese related, but no, 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 that's fine. Kick out. <laughs> So yeah, the, so we're going to start experimenting with that. At the moment, we're just making ricotta with the whey, and then unfortunately, we we just throw it out, like hundreds of liters. But yeah, uh, yeah it's definitely been a, a, a good year. <laughs> I can say. Yeah. There's some there's some companies here in um, Tasmania in in, uh, in Australia that actually make gin with the whey. So, oh yeah. Yes, yeah, so they so they make that as an alcoholic product and sell that as well. So they got a license to to make the so they get the whey from the local cheesemaker mm -hmm. and then make gin out of it as well. Oh wow, that's really interesting. Okay. So uh, then, have you ever tried that? Uh, yes, I have. It's delicious, so nice. <laughs> the nice um, juniper berry flavour to it. Um, you know your typical gin flavour, nice gin flavour. So. Yeah, it's it's delicious. You couldn't tell oh, it was made from whey. Oh, I have to I have to look that up too. It becomes a, yeah, like an interesting experiment. <laughs> Indeed, and I'm not sure what yeast they use. I would have no idea. I know they have to then fill it um, at, to produce the gin and then add flavourings to the gin. But it, it look yeah. it's, something, it's something to think about if you're if you're into that sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. Especially on like small scale, you have to to try and make something with whatever you have instead of wasting it. Exactly, you know, especially that small scale, like you said, the last thing you want to do is throw away a byproduct like way. Yeah, for sure. Um, so as far as challenges go in your production, when, when you first started off, has the production um, methodology changed 
from when you first started and you've learned stuff as you go along. Tell us about that journey. Well, it, there's diff- there's been so many challenges along the way. It's hard to to really <laughs> to to really really say all of them. Uh, I reckon, I guess the biggest challenge was in at first getting the the milk in the first place. Yeah. Um, because after we got the first forty liters from the farm, uh, they wouldn't let us buy any more basically they were saying the cows were dry even though they had 500 cows yeah, yeah. Uh, uh so we figured that they probably just didn't want to sell to individuals uh but luckily a friend of mine that has a spa here in camper the owner of the farm actually goes to his spa and he introduced me and i bought him a cheese plate of the cheeses that i had made from his milk and that like won him over completely and he was oh, like he was very happy that's the um, best part, yeah but uh, but also uh, cross contamination is is like we had a little hiccup in the in the beginning also with uh, the bee linens bacteria. Yeah, we're on the combat. Um, it, we just used the same fridge uh, as we had used for Tom, and uh, it, it started growing all over the camel bears basically. Yes. Although it didn't, um, it was still delicious. Yeah, we, but it just wasn't camel bear. Yeah, you could just call it some other kind of wine <laughs> cheese. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And there's been a couple also where the camembert, for some reason, has dried out a bit. Yo, I've just lost you. Anyway, yeah, it looks like we've lost John, but I dare say he'll be back in a minute. The His network signals just died uh, down to zero out of ten. So we'll see how that goes when he, he should come back in a second. Um so I will uh, just quickly drop him out and he'll come back in again. So there we go. So very interesting so far. It's lovely to see the journey of some enthusiastic young people um, making cheese where there was a, mar- a known market for it. So uh, very interesting indeed. I hope John comes back in a second. Um, so his neighbour, <laughs> oh, that is hilarious. Yeah, his uh, neighbour turned his Wi-Fi off. Oh, that's so good. But, yeah, hopefully he comes back in a second. Um, but, yeah, oh, here he comes, I think. I heard a da-ding. There he is. He's back again. I don't know what happened there, mate. I think it dropped out. Yeah, so, yeah I think my uh, neighbour's electric turned off. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's what, are you picking back and off his Wi-Fi as well? Uh, basically, yeah. But it's uh, it's the owner of the Howling at the moment, so I'm sure he doesn't mind. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. That's hilarious. <laughs> oh, no, well done. Uh, yeah, because it would be a killer if you were trying to use 4G for a one-hour interview. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm on yeah. 4G at the moment. Now his power is still off. I've had to reconnect on my, on my data. Oh, good on you, mate. Yeah, well, I hope it doesn't cost too much. <laughs> no, yeah, it, it, everything's pretty cheap. But... <laughs> All right, cool. Now, where we're up to, we're talking about your bee linens problem. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that that was a one-time deal. We just didn't realise um, how easy the cross-contamination happened, basically. And uh, we had another another issue like this when we first received the, the Rock 40. Yeah, mold. We still haven't done any experiments with that, but I just opened the cap inside the the cheese making room, and then a couple of days later, a few of the camemberts inside the fridge started having dots of blue blue mold on them. And we're like, yeah. whoa! It's like it just spread. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've lost you again. I don't know what's going on. Uh, right. So, um. Yeah, we keep losing John. He seems to be having some network issues, which is uh, okay. We'll, we'll we'll get him back again. He'll come back in a second. But yeah, as far as um, continuing on with uh, John's conversation about cross contamination, I can attest to that. Uh, I found that um, if I don't actually use um, if I don't use bleach to clean out my ripening boxes that I've ripened, say I've ripened a, uh, a blue mold cheese in the, um, uh, in the, in that ripening box. And I don't use bleach to clean it and sanitize it. 
it will cross contaminate every time. Uh, so yeah, you've got to be uh, meticulous when it comes down to cleaning those ripening boxes, or in uh, in John's case, the the fridges that they're using uh, from one cheese to another. If you can, then obviously stick to one fridge per style of cheese. Um, so. Um, yeah, that definitely is an issue, is is cross-contamination. Now, hopefully he'll be back in a second. Obviously, um, like I said, he's having some network and power issues uh, there in Cambodia, which is, is not very good. But until uh, John comes back, if anybody's got any questions uh, that they would like me to answer, then uh, shoot them into the the chat and I will answer them as best as I can. Um, looks like John's back again. Let's let's see how he's going this time. Where is he? There he is. <laughs> All right. I can't hear you. Can you? No, he's frozen again. Goodness me. Okay. So, yeah, if anybody's got any questions, then throw them in the chat and we'll, we'll get to those. Uh, yeah, it, it keeps crashing. So... Um, uh, Titus says, uh, I use a pressure cooker to sterilise some items. Indeed, that would be, uh, that certainly works. It's very li uh, like a uh, dentists and doctors use a thing called an autoclave, uh, which uh, has high pressure steam and high temperature steam, higher than 100 degrees Celsius. Very similar to a pressure cooker. Uh, and that's how they sanitise all of their stainless steel utensils and stuff like that. If you've got that sort of stuff, then yeah, look, I'm not saying it's overkill or anything like that. If you've got that stuff to sanitize uh, equipment that can become uh, contaminated, then yeah, go for it. Um, however, if you've got things like plastic molds that are made from uh, high density polyethylene, uh, which is food grade plastic, then the best thing you can do is, um, uh, is use a bleach solution or uh, wash them in hot, very hot soapy water and then uh, rinse them in, in boiling water. Uh, and then for added protection, I add a little bit of, um, uh, a little bit of uh, white vinegar and, and spray that until it, it works. So uh, Robert has just uh, rightly stated that pouring ball or boiling water over equipment will work. Um, Oh, so will pouring board. Well, I find with the plastic stuff it does, Robert, um, and then I follow it up with some white vinegar until the white vinegar dries uh, because the, the moulds are a little bit warm, so, you know, they will they'll dry off. So that works. On I haven't had a contamination issue uh, at all. So um, uh, Lacrette has a question and says... Um, I have a question. Any ideas how to guess how to screw press screwing to do a good uh, cheese, for example, howder? Um, Lacrette, what I do, um, and there is a video that I've um, made about the uh, spring press that I have, um, and the spring press uh, is a the, the spring itself is a fifty pound a fifty pound or twenty two kilo. Uh, spring. So that, that's how much weight it takes to close the spring fully closed. So I use that as an estimate. So half closed is about um, uh, 25 pounds of, of pressure or weight. Um, I know the two aren't interchangeable, but it seems to work for me. Um, or about um, uh, 11 kilograms and then fully closed is 50. So I just gauge it um, by by doing that, the compression of the spring. So I hope that helps, mate. Um, Andy says, uh, if you have cheeses that need maturing at different temperatures, uh, for example, 10 degrees C versus 12 degrees C, do you need more than one cheese cave? Um, so the answer to that is no, because different fridges have various temperatures within them. Just get your thermometer and check the different levels of temperature. All right, it looks like John's back again. Uh, there he is. Uh, yeah, sorry about that, mate. <laughs> that's all right. It seems to be dropping. It looks like somebody just flashed up the curd nerd light. So, <laughs> Super Chat, thank you very much to Cheryl. I'll just show that. Uh, Cheryl says, it's almost 2.30 oh, yeah. a.m. in Florida. 
how are you doing? Uh, well, I'm doing okay, Cheryl. So thank you very much. And uh, John, are you still there? I seem to have lost your video again. Uh, it's, it says weak signal. So not a very good connection. Seems to be dropping out all the time. Um, okay. So, oh, it says you're good again. No, he's gone. Oh, well. Um, we'll see if, um, we, John, if you're listening, mate, if um, we w we can reschedule our interview um, at a later date when you've got power back on and proper internet. Um, and what we'll do, instead of coming back on again and trying all the time, uh, I'll reschedule one and we can then put that up on the channel after we do a, an interview without um, the technical issues, if that's okay with you. So um, all good. But yeah, um, back to uh, what uh, Cheryl's saying. Um, how am I doing? Well, I suppose, what? how many hours are we? We're in nine and a half hours into the chat. Uh, into the stream. So I'm feeling a, a little bit tired, but not too bad. But thank you so much for that kind $20 super chat, Cheryl. I really appreciate it. Um, okay. Um, Lacrette says that I only have a, sc a screw press uh, for cheese making. So what you may need to do, Lacrette, is get a, a spring um, and we do sell them. Uh, I'm not sure where you're located, but we do sell them. Uh, they're fairly cheap. And, um, uh, yeah, so you'll know, a spring helps you determine what the pressure is uh, on the press. Um, Titus says that uh, John is a interesting chap. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to, without the technical issues, I'd love to have a, a full-blown uh, interview with uh, John. But he, he called me up about half an hour before the... Uh, before the before he started again, and um, and said that um, uh, he was having uh, issues. The power went out. The internet went out. Uh, so he had to go to his phone. And uh, yeah, subsequently we're having some issues. But yeah, he seems like a nice guy. I'd love to um, delve a little bit deeper into some of the things that they're doing. I had like five more questions to um, to ask him. So yeah, very interesting. Um, all right, so what we'll do um, now that uh, that uh, John has finished, and, and so sorry, John, uh, really interesting. I was really getting into uh, that conversation to uh, to learn more about your artisan cheese making uh, factory and process there in, in Cambodia, which seems to have lots of challenges, but you've overcome a lot of them, so that's fantastic. Okay. All right, so what we do have, we have a gallery, and I did forget to show you this. Um, so let's uh, let's bring up the gallery. Uh, people have sent me in photos, so let's uh, let's bring that up and all of the little comments. So first cab off the rank, we have um, we have a net. And let me see if I can bring that up and then share the screen. All righty. Let's have a look at this. So always be prepared, Scout's motto. <laughs> All righty. So here we go. So an impromptu gallery. So Annette sent me in some cheeses and she uh, sent me in cheeses. Um, she said that, um, oh, where's the email gone? My goodness, I've lost everything now. Where are you, Annette? Um, she sent it in this morning. Uh, Annette, where are you? No, I cannot find it. Doesn't matter. Uh, Annette says these are a bunch of cheese making photos. She's got a big scroll here. So she's got some blue cheese that she started off with, and then she's got some uh, Budakaiser that she's made. There's the Budakaiser there. Uh, this one, if I remember rightly, was castle blue uh that she made three of and they look absolutely fantastic uh then she made a cotswold which is this one here hopefully you can see my little hand so we've got a cotswold there as well uh that she's made from my recipe and then a blue cheese which i'm not sure what it is i think it was a farmhouse cheddar um and then she made some more <laughs> she got some more cheeses 
And she's got a lovely picture of herself there as well. So she's made this one here was the uh, the Gouda that she's made. Let's have a look. Yeah, it says Annette's Gouda. There we go. So that was made in May 2020 uh, using one of the baskets that I think I sold her. Uh, and then she's got some camemberts or and, and a brie. Maybe I think they're just the camemberts is what she's trying to show there. They look fantastic. And uh, it looks like Annette is a true certified curd nerd. So thank you, Annette, so much for sending in those photos. They look – oh, it's Gorgonzola. Oh, you're there in the chat. Hello. That's fantastic. So, yeah, the blue was a Gorgonzola. So well done. Um, and thanks for the lovely photo of yourself. It's it's very rare that I can put a photograph to a name. So thanks, Annette. Appreciate it. Okay, so the next photo is from – this is from Carol Leclerc. Uh, and there's there's no – nothing, no, no comments. It was just a photo that was sent through to me, and it says, uh, all I've got and the only cheese that I've made so far – is a queso fresco. And I tell you what, that is a good-looking queso fresco. Uh, I'm not sure what you're using as a mould or a mat there, but it's got some nice little dimples on top, so very cute. Um, so good-looking and a lovely-looking cheese. So well done. Thank you, Carol, for sending that in. Uh, the next cheese is from Celeste, and Celeste has a note here. What's it say? Uh, Celeste says, uh, hi, Gavin, looking forward to the 12 hours of cheese. I hope you're enjoying it, Celeste. Um, says, I've attached my my two latest creations. Uh, this one is Blue by You at two and a half months. And the next cheese is a tome. Um, and the last comments from Celeste says, I just love taking photos of mould. It is so interesting, but that tome looks amazing. It looks like you've wiped that down and growing the proper uh, rind on it. So well done. I, I made a tome once and it wasn't as good as I wanted it to be, uh, but this one looks great with a nice rind development. So there's another picture of the tome. There it is there, nice and close. But, um, yeah, well done. Uh, that looks fantastic, Celeste. Well done to you. Okay, so the next photo is from uh, Timothy, and Timothy sent these in early this morning. I managed to get them, uh, and there was no uh, commentary per se, so uh, the cheeses are in no particular order than he sent them in. Uh, this is a canestrato, canestrato, yeah, that's how you say it, um, so, which is an Italian table cheese that is not aged very long, it's quite fresh. Um, I've yet to make it. Make it. I, I do have a recipe for it, so I might pop it on the list, actually. It looks worth making, that's for sure. Uh, Canestrato. Right, so I'll put that on my list to make with the yesterday's cheese. So that should be very interesting. So the next cheese that Timothy sent me in, uh, this one is a, a, cran a cherry... Wensleydale. So made in the Wensleydale style, which takes uh, a lot of effort to make. Wensleydale is a, a bit of a pain, as I meant, as um, who, to who were talking about? I think it was Jennifer to was, we were talking about it. Um, but yeah, it is, um, it is a difficult cheese to make. It takes a long, long time. But kudos to you, Timothy. Uh, I like the cherries in it. Uh, there was no mention of the flavour of the cheese, but it certainly does look very, very nice indeed. Uh, the next cheese that Timothy sent me was uh, the cheese that cannot be named. So this is a Grana-style cheese uh, that he's made, and, and it does certainly look very grainy. Uh, it's the texture it's supposed to be. Uh, it looks a little bit dry, but I think it's been aged for a long time. So it's still a very good looking cheese. Um, the Grana Padano, oh, I can't say that word. They'll get me again. Um, the um, uh, cheese and desist cheese that I made, 
uh, was was delicious. It was really nice, grainy. Uh, it had that deep, rich uh, picante or picante uh, flavour um, that is known for those styles of cheese like um, Grana Padano and Parmigiano Reggiano. Um, but, yeah, making them in small batches, they do tend to dry out. So thank you, Timothy, for sending that in. I think there's one last photo from you. Uh, here it is, yeah. So this is a, a pepper jack, and it looks like he's used uh, fresh uh, green uh, chilies and dried red chilies. And uh, because of the high acidity, it looks like it's fairly crumbly, um, but nonetheless a very good-looking cheese. So uh, I'm very impressed with that. So well done, Timothy. Um, is there any other comments there is another cheese where is it uh it's not here why can't i see it did i put it in there uh this one should be from nick i don't know where i put it hang on let me just search for this here it is there we go um hang on i'll just uh change shared screens two seconds uh looks like John's back, but we'll we'll get to that in a sec. If just hang on there for a sec, John. I can see your video, so we'll go from there. Um, and this final one's from Nick. This is a UK Platinum Jubilee cheese, uh, and his comments around this are that the uh, it's a UK Platinum Jubilee cheese. It's actually a Colby Cheddar style uh, from my video with edible glitter added for the platinum thing. So very patriotic. Um, God bless the Queen and all that. So thank you, Nick, for sending that in. Now, it looks like we do have uh, John back, and there he is. He's back again. Yeah. So I've driven down the road. I'm on the riverside now. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. So you've got ample battery and better reception? Yep. Yeah, I'm using right. uh, the, the hostel's Wi-Fi. Oh, <laughs> I love your work, mate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let me just um, grab my little questions again. Um, two seconds. Bear with me. Unexpected uh, return of John. Let's have a look. Here he is. All righty. So we talked about uh, challenges that you had. So what are some of the best successes and unexpected cheeses that you've managed to produce? Um. The, the best cheese we produce is probably the brie. Um, so we use, um, we get the milk in the quantity and then we skim part of it to make some after that. And then with that cream, we use it for the brie. Oh, and, fantastic. Um, this is actually something we were doing wrong for a while because we were buying UHG cream, uh, very expensive also here. Yeah. And then, but it was giving the brie a really sour, bitter flavor at the end where, and a lot of people... It was just too strong for them. Yeah. Like, it, was, it was still pretty decent, but it was just like a really strong camembert, basically. Uh, and now that we've realized this, what the problem was, and that we're adding the cream from the skimmed milk for the uh, for the mm. uh, yeah. that that's changed everything, and it's uh, it's absolutely beautiful now. Well done, mate. That's a great <laughs> troubleshooting solution. <laughs> also, like it, it's pretty cool to see. Um, to see locals eating more and more cheese uh they they have this thing here called pohok uh which is like a fermented fish basically but everyone calls it cambodian cheese it's got a really strong pungent smell and they love that <laughs> fish. so like it, it's uh it's it, there's a slow transition to, to cheese is also <laughs> from, from <laughs> fish to cheese that's so, uh, and, <laughs> it, it, it's basically fish cheese, yeah. It's like you get all the fish, put it in a jar, and then bury it basically for a year. Oh, <laughs> that'd be smelly, wouldn't it? It smells very strong, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> now, before I lost you last time, you were talking about cross-contamination issues. Oh, have, yeah. you have you managed to figure that out and, and fix it all up? Um, so we're taking a lot more care now when, uh, when we're using the different bacteria and everything is separated properly. So we have a, a fridge, a, a fridge per type of cheese, basically. 
Yeah, funny. I exactly what I expected um, as I lost you. I thought, yeah, use one one cheese per type of one fridge per type of cheese, and that'll yeah, exactly. that issue. And the good thing is the the different generations of the bacteria will give you a unique flavour to your type of cheese. So you'll have, even though it's it's contaminated in that fridge, you'll get that amazing flavour that will just continue to develop with those cheeses. Mm, yeah, definitely, definitely. There's, um, especially with, uh, with like, Tom-style cheeses, mm. uh, where, when you continue using the same boards, uh, the bacteria and uh, everything starts developing in the board itself as long as you don't use, like, um, like soap, actual soap. We wash everything with hot water, vinegar, and then dry it in the sun. Yeah, and then put it away quickly after it's dried. Yeah, uh, but yeah. by doing that, the 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 bacteria and everything of the cheese develops over time, and you get a really unique mm. um, type of bacteria that you wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, indeed, and especially with using raw milk as well, that would add to the flavor profile. Yeah. 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 Definitely. That, that's also another thing that we didn't realize in the beginning. Uh, like very amateur mistake, but we sometimes we were putting the same amount of cultures inside the raw milk and instead of taking about 20 or 40 percent off yeah and it, they were became, becoming very very strong also very quickly yeah so there's been loads of trial and error like we've had i think we've thrown away maybe about 20 kilos of cheese and in, in total Ooh. just because uh, <laughs> it was too strong. Because of mistakes yeah look you gotta learn you know yeah um, yeah for sure yeah, I don't know if you were watching um, Ruth, uh, the lady from San Francisco. She was talking about a sixty percent failure rate she had, oh, yeah. and 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 she just kept going and learning as she went along. So yeah, it seems yeah, like you guys are doing the same thing. Oh yeah, but yeah, so persistence is key. Like, if you do something wrong, then do it again and do it right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Learn from your mistakes. Don't do the same thing over and over. Yeah, exactly. Also, this is uh, like with the notes. Like, um, was was it Tracy? I'm sorry, I'm terrible with name. The last interview you had? Yes, from Canada. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, oh, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> oh, so like persistent. Oh no, sorry, my train of thought is gone, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, uh, uh, no, you're right. So. So when you when you do make changes, like you have something go wrong, when you make changes, do you just change one thing at a time and then see if that works instead of making twenty changes? And then yeah, yeah, basically, um, uh, and also just sitting there and trying to analyze everything we did in case we did something we weren't supposed to. And a lot of the times, it, it is actually that we did something we weren't supposed to because we're making so many different cheeses at the same time. Yeah, especially when you take notes. That's what I was going to say. The importance of taking notes so you can know what you did exactly it is very, very important. Because both for the for the best cheeses that you'll have and for the worst ones, you have to know mm. on each side. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, making only small batches. What's your most popular cheese? So you say you make quite a few different French styles. So what's the one that just flies off the shelf? It has to be Camembert. Yeah, camembert yeah. just fly, flies out. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's the first one we started with. I, I feel like it's a pretty easy recipe to start with. There's not too many steps. You just have to take care of it well. Um, and that's why we started with that. Also, camembert is like the staple in France. Like, if you go to a house, yeah. there's always camembert. <laughs> yeah. So we, we have to have it here. I think we must be like we must have eaten the most camembert <laughs> ever in Cambodia that I've ever eaten. <laughs> That's fantastic. Hey, as long as you eat your own product, it can't be too bad. For sure, for sure. Uh, and it's, it's especially here too. It's growing. Um, uh, people are wanting more and more locally made products, whether it be um, cold cuts or cheeses or alcohol. Uh, there's there's a lot of small artisanal makers that are starting especially after covid it's, yeah. it, it's hard to make money here in the first place but after covid it, it's even it was even harder so a lot of people have turned to, to making their own products and then selling that and there, there's a there's a small community emerging of uh, artisanal food makers of like any description 
Yeah, it's yeah. really cool. Yeah, it's very that, great. That's fantastic. Um, so <laughs> as far as your most popular cheese, um, which is camembert, uh, how many? I'm trying to think. How many units would you sell on a fortnightly basis? So at the moment, every every production day we make uh, 90, 90 camemberts. So every month we have one hundred and eighty camemberts. Right, and they and then they sell, all sell out, all gone. Yep, yep. So are you managing to cover? Your, are you managing to cover your costs at the moment? Um, not really. Not. We're we're still not making much money. I think that we make goes straight back into buying milk and buying anything else we need. Yeah. Uh, but with with the new cold room, it's going to help that a lot because we can start producing more and more and more. Yeah. So you're basically just reinvesting back into the business. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, at the moment. That's a good way to do it, mate. Um, yeah. For sure. From from my personal uh, experience from my own home business. I've been, we've been running the e-commerce side of it since 2014, and it was only this year that Kim and I have started to pay ourselves. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a long time. <laughs> yeah, it, it, and it does. You know, it depends on how fast you can ramp up, right? If you can ramp up production like you said you can, then, you know, you should be able to, you know, you should make a living out of it, no yeah. problems at all. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we're getting that. <laughs> yeah, too uh, right. Too right. Yeah, it's so, definitely been a struggle, though. But yeah. Yeah. Are you having trouble sourcing uh, equipment that is help you make a larger scale? Yeah, for sure. Like um, all the all the commercial cheese making equipment is uh, first of all is expensive in the first place, but then to get here with the transport and then the tax involved on it, it is very difficult. Yeah. Um, are you are you trying to source it from China? Well, we have looked, but but we uh, like the catalogue that we have from uh, Kokar in uh, in France, like mm. the the biggest these machinery makers. Yeah. Um, they have equipment that that can that can raise the temperature of the milk by a certain temperature at a certain time. So it it makes it so it's like designed for cheese making. And the ones in China, they don't have that technology yet. So oh, it's more right. annual. A manual process that you would have to do you would have to heat up 500 liters of milk by a certain temperature at a certain time which is it sounds very hard yeah yeah it's a, a very similar to using a precision cooker at a small scale yeah yeah exactly so yeah. at the moment we, we have to just heat up everything by do double boiling it put it in a bigger container so it's all together and uh, then go from that yeah Oh, fantastic! The ingenuity you guys are using to to, to help, <laughs> help make more cheese is is uh, is is very good. I'm I'm, I'm very, very I'm very pleased that you managed to pull it off. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. No problems at all. Um, so there is a question in the chat, and and this is a good one. Uh, it says uh, Cambodians are not t lactose intolerant. Oh, that is a that is a good question because. Because it's not in the in the, the daily diet. Coffee, they don't yeah they they don't eat any at all. So I guess they must be up to a certain point. But I've never I've never heard any problems about it directly from customers. Yeah, oh, that's, that's although good. it's not really a problem that you would <laughs> you would share really. <laughs> no, true. You don't you don't share that you got a bloated stomach and and maybe the runs as well. So <laughs> they'll just keep eating your cheese. That'll be fine. Yeah, and uh, we're we're making a couple of different ways. Like uh, we're making some halloumi with campot pepper on it, and Lovely. then stuff uh, with salted pepper. And then on the outside, we have uh, the pepper, mm. and uh, that is, the locals really love that. The campot pepper is is amazing on cheese. The the flavor of it is it a not... special type of ch pepper or? Yeah, it's uh it's world famous. Like um, oh. especially in France, obviously because of the culture here. Yeah. Um, but but it, yeah, it's a it's a world famous cheese. It's not too spicy, but the the flavor is, is amazing, especially yeah. the the sorted one. Yeah, and and halloumi made with raw milk is just amazing anyway by itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's also I think it's maybe our second biggest seller. Maybe is the halloumi. Yeah, and you could probably pump out some big batches of that as well because you only sell it in small 
small blocks. Yeah, yeah, true. Mm. No, that's good. Yeah, that's good. So um, we're nearly running out of time, uh, John. So uh, what what words of encouragement would you give any person that was thinking of starting their own business uh, <laughs> in a country that doesn't really have a cheese culture? Um. Uh, that's a hard one. <laughs> um, Have a think about the things that you've done and overcome and, and what would you recommend others have a uh, think I about? Like it, it, I feel like it's a little bit easier here just because of the lack of permits required and the licenses and everything. Mm. So there's so many challenges that I can't, I can't even imagine from a first world um, yeah. just because I've grown, I've grown up here since I was 10. And uh, this is like my normal to me. Yeah. Uh, but I would say persistence. And if you make a mistake, you don't just give up on on that because you're it's it's normal that you're going to make mistakes, and you have to just figure out what you did wrong and do it properly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And take notes. <laughs> yeah. Take notes. Uh, the, the notes is so important for sure. That's fantastic. Great advice. <laughs> And it's been fan even with all the technical issues, it's been lovely talking to you. Yeah, and cheers. Man. It's inspiring to see that you guys are actually giving it a good go. <laughs> it's, it's definitely been a challenge. I appreciate your no problems at all, mate. <laughs> all right, we must get together again soon with a better connection and have another chat. Yeah, definitely. Right? yeah, I would love that. I would love all that. right, no drama. We'll schedule that at a later date, and I'll be in contact. How's that sound? Uh, that sounds amazing, Gavin. All right, uh, no, okay. maybe your partner can come along and we can have a, a three-way chat sort of thing. Definitely. He doesn't speak uh, much English, but I feel like uh, the authenticity is there. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You can translate or whatever. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Good on you, mate. All right, thank you, John, for joining us today. Yeah, you too. Thank you. All right, see you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Well, that was John Wilson, uh, and him and his friend have got a – cheese making factory in cambodia so very good and wendy has said something in the chat where is he where is she sorry he uh that cam pop uh pepper is fantastic i've never tried it myself so i'm gonna have to see if i can find some um but yeah big thank you to john thank you so much mate uh for taking the time and you know struggling through the technical issues it's been um, it's been inspirational, the, the sort of things that you've had to overcome, especially when uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't get your hands on the raw product, the milk, and you've managed to um, win over the, the, the person that owned the, the dairy and, and, uh, and get the milk to, to keep producing. So that is so good. And lots of people chiming in on the chat saying thank you. So good on you, mate. Appreciate it. Okay. So we will bring the next session um, forward a little bit. Uh, let me just uh, queue it up uh, and find it. So the next session is uh, another, I know it's a mold ripened cheese session. I'm going to teach you now how to make a uh, chili brie um, Gav style. Uh, sorry, petite chili brie, Gav style. And um, then after that, in 30, so this is only a 30 minute session. Um, then we will have uh, Tutu Said from Bangladesh, who's another artisan cheesemaker. Uh, and he will be chatting to us about all the issues and challenges that he has um, when making cheese. So that is actually fantastic. So um, thank you so much. Um, all right, so let's move over to um, uh, the – let me just fix the audio up. There we go. We should still have Gav on the microphone. Okay, so um, stay tuned for the mould session. It's only a 30-minute session, this one. Um, I'll go and have a quick break and then come back and we'll talk to uh, Tutu from Bangladesh uh, about his cheese-making challenges, so that'll be fantastic. All right, over to the mold cheese session. Well, g'day, curd nerds. Today, we're going to be making petite chili brie. So this is a modification of my uh, fake camembert or stabilised paste washed curd cheese. Uh, which is kind of what 
a lot of commercial cheesemakers uh, make their camemberts uh, like. It's the same sort of process. Uh, you would have seen in the fake camembert video that uh, the cheese has turned out absolutely fantastic. They were a little bit salty. So I've eased back on the brining time for these ones. Um, and I've added in uh, chili flakes into the curds. And I've also added the water that I rehydrated the chili flakes with uh, into the milk to start with. Now, it's going to turn out, well, I hope it's going to turn out into a delightful little cheese. We won't know that until the taste test video, which will be in about four to or four to six weeks. We'll, we'll see how that goes. I've just got to test the little buggers for um, firmness. It starts to get a little bit squishy in the middle. Then I'll know that it's ready to eat. Anyway, they're all wrapped up. Uh, ready to go into the kitchen fridge for their maturation time at four degrees Celsius or 39 Fahrenheit. So let's see how I made petite chili brie. So as always, don't forget to sanitize your equipment. I'm boiling the stainless steel utensils there that I'm using today. And uh, for the plastic uh, molds, I have washed them in hot soapy water and I have sprayed them all with vinegar and letting them dry off. Now the milk I'm using today is Inglenook Dairy's full cream unhomogenized milk. It's a lovely milk, great for cheese making. So the ingredients for this cheese is four litres or four quarts of whole cow's milk, one thirty second of a teaspoon of Flora Danica or Sacco MO36R aromatic mesophilic, one thirty second of a teaspoon of thermophilic culture. You can use any, it's no big deal. 1 32nd of a teaspoon of Penicillium candidum, 1 64th of a teaspoon of Geotrichum candidum, a quarter of a teaspoon or 1.25 millilitres of calcium chloride diluted in a quarter of a cup of non chlorinated water, 10 drops or 0.5 millilitres of single strength rennet diluted in a quarter of a cup of non chlorinated water, an 18% brine solution and one tablespoon of chili flakes of your choice in one cup of non-chlorinated water. So give your milk a stir and start heating it to 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm just heating it initially on the stove top, then I'll transfer it over to my sink where I've got the sous vide heated up the water and that will maintain it during the cheese making process. Now there's a little bit too much water in there, so I'm just taking some out so the pot doesn't float. I'm just putting the plug back in again. So just giving that a quick stir, checking the temperature. And it's a little bit on the low side, so I'm gonna pop the lid on it and uh, move on to the next part of the chili brie process. So over on the stove top, I've got my one tablespoon of chili and I'll add those flakes and the one cup of water to a small saucepan. So we're simply going to uh, rehydrate or sanitize those chili flakes. So we're going to bring that to the boil and then we're going to simmer that for 10 minutes and that should impart some color and flavor into the water as well as Get rid of any yeasts or molds that could have been on the chilies um, by the boiling. So just turn that off and then strain into a bowl and retain both the water and the chili flakes. So let that water cool off. We're going to use it in the process in a minute. Blast all those chili flakes out. I want them in my chili brie. Okay, so the water should, uh, sorry, the milk should be up to the correct temperature now. And it's fairly close, 34, one degree off, that'll heat up. Probably need to turn the sous vide up, uh, probably a degree above the target temperature I want of the milk. But first of all, we're going to add the Flora Danica, just sprinkle that over the top of the milk. Then we're going to add the thermophilic starter culture.
And then we're going to add the two molds, the Penicillium Candidum. And the Geotrichum Candidum. Now allow that to rehydrate for five minutes. And then stir in the cultures and molds into the milk. So once they're stirred in, add the chilli water to the milk and give that a good stir. The milk will change colour slightly, but that's a no big deal at all. Pop the lid on and we're going to allow the milk to ripen for three hours. So start making this cheese early in the morning. So just giving that a quick stir to incorporate the cream back into the milk. Just check the temperature and yeah, it's nearly spot on, which is great. You can see I've got the sous vide set at uh, 36 degrees, so it's above. Now we just check the pH. It should be between 6.2 and 6. So just checking it there. And it's not quite low enough, so it's at 6.4 according to the test strip. So I'm going to leave it for another 20 minutes before I test it again. Let those starter cultures acidify the milk a little bit better. This is how we ensure a stabilised paste. So just giving that a stir again, we're going to check the pH of the milk again using the test strip and it's changed color so it's about 6.2 which is perfect so I'm going to proceed on with the process So just check the temperature, make sure it's ready to go, yep, 35 or pretty close, there we go, perfect. So just turn that down a little bit so it doesn't creep up. So we're going to add the calcium chloride to the milk now, this uh, ensures you get a firm curd set when you're using pasteurised milk, so give that a good stir. Now we're going to add the rennet to the milk. So just give that a stir, but no more than one minute. Now I'm not doing the flocculation method for this cheese because I've used made this recipe before and I know that it's an accurate timing. So allow the milk to set for 45 minutes. And then once 45 minutes has elapsed, we are going to check for a clean break. I just put the knife in, turn it sideways, and if it splits cleanly, which it does, that's perfect. So I'm going to cut the curds into 1.25 centimetre or half inch cubes. Just doing the horizontals with the curd harp there and using the curd knife to do the vertical cuts. Try to cut the curds as evenly as you can. This will help in the long run. Pop the lid on. And we're going to let those heal for five minutes. So you can see the curds have sunk a little bit there, which is a good sign. So what we're going to do now is stir the curds every 10 minutes for three repetitions. We're only stirring for about a minute. We don't want to expel too much whey. So this is the first time. Don't want to expel too much whey because we want this to be a fairly soft cheese. So 10 minutes later, this is the second time. You can see more whey has been expelled. Notice I'm keeping it at the target temperature of 35 Celsius during the whole process. And then this is the third time. 
or thrice. And there we go, just a gentle stir to prevent it from matting together. So I'm going to allow the curds to settle now for 10 minutes. And meanwhile, heat up 1.5 litres or 1.5 quarts of water to the same temperature, 35 Celsius or 95 Fahrenheit. Now we're going to use a ladle and a sieve. We're going to remove 1.5 litres or 1.5 quarts of whey. Just using a measuring jug to gauge that. And then just replace that whey with the water that you've heated up. Just before you do that, though, give it a gentle stir because this stops it from matting as you pour the water in. So give that a stir now. And stir for about 30 seconds just to stop things from matting together. The temperature is about right. It'll stay warm as I keep the sous vide in there. So cover that and rest for 10 minutes. And then stir for another 30 seconds. And then cover that back up again. Now cover and let that rest for 30 minutes. Now that should have all sunk to the bottom. So we're going to dip out the whey to the level of the curds this time. Remove it from the heat. I've just uh, unplugged it and all the water's drained out. And I'll turn the sous vide off and just remove that from the workspace. So to prevent the curds from um, matting, give them a quick stir. So still a bit of whey in there, but that's okay. And now I'm going to add the chili flakes into the curds. So I'm going to mill them in with the curds. So add them in and uh, mix the chilies well. Now I found that a tablespoon of Chili flakes was just right uh, for this cheese. I don't think you want any more, unless you want it really hot, of course. But then you can just use hotter chili flakes. So good stir through. And now we're ready to put the curds into the moulds. Now, initially, I used four uh, 10 centimetre or four inch moulds. Uh, but I may have overstirred the curds because they had shrunk quite a bit. And I found that I didn't have as much curds as I thought I did. But we can fix that later on. So we'll let these drain now for one hour. So after an hour, we're just going to flip the cheese three times in five hours. So they're fairly firm because of this process. Just take them out of the mould and flip them over. It's the easiest way to do it. That way you'll get a smooth surface on the bottom of the cheese as well, as well as the top. So flipping them over, I, a thought came to mind, looking how small they were after that one hour of draining. And I came to a decision point about now. So mine were too small. So what I chose to do was combine two to make one. So I took it out of the basket and popped the two rough surfaces together. There we go. And then I gave them a bit of a press. Had a look at the height and I thought, yeah, that's okay. After the draining, they should be fairly good. So just press them firmly to combine the two layers together. And as it drains, they will knit together anyway. That's what curds do. So just firmly on top. Just placing a mat over the top, keep any beasties off during draining. So that was the 
second, that's the Civic second flipping. So the layers stuck together successfully, so that was a good sign. So I just turned them over. And they're looking about the right height that I was after. Perfect. So this is the final flipping. So I've been flipping for five hours, draining and flipping for five hours. And the cheese is the perfect height that I wanted for the chili breeze. Okay, so after that five hours has elapsed, we're going to remove the cheese from the moulds. And I'm, instead of using my normal brining bucket, I find these smaller cheeses don't brine very well in the brining bucket. I'm just going to use my maturation box and pour the brine. Uh, this is a fresh batch that I made earlier in the day. And you can check out my brining video here. So I poured that in and I'm going to place the uh, two chilli breeze into the brine. Now there's not enough brine in there and luckily I had some in a bottle. So I topped that up. We're going to brine it for two to three hours depending on how salty you want them. So... Now that they're floating, that's a good sign. Uh, sprinkle a layer of salt on top on the top surface and turn after an hour of brining time and then repeat the salting and let it go for two hours, two to three hours. This just ensures that uh, maximum salt is absorbed during that time. So I chose two hours of brining time. I think the initial recipe was like six hours and they were just way too salty. Alrighty, so once the brining time has elapsed and remove the cheeses from the brine and place them on a mat. Smooth those out of the way. I'm just going to save this brine because... Uh, we can use it for our next cheese. So it has got a few chilli flakes in it, so I'm just uh, using a sieve to filter those out. And then I'll store that in my cheese fridge at 13 degrees Celsius. So just give the ripening box a bit of a wipe out after I used it with the brine, with some paper towel. And now we're going to pop the uh, chilli breeze back into the ripening box. Allow those to dry, air dry uncovered for 24 hours. And I turn them about every six hours. Just pop a little umbrella on top of that. Keep any flies or dust or what have you off of the cheese. 24 hours seemed to be enough, so these were touch dry. There we go. Nice umbrella. So cover and ripen in a cheese fridge at 11 Celsius or 52 Fahrenheit at 90% humidity until they're coated with the white mould. So I turn them every two days and have so religiously during the cheese making process. Don't worry too much about those holes. You can see that the mould grows over. It takes about 14 to 21 days for a full mould covering. And there they are. Just a little bit of a flip. Now we make sure we flip them or turn them, those every two days, to stop them from sticking on the mat. If you neglect them, the mould grows through the mat and you are going to tear the rind of the cheese. Okay, looking lovely. I think that's a fair coating. I think I left it for about another two days before I started to uh, wrap the cheese. So once they're fully coated and you're happy with the surface of the cheeses, we're going to wrap each cheese in micro perforated cheese wrap, which you can get readily available from most good cheese making suppliers. 
Here's my attempt at wrapping the first one. Yep, uh, I'm not very good at this. Bit of a dog's breakfast, really. Oh, the agony. I'm, all, I'm also terrible at wrapping gifts, as you can probably figure out here. I promise I'll do the next one much better. Anyway, once you've got it wrapped, then fasten it with a single piece of tape. Put that one aside and then wrap the next one. So I figured out how to do it. You take opposite corners. There we go. Look at that. And then just tuck the sides in, fold it over, and do the same. Half the time it took to do the first one. There we go. Stick a bit of tape on and squish the sides in. Nice. All done. Couldn't have done it better myself. Ta-da! Okay, so what we're going to do now is ripen it further now that they're wrapped. I've just cleaned out my ripening box, pop the two wrapped uh, chili brie in there, and now we're going to ripen them at 4 degrees Celsius or 39 Fahrenheit in your kitchen fridge for four to six weeks until they're soft to press in the middle. Anyway, back to Gav. So as you can see, the process was not very different from the fake camembert. Uh, I wanted to make this stabilised paste cheese again because I really enjoyed the flavour and I jumped at the chance because Kim, my lovely wife, told me uh, she really enjoyed a, a chilli brie that's made by, I think it's Unicorn brand here in, in Australia. Uh, a lovely little uh, uh, cheese and, and I could tell by the structure of it that it was a stabilised paste style cheese. So... Uh, I set out to make it and hopefully we'll soon know in the taste test uh, whether I've achieved that. I do believe that it looks pretty good, uh, certainly from the photos and just studying the cheese uh, with the white mould all over it before I wrapped it. I don't think it'll have too many problems with ageing. So my chilli brie was made in, oh, the writing's rubbed off. Uh, it was a while ago about four, six, maybe eight weeks ago. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, it's little uh, micro perforated cheese wrap. Uh, and it was based on a cheese uh, that we found in the supermarket. It was based on this cheese here, which is unicorn chili brie. And you can see that there. So uh, this has very similar stuff inside that uh, mine does. So it's got milk, cream, salt, starter cultures, non-animal rennet and chilli, which is exactly what I put into my cheese. So let me open this up and we'll have a look at see and see how good the white mould growth was. Um, and yeah, I think my wrapping is actually on par with their wrapping. So that's a good thing. So I'm not such a disaster at wrapping things as I thought I was. Anyway, let's cut this open. I use one, one sticky tape, I think. There we go. Oh, I can see underneath. We've got a lovely white mold coating. Goodness me, look at that. So that's spot on. Oh, I can smell it now. Oh, look at that. That is just phenomenal oh it smells earthy mushroomy mm, just kind of what you want um now this has come up to room temperature if you press it it's a little bit firm which is okay and that's the style remember this was based on the uh, how do i say it again uh it's based on the um uh, stabilized paste washed curd 
white mold cheese recipe that is in uh, Giannaclis Caldwell's Mastering Artisan Cheese Making book. So it's adapted from that. It's not exactly the same. Fairly close, though. All right, so the mold growth is fantastic. Uh, there's no mushiness or, sorry, soggy bits. The mold, there's no blue mold. It's just all white, which is fantastic. So without further ado, let's cut into this bad boy. Oh, no, we don't cut it in half, do we? That's what we do. We do cut a wedge. Oh, that's nice. Cut a wedge there. And look at that. That's magnificent. Yeah, a little bit squishy when you press it. So it's got chilli all the way through it. And... Uh, yeah, the, the white mould has made it a little bit firm. You can see it's aged quite well because the um, around the outside, there's a little bit of rind action going on. It's a little bit darker on the outside than it is on the inside. So this is a typical ex example of a uh, of a, a stabilised paste white mould cheese. A few holes and stuff in it where um, it didn't press, but the, we didn't well, don't press them anyway. They're pressed on their own weight. But let's cut a sliver. Yeah, that is starting to get a little bit gooey there. Now, it's been sitting here at room temperature for about two hours. Yeah, two hours. So let's try it. We'll try it without cracker first. So cracker lacking. And then we'll try it with a cracker. So here we go. Lots of chilli through it, which is fantastic. Mmm. My goodness. The salt, perfect. I think I only salted these for two hours, if I remember rightly. <clears throat> um, uh, two, two to two and a half hours. Oh, absolutely perfect. And the chilli flavour, great. It's not really strong like I kind of expected, but it's between mild and hot, if that makes any sense. Mmm, that is so good. Oh. Mm. So I'm so glad that I actually mixed the chilies through the curds uh, before I put them into the moulds. I think that helped a lot. Uh, and it doesn't really matter. You, you really remember the on the sides of the cheese, there were those, the, uh, there was um, uh, cavities in the sides of the cheese. You can't tell, you couldn't tell now because the white mould's covered it up. It's made a really nice rind. And um, well, there's some uh, mechanical holes in the middle, but like I said, it was pressed under its own weight. The recipe is what it is. And I think it's really good. Uh, not, no, I don't think, I know. I know it's really good because I've just tasted it. Rightio, I hope Tutu is ready. I can see him in the green room. Hopefully he's ready to go. I can see him smiling, so I think he's ready to go. So let me just uh, introduce uh, Tutu, our next uh, uh, guest. Uh, Tutu is from Bangladesh, and he started his own artisan cheesemaking country to a bit like John and to fulfil a niche that was there. Uh, he told me in a we've had a previous chat in the test that he is one of the very few cheesemakers in Bangladesh uh, that makes cheese hard cheeses with rennet uh it's something that they don't do in the indian subcontinent so uh let's have a let's bring in tutu here he is mate you'll have to there you go how are you i can't hear you for some reason you're not on mute or something are you mate There we go. I can hear something. Mm. 
maybe take the headphones out and we'll go from there. Maybe that, that'll do it. And I, I haven't muted you this time myself. <laughs> Hopefully you can hear me. Still can't hear you, mate. Sorry. Technical difficulties. <laughs> it seems to be the go this afternoon. Uh, while uh, Tutu tries to fix that up, um, uh, like I said, he uh, started his own cheese-making factory in Bangladesh. And uh, no, still haven't got you. No sound. Uh, okay, let's. did I do something wrong? Hopefully not. No, it looks good. I've got audio. I don't know. And your network's just dropped out. You haven't got your microphone muted on the um, on the the web page, have you, Tutu? All right, he's just dropped out. So um, hopefully he'll fix that up and come back um, in a minute. There we go. I brought him back in. Still can't hear you, mate, unfortunately. <laughs> cool cat says, have you tried turning it on and off again? Um, sorry, mate, I can't hear you. So that's not good. Uh, I'll let you try and figure it out there. Why you don't have any audio? Maybe take the headphones out and unplug the the thing and use the microphone on the iPad. Sorry about this, curd nerds, but we'll we'll get through this hurdle and we'll get we'll get there. Hello, can you hear me? No, it doesn't seem to be working, mate. Sorry about that. Hello. Let me just, I can see audio coming in. Let me just, there we go. How's that? I can hear. Hello. Can you hear me? No, now I can't again. Oh, one second. iPad, iPad microphone. We heard can you, you hear for me? a second, but. What happened? Hello. Well, somebody can hear you. I can't. Hello. Hello. Oh, loud and clear. Maybe it was me. No. Right, now I've lost his signal completely. Oh, you can hear him, but I can't. Right. Hello. Hang on. Let me see if I can do something there. Um... Let me just change something. Hello. Right. Hang on. Hello. Let's just kill that. Right. There we go. I found the problem. Hello. Hello. Can How you are you? Me? Yes, I can now. But your video Hello. is frozen for some reason. Thank goodness. Goodness me. There we go. How's that? There is, a, there is an echo here. Yeah. Are Hang you, on. Are you I'll getting just, an echo? I'll just fix it. Hang on. I've got to go to a different uh, setting. Sorry, mate. I, I apologize profusely. No problem. Right. There we go. Front camera. Right. <sighs> so, happening, what do I have to do? All happening here today. Hang on. It's just um, now I've lost my camera. Oh, there we go. Oh. Right. I can see you. Right. Now, no echo for me. Hang on. Let me just... Uh, I've got... 
all sorts of stuff happening that's your, not, it's, not... It, it's showing your camera is off yes there we go you are I'm on back now. I'm back there we go I'm back but I, I'm not visible no I've uh, I've got frozen video on you sorry everybody we'll get this video teach yep oh there we go I can see your audio so if you can turn your camera back on maybe we'll have a we'll have an interview hello hello I can hear you mate I can hear you as well I just haven't but got your picture mate my, my but I can't see myself I can no see neither you. can I neither can anybody else mate Can watch it on. Shall I rejoin again? Yes, please. That would be good, and we'll see how we go. Yeah. Right, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry about that. Um, these things look. These things happen when we're live. Um, nothing's ever perfect, and uh, I apologise in advance. We should get two two back in a second. Uh, and there were some tech technical difficulties, my end too. I don't know why things froze, um, but it looks like he's coming back in a second and we'll see how that goes. Uh, maybe not. He's trying to connect again. Use sign language. <laughs> uh, nice one. Um, yeah, we'll get this, we'll get this going and it'll be all good. So he'll be back in a second, hopefully. Um, but like I said, um, in the Indian subcontinent, I know he's in Bangladesh. Which was it was part of the Indi It is part of the in Indian subcontinent. Um, so uh, they don't because of the uh, Hindu religion. They don't use rennet. Well, rennet was sourced from the four stomach of the cow. Uh, so um, it. I don't know if it was banned or uh, difficult to get your hands on because of uh, the religious issues that go with um, uh, cows because they're sacred animals. But he managed to get around it by using vegetarian rennet. Um, and, uh, yeah, the little chat that we had already um, beforehand, before this interview, uh, that hopefully is still going to go ahead, he said that he managed to get around it and uh, has managed to make a business out of uh, selling his own cheese made with rennet. And like I said, he's one of the very first uh, people in uh, Bangladesh that makes uh, harder uh, Italian and French cheeses using rennet. So it's very interesting if we can get him back uh, in a second. But, um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, if anybody will just uh, open up again to questions while we're waiting for Tutu, if we, uh, if anybody's got any questions uh, from anything that's happened during the day, then yeah, feel free to throw them into the chat and I will attempt to uh, answer them as best as I can. Uh, and uh, yeah, happy to do that now. While I'm having a drink and not losing my voice. Oh, he's, you know, he might be here. Rightio. I might have him. He looks a bit frozen still, so I don't have the video for some reason. I think his network connection is um, having some issues. Uh, Robert has a question while we're waiting. Um, how do you find, how do you go about finding raw milk, um, cows and sheep? Well, uh, yeah, you're going to have to contact dairies, mate. That's the only way you can get around it, Robert. Um, especially with uh, the ban or well, here in Victoria, I know, I think you're in New South Wales. So the ban on um, on selling raw milk to customers uh, is is difficult to get around. Um, some places you can do a a cow share type situation where you own part of the cow and you can get around it that way. But uh, raw sheep's milk was difficult for me to get my hands on as well. Uh, a lovely guy um, in New South Wales, a place called um, Arcadia Saltbush Lambs, uh, I think Graham was his name, and he uh, he reached out to me and said, do I want some raw sheep's milk? 
and uh, he froze it, and uh, we got it down to Victoria, where I am, and and uh, I made some uh, a pecorino romano out of it. It was absolutely delicious, so really good. But yeah, you're just going to have to ring around and see if anybody is willing to sell you the raw milk, Robert. That's the only way. There's no list of places because, like I said, in most places it is illegal, so not very good. Okay. Um, so, uh, oh, Tutu's back. So, sorry about that. We'll see if we can get him on there. He yes. Is. Hey. Yes, I can. Big thumbs up. Fantastic. Thank you, mate, for persisting and managing to get that to work. Do we do we know what the issue was? No, but there is a <laughs> message saying that there is a problem occurred, and we are trying to fix it or something like that. Oh goodness! Okay, all right. Well, that's good. I'm glad it's all working now. Fantastic. Yes. So, <laughs> uh, so your name Sorry, is so Tutu to, to Saad Ullah, but that's for you. short, Tutu Saad. All right, Saad. It's not yes. sad. It's sad. No. <laughs> so, so you're not you're not a sad person. You're a happy person. <laughs> Thank um, you, fantastic. It's a relief that it got connected. Yes, yes, indeed. Now, mate, you you started off by making your own cheese at home, right? Yes, I just started as a hobby. Yeah. Uh, about five years back, but word of mouth it spread. Yeah, you know, I tried my first cheese. It was a, um, I think it was an. I got some from somewhere uh, a recipe, which was an uh, old Amish uh, uh, recipe. All right, uh, yeah. With yogurt, right? The, yeah. That was the yogurt as the uh, Amish as a culture. Yeah. So I tried it. I didn't have anything. My daughter lives in England. He sent me in a small bottle of. Uh, uh, run it most probably from Amazon right. and that's, that's what I used I didn't have anything right. so I made the mold with a you know round uh, mold I perforated it everything uh, in Bangladesh most probably I'm the first person who actually uh, tried making European style hard cheeses Oh, mate, that's fantastic! And you pers persisted all the way through, and now you actually sell them on your um, your Facebook I, I, page it's a, as well. It, it, it's it's a journey with failure and successes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, there were times when I was absolutely, you know, I didn't know what to do. Mm. But it's just such an engrossing hobby. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a passion. It's a such a passionate thing that. Uh, I couldn't leave it. Yes. Yeah, so once, you, once you're bitten, you can't stop, right? Yeah, it's simply you can't stop. Now, I don't know what to do. It has, uh, I, I never wanted to go into a business, but I'm forced to. I have around 5,000, my Facebook, uh, you know, uh, they're not always, but about three to 400 regularly, you know, uh, pestering me. <laughs> Right. Not the right the word for it. Uh, so, this is how the whole thing started. Mate, that's Initially, fantastic. I started I started with four liters of milk. Now I use around hundred liters. Mate, that's and, fantastic. And the vats and everything I have designed myself. Uh, my, I must tell you, I'm basically uh, I, I I'm an industrial designer, product designer. Right. Uh, yeah. Actually, that could. My profession is making uh, how do clothes in Bangladesh. I'm the CEO of a uh, company uh, yeah. where uh, where I make wooden hard hardwood floors. Right. So do you are you so do you make uh, cheese full time now? Have you given up the hardwood floor business? No, 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 no. That's that's my bread and butter. <laughs> hardwood right. floor. But uh, the artisan cheese. I usually uh, make. Uh, I, most of the time, I follow you. Oh, you, are my, you are my. You are my cheese guru. Let's be frank about it. <laughs> That's not. Though A few I people have, have said that today, apparently. No, no uh, actually, I have in my in my Facebook about two years back. I think there was a post. I uh, showed you a picture, 
and said that this is my guru, my cheese guru. <laughs> <laughs> if you go back, you'll find it. Bye. Thank anyway, you so much. Uh, anyway, uh, your instructions are so methodical yeah. and any layman can follow it up, provided he has little <laughs> yeah. layman over here. It's not, uh, it's not difficult. But you know, there are uh, times when I have failed, the things yeah. didn't work. So I tried to, I wanted to find out what actually went wrong. Mm. Uh, then after, again, trial and error, yeah. I could perfect it. In my, whatever I do, I usually uh, try to, uh, you know, go up to the end. <laughs> Yeah. Until unless I'm satisfied, I'm, I, uh, until I, I, uh, I reach the perfection. You yeah, can say exactly. it like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so what made you go from making your own cheese at home to making artisan batches of cheese and selling them? Was, it, was there something uh, that you wanted to strive for something better? No, actually, how, how it happened, I don't know. It was a absolutely... Uh, Home home cheese making. Yeah, I my office was next door, so I moved it to my uh, next room to my office where I used to sit. So yeah. on that desk, I started making, and from four liters, it went to twelve liters, then twenty liters, then thirty liters, and with two pots of twelve uh, liters of you know, I uh, I had I was looking for a. Uh, you know, the uh, large kind of pots, which, yeah. is, which was also not available in Bangladesh. So yeah. I fabricated one. Then right. I, I got hold of someone and I made it. The first pot was around 35 to 40 liters. And that also I couldn't manage as the, you know, the demand started uh, increasing. Increasing, yeah. I, 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 I made another vat, round vat with uh, stainless steel the food grade stainless steel yeah and uh, it, it, i could manage with 100 liters at a time yeah so it became about twice a week uh both soft and hard cheese oh mate that's fantastic so does the the, the pots that you fabricated the 100 liter one is <laughs> does that have a water jacket or how do you heat it i get it heated uh you know uh, i usually put a i have designed a uh, like you have, you have a double, uh, a double pot. You know the yep. steam thing. It's a, yep. it's a shallow thing, uh, and I have a, this induction heater, the induction thing, and yep. which heat, heats up the, the water underneath, and that actually uh, heats the milk. Oh, mate, that's fantastic! And, and, have, you, and you've got precise temperature control, right? Yes, I, I have. Uh, uh, I have uh, managed to get, when I go abroad or when someone comes, they bring it for me, uh, you know, the, uh, the milk thermometer and things like that. All right. Okay. Now, that's so, fantastic. Well done, mate. So as far as somebody <laughs> asked the question in the chat, um, and I'll just put it on the screen, it says, Mr. Tutu, do you use buffalo milk or cow's no, milk? No, I, I use cow's milk because... I can't get buffalo milk in Dhaka, in the capital. I'm actually based in capital. Oh, it's right. a, okay. you know, it's a yeah. big city. Yes, so yes. the dairy also, dairy industry has picked up, uh, you know, in last uh, seven to 10 years. That right. was not such a dairy industry. Now, uh, a lot of uh, fast food shops have uh, sprung up. And for the demand of mozzarella and, you know, the American processed cheese, Jeez, the yeah. Yeah. The sliced one. They usually used to get it from your your country. Right. <laughs> from, from, Australia. Australia. <laughs> from Vega, I think it, it's a, a company uh, which usually sells those sliced cheeses here. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so there are just uh, four or five uh, enterprises. They usually uh, making this to kind of cheeses like mozzarella and yeah. uh, the soft processed cheese. But I'm the only one who is doing this, uh, you know, from hard cheeses, from uh, cheddar to, you know, Dutch cheeses and Swiss cheeses, Italian yeah. cheeses, and, uh, you know, in soft cheeses like 
feta and uh, halloumi and yes. uh, ricotta these things yes. uh, you must understand in uh, uh, in this subcontinent though the portuguese introduced this 400 years back the yes. cheese making it didn't survive there is one particular place in bangladesh the northern part of uh, the capital uh, they make this indigenous round kind of uh, uh, in a uh, wicker basket in a bamboo yeah. basket yeah. Uh, it's a it's a soft cheese like hard feta feta right. and uh, uh, they uh, kind of make three holes and insert uh, 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 salt Right. Just not sea salt, just just normal salt. Yeah, yeah. But in the uh, shelf life is around uh, two weeks maximum. Right. That and was the goes, only cheese. That's and it goes that moldy. Only cheese that was. Right. So. And it gets slimy and moldy, and yeah. not uh, it loses its freshness. So, how difficult is it to get your hands on rennet? I was talking while you were uh, getting the technical issues sorted out that. Uh, because of religious issues, uh, getting your hands on rennet is a difficult thing in Bangladesh. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, in Bangladesh, we do slaughter uh, cows. Right, so you can get rennet. It's a, it's a Muslim country. That's right. right. But right. In, in India and other places where there's a religious uh, thing is involved, and most probably, I don't want to go into that. No, you no, know, sure, but, sure. You know. In, in Amazon also, Amazon, in, they have opened a yield. And they, can't, they also don't import rennet. Right. Uh, so recently what I heard that they're uh, selling vegetable rennet, right. not animal rennet. Perfect. That's but, exactly but, what I use. Yes, that's, that, that's right. And now because of these uh, uh, demand for mozzarella, some suppliers have come up in Dhaka. Then they what? Uh, not too many companies. Char Char Hansen is one yeah. that they bring in those already prepacked uh, small sashes for cheese making. The one gentleman is very kind enough to get some of the both mesophilic and thermophilic culture for me. Right. So that's one. That's the locally I get. Otherwise. Yeah. My, either my, I go abroad or uh, I ask my, you know, once upon a time I used to be a <laughs> pilot yeah. and uh, I ask my friends and others if they can uh, hand carry something for me. Usually, right. mostly I get my cheese, uh, cheese uh, uh, cultures and enzymes and things from England. There's right. a company called uh, uh, Goat Nutrition, I think. Oh, right. Uh, yes, I've heard of them. So, yeah. so they're my regular supplier. So they're your suppliers. But, yeah. So I can't get it through customs. It, uh, you know, it has to be hand carried yeah. because in the airport it gets stuck for a month or two months or so because of various checks and it's not a regular item, an imported item. Right. So, so that's it, why that's it. So if you do try and get it through customs, it just sits there and goes bad. Yeah, right. So, mate, so, I feel, I feel so, for you trying to get those cultures. <laughs> goodness me. Uh, but the quantity I'm making, it's it's all right for about six months. It's okay. Shelf size is around two years. Yes. So I put I stuff them in my deep freeze, and that's all. And yes. uh, as the volume increased, I have use my knowledge and my, you know, what do you call it, my uh, technical know-how to... Yes. Uh, like now, I, am, I don't have, the, like the artists and cheese makers have uh, the, uh, the, the cheese cakes, like uh, yeah, yeah. small the converting room, the room. fridge. Yeah. No, no, not the room. I mean the fridge. Yeah. And the fridge. Convert the fridge with an external thermostat. Right. So yeah. I, 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 it just struck me if it can be done with an external thermometer, why can't do it with a large size, you know, big freezer, chest yeah. freeze, well, about yeah, 400, can, yeah. 400. I, I did that. So I'm hmm. having three large deep freezers now with your temperature control. And I actually don't, initially I thought I'll be needing it, yeah. but I don't need uh, any... Uh, 
to, so far the uh, moisture is concerned, I mean, the, uh, it normally is around 85 to 95, so I don't have to oh, worry about humidity, it. right, yes. Uh, humidity, humidity. Right. And, and uh, for the temperature, I just uh, use an external, the probe goes in, and yep. I can set it for 45 to 55. Yeah. Oh, that's, how I'm, and, and it stays, that's how I'm managing. Yeah, and it stays at the like, right temperature for you. Like, and, yeah, that's fantastic, mate. Like, but, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, like, keep going. No, uh, like Stephen Pope, he wrote to me, I said, Tutu, you have done enough experiments. Why don't you get a, uh, a proper uh, cheesecake? Uh, and I wanted to do it, but yeah. couldn't get any, anything, you know, uh, so I have already ordered an American uh, thing which can be attached to a uh, window type air cooler or something like that. It's yeah. called Cool Bot, I think. Right. It's a Cool Bot, and that can uh, give me the correct temperature. So you will so then. So you'll then manufacture a room insulated room. It and is. And use the cool bot, yeah, and use yes, the cool bot cool thing bot. to cool the room, yeah. That's what I'm thinking now. But yeah. I, at my age, I'm already seventy-eight. Yeah. I, I don't know whether I'll. Uh, uh, I have little hesitations about it. Yes, I suppose. <laughs> I'd like to, I suppose I, you I'd may. Like to, I'd like to teach, uh, you know, the young generation so that they can, uh, because. It's a tremendous opportunity is there, and the milk is there, and why not? Yeah, exactly. Have you got anybody that's interested in you teaching them how to make well, artificial I, cheese? In my Facebook page, I said I had many, many <laughs> requests that uh, count me in, I'm coming in. So I haven't still decided when and where. I need a place. Yeah. To be very honest, I need a place. It can't be done in my house. or you know. So I don't exactly have a factory. Yeah. But I have rented out a space near my residence mm. where I, I have three rooms. Yeah. Uh, my, and, and that works for you, yeah? That, that works, that for, works you. for me. Yeah. So with the quantity I make, it's all right. Yeah, cool. So, are you are you uh, making a profit at the moment, or or breaking even? No, no, it's uh, not even break even. No, <laughs> because so it's just I'm a buying at the moment. Yes, passion at the moment. Yeah. The thing is, is uh, the milk I buy in Dhaka, in the capital city, is three times the price than what is uh, available in the rural area, yeah. where the farms have. Uh, Say, to give you an example in numerical figure, if that is 30 taka, that's a, uh, taka is the Bangladeshi currency name. Right, yeah. If that is 30 taka in, in a village, and with transport and everything, when it comes to Dhaka, it is 90 taka. Good. Three times. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, and all they do, it's not even pasteurized. So it's still it's raw milk. just raw, raw milk, but they do have they do bring it in four degrees uh, centigrade so that it is fresh for about two, three days. Yeah. They usually uh, uh, give it for uh, making sweets in Bangladesh and India also. Uh, yeah. uh, the sweet is a after dinner or after, uh, after meal. The sweet is a variation like a desert. This right. is most probably when the English were here, they yeah. introduced it. They introduced it like... Uh, like the uh, the Portuguese taught uh, taught these uh, uh, know how I mean the gave the know how how to make it with yeah. rennet, but yeah. it didn't survive with the rennet. Oh, they right. went back to the acid coagulation separation. You know yeah, they yeah. used to make the thing. You you know the uh, the Indian paneer is yes, a very paneer, very big yeah. business. Yeah. Paneer they use the acid coagulation. Yeah, so like, lemon uh, juice or vinegar. Uh, or lemon stuff. juice or white vinegar. Yeah. White vinegar and with little pressure. And that is a, uh, a cheese, soft cheese, that, that can be fried and it yeah. can be put in uh, Indian cuisines like uh, in uh, lentils with, with yeah. uh, spinach and uh, Indian paneer. They and they can it eat it sweet paneer. as well, yeah? Yeah. No, that's, that's 
that's a different uh, thing. Like oh. they coagulate it, but don't add salt in it. Right. So they make, uh, uh, they add sugar to it, and they make different types of, like uh, like the Boko Chini style. Uh, oh, right, you know, yeah. They make balls, and they boil it in, uh, in syrup, uh, boiling syrup. Oh, sugar uh, syrup. Sugar, sugar syrup. Yeah. And it puffs up, and that's called rasagulla. That's oh, right. one of the very, that's a very, very popular, like, if you give a search, what is a rasagulla, you'll find it most probably in that's internet. That's fantastic. Also. So when the British were here, and the viceroys, their wives and others, they became a bit big patrons for this a sweet thing. There is yeah. one sweet called Lady Kinney. Lady Kinney, it's right. a, uh, but it was with, uh, from the name of Lord Canning. Right. He was a viceroy in India. His wife, uh, Lady Canning, the name got distorted and things like that. And yeah. uh, it became Lady Kenny. It's a very popular suite in Calcutta. Oh, right. So, so this is how, you know, uh, things have evolved. So far, the cheese and curds uh, have, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's there, but not in the yeah. proper way of making with rennet. So yeah. who, who are most of your customers? If you're making the harder style cheeses and, and it's not really part of the culture, who are your customers? Are they expats from other countries? Or? Ex expats and those who have gone abroad and, you know, the higher echelon elite class. Right. The richer area of uh, the uh, neighborhood. They are yeah. the only customers. Yeah, because they wouldn't be able to import much to, no. to, to Bangladesh. They, they, they? They, they do import, but these are all stale and, you know, three or four times it has been frozen and oh. defrosted and frozen and defrosted. Yeah. The people tell me, uh, you know, that two tastes are completely different. Commercial yeah. cheese, which you get in the uh, supermarkets, uh, they have so many additives to it, like the shelf life, uh, to extend the shelf life and things like yeah. that. But we, we are cheese makers. We know, we just eat the uh, enzymes and yeah. Not much. Just yeah. to uh, either the low grade culture like mesophilic or if you raise the temperature. It all, all depends what kind of chicken. Yeah, so, of course. Of course. I, it, it don't mean we, you know, that if people in Africans, uh, African continent can make cheeses like very much like in a, uh, a war zones like Congo and other places. Yeah. If they can make cheeses there, why can't we do it here? It's not yeah, exactly. a, here. So they are making some kind of, uh, you know, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, most probably a, a German priest who actually started it yeah. sometimes in yeah. early, early, early 70s. And it is, uh, it, it is still going on. And the gentleman who actually makes it is like something like mild, uh, Buddha, Kuda, right? Uh, yeah. Howda. How do you pronounce Howda. it? Yeah, that's Howda. The one. Howda. <laughs> so there, there, there is. If I can, at my age, I can do it. Why yeah. young generation can't do it? Well, they've got to have. Uh, they've got to have the interest, of course. Um, I'm sure that you'll be able to find somebody soon, uh, because it's a great business opportunity too. You know, if you if you're one of the very few that are making those harder style cheeses in your country and there's a demand for it, I tell yes. you what, if somebody can make it to scale, um, then yeah, you'll make a, 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 a they'll make a business, they'll make a business that's successful and profitable and you can be their guru, mate. Uh, there are, there are uh, subjects are being taught in agricultural yeah. university. Uh, the, a month back, one professor from one of the agricultural universities contacted me and he was amazed that why nobody knows that there is a guy like me who is making it. So he was <laughs> interested. But he also teaches in, the, in his classroom 
but he can't motivate anybody to get into the actual cheese making thing or yeah. a pro- make a project or you know that how a small cheese making thing. it has to start sometime that's right so nobody has done it, it has done. yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, mate, that you're still teaching for a few years yet and you manage to find somebody uh, who's passionate and will take up the baton and start, you know, work with you to make, you know, to learn to make cheese. Yes, that's, that's my desire and that's my... But whether my health will permit, I don't know. <laughs> I'm already, that, mate? My, I told you about, you know, my... Uh, uh, the voice is also sounding funny to me. It's yeah. all uh, choked up and everything. My, I hope, I hope anyway, you get over I, I, Yes, I'll but get I can, it. Yeah. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I, have made, I have made, you know, uh, like the vat, the Dutch press kind of thing. I, yeah. I initially made a small thing with a wooden uh, stick and things like that. I have a st- stainless steel uh, um, s- uh, structure. Where press, it can yeah, yeah. Uh, press large size around twelve inch dia, two cheeses at a time. So, oh, yeah. uh, so I uh, I have set up the thing in my own way, but so, yeah. it it it, can, it, it does uh, like I I don't know because the expat community they usually ask me that if you are like if Dutch community uh, yeah. they have uh, they say that we have Buddha with cumin seed. Why don't you give it a try? So I made yeah. it with there the you go. and this is fantastic. They, I, loved, it. they loved it. Yeah. So like like uh, camembert and brie, like I I tried the brie with about that twelve inches dia, and yeah. I when I cut it into a wedge, and I couldn't pack it because yeah. it was all oozing out. Yeah, so yeah, later yeah. on I I thought of making a, a mini. Mini coming there, mini brie, about four inches dia. I'm using the same mold now yeah. to make both brie and uh, coming there. Oh, that's fantastic. So, and they, the smaller now versions of the mold cheese, they are turning out better and not as runny, and that you can actually get them no. to market? Yes, yes. I, I, have de- I, I, have de- I have started my own delivery thing, it's only based in Dhaka. Not yeah. outside the capital, not outside the capital, and it's the cool chain. Uh, whoever takes, uh, whenever my peop- my chappies make the delivery, they yeah. uh, take it in a cool box uh, because in Bangladesh uh, temperature is quite high. Yeah. Uh, it, it's hot. Uh, it's not good for cheese. And I usually tell people, you know, those who are trying new uh, have never. There is another thing: the palate, the Bangladeshi palate, has to change. Yeah. Because, you know, they know that with curd, it's the taste only sweet. But it can be salty taste also, mm. or a little bit of moldy, or, you know, some green, uh, blue streaks in it. And yeah, they yeah. will just throw it away. Because they, they don't know, yeah. Because they don't have the, 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 that cheese, that sort of cheese culture. Um, yes. And it, that only comes to, too, with education, as you know. So... Yeah. Um, and it's a and it's a it's a long road to educate people to try new things, you know. But yeah, uh, yeah hopefully, hopefully you'll manage to do that. And, and I suppose it'll be through the um, the expats that are buying your cheese will then tell others that, and, and it'll all be word of mouth. You know what I mean? They do. They do. Yeah. They do. And that's how my the uh, there are that like a, there's an American club. There's a Dutch club, there's a Norwegian club. They do order uh, that. Uh, I got a um, order whether I would be able to make Jarlsberg for them or not. I said oh, that right. Swiss, Swiss and Jarlsberg or Masadam are almost a kind of same thing. So yeah, yeah. I just did it and it worked. And they said, oh, who taught you? I said, well, uh, I, I just... There are a few places, including you. Yeah. You know. Thank that you. That has helped me. Now, they actually, it's not trying to flatter somebody or it. No, it's no, a, no. It's, no. A, it's a dada. It, it is. A, you, look, I 
and I, even though I make the videos myself, they're a useful tool. Like I've even gone back yeah, and used my, I've used my yeah. own videos to make cheese that I've forgotten how to. So, you know, it's going to help me as I get older as well. Yes. But your videos are so, your, uh, how, how shall I put it? It's so easy to follow. So yeah. simple. I there are other, other, other YouTube videos as well. It's a bit lengthy. Or your one is the correct time, say maximum 12, 15 minutes. Sometimes yeah. it runs a little. But once you get hooked in making cheese, then I'm watching this program, say, I just missed one, one hour in the morning. You started yeah. around four hour time. Mate, I tell you what, you're dedicated watching the stream that long today. I, I mean, off and on, I'm following you. Following you from five in the morning. Goodness so me. I, so I saw uh, three interviews. Ruth, yeah. uh, prior to that, there is another. And yeah, later Krishna. on, again, I was I dozed, dozed off for a little while. <laughs> again, woke up, and I didn't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate, that's fantastic. So... Besides the challenges of getting starter cultures and and rennet supplies in in Bangladesh, what are some of the other challenges that you have trying to ramp up production to meet demand that you have? Uh, to get the right kind of milk. Right. Yep. That's that's the main thing I have. Uh, you know, once I got about hundred liters of milk. And it was contaminated with E. coli. All oh, the E. coli. E. coli. All yeah. floated up. Oh, so that... I took the sample to one of these labs and said that, could you tell me what's the problem here? They said it's E. coli. Mm. And I searched the internet. What happens if you have E. coli in the milk? And I found out it is with the silage that yeah. they feed the, the fodder and the things that uh, there is nobody will uh, there is no pastures so the cows are all uh, the cattle are all uh, in a shed oh, and they are given with the dry uh, grass and other and uh, fermented, grass, and the fermented well, yeah. grass and things like that and with that you don't get good milk no, the, you get, my, my you get milk early supplier. blown milk too. Yeah. My yes. milk supplier, he has about 10 uh, jersey cows. And he mixes all fishian and jersey, he mixes all together. So I said, please, for heaven's sake, keep <laughs> some separate for me because it has a much higher uh, you know, protein and, and uh, fat content, fat content yeah. uh, that yields better cheddar. Mm. You know, I can do proper cheddaring with it. Yeah. So if I do it two hours of cheddaring, you know, and later on uh, when it dries and I, it, it's in fantastic cheese. Yeah, yeah. So with the, the raw milk you get, if, you're, if, if there was some E. coli contamination, do you now pasteurize? Uh, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't pasteurize the hard, hard cheeses. Right. Because, as they said, if you long age, you know, them. in long age, they, they you know, good bacteria only survive, and yeah. the bad ones they, they die off. I only pasteurize, I also do the pasteurization myself. That simple yeah. thing, you know, the 62, uh, yeah, low uh, temperature, long hold, just yeah. hold it for half an hour, then yeah. uh, pull it down to uh, 30 or even yeah. lower than that. That's what I do. I I didn't have any I didn't have any complaint. I don't do the shorter version, which yeah. is seventy three and uh, fifteen seconds. Yeah, I don't that do kills that. too many enzymes. No, no, no. no. Yeah. So I do that half an hour thing, so, uh, as long as I'm, I'm making the you know uh, the the feta and the yeah, halloumi. the softer cheese. Yeah. That, uh, nowadays I don't do halloumi because when I'm boiling it to you know to cook it yeah. uh, later part. Uh, the, already the temperature is, reaches around uh, 85 uh, centigrade, so it kills off. So one of the uh, microbiologists told me, you don't have to uh, bother about it. Because yeah, of, which uh, is, I think, that, why the Cypriots uh, chose that style of cheese. They didn't have to pasteurize their milk 
um, because they have to put it in the boiling way, you know, to, oh, yes. to get it to float. So, yeah. you know, they, they didn't know that's why they did it. They did it because, you know, that stopped half the issues. They were probably getting sick and stuff like that. So it, it's yeah, amazing yeah. how uh, before uh, microbiology, you know, was discovered um, that all these different cheeses through the world had different processes to handle issues that they may have with raw milk. So, yeah, yeah. so halloumi is one You're of right. my yeah. yeah. And, and halloumi is one of my highest selling cheese so it, far, Bengal is Bangladeshi palate is concerned. Right. It's both, it's popular with both uh, the expat community and Bangladeshi. Once the, you fry it, you know, uh, in them without without oil, I teach them just put it in a skillet without yeah. any oil. It has enough fat in it. Yeah. And when you get it golden brown, it is amazingly tasty. It is. It is. It, yeah. It's it's it, as far as I'm concerned, it's better than fried paneer. That's for sure. Yes. And it just, yes. it has that saltiness and the the squeak when you bite into it. It is just amazing. And amazing. when you and when you make it with raw milk, the lactic bacteria that are present in the milk would definitely add something really special to that cheese. Sure. Mm. And, and and you say that's nearly your highest selling cheese. That's one of my highest selling cheese. Yeah. Every day I'm getting orders for it. Yeah. And there is both both uh, camembert and brie as well. But All right. some complain uh, I, because maybe my aging takes maybe little temperature is a little high or don't i still haven't been i don't have enough in your hair so nobody tells me when to stop and this is all trial and error right uh, sometimes i have i got complaint i have got uh, complaints like they uh, smell a little bit of ammonia and things like yeah. that and that happens but and, yeah, that, you know, look, that's part of the process really yes um but that's again Yes, someone said no. I love that. Yeah, exactly. Scent. You, you, so you look, why? And I had to replace that when okay. I get complaint. I usually say, "Okay, I'll, I'll either you adjust it with my second consignment, or I'll I'll pay you back." Yeah, I send it there. Yeah. So, but so some people like spirit. it. Some people like it super runny, and some people like it firmer. So I love you it. know, what what can you do? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Like the like the paste cheese you are making, you just showed the little while ago. Yeah. Uh, the the chili brie. Oh, the stabilized the, the, paste the, the one. Stabilized yeah. paste. Stabilized paste. I haven't tried it, but I will. I will have a go at it. Yeah. Maybe that will be that will be much uh, much palatable for others. But yeah, I like the gooey. I like the gooey one. Like me too. One. But but um, <laughs> my my wife Kim, she doesn't like it when it's runny. She likes the. The stabilized no. paste version. So you I know, see. what can you do? You'll have a market for both, really. Right. Yeah. So uh, now I think we've nearly answered all the questions, Tutu. And what is it? It's only ten past um, six. We've got another twenty minutes to go. Um, <laughs> so, have you got any anything else you would like to talk about on some of the the challenges and and issues that you've had during? Uh, you know, starting up this practice. And do you think, here's a question for you, do you think it'll be profitable uh, in the near future for you? It, it will be profitable, uh, provided people like me, those who don't understand marketing, will make cheese and yeah. marketing people joining together yeah. and make out a strategy how to sell. Yeah. Only then it will su succeed. Is there, any, my, yeah. is there any sort yes. of consortium? You know, like the Italians love a good consortium. You don't have no, anything like no, that no, there? No. no. You, we, you have have a, one. <laughs> we have, uh, you know, uh, the dairy farms now. Yeah. They bring in like Brahmi species or something like from America. It's right. a very big bull and things like that. Brahman they bull? Do the Brahman bull. Yeah. And that is they bring in here for meat production. Right. So not for dairy. So not for, for dairy. Yeah. So everybody thinks that that is more profitable than having a dairy. 
Yeah, but dairy farming is is profitable if you can uh, upscale, not upscale, if you can convert the milk to something else. Selling Do milk something itself, is, yeah, yeah, selling milk that, itself that, is not profitable. I, you are very right. Do, do value add it in a way that, so that it becomes, it becomes yeah. like yeah. even the sweet meat that Indian subcontinent or we make, that is also very short life. Yeah. You know, maximum two weeks, then it goes, you know, rancid and, and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if someone can be convinced, you know, the I don't have a farm. Like right, the, yeah. those who are actually producing milk, that it will be much more profitable yeah, if you convert it to, it to a something yeah. and you can extend it to for six months or one year. And if you even you can sell it for a higher price. Hmm. And that's Someone right. has and to then, convert that. Yeah, so you it's, a, it's not possible. There. It's not possible dairy. with a one man band. I'm <laughs> thinking like a one man band. You, How do you do it? You know what? I um I had a similar issue. How was I going to promote home cheese making, and then make a living out of it? So, I don't know. You just got to be persistent. I think that's what you're doing, right? You're being you continue to make the cheese, you continue to promote it, and and be as persistent and in people's faces with the cheese as you can. I think that's the only way. Time is going to help and and sure. and, and help. I wish. Uh, I, 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 I wish I could convince someone. I'll, be, I, I'll start making some, I'll arrange for some uh, training uh, for, you know, some basic cheeses. Yes. If I can bring, bring the interest out in young generation and they yes. can be motivated that this will pay you. This yes. will be a profitable thing in the long run. Yes. Ah, with uh, uh, most probably little work. But yes. not by myself alone. Yeah, the yeah, government yeah. has to take initiative, or you know the the farmers, the uh, dairy farmers, yeah. those who are producing milk, they have to join up together. Yeah. Uh, I, the professor I was talking about from the, the uh, agricultural university, yeah. uh, we had a talk together. That uh, he says that I wish you were twenty years younger. I would have taken you out <laughs> and the touring Bangladesh. I say anyway, you can do it. Yeah. But I can always come and uh, I can share my experience I have gathered in the last five years. Yeah, uh, definitely. So have you thought about giving workshops to... Not yet, not yet. No? No. With... Like in the YouTube also, I have no... I have never done any video. Uh, yeah. So I was a little apprehensive about you I, know, I think what in I your, talk. I think, too, too, in your situation with the experience that you've had so far that the best way that you're going to get to promote new, to to grow new cheesemakers in Bangladesh is for you uh, if you're up to it to to teach others how to make oh, the cheese that, I that's think that's the I'm only way it's going to grow right it's the only way sure. it's going to grow unless you get passionate expats that come in there with the cheese making knowledge and and either help you out or or do their own thing you know so that the pandemic has uh, have been a drawback for me. That is the that is the uh, um, from the Netherlands. Yeah. They call it pump. These are retired senior citizens. Uh, yeah. They have a uh, organization. They come to developing countries like us, ours, yeah. where where they teach because of pandemic. Yeah, I, you they know, couldn't do I, it. I arranged yeah. it one for now. They couldn't do it. Mm. They wanted that they can do it online. I said online it will not work. Yeah, Actually, you've got to be you got to be in people's faces. Them. Yeah, in people's face, and actually they have to uh, touch the solid the milk solid. Yeah, and yeah. How it feels. The tactile the tactile sensation has to be there until yeah. you touch you will not understand what you are making. It yeah. doesn't come from... It, it happened with me. Hmm. I can tell you. The, yeah. When I saw you uh, cutting the curd and, you know, it is all looks fantastic. But... you got to do it the, yourself. You, know, you have to do it yourself. Yeah. And a time comes when the, the tube size uh, shrinks and it becomes harder 
the with temperature scalding you uh, you make it a uh, the recipe becomes perfect yeah you know you know uh, through experience on handling the you know physically handling the curds on whether they're the right size whether they're holding the right moisture and all that yes. sort of look i i hear you mate i tell you um because when i first started making cheese there were no youtube channels on how to make cheese so no. i i <laughs> went to yeah i went to a workshop um taught by two lovely old ladies um here in victoria and they taught me how to make cheese so i made feta was Fantastic. the very first cheese that i made um and yeah it was it was because i had my hands in the curd i learned better i understood and that was one of the reasons why i was teaching physical workshops as well um and and that I don't know if anybody's gone on to make their own artisan cheese making business. I, I, I don't care either way, but it was, uh, I've got a lot, a new, there's a new breed of home cheese makers that are passionate about making their own cheese at home. Um, and like you said, when the pandemic hit, you, you couldn't do face to face anymore. You really had to, um, you, you had to, I, I well, I was online anyway, thank goodness. And, and it just went from there. I just got more and more videos up. So, but yeah, people have to follow. They can't just watch a video and and learn. They've got to then try it themselves. Try so, it. Sure. Yeah. And Never. fail. And fail. You got to fail. No, to that's, learn. Until unless you fail, it doesn't. You don't learn. That's right. Yeah. Unless you, you know, if you get it perfect the first time. Guaranteed, the next time you do it, it's not going to be perfect. It's not, you know? it's never, never. And and a lot of people tend to give up once they failed for a first time. But you know, my advice and the advice of everybody that's interviewed today, including yourself, is to keep trying, try, sure. try again. Yeah, you know, sure. or you, it, it's um, cheese making the is something you got to learn, right? The will has to be there. The motivation mm. has to be there. Yeah. The passion has to be there. Only then you will succeed. Yes. Yes. Otherwise, exactly. you know, uh, otherwise, it has, sometimes it was very, very difficult. Why can't mm. I do it? Yes. I'll just tell you one simple thing. I couldn't fold the halloumi. It was too great. <laughs> right. So what did you do? Did then you fold one it day the just, end? It no, happened? Oh, oh. It, it, I, I saw another uh, Citrix video somewhere, most probably. It's uh, uh, sponsored by some UNTP or something. Yeah. And uh, the, the lady was tying it in a, a small handkerchief kind of cloth. Right. So I tried that. It did <laughs> fold up on its own. But I just did it two or three times. And later on, I got the idea that that correct temperature will make it that valuable. You can just fold it. Yes, yes. It just, it happens. Yeah. I, and that, I fold I just, it straight out of a hot way. And if you leave it for yes. any more time, Gentlemen, it breaks. It will not. Yeah. It breaks. So, yeah. And that, that and you learned that file so, trial, trial and error. It's a trial, trial and yeah. error. Yeah. No, Nobody will teach you that. Nobody will teach you that. No, unless you're in Cyprus. Inside. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I'm okay. All right, my, good. I told you about my ailment. It's, it's okay. No problem. My, fantastic. It's but, lovely um, that uh, this lovely to uh, take part in your you inviting me and you know uh, give me the opportunity to share my experiences. Mate, I, uh, when so. I was searching for people um, to interview, you came straight to mind because. I remember a few times we've had conversations on Facebook. Yes, and I, I did. And I've seen your lovely cheese that you produce for people. And I thought, we've got to get an artisan cheesemaker on the stream and have a chat about um, the things that they've done. So, mate, before you go, um, do you have any words of encouragement for new cheesemakers who are thinking of going, making that transition from home cheesemaker to artisan cheesemaker? It's all, it's all is there. If you are a good home cheese maker, you can extend it. Don't lose heart. And as I said, ah, do it in a larger volume. Let people know. 
and uh, you think about you know how to i'm not a marketing man as i told you told yeah. you before and how to go about selling your stuff is if you don't know you take somebody else's help i don't know but <laughs> it, that is a tremendous opportunity so far yeah. the young generation in bangladesh is concerned i will yeah. advise them you if, if anybody wants to contact me or yeah. you know uh, to form something it can be a group training thing and come yeah. and learn yeah i'm willing to teach so your facebook page has to be there. is and so, yeah so i was going to say uh, that if anybody yes, wants to contact two. you you've it's called cheesy tutu right yes yeah and uh, and I'm i think tutu, the name is it is called my company is called tutu's artisan cheese Right, and so if people if look that Facebook up and if they're interested or in, in UCT, and yeah, give a Google Google search, you will also get me. Or www.facebook.com/cheesytutu. Uh, yeah. That's nice. my that's my <laughs> cheesy tutu. Well, hopefully cheesy somebody tutu takes you up. Yeah, it's hopefully tutu somebody takes you up on your offer, and you get a flood sure. of people that want to learn how to make cheese and then sure. take it to the next level in your country. That would be fantastic, sure. mate. So Keeping my thank finger you. crossed. Yes, so thank do so I. Hopefully, and hopefully this video gets out there and, and people learn that you're there ready to, um, to teach them that sort of skill. Mate, it's been fantastic talking to you today. Thank you so much for coming on the stream. It's, thank it's you been for having me, Kevin. Mate, no and problem at all, as me. I said. As I said, we'll no be, problem. We'll be in touch and you will still remain my guru and <laughs> uh, guide me through my, uh, you know, uh, and things that I don't understand or things like that. Mate, it's, no I problem. can't, sure. Happy to, uh, happy to answer any questions that you've got. So just shoot them through. Um, sure, I'll do that. And got all my best, best research to Kim also. Thank you she, so much, mate. Done. She's probably watching still. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, to okay. I'll see you later, mate. Okay. okay. Take right. care. Bye-bye. 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 Fantastic. So that was Tutu. Um, and, yeah, he's got a lot of passion around teaching the uh, next generation of cheesemakers there in uh, Bangladesh. And uh, hopefully he uh, achieves his goal. I, I wish him all the best. Um, and uh, yeah, he's a very passionate man about cheese. So fantastic! Thank you, Tutu, for uh, being there today and uh, and and talking to us about his challenges that he has um, over there in Bangladesh, in a country that doesn't have the same sort of cheese culture that um, well we do here in Australia and and, and other places. Um, so we've got the last uh, 30 minutes is uh, scheduled for uh, live wrap-up and Q&A. So what I'm going to do is um, just um, go back through the day, in my memory anyway, and, and just one thing that I learned from each, uh, each interview. Now, we've had six interviews today. Um, so the thing that I learned from the first interview from uh, Jennifer... Um, is that um, that uh, when you have your own cow, you get a lot of milk, and she's now got two cows, so uh, that is uh, amazing uh, that she manages to process all of that milk into cheese, and the sizes of the wheels that she makes uh, are absolutely massive. So we're talking... Uh, three to four kilogram wheels of cheese made with, uh, she said, seven gallons, which is what, nearly uh, 28 litres of milk. So that is massive. Uh, and the other thing I learned from uh, Jennifer is that uh, you can wean a calf uh, off a cow within, she said, two weeks. So I think it's sometimes a little bit more, but uh, it's good that you can then get all of the, well, the vast majority of the milk anyway from the cow. So that's what I learned from Jennifer. And she was a lovely lady and we had a fantastic chat there. So the next thing that I learned from Patricia um, was 
uh, that you can, you know, she started off small and just followed videos and uh, and make some amazing cheeses. And some of the things that I learned was that uh, that uh, you can be daring. Um, once you've got the basics of cheese making under your belt, you can make any style of cheese that you like and then tweak it uh, to to what you want. So that was um, uh, fantastic. So, um, that was what I learned from Patricia and she's made some amazing cheeses. She always sends me photos and she's always in the chat on uh, Sunday morning. Uh, I'm starting to lose my voice now. So just a drink. <clears throat> okay. So, um, the next interview was with Ruth and what I learned from Ruth, she's a lovely lady and, um, that, uh, Cheese making for her is therapy. Um, even though she's a therapist herself, uh, she needed a release um, from all that hard work that she does with other people. She needed a release. And what she has done by making cheese herself, she's managed to uh, incorporate that into her therapy sessions by using analogies and uh, gifts of cheese and all sorts of other things. Um, to help heal people as well. Not only heal herself uh, mentally and physically after a hard day's work or a hard week's work, but help heal others. Uh, so that was the lesson that I learned from, uh, from Ruth, and that was absolutely fantastic. The next lesson I learned was that, uh, and that was from myself, was that I can smoke cheese uh, just in a normal hooded barbecue. It was... Uh, great fun uh, teaching, well, or making the video on how I smoked cheese. There's some things that I would do differently, as I mentioned. Uh, I wouldn't use that little sawdust um, uh, a smoker. I would use a pellet smoker next time and just keep that away from the, the cheese so that doesn't become hot and melt. Um, I, I could use my barbecue. I've got no problems with using that and, and getting um, aluminium foil and blocking up all the gaps. That would work still, but I think I'm going to purchase a pellet um, smoker uh, and, and cold smoke the cheese. I need a, a bigger volume of uh, smoke and I'll be able to do it in less time. Instead of taking the six hours, I could probably cut that down to three hours, but definitely we'll be smoking some more cheese. So that's what I learned from that session. Uh, from the Tracy Johnson session, uh, Tracy, who now runs uh, Cheese Needs, uh, that um, the thing that I learned there was that her passion for making cheese initially, uh, she went on then to do a cheese making supply business and promoting home cheese making um, all around British Columbia, so in Canada. So, um, from simple background, from simple beginnings, she has managed to make a uh, a full time business uh, selling cheese making supplies, uh, and that is admirable. It, for me, it kind of happened organically, but she took determined steps uh, to do that. So that was really good. So that's what I learned from the Tracy interview, and that she's a lovely person as well. So, uh, in fact, all of the people I interviewed today have a passion and are amazing people. All right, so uh, the next one was uh, John Wilson in uh, Kampot in Cambodia. Uh, besides the technical difficulties, which, look, I know live and, and not having reliable internet is, is, is an issue, but his passion just shined through uh, from, uh, you know, um, hooking up with his friend um, that they make, you know, artisan cheese in Cambodia where there aren't any, um, artisan cheese makers and he saw a need for it and it's a lot of fun he loves cheese as well I could tell by you know his passion um, that he learning <laughs> learning as he goes along so uh, creating a business out of that um, is admirable and it looks like I think that they will turn a profit soon uh, he's investing all of the profits back into the business at the moment and um, and look, I, I know that they're going to become successful. 
Um, so it, it will be great. Um, I'm going to schedule another interview uh, with John because he's such an interesting guy and we did have so many difficulties, technical difficulties. So, yeah, we'll, we'll catch up with him again. And the last thing I learned from Tutu was that in uh, Bangladesh, there is a market for, for rennet-based cheeses um, and definitely there is a a demand for for that cheese. And it's a shame that he hasn't been able to find uh, at the moment uh, any uh, people who are willing to learn the skills and then take it forward to the next step. I'd hate to see um, the 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 um, a blossoming cheese making industry in that country coming to a screaming halt um, after uh, you know Tutu gets too tired to to make it. It would be fantastic to see the next generation of cheese makers within uh, Bangladesh and and take it forward. So I learnt there that there is a you know, demand in that country that doesn't normally have a cheese culture and that it is starting to grow uh, within Bangladesh. So thank you, Tutu, for um, coming on the stream and, and sharing all of your knowledge and stuff with us. So that is absolutely fantastic. Now, my voice is nearly gone. I might actually call the end of the show a little bit early, and I'm, I'm, I know that's sad for some people, but I won't be able to talk much longer seeing I've been at it for, you know, 12 hours odd, uh, six hours definitely talking straight, <clears throat> which is unusual for me. I don't have many words to say, but today has been fantastic. What I would like to do is to thank everybody uh, for watching the stream today. Um, we've had consistent viewership throughout the day. Uh, which has been absolutely fantastic. Um, unfortunately, one of the technical difficulties with uh, streaming onto Facebook as well is that they only allow streaming for eight hours, whereas YouTube, you can go, I think it's 24 hours or 12 hours if you want to keep the recording. So uh, that's why I've kept it to this, well, shorter <laughs> shorter period um, and, uh, and still uh, streaming on YouTube. But once again, uh, without all of your questions and participation, it wouldn't have been the event that it is. Uh, you will see over the next coming weeks that I will be chopping up uh, the interviews and turning them into podcast episodes. So watch for that. If you haven't already subscribed to my podcast, either um, via your podcast catcher, uh, audio, audio only, or... I do have a YouTube channel that has the video version of the podcasts. Just go and check out Little Green Cheese uh, podcast with Gavin Weber, and you will find that. Just search for Gavin Weber. It'll probably come up on the list anyway. But it's been fantastic. Um, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, I am going to say goodbye now before I lose my voice. So thank you one and all for turning up for the stream. It's been going for 11 hours, 38 minutes. I didn't quite make it to the 12 hours, but close enough as far as I'm concerned. So thanks for watching, everybody. And I will see you next Sunday. There is no show. I'm taking a break next weekend. I'm going to visit my daughter who lives in uh, rural Victoria, so I won't um, have an internet connection. I won't be able to do the stream. But, um, yeah, it'll be great. And thank you, everybody, that stuck around. I know some people have put in all-nighters to watch this, and we've got a super chat. Thank you so much to Cheryl um, for the super chat, the last one of the day. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and she has a comment. She says, uh, this has been an extraordinary live 12 hours. I wasn't sure if I was going to stay up all night, but at 4.35 a.m., I'm glad I didn't miss a minute. I learned a lot and laughed. Curd nerds are cool people. Indeed, they are. Thank you so much, Cheryl, and appreciate the uh, $20 US Super Chat. All right, my voice is going. I'm going to call it a night and uh, go and have a nice glass of champagne and some dinner. 
that Kim has cooked for me. So thank you so much, everybody. And like I said, uh, no show next week. There'll be a show the weekend after. So uh, from me, uh, I will, as Ruth says, <laughs> uh, thanks for watching, Curd Nerds, and I'll see you next time. Ha, ha, ha.